This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1, by Edward Gibbon. Preface of the Author. It is not my intention to detain the reader by expatiating on the variety or the importance of the subject, which I have undertaken to treat, since the merit of the choice would serve to render the weakness of the execution still more apparent and still less excusable. But as I have presumed to lay before the public a first volume only of the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, it will perhaps be expected that I should explain, in a few words, the nature and limits of my general plan. The memorable series of revolutions, which in the course of about thirteen centuries gradually undermined, and at length destroyed, the solid fabric of human greatness, may with some propriety be divided into the three following periods. The first of these periods may be traced from the age of Trajan and the Antonines, when the Roman monarchy, having attained its full strength and maturity, began to verge toward its decline, and will extend to the subversion of the Western Empire by the barbarians of Germany and Scythia, the rude ancestors of the most polished nations of modern Europe. This extraordinary revolution, which subjected Rome to the power of a Gothic conqueror, was completed about the beginning of the sixth century. The second period of the decline and fall of Rome may be supposed to commence with the reign of Justinian, who by his laws as well as by his victories restored a transient splendor to the Eastern Empire. It will comprehend the invasion of Italy by the Lombards, the conquest of the Asiatic and African provinces by the Arabs, who embraced the religion of Mohammed, the revolt of the Roman people against the feeble princes of Constantinople, and the elevation of Charlemagne, who in the year 800 established the second, or German, empire of the West. The last and longest of these periods includes about six centuries and a half, from the revival of the Western Empire till the taking of Constantinople by the Turks, and the extinction of a degenerate race of princes, who continued to assume the titles of Caesar and Augustus after their dominions were contracted to the limits of a single city, in which the language as well as manners of the ancient Romans had been long since forgotten. The writer who should undertake to relate the events of this period would find himself obliged to enter into the general history of the Crusades, as far as they contributed to the ruin of the Greek Empire, and he would scarcely be able to restrain his curiosity from making some inquiry into the state of the city of Rome, during the darkness and confusion of the Middle Ages. As I have ventured, perhaps too hastily, to commit to the press a work which, in every sense of the word, deserves the epithet of imperfect— I consider myself as contracting an engagement to finish, most probably in a second volume, the first of these memorable periods, and to deliver to the public the complete history of the decline and fall of Rome, from the age of the Antonines to the subversion of the Western Empire. With regard to the subsequent periods, though I may entertain some hopes, I dare not presume to give any assurances. The execution of the extensive plan which I have described would connect the ancient and modern history of the world— but it would require many years of health, of leisure, and of perseverance. Bentnick Street, February 1st, 1776 Edition The entire history, which is now published, of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire in the West, abundantly discharges my engagements with the public— Perhaps their favorable opinion may encourage me to prosecute a work which, however laborious it may seem, is the most agreeable occupation of my leisure hours. Bentnick Street, March 1st, 1781 Addition An author easily persuades himself that the public opinion is still favorable to his labors, and I have now embraced the serious resolution of proceeding to the last period of my original design, and of the Roman Empire— the taking of Constantinople by the Turks, in the year 1453. The most patient reader, who computes that three ponderous volumes have already been employed on the events of four centuries, may perhaps be alarmed at the long prospect of nine hundred years. But it is not my intention to expatiate with the same minuteness on the whole series of the Byzantine history. At our entrance into this period, 
the reign of Justinian, and the conquests of the Mohammedans will deserve and detain our attention, and the last age of Constantinople, the Crusades and Turks, is connected with the revolutions of modern Europe. From the seventh to the eleventh century, the obscure interval will be supplied by a concise narrative of such facts as may still appear either interesting or important. Bentnick Street, March 1st, 1782 Preface to the First Volume Diligence and accuracy are the only merits to which an historical writer may ascribe to himself, if any merit indeed can be assumed from the performance of an indispensable duty. I may therefore be allowed to say that I have carefully examined all the original materials that could illustrate the subject which I had undertaken to treat. Should I ever complete the extensive design which has been sketched out in the preface, I might perhaps conclude it with a critical account of the authors consulted during the progress of the whole work, and however such an attempt might incur the censure of ostentation, I am persuaded that it would be susceptible of entertainment, as well as information. At present I shall content myself with a single observation. The biographers who, under the reigns of Diocletian and Constantine, composed, or rather compiled, the lives of the emperors, from Hadrian to the sons of Carus, are usually mentioned under the names of Aelius Spartianus, Julius Capitolinus, Aelius Limpridius, Volcatius Gallicanus, Trebilius Polio, and Flavius Vopiscus. But there is so much perplexity in the titles of the manuscripts, and so many disputes that have arisen among the critics concerning their number, their names, and their respective property, that for the most part I have quoted them without distinction, under the general and well-known title of the Augustan History. Preface to the fourth volume of the original quarto edition. I now discharge my promise, and complete my design, of writing the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, both in the West and in the East. The whole period extends from the age of Trajan and the Antonines to the taking of Constantinople by Mohammed the Second, and includes a review of the Crusades and the state of Rome during the Middle Ages. Since the publication of my first volume, twelve years have elapsed, twelve years, according to my wish, of health, of leisure, and of perseverance. I may now congratulate my deliverance from a long and laborious service, and my satisfaction will be pure and perfect if the public favor should be extended to the conclusion of my work. It was my first intention to have collected, under one view, the numerous authors of every age and language from whom I have derived the materials of this history, and I am still convinced that the apparent ostentation would be more than compensated by real use. If I have renounced this idea— if I have declined an undertaking which had obtained the approbation of a master artist, my excuse may be found in the extreme difficulty of assigning a proper measure to such a catalogue. A naked list of names and editions would not be satisfactory either to myself or my readers. The characters of the principal authors of the Roman and Byzantine history have been occasionally connected with the events which they describe. A more copious and critical enquiry might indeed deserve, but it would demand, an elaborate volume which might swell by degrees into a general library of historical writers. For the present, I shall content myself with renewing my serious protestation that I have always endeavoured to draw from my fountainhead, that my curiosity, as well as a sense of duty, has always urged me to study the originals, and that if they have sometimes eluded my search, I have carefully marked the secondary evidence on whose faith a passage or fact were reduced to depend." I shall soon revisit the banks of the Lake of Lausanne, a country which I have known and loved from my early youth, under a mild government, amidst a beauteous landscape, in a life of leisure and independence, and among a people of easy and elegant manners, I have enjoyed, and may again hope to enjoy, the varied pleasures of retirement and society. But I shall ever glory in the name and character of an Englishman. I am proud of my birth in a free and enlightened country, and the approbation of that country is the best and most honorable reward of my labors. Were I ambitious of any other patron than the public, I would inscribe this work to a statesman, who in a long, a stormy, and at length an unfortunate administration, had many political opponents, almost without a personal enemy, who has retained in his fall from power many faithful and disinterested friends, and who under the pressure of severe infirmity enjoys the lively vigor of his mind and the felicity of his incomparable temper. 
Lord North will permit me to express the feelings of friendship in the language of truth, but even truth and friendship should be silent if he is still dispensed the favors of the crown. In a remote solitude, vanity may still whisper in my ear that my readers, perhaps, may inquire whether, in the conclusion of the present work, I am now taking an everlasting farewell. They shall hear all that I know myself, and all that I could reveal to the most intimate friend. The motives of action or silence are now equally balanced, nor can I pronounce in my most secret thoughts on which side the scale will preponderate. I cannot dissemble that six quartos must have tried, and may have exhausted, the indulgence of the public, that in the repetition of similar attempts a successful author has much more to lose than he can hope to gain, that I am now descending into the vale of years, and that the most respectable of my countrymen, the men whom I aspire to imitate, have resigned the pen of history about the same period of their lives. Yet I consider that the annals of ancient and modern times may afford many rich and interesting subjects, that I am still possessed of health and leisure, that by the practice of writing some skill and facility must be acquired, and that in the ardent pursuit of truth and knowledge I am not conscious of decay. To an active mind, indolence is more painful than labor, and the first months of my liberty will be occupied and amused in the excursions of curiosity and taste. By such temptations I have been sometimes seduced from the rigid duty even of a pleasing and voluntary task, but my time will now be my own, and in the use or abuse of independence I shall no longer fear my own reproaches or those of my friends. I am fairly entitled to a year of jubilee, Next summer and the following winter will rapidly pass away, and experience only can determine whether I shall still prefer the freedom and variety of study to the design and composition of a regular work, which animates while it confines the daily application of the author. Caprice and accident may influence my choice, but the dexterity of self-love will contrive to applaud either active industry or philosophic repose. Downing Street, May 1st, 1788 Addition. I shall embrace this opportunity of introducing two verbal remarks, which have not conveniently offered themselves to my notice. 1. As often as I use the definitions of beyond the Alps, the Rhine, the Danube, etc., and generally suppose myself at Rome, and afterwards at Constantinople, without observing whether this relative geography may agree with the local, but variable, situation of the reader or the historian. 2. In proper names of foreign, and especially of oriental origin, it should always be our aim to express in our English version a faithful copy of the original. But this rule, which is founded on a just regard to uniformity and truth, must often be relaxed, and the exceptions will be limited or enlarged by the custom of the language and the taste of the interpreter. Our alphabets may often be defective. A harsh sound, an uncouth spelling, might offend the ear or eye of our countrymen. And some words, notoriously corrupt, are fixed, as it were, naturalized in the vulgar tongue. The Prophet Mohammed can no longer be stripped of the famous, though improper, appellation of Mahomet. The well-known cities of Aleppo, Damascus, and Cairo would be almost lost in the strange descriptions of Haleb, Damash, and Al-Kahira. The titles and offices of the Ottoman Empire are fashioned by the practice of three hundred years— and we are pleased to blend the three Chinese monosyllables, Confuci, in the respectable name of Confucius, or even to adopt the Persian corruption of Mandarin. But I would vary the use of Zoroaster and Sertusht, as I drew my information from Greece or Persia, since our connection with India, the genuine Timur, is restored to the throne of Tamerlane. Our most correct writers have retrenched the all, the superfluous article from the Quran and we escape an ambiguous termination by adopting Moslem instead of Musulman in the plural number. In these, and in a thousand examples, the shades of distinction are often minute, and I can feel where I cannot explain the motives of my choice. End of the Prefaces Chapter 1, Part 1 of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Chapman. The History of the Decline and Fall 
of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. Chapter 1. The Extent of the Empire in the Age of the Antonines. Part 1. Introduction. The Extent and Military Force of the Empire in the Age of the Antonines. In the second century of the Christian era, the empire of Rome comprehended the fairest part of the earth and the most civilized portion of mankind. The frontiers of that extensive monarchy were guarded by ancient renown and disciplined valor. The gentle but powerful influence of laws and manners had gradually cemented the union of the provinces. Their peaceful inhabitants enjoyed and abused the advantages of wealth and luxury. The image of a free constitution was preserved with decent reverence. The Roman Senate appeared to possess the sovereign authority and devolved on the emperors all the executive powers of government. During a happy period of more than fourscore years, the public administration was conducted by the virtue and abilities of Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, and the two Antonines. It is the design of this, and of the two succeeding chapters, to describe the prosperous condition of their empire, and afterwards from the death of Marcus Antoninus to deduce the most important circumstances of its decline and fall a revolution which will ever be remembered and is still felt by the nations of the earth. The principal conquests of the Romans were achieved under the Republic, and the emperors, for the most part, were satisfied with preserving those dominions which had been acquired by the policy of the Senate, the active emulations of the consuls, and the martial enthusiasm of the people. The seven first centuries were filled with a rapid succession of triumphs, but it was reserved for Augustus to relinquish the ambitious design of subduing the whole earth and to introduce a spirit of moderation into the public councils. Inclined to peace by his temper and situation, it was easy for him to discover that Rome, in her present exalted situation, had much less to hope than to fear from the chance of arms, and that in the prosecution of remote wars the undertaking became every day more difficult, the event more doubtful, and the possession more precarious and less beneficial. The experience of Augustus added weight to these salutary reflections, and eventually convinced him that by the prudent vigour of his counsels it would be easy to secure every concession which the safety or the dignity of Rome might require from the most formidable barbarians. Instead of exposing his person and his legions to the arrows of the Parthians, he obtained, by an honourable treaty, the restitution of the standards and prisoners which had been taken in the defeat of Crassus. His generals, in the early part of his reign, attempted the reduction of Ethiopia and Arabia Felix. They marched near a thousand miles to the south of the tropic, but the heat of the climate soon repelled the invaders and protected the unwarlike natives of those sequestered regions. The northern countries of Europe scarcely deserved the expense and labor of conquest, the forests and morasses of Germany were filled with a hardy race of barbarians who despised life when it was separated from freedom, and though on the first attack they seemed to yield to the weight of the Roman power, they soon, by a signal act of despair, regained their independence and reminded Augustus of the vicissitude of fortune. On the death of that emperor, his testament was publicly read in the Senate. He bequeathed, as a valuable legacy to his successors, the advice of confining the empire within those limits which nature seemed to have placed as its permanent bulwarks and boundaries. On the west, the Atlantic Ocean, the Rhine and Danube on the north, 
the Euphrates on the east, and towards the south, the sandy deserts of Arabia and Africa. Happily for the repose of mankind, the moderate system recommended by the wisdom of Augustus was adopted by the fears and vices of his immediate successors. Engaged in the pursuit of pleasure, or in the exercise of tyranny, the first Caesars seldom showed themselves to the armies or to the provinces, nor were they disposed to suffer that those triumphs which their indolence neglected should be usurped by the conduct and valour of their lieutenants. The military fame of a subject was considered as an insolent invasion of the imperial prerogative, and it became the duty, as well as interest, of every Roman general to guard the frontiers entrusted to his care without aspiring to conquests which might have proved no less fatal to himself than to the vanquished barbarians. The only accession which the Roman Empire received during the first century of the Christian era was the province of Britain. In this single instance, the successors of Caesar and Augustus were persuaded to follow the example of the former rather than the precept of the latter. The proximity of its situation to the coast of Gaul seemed to invite their arms. The pleasing though doubtful intelligence of a pearl fishery attracted their avarice, and as Britain was viewed in the light of a distinct and insulated world, the conquest scarcely formed any exception to the general system of continental measures. After a war of about forty years, undertaken by the most stupid, maintained by the most dissolute, and terminated by the most timid of all the emperors, the far greater part of the island submitted to the Roman yoke. The various tribes of Britain possessed valour without conduct, and the love of freedom without the spirit of union. They took up arms with savage fierceness. They laid them down, or turned them against each other, with wild inconsistency, and while they fought singly, they were successively subdued. Neither the fortitude of Caractacus, nor the despair of Boadicea, nor the fanaticism of the Druids, could avert the slavery of their country, or resist the steady progress of the imperial generals who maintained the national glory when the throne was disgraced by the weakest or the most vicious of mankind. At the very time when Domitian, confined to his palace, felt the terrors which he inspired, his legions under the command of the virtuous Agricola defeated the collected force of the Caledonians at the foot of the Grampian hills, and his fleets, venturing to explore an unknown and dangerous navigation, displayed the Roman arms round every part of the island. The conquest of Britain was considered as already achieved, and it was the design of Agricola to complete and ensure his success by the easy reduction of Ireland, for which, in his opinion, one legion and a few auxiliaries were sufficient. The western isle might be improved into a valuable possession, and the Britons would wear their chains with the less reluctance, if the prospect and example of freedom were, on every side, removed from before their eyes. But the superior merit of Agricola soon occasioned his removal from the government of Britain, and forever disappointed this rational, though extensive, scheme of conquest. Before his departure, the prudent general had provided for security as well as for dominion. He had observed that the island is almost divided into two unequal parts by the opposite gulfs, or, as they are now called, the Firths of Scotland. Across the narrow interval of about forty miles, he had drawn a line of military stations, which was afterwards fortified in the reign of Antoninus Pius, by a turf rampart erected on foundations of stone. This wall of Antoninus, 
at a small distance beyond the modern cities of Edinburgh and Glasgow, was fixed as the limit of the Roman province. The native Caledonians preserved, in the northern extremity of the island, their wild independence, for which they were not less indebted to their poverty than to their valour. Their incursions were frequently repelled and chastised, but their country was never subdued. The masters of the fairest and most wealthy climates of the globe turned with contempt from gloomy hills assailed by the winter tempest, from lakes concealed in a blue mist, and from cold and lonely heaths, over which the deer of the forest were chased by a troop of naked barbarians. Such was the state of the Roman frontiers, and such the maxims of imperial policy, from the death of Augustus to the accession of Trajan. That virtuous and active prince had received the education of a soldier and possessed the talents of a general. The peaceful system of his predecessors was interrupted by scenes of war and conquest, and the legions, after a long interval, beheld a military emperor at their head. The first exploits of Trajan were against the Dacians, the most warlike of men who dwelt beyond the Danube, and who, during the reign of Domitian, had insulted with impunity the majesty of Rome. To the strength and fierceness of barbarians they added a contempt for life, which was derived from a warm persuasion of the immortality and transmigration of the soul. Decebalus, the Dacian king, approved himself a rival not unworthy of Trajan, nor did he despair of his own and the public fortune, till, by the confession of his enemies, he had exhausted every resource both of valour and policy. This memorable war, with a very short suspension of hostilities, lasted five years, and as the emperor could exert without control the whole force of the state, it was terminated by an absolute submission of the barbarians. The new province of Dacia, which formed a second exception to the precept of Augustus, was about 1,300 miles in circumference. Its natural boundaries were the Niesta, the Tace or Tabiscus, the Lower Danube, and the Euxine Sea. The vestiges of a military road may still be traced from the banks of the Danube to the neighborhood of Bender, a place famous in modern history and the actual frontier of the Turkish and Russian empires. Trajan was ambitious of fame, and as long as mankind shall continue to bestow more liberal applause on their destroyers than on their benefactors, the thirst of military glory will ever be the vice of the most exalted characters. The praises of Alexander, transmitted by a succession of poets and historians, had kindled a dangerous emulation in the mind of Trajan. Like him, the Roman emperor undertook an expedition against the nations of the East, but he lamented with a sigh that his advanced age scarcely left him any hopes of equalling the renown of the son of Philip. Yet the success of Trajan, however transient, was rapid and specious. The degenerate Parthians, broken by intestine discord, fled before his arms. He descended the river Tigris in triumph from the mountains of Armenia to the Persian Gulf. He enjoyed the honour of being the first, as he was the last, of the Roman generals who ever navigated that remote sea. His fleets ravaged the coast of Arabia, and Trajan vainly flattered himself that he was approaching towards the confines of India. Every day the astonished Senate received the intelligence of new names and new nations that acknowledged his sway. They were informed that the kings of Bosphorus, Colchos, Iberia, Albania, Osroene, and even the Parthian monarch himself 
had accepted their diadems from the hands of the emperor, that the independent tribes of the Median and Cardusian hills had implored his protection, and that the rich countries of Armenia, Mesopotamia, and Assyria were reduced into the state of provinces. But the death of Trajan soon clouded the splendid prospect, and it was justly to be dreaded that so many distant nations would throw off the unaccustomed yoke when they were no longer restrained by the powerful hand which had imposed it. End of chapter 1, part 1Chapter 1, Part 2 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Chapman. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter 1. The Extent of the Empire in the Age of the Antonines Part 2 It was an ancient tradition that when the capital was founded by one of the Roman kings, the god Terminus, who presided over boundaries and was represented according to the fashion of that age by a large stone, alone among all the inferior deities, refused to yield his place to Jupiter himself. A favorable inference was drawn from his obstinacy, which was interpreted by the augurs as a sure presage that the boundaries of the Roman power would never recede. During many ages, the prediction, as it is usual, contributed to its own accomplishment. But though Terminus had resisted the majesty of Jupiter, he submitted to the authority of the Emperor Hadrian. The resignation of all the eastern conquests of Trajan was the first measure of his reign. He restored to the Parthians the election of an independent sovereign, withdrew the Roman garrisons from the provinces of Armenia, Mesopotamia, and Assyria, and, in compliance with the precept of Augustus, once more established the Euphrates as the frontier of the empire. Sentia, which arraigns the public actions and the private motives of princes, has ascribed to envy a conduct which might be attributed to the prudence and moderation of Hadrian. The various character of that emperor, capable by turns of the meanest and the most generous sentiments, may afford some colour to the suspicion. It was, however, scarcely in his power to place the superiority of his predecessor in a more conspicuous light than by thus confessing himself unequal to the task of defending the conquests of Trajan. The martial and ambitious of spirit Trajan formed a very singular contrast with the moderation of his successor. The restless activity of Hadrian was not less remarkable when compared with the gentle repose of Antoninus Pius. The life of the former was almost a perpetual journey, and as he possessed the various talents of the soldier, the statesman, and the scholar, he gratified his curiosity in the discharge of his duty. Careless of the difference of seasons and of climates, he marched on foot and bareheaded over the snows of Caledonia and the sultry plains of the upper Egypt. Nor was there a province of the empire which, in the course of his reign, was not honoured with the presence of the monarch. But the tranquil life of Antoninus Pius was spent in the bosom of Italy, and during the twenty-three years that he directed the public administration, the longest journeys of that amiable prince extended no farther than from his palace in Rome to the retirement of his Lanuvian villa. Notwithstanding this difference in their personal conduct, the general system of Augustus was equally adopted and uniformly pursued by Hadrian and by the two Antonines. 
they persisted in the design of maintaining the dignity of the empire without attempting to enlarge its limits. By every honorable expedient, they invited the friendship of the barbarians, and endeavored to convince mankind that the Roman power, raised above the temptation of conquest, was actuated only by the love of order and justice. During a long period of forty-three years, their virtuous labors were crowned with success, and if we accept a few slight hostilities that served to exercise the legions of the frontier, the reigns of Hadrian and Antoninus Pius offer the fair prospect of universal peace. The Roman name was revered among the most remote nations of the earth. The fiercest barbarians frequently submitted their differences to the arbitration of the emperor, and we are informed by a contemporary historian that he had seen ambassadors who were refused the honor which they came to solicit of being admitted into the rank of subjects. The terror of the Roman arms added weight and dignity to the moderation of the emperors. They preserved peace by a constant preparation for war, and while justice regulated their conduct, they announced to the nations on their confines that they were as little disposed to endure as to offer an injury. The military strength, which it had been sufficient for Hadrian and the elder Antoninus to display, was exerted against the Parthians and the Germans by the Emperor Marcus. The hostilities of the barbarians provoked the resentment of that philosophic monarch, and in the prosecution of a just defense, Marcus and his generals obtained many signal victories, both on the Euphrates and on the Danube. The military establishment of the Roman Empire, which thus assured either its tranquillity or success, will now become the proper and important object of our attention. In the purer ages of the Commonwealth, the use of arms was reserved for those ranks of citizens who had a country to love, a property to defend, and some share in enacting those laws which it was their interest as well as duty to maintain. But in proportion, as the public freedom was lost in extent of conquest, war was gradually improved into an art, and degraded into a trade. The legions themselves, even at the time when they were recruited in the most distant provinces, were supposed to consist of Roman citizens. That distinction was generally considered either as a legal qualification or as a proper recompense for the soldier, but a more serious regard was paid to the essential merit of age, strength, and military stature. In all levies, a just preference was given to the climates of the north over those of the south. The race of men born to the exercise of arms was sought for in the country rather than in cities, and it was very reasonably presumed that the hardy occupations of smiths, carpenters, and huntsmen would supply more vigor and resolution than the sedentary trades which were employed in the service of luxury. After every qualification of property had been laid aside, the armies of the Roman emperors were still commanded, for the most part, by officers of liberal birth and education. But the common soldiers, like the mercenary troops of modern Europe, were drawn from the meanest and very frequently from the most profligate of mankind. That public virtue, which among the ancients was denominated patriotism, is derived from a strong sense of our own interest in the preservation and prosperity of the free government of which we are members. Such a sentiment, which had rendered the legions of the Republic almost invincible, could make but a very feeble impression on the mercenary servants of a despotic prince, and it became necessary to supply that defect by other motives, of a different but not less forcible nature, honor, and religion. The peasant, or mechanic, 
imbibed the useful prejudice that he was advanced to the more dignified profession of arms, in which his rank and reputation would depend on his own valour, and that, although the prowess of a private soldier must often escape the notice of fame, his own behaviour might sometimes confer glory or disgrace on the company, the legion, or even the army, to whose honours he was associated. On his first entrance into the service, an oath was administered to him with every circumstance of solemnity. He promised never to desert his standard, to submit his own will to the commands of his leaders, and to sacrifice his life for the safety of the emperor and the empire. The attachment of the Roman troops to their standards was inspired by the united influence of religion and of honour. The golden eagle, which glittered in the front of the legion, was the object of their fondest devotion. Nor was it esteemed less impious than it was ignominious to abandon that sacred ensign in the hour of danger. These motives, which derived their strength from the imagination, were enforced by fears and hopes of a more substantial kind. Regular pay occasional donatives, and a stated recompense after the appointed time of service, alleviated the hardships of the military life, whilst, on the other hand, it was impossible for cowardice or disobedience to escape the severest punishment. The centurions were authorized to chastise with blows, the generals had a right to punish with death, and it was an inflexible maxim of Roman discipline that a good soldier should dread his officers far more than the enemy. From such laudable arts did the valour of the imperial troops receive a degree of firmness and docility unattainable by the impetuous and irregular passions of barbarians. And yet, so sensible were the Romans of the imperfection of valour without skill and practice, that in their language the name of an army was borrowed from the word which signified exercise. Military exercises were the important and unremitted object of their discipline. The recruits and young soldiers were constantly trained, both in the morning and in the evening, nor was age or knowledge allowed to excuse the veterans from the daily repetition of what they had completely learnt. Large sheds were erected in the winter quarters of the troops, that their useful labours might not receive any interruption from the most tempestuous weather, and it was carefully observed that the arms destined to this imitation of war should be of double the weight which was required in real action. It is not the purpose of this work to enter into any minute description of the Roman exercises we shall only remark that they comprehended whatever could add strength to the body, activity to the limbs, or grace to the motions. The soldiers were diligently instructed to march, to run, to leap, to swim, to carry heavy burdens, to handle every species of arms that was used either for offence or for defence, either in distant engagement or in a closer onset to form a variety of evolutions, and to move to the sound of flutes in the pyrrhic or martial dance. In the midst of peace, the Roman troops familiarized themselves with the practice of war, and it is prettily remarked by an ancient historian who had fought against them, that the effusion of blood was the only circumstance which distinguished a field of battle from a field of exercise. It was the policy of the ablest generals, and even of the emperors themselves, to encourage these military studies by their presence and example. And we are informed that Hadrian, as well as Trajan, frequently condescended to instruct the unexperienced soldiers, to reward the diligent, and sometimes to dispute with them the prize of superior strength or dexterity. Under the reins of those princes, 
the science of tactics was cultivated with success, and as long as the empire retained any vigor, their military instructions were respected as the most perfect model of Roman discipline. Nine centuries of war had gradually introduced into the service many alterations and improvements. The legions, as they are described by Polybius in the time of the Punic Wars, differed very materially from those which achieved the victories of Caesar, or defended the monarchy of Hadrian and the Antonines. The constitution of the imperial legion may be described in a few words. The heavily armed infantry, which composed its principal strength, was divided into ten cohorts and fifty-five companies, under the orders of a correspondent number of tribunes and centurions. The first cohort, which always claimed the post of honor and the custody of the eagle, was formed of eleven hundred and five soldiers, the most approved for valor and fidelity. The remaining nine cohorts consisted each of five hundred and fifty-five, and the whole body of legionary infantry amounted to six thousand one hundred men. Their arms were uniform, and admirably adapted to the nature of their service. An open helmet with a lofty crest, a breastplate or coat of mail, greaves on their legs, and an ample buckler on their left arm. The buckler was of an oblong and concave figure, four feet in length and two and a half in breadth, framed of a light wood, covered with a bull's hide, and strongly guarded with plates of brass. Besides a lighter spear, the legionary soldier grasped in his right hand the formidable pylum, a ponderous javelin, whose utmost length was about six feet, and which was terminated by a massy triangular point of steel of eighteen inches. This instrument was indeed much inferior to our modern firearms, since it was exhausted by a single discharge at the distance of only ten or twelve paces. Yet, when it was launched by a firm and skilful hand, there was not any cavalry that durst venture within its reach, nor any shield or corslet that could sustain the impetuosity of its weight. As soon as the Roman had darted his pylum, he drew his sword and rushed forwards to close with the enemy. His sword was a short, well-tempered Spanish blade that carried a double edge and was alike suited to the purpose of striking or of pushing. But the soldier was always instructed to prefer the latter use of his weapon, as his own body remained less exposed while he inflicted a more dangerous wound on his adversary. The legion was usually drawn up eight deep, and the regular distance of three feet was left between the files as well as ranks. A body of troops, habituated to preserve this open order in a long front and a rapid charge, found themselves prepared to execute every disposition which the circumstances of war or the skill of their leader might suggest. The soldier possessed a free space for his arms and motions, and sufficient intervals were allowed, through which seasonable reinforcements might be introduced, to the relief of the exhausted combatants. The tactics of the Greeks and Macedonians were formed on very different principles. The strength of the phalanx depended on sixteen ranks of long pikes, wedged together in the closest array, but it was soon discovered by reflection, as well as by the event, that the strength of the phalanx was unable to contend with the activity of the legion. The cavalry, without which the force of the legion would have remained imperfect, was divided into ten troops or squadrons. The first, as the companion of the first cohort, consisted of a hundred and thirty-two men, whilst each of the other nine amounted only to sixty-six. The entire establishment formed a regiment, if we may use the modern expression, of seven hundred and twenty-six horse. 
naturally connected with its respective legion, but occasionally separated to act in the line and to compose a part of the wings of the army. The cavalry of the emperors was no longer composed, like that of the ancient republic, of the noblest youths of Rome and Italy, who, by performing their military service on horseback, prepared themselves for the offices of senator and consul, and solicited by deeds of valour the future suffrages of their countrymen. Since the alteration of manners and government, the most wealthy of the equestrian order were engaged in the administration of justice and of the revenue, and whenever they embraced the profession of arms, they were immediately entrusted with a troop of horse or a cohort of foot. Trajan and Hadrian formed their cavalry from the same provinces, and the same class of their subjects, which recruited the ranks of the legion. The horses were bred for the most part in Spain or Cappadocia. The Roman troopers despised the complete armour with which the cavalry of the east was encumbered. Their more useful arms consisted in a helmet, an oblong shield, light boots, and a coat of mail. A javelin and a long broadsword were their principal weapons of offence. The use of lancers and of iron maces they seem to have borrowed from the barbarians. The safety and honour of the empire was principally entrusted to the legions, but the policy of Rome condescended to adopt every useful instrument of war. Considerable levies were regularly made among the provincials, who had not yet deserved the honourable distinction of Romans. Many dependent princes and communities, dispersed round the frontiers, were permitted for a while to hold their freedom and security by the tenure of military service. Even select troops of hostile barbarians were frequently compelled or persuaded to consume their dangerous valour in remote climates and for the benefit of the state. All these were included under the general name of auxiliaries, and howsoever they might vary according to the difference of times and circumstances, their numbers were seldom much inferior to those of the legions themselves. Among the auxiliaries, the bravest and most faithful bands were placed under the command of prefects and centurions, and severely trained in the arts of Roman discipline. But the far greater part retained those arms to which the nature of their country, or their early habits of life, more peculiarly adapted them. By this institution, each legion, to whom a certain proportion of auxiliaries was allotted, contained within itself every species of lighter troops and of missile weapons, and was capable of encountering every nation with the advantages of its respective arms and discipline. Nor was the legion destitute of what, in modern language, would be styled a train of artillery. It consisted in ten military engines of the largest, and fifty-five of a smaller size, but all of which, either in an oblique or horizontal manner, discharged stones and darts with irresistible violence. End of chapter 1, part 2《Chapter One, Part Three of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Chapman. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon, Volume One, Chapter One. The Extent of the Empire in the Age of the Antonines Part 3 The camp of a Roman legion presented the appearance of a fortified city. As soon as the space was marked out, the pioneers carefully leveled the ground and removed every impediment that might interrupt its perfect regularity. 
Its form was an exact quadrangle, and we may calculate that a square of about seven hundred yards was sufficient for the encampment of twenty thousand Romans, though a similar number of our own troops would expose to the enemy a front of more than treble that extent. In the midst of the camp, the Praetorium, or General's Quarters, rose above the others. The cavalry, the infantry, and the auxiliaries occupied their respective stations, the streets were broad and perfectly straight, and a vacant space of two hundred feet was left on all sides between the tents and the rampart. The rampart itself was usually twelve feet high, armed with a line of strong and intricate palisades, and defended by a ditch of twelve feet in depth as well as in breadth. This important labor was performed by the hands of the legionaries themselves, to whom the use of the spade and the pickaxe was no less familiar than that of the sword or pilum. Active valor may often be the present of nature, but such patient diligence can be the fruit only of habit and discipline. Whenever the trumpet gave the signal of departure, the camp was almost instantly broke up, and the troops fell into their ranks without delay or confusion. Besides their arms, which the legendaries scarcely considered as an encumbrance, they were laden with their kitchen furniture, the instruments of fortification, and the provision of many days. Under this weight, which would oppress the delicacy of a modern soldier, they were trained by a regular step to advance in about six hours, near twenty miles. On the appearance of an enemy, they threw aside their baggage, and by easy and rapid evolutions converted the column of march into an order of battle. The slingers and archers skirmished in the front, the auxiliaries formed the first line, and were seconded or sustained by the strength of the legions. The cavalry covered the flanks, and the military engines were placed in the rear. Such were the arts of war by which the Roman emperors defended their extensive conquests, and preserved a military spirit at a time when every other virtue was oppressed by luxury and despotism. If, in the consideration of their armies, we pass from their discipline to their numbers, we shall not find it easy to define them with any tolerable accuracy. We may compute, however, that the legion, which was itself a body of 6,831 Romans, might, with its attendant auxiliaries, amount to about 12,500 men. The peace establishment of Hadrian and his successors was composed of no less than thirty of these formidable brigades, and most probably formed a standing force of 375,000 men. Instead of being confined within the walls of fortified cities, which the Romans considered as the refuge of weakness or pusillanimity, the legions were encamped on the banks of the great rivers and along the frontiers of the barbarians. As their stations for the most part remained fixed and permanent, we may venture to describe the distribution of the troops. Three legions were sufficient for Britain. The principal strength lay upon the Rhine and Danube, and consisted of sixteen legions in the following proportions. Two in the lower and three in the upper Germany, one in Rhaetia, one in Noricum, four in Pannonia, three in Mesia, and two in Dacia. The defense of the Euphrates was entrusted to eight legions, six of whom were planted in Syria, and the other two in Cappadocia. With regard to Egypt, Africa, and Spain, as they were far removed from any important scene of war, a single legion maintained the domestic tranquillity of each of these great provinces. Even Italy was not left destitute of a military force. Above twenty thousand chosen soldiers, distinguished by the titles of city cohorts and praetorian guards, 
watched over the safety of the monarch and the capital. As the authors of almost every revolution that distracted the empire, the Praetorians will, very soon and very loudly, demand our attention. But in their arms and institutions we cannot find any circumstance which discriminated them from the legions, unless it were a more splendid appearance and a less rigid discipline. The navy maintained by the emperors might seem inadequate to their greatness, but it was fully sufficient for every useful purpose of government. The ambition of the Romans was confined to the land, nor was that warlike people ever actuated by the enterprising spirit which had prompted the navigators of Tyre, of Carthage, and even of Marseille to enlarge the bounds of the world and to explore the most remote coasts of the ocean. To the Romans, the ocean remained an object of terror rather than of curiosity. The whole extent of the Mediterranean, after the destruction of Carthage and the extirpation of the pirates, was included within their provinces. The policy of the emperors was directed only to preserve the peaceful dominion of that sea and to protect the commerce of their subjects. With these moderate views, Augustus stationed two permanent fleets in the most convenient ports of Italy, the one at Ravenna on the Adriatic, the other at Misenum in the Bay of Naples. Experience seems at length to have convinced the ancients that as soon as their galleys exceeded two, or at the most three ranks of oars, they were suited rather for vain pomp than for real service. Augustus himself, in the victory of Actium, had seen the superiority of his own light frigates, they were called Liburnians, over the lofty but unwieldy castles of his rival. Of these Liburnians he composed the two fleets of Ravenna and Misenum, destined to command the one the eastern and the other the western division of the Mediterranean, and to each of the squadrons he attached a body of several thousand marines. Besides these two ports, which may be considered as the principal seats of the Roman navy, a very considerable force was stationed at Frejus, on the coast of Provence, and the Euxine was guarded by forty ships and three thousand soldiers. To all these we add the fleet which preserved the communication between Gaul and Britain, and a great number of vessels constantly maintained on the Rhine and Danube to harass the country, or to intercept the passage of the barbarians. If we review this general state of the imperial forces, of the cavalry as well as infantry, of the legions, the auxiliaries, the guards, and the navy, the most liberal computation will not allow us to fix the entire establishment by sea and by land at more than 450,000 men, a military power which, however formidable it may seem, was equalled by a monarch of the last century, whose kingdom was confined within a single province of the Roman Empire. We have attempted to explain the spirit which moderated and the strength which supported the power of Hadrian and the Antonines. We shall now endeavour, with clearness and precision, to describe the provinces once united under their sway, but at present divided into so many independent and hostile states. Spain, the western extremity of the empire, of Europe, and of the ancient world, has in every age invariably preserved the same natural limits, the Pyrenean Mountains, the Mediterranean, and the Atlantic Ocean. That great peninsula, at present so unequally divided between two sovereigns, was distributed by Augustus into three provinces, Lusitania, Baetica, and Tarraconensis. The kingdom of Portugal now fills the place of the warlike country of the Lusitanians, and the loss sustained by the former on the side of the east is compensated by an accession of territory towards the north. 
The confines of Grenada and Andalusia correspond with those of ancient Baetica. The remainder of Spain, Galicia, and the Asturias, Biscay, and Navarre, Leon, and the two Castiles, Mercia, Valencia, Catalonia, and Aragon, all contributed to form the third and most considerable of the Roman governments, which, from the name of its capital, was styled the province of Tarragona. Of the native barbarians, the Celtiberians were the most powerful, as the Cantabrians and Asturians proved the most obstinate. Confident in the strength of their mountains, they were the last who submitted to the arms of Rome, and the first who threw off the yoke of the Arabs. Ancient Gaul, as it contained the whole country between the Pyrenees, the Alps, the Rhine, and the Ocean, was of greater extent than modern France. To the dominions of that powerful monarchy, with its recent acquisitions of Alsace and Lorraine, we must add the Duchy of Savoy, the cantons of Switzerland, the four electorates of the Rhine, and the territories of Liege, Luxembourg, Hainaut, Flanders, and Brabant. When Augustus gave laws to the conquests of his father, he introduced a division of Gaul, equally adapted to the progress of the legions, to the course of the rivers, and to the principal national distinctions, which had comprehended above a hundred independent states. The sea coast of the Mediterranean, Languedoc, Provence, and Dauphiné, received their provincial appellation from the colony of Narbonne. The government of Aquitaine was extended from the Pyrenees to the Loire. The country between the Loire and the Seine was styled the Celtic Gaul, and soon borrowed a new denomination from the celebrated colony of Lugdunum, or Lyon. The Belgic lay beyond the Seine, and in more ancient times had been bounded only by the Rhine, but a little before the age of Caesar, the Germans, abusing their superiority of valour, had occupied a considerable portion of the Belgic territory. The Roman conquerors very eagerly embraced so flattering a circumstance, and the Gallic frontier of the Rhine, from Basel to Leyden, received the pompous names of the Upper and the Lower Germany. Such, under the reign of the Antonines, were the six provinces of Gaul, the Narbonnais, Aquitaine, the Celtic, or Lyonnais, the Belgic, and the two Germanies. We have already had occasion to mention the conquest of Britain, and to fix the boundary of the Roman province in this island. It comprehended all England, Wales, and the lowlands of Scotland, as far as the friths of Dumbarton and Edinburgh. Before Britain lost her freedom, the country was irregularly divided between thirty tribes of barbarians, of whom the most considerable were the Belgi in the west, the Brigantes in the north, the Silures in South Wales, and the Iceni in Norfolk and Suffolk. As far as we can either trace or credit the resemblance of manners and language, Spain, Gaul, and Britain were peopled by the same hardy race of savages. Before they yielded to the Roman arms, they often disputed the field, and often renewed the contest. After their submission, they constituted the western division of the European provinces, which extended from the columns of Hercules to the wall of Antoninus, and from the mouth of the Tagus to the sources of the Rhine and Danube. Before the Roman conquest, the country which is now called Lombardy was not considered as a part of Italy. It had been occupied by a powerful colony of Gauls, who, settling themselves along the banks of the Po, from Piedmont to Romagna, carried their arms and diffused their name from the Alps to the Apennine. The Ligurians dwelt on the rocky coast which now forms the Republic of Genoa. Venice was yet unborn, 
but the territories of that state, which lie to the east of the Ardige, were inhabited by the Venetians. The middle part of the peninsula, that now composes the Duchy of Tuscany and the ecclesiastical state, was the ancient seat of the Etruscans and Umbrians, to the former of whom Italy was indebted for the first rudiments of civilized life. The Tiber rolled at the foot of the seven hills of Rome, and the country of the Sabines, the Latins, and the Volsci, from that river to the frontiers of Naples, was the theatre of her infant victories. On that celebrated ground the first consuls deserved triumphs, their successors adorned villas, and their posterity have erected convents. Capua and Campania possessed the immediate territory of Naples. The rest of the kingdom was inhabited by many warlike nations, the Marsi, the Samnites, the Apulians, and the Lucanians, and the sea coasts had been covered by the flourishing colonies of the Greeks. We may remark that when Augustus divided Italy into eleven regions, the little province of Istria was annexed to that seat of Roman sovereignty. The European provinces of Rome were protected by the course of the Rhine and the Danube, the latter of those mighty streams, which rises at the distance of only thirty miles from the former, flows above thirteen hundred miles, for the most part to the south-east, collects the tribute of sixty navigable rivers, and is at length, through six mouths, received into the Euxine, which appears scarcely equal to such an accession of waters. The provinces of the Danube soon acquired the general appellation of Illyricum, or the Illyrian frontier, and were esteemed the most warlike of the empire but they deserve to be more particularly considered under the names of Rhetia, Noricum, Pannonia, Dalmatia, Dacia, Mesia, Thrace, Macedonia, and Greece. The province of Rhetia, which soon extinguished the name of the Vindelicians, extended from the summit of the Alps to the banks of the Danube, from its source as far as its conflux with the inn. The greatest part of the flat country is subject to the elector of Bavaria. The city of Augsburg is protected by the constitution of the German Empire. The Grisons are safe in their mountains, and the country of Tyrol is ranked among the numerous provinces of the House of Austria. The wide extent of territory which is included between the inn the Danube and the Sarve, Austria, Styria, Carinthia, Carniola, the Lower Hungary, and Sclavonia, was known to the ancients under the names of Noricum and Pannonia. In their original state of independence, their fierce inhabitants were intimately connected. Under the Roman government they were frequently united, and they still remain the patrimony of a single family. They now contain the residence of a German prince, who styles himself Emperor of the Romans, and form the centre, as well as strength, of the Austrian power. It may not be improper to observe that if we accept Bohemia, Moravia, the northern skirts of Austria, and a part of Hungary between the Tais and the Danube, all the other dominions of the House of Austria were comprised within the limits of the Roman Empire. Dalmatia, to which the name of Illyricum more properly belonged, was a long but narrow tract between the Sarve and the Adriatic. The best part of the sea coast, which still retains its ancient appellation, is a province of the Venetian state, and the seat of the little republic of Ragusa. The inland parts have assumed the Sclavonian names of Croatia and Bosnia. The former obeys an Austrian governor, the latter a Turkish pasha. But the whole country is still infested by tribes of barbarians, 
whose savage independence irregularly marks the doubtful limit of the Christian and Mahometan power. After the Danube had received the waters of the Tais and the Sarve, it acquired, at least among the Greeks, the name of Ister. It formerly divided Mysia and Dacia, the latter of which, as we have already seen, was a conquest of Trajan, and the only province beyond the river. If we inquire into the present state of those countries, we shall find that, on the left hand of the Danube, Temesvar and Transylvania have been annexed, after many revolutions, to the crown of Hungary, whilst the principalities of Moldavia and Wallachia acknowledge the supremacy of the Ottoman port. On the right hand of the Danube, Mysia, which during the Middle Ages was broken into the barbarian kingdoms of Servia and Bulgaria, is again united in Turkish slavery. The appellation of Rumelia, which is still bestowed by the Turks on the extensive countries of Thrace, Macedonia, and Greece, preserves the memory of their ancient state under the Roman Empire. In the time of the Antonines, the martial regions of Thrace, from the mountains of Hemus and Rhodope, to the Bosphorus and the Hellespont, had assumed the form of a province. Notwithstanding the change of masters and of religion, the new city of Rome, founded by Constantine on the banks of the Bosphorus, has ever since remained the capital of a great monarchy. The kingdom of Macedonia, which under the reign of Alexander gave laws to Asia, derived more solid advantages from the policy of the two Philips, and with its dependencies of Epirus and Thessaly, extended from the Aegean to the Ionian Sea. When we reflect on the fame of Thebes and Argos, of Sparta and Athens, we can scarcely persuade ourselves that so many immortal republics of ancient Greece were lost in a single province of the Roman Empire, which, from the superior influence of the Achaean League, was usually denominated the province of Achaea. Such was the state of Europe under the Roman emperors. The provinces of Asia, without accepting the transient conquests of Trajan, are all comprehended within the limits of the Turkish power. But instead of following the arbitrary divisions of despotism and ignorance, it will be safer for us, as well as more agreeable, to observe the indelible characters of nature. The name of Asia Minor is attributed with some propriety to the peninsula, which, confined betwixt the Euxine and the Mediterranean, advances from the Euphrates towards Europe. The most extensive and flourishing district, westward of Mount Taurus and the River Halys, was dignified by the Romans with the exclusive title of Asia. The jurisdiction of that province extended over the ancient monarchies of Troy, Lydia, and Phrygia, the maritime countries of the Pamphylians, Lycians, and Carians, and the Grecian colonies of Ionia, which equalled in arts, though not in arms, the glory of their parent. The kingdoms of Bithynia and Pontus possessed the northern side of the peninsula, from Constantinople to Trebizond. On the opposite side, the province of Cilicia was terminated by the mountains of Syria, the inland country, separated from the Roman Asia by the river Halys, and from Armenia by the Euphrates, had once formed the independent kingdom of Cappadocia. In this place we may observe that the northern shores of the Euxine, beyond Trebizond in Asia, and beyond the Danube in Europe, acknowledged the sovereignty of the emperors, and received at their hands either tributary princes or Roman garrisons. Budzak, Crim Tartary, Circassia, and Mingrelia are the modern appellations of those savage countries. Under the successors of Alexander, Syria was the seat of the Seleucidae, 
who reigned over Upper Asia till the successful revolt of the Parthians confined their dominions between the Euphrates and the Mediterranean. When Syria became subject to the Romans, it formed the eastern frontier of their empire, nor did that province, in its utmost latitude, know any other bounds than the mountains of Cappadocia to the north, and towards the south, the confines of Egypt and the Red Sea. Phoenicia and Palestine were sometimes annexed to, and sometimes separated from, the jurisdiction of Syria. The former of these was a narrow and rocky coast, the latter was a territory scarcely superior to Wales, either in fertility or extent. Yet Phoenicia and Palestine will forever live in the memory of mankind, since America, as well as Europe, has received letters from the one, and religion from the other. A sandy desert, alike destitute of wood and water, skirts along the doubtful confine of Syria, from the Euphrates to the Red Sea. The wandering life of the Arabs was inseparably connected with their independence, and wherever, on some spots less barren than the rest, they ventured to for many settled habitations, they soon became subjects to the Roman Empire. The geographers of antiquity have frequently hesitated to what portion of the globe they should ascribe Egypt. By its situation that celebrated kingdom is included within the immense peninsula of Africa, but it is accessible only on the side of Asia, whose revolutions, in almost every period of history, Egypt has humbly obeyed. A Roman prefect was seated on the splendid throne of the Ptolemies, and the iron scepter of the Mamelukes is now in the hands of a Turkish pasha. The Nile flows down the country. Above five hundred miles from the Tropic of Cancer to the Mediterranean, and marks on either side of the extent of fertility by the measure of its inundations. Cyrene, situated towards the west and along the sea coast, was first a Greek colony, afterwards a province of Egypt, and is now lost in the desert of Barca. From Cyrene to the ocean, the coast of Africa extends above 1,500 miles, yet so closely is it pressed between the Mediterranean and the Sahara, or sandy desert, that its breadth seldom exceeds four score or a hundred miles. The eastern division was considered by the Romans as the more peculiar and proper province of Africa. Till the arrival of the Phoenician colonies, that fertile country was inhabited by the Libyans, the most savage of mankind. Under the immediate jurisdiction of Carthage, it became the centre of commerce and empire, but the Republic of Carthage is now degenerated into the feeble and disorderly states of Tripoli and Tunis. The military government of Algiers oppresses the wide extent of Numidia as it was once united under Massinissa and Jugurtha. But in the time of Augustus, the limits of Numidia were contracted, and at least two-thirds of the country acquiesced in the name of Mauritania, with the epithet of Caesariensis. The genuine Mauritania, or country of the Moors, which from the ancient city of Tingi, or Tangier, was distinguished by the appellation of Tingitana, is represented by the modern kingdom of Fez. Sal, on the ocean, so infamous at present for its piratical depredations, was noticed by the Romans as the extreme object of their power and almost of their geography. The city of their foundation may still be discovered near Meknes, the residence of the barbarian whom we condescend to style the emperor of Morocco. But it does not appear that his more southern dominions, Morocco itself, and Sigilmessa, were ever comprehended within the Roman province. The western parts of Africa, 
are intersected by the branches of Mount Atlas, a name so idly celebrated by the fancy of poets, but which is now diffused over the immense ocean that rolls between the ancient and the new continent. Having now finished the circuit of the Roman Empire, we may observe that Africa is divided from Spain by a narrow strait of about twelve miles, through which the Atlantic flows into the Mediterranean. The columns of Hercules, so famous among the ancients, were two mountains which seem to have been torn asunder by some convulsion of the elements, and at the foot of the European mountain, the fortress of Gibraltar is now seated. The whole extent of the Mediterranean Sea, its coasts and its islands, were comprised within the Roman dominion. Of the larger islands, the two Balears, which derive their name of Majorca and Minorca from their respective size, a subject at present, the former to Spain, the latter to Great Britain. It is easier to deplore the fate than to describe the actual condition of Corsica. Two Italian sovereigns assume a regal title from Sardinia and Sicily. Crete or Candia, with Cyprus, and most of the smaller islands of Greece and Asia, have been subdued by the Turkish arms, whilst the little rock of Malta defies their power, and has emerged under the government of its military order, into fame and opulence. This long enumeration of provinces, whose broken fragments have formed so many powerful kingdoms, might almost induce us to forgive the vanity or ignorance of the ancients. Dazzled with the extensive sway, the irresistible strength, and the real or affected moderation of the emperors, they permitted themselves to despise, and sometimes to forget, the outlying countries which had been left in the enjoyment of a barbarous independence, and they gradually usurped the license of confounding the Roman monarchy with the globe of the earth. But the temper, as well as knowledge, of a modern historian require a more sober and accurate language he may impress a juster image of the greatness of Rome by observing that the empire was above two thousand miles in breadth from the wall of Antoninus and the northern limits of Dacia to Mount Atlas and the Tropic of Cancer, that it extended in length more than three thousand miles from the western ocean to the Euphrates, that it was situated in the finest part of the temperate zone between the twenty-fourth and fifty-sixth degrees of northern latitude, and that it was supposed to contain above sixteen hundred thousand square miles, for the most part of fertile and well-cultivated land. End of chapter one, part three. Chapter 2, Part 1 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. Chapter 2 The Internal Prosperity in the Age of the Antonines. Part 1 of the union and internal prosperity of the Roman Empire in the age of the Antonines. It is not alone by the rapidity or extent of conquest that we should estimate the greatness of Rome. The sovereign of the Russian deserts commands a larger portion of the globe. In the seventh summer after his passage of the Hellespont, Alexander erected the Macedonian trophies on the banks of the Hephaestus. Within less than a century, the irresistible Genghis and the Mughal princes of his race spread their cruel devastations and transient empire from the Sea of China to the confines of Egypt and Germany. But the firm edifice of Roman power was raised and preserved by the wisdom of ages. The obedient provinces of Trajan and the Antonines were united by laws 
and adorned by arts. They might occasionally suffer from the partial abuse of delegated authority, but the general principle of government was wise, simple, and beneficent. They enjoyed the religion of their ancestors, whilst in civil honors and advantages they were exalted by just degrees to an equality with their conquerors. The policy of the emperors and the senate, as far as it concerned religion, was happily seconded by the reflections of the enlightened and by the habits of the superstitious part of their subjects. The various modes of worship which prevailed in the Roman world were all considered by the people as equally true, by the philosopher as equally false, and by the magistrate as equally useful. And thus toleration produced not only mutual indulgence, but even religious concord. The superstition of the people was not embittered by any mixture of theological rancor, nor was it confined by the chains of any speculative system. The devout polytheist, though fondly attached to his national rights, admitted with implicit faith the different religions of the earth. Fear, gratitude, and curiosity, a dream or an omen, a singular disorder or a distant journey, perpetually disposed him to multiply the articles of his belief and to enlarge the list of his protectors. The thin texture of the pagan mythology was interwoven with various but not discordant materials. As soon as it was allowed that sages and heroes who had lived or who had died for the benefit of their country were exalted to a state of power and immortality, it was universally confessed that they deserved, if not the adoration, at least the reverence of all mankind. The deities of a thousand groves and a thousand streams possessed in peace their local and respective influence, nor could the Romans, who deprecated the wrath of the Tiber, deride the Egyptian who presented his offering to the beneficent genius of the Nile. The visible powers of nature, the planets, and the elements were the same throughout the universe. The invisible governors of the moral world were inevitably cast in a similar mold of fiction and allegory. Every virtue, and even vice, acquired its divine representative every art and profession its patron, whose attributes in the most distant ages and countries were uniformly derived from the character of their peculiar votaries. A republic of gods of such opposite tempers and interests required in every system the moderating hand of a supreme magistrate who, by the progress of knowledge and flattery, was gradually invested with the sublime perfections of an eternal parent and an omnipotent monarch. Such was the mild spirit of antiquity that the nations were less attentive to the differences than to the resemblance of their religious worship. The Greek, the Roman, and the barbarian, as they met before their respective altars, easily persuaded themselves that under various names and with various ceremonies they adored the same deities. The elegant mythology of Homer gave a beautiful and almost regular form to the polytheism of the ancient world. The philosophers of Greece deduced their morals from the nature of man, rather than from that of God. They meditated, however, on the divine nature as a very curious and important speculation, and in the profound inquiry they displayed the strength and weakness of the human understanding. Of the four most celebrated schools, the Stoics and the Platonists endeavored to reconcile the jarring interests of reason and piety. They have left us the most sublime proofs of the existence and perfections of the first cause, but, as it was impossible for them to conceive the creation of matter, the workman in the Stoic philosophy was not sufficiently distinguished from the work, whilst, on the contrary, the spiritual god of Plato and his disciples resembled an idea rather than a substance. The opinions of the academics and Epicureans were of a less religious cast, but whilst the modest science of the former induced them to doubt, the positive ignorance of the latter urged them to deny the providence of a supreme ruler. The spirit of inquiry, prompted by emulation and supported by freedom, had divided the public teachers of philosophy into a variety of contending sects, but the ingenious youth who, from every part, resorted to Athens, and the other seats of learning in the Roman Empire, were alike instructed in every school to reject and despise the religion of the multitude. How indeed was it possible that a philosopher should accept as divine truths the idle tales of the poets and the incoherent traditions of antiquity, or that he should adore as gods those imperfect beings whom he must have despised as men? Against such unworthy adversaries Cicero condescended to employ the arms of reason and eloquence, but the satire of Lucian was a much more adequate as well as more efficacious weapon. 
we may be well assured that a writer conversant with the world would never have ventured to expose the gods of his country to public ridicule had they not already been the objects of secret contempt among the polished and enlightened orders of society notwithstanding the fashionable irreligion which prevailed in the age of the antonines both the interests of the priests and the credulity of the people were sufficiently respected in their writings and conversation the philosophers of antiquity asserted the independent dignity of reason but they resigned their actions to the commands of law and custom viewing with a smile of pity and indulgence the various errors of the vulgar they diligently practised the ceremonies of their fathers devoutly frequented the temples of the gods and sometimes condescending to act a part on the theatre of superstition they concealed the sentiments of an atheist under the sacerdotal robes reasoners of such a temper were scarcely inclined to wrangle about their respective modes of faith or of worship it was indifferent to them what shape the folly of the multitude might choose to assume and they approached with the same inward contempt and the same external reverence the altars of the libyan the olympian or the capitoline jupiter it is not easy to conceive from what motives a spirit of persecution could introduce itself into the roman councils the magistrates could not be actuated by a blind though honest bigotry since the magistrates were themselves philosophers and the schools of athens had given laws to the senate they could not be impelled by ambition or avarice as the temporal and ecclesiastical powers were united in the same hands the pontiffs were chosen among the most illustrious of the senators and the office of supreme pontiff was constantly exercised by the emperors themselves they knew and valued the advantages of religion as it is connected with civil government they encouraged the public festivals which humanized the manners of the people they managed the arts of divination as a convenient instrument of policy and they respected as the firmest bond of society the useful persuasion that either in this or in a future life the crime of perjury is most assuredly punished by the avenging gods but whilst they acknowledged the general advantages of religion they were convinced that the various modes of worship contributed alike to the same salutary purposes and that in every country the form of superstition which had received the sanction of time and experience was the best adapted to the climate and to its inhabitants avarice and taste very frequently despoiled the vanquished nations of the elegant statues of their gods and the rich ornaments of their temples but in the exercise of the religion which they derived from their ancestors they uniformly experienced the indulgence and even protection of the roman conquerors the province of gaul seems and indeed only seems an exception to this universal toleration under the specious pretext of abolishing human sacrifices the emperors tiberius and claudius suppressed the dangerous power of the druids but the priests themselves their gods and their altars subsisted in peaceful obscurity till the final destruction of paganism rome the capital of a great monarchy was incessantly filled with subjects and strangers from every part of the world who all introduced and enjoyed the favored superstitions of their native country every city in the empire was justified in maintaining the purity of its ancient ceremonies and the roman senate using the common privilege sometimes interposed to check this inundation of foreign rights the egyptian superstition of all the most contemptible and abject was frequently prohibited the temples of serapis and isis demolished and their worshippers banished from rome and italy but the zeal of fanaticism prevailed over the cold and feeble efforts of policy the exiles returned the proselytes multiplied the temples were restored with increasing splendor and isis and serapis at length assumed their place among the roman deities nor was this indulgence a departure from the old maxims of government in the purest ages of the commonwealth sibyl and Asclepius had been invited by solemn embassies and it was customary to tempt the protectors of besieged cities by the promise of more distinguished honors than they possessed in their native country rome gradually became the common temple of her subjects and freedom of the city was bestowed on all the gods of mankind the narrow policy of preserving without any foreign mixture the pure blood of the ancient citizens had checked the fortune and hastened the ruin of athens and sparta the aspiring genius of rome sacrificed vanity to ambition and deemed it more prudent as well as honorable to adopt virtue and merit for her own wheresoever they were found among slaves or strangers enemies or barbarians 
During the most flourishing era of the Athenian commonwealth, the number of citizens gradually decreased from about thirty to twenty-one thousand. If, on the contrary, we study the growth of the Roman Republic, we may discover that, notwithstanding the incessant demands of wars and colonies, the citizens who, in the first census of Servius Tullius, amounted to no more than 83,000, were multiplied before the commencement of the social war to the number of 463,000 men able to bear arms in the service of their country. When the allies of Rome claimed an equal share of honors and privileges, the Senate indeed preferred the chance of arms to an ignominious concession. The Samnites and the Lucanians paid the severe penalty of their rashness, but the rest of the Italian states, as they successively returned to their duty, were admitted into the bosom of the Republic, and soon contributed to the ruin of public freedom. Under a democratical government, the citizens exercise the powers of sovereignty, and those powers will be first abused and afterwards lost if they are committed to an unwieldy multitude. But when the popular assemblies had been suppressed by the administration of the emperors, the conquerors were distinguished from the various nations only as the first and most honorable order of subjects, and their increase, however rapid, was no longer exposed to the same dangers. Yet the wisest princes who adopted the maxims of Augustus guarded with the strictest care the dignity of the Roman name, and diffused the freedom of the city with a prudent liberality. End of chapter 2, part 1《Chapter Two, Part Two of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. Chapter Two, The Internal Prosperity in the Age of the Antonines. Part Two. Till the privileges of Romans had been progressively extended to all inhabitants of the empire, an important distinction was preserved between Italy and the provinces. The former was esteemed the center of public unity and the firm basis of the constitution. Italy claimed the birth, or at least the residence, of the emperors and the senate. The estates of the Italians were exempt from taxes, their persons from arbitrary jurisdiction of governors their municipal corporations, formed after the perfect model of the capital, were entrusted under the immediate eyes of the supreme power with the execution of the laws. From the foot of the Alps to the extremity of Calabria, all the natives of Italy were born citizens of Rome. Their partial distinctions were obliterated, and they insensibly coalesced into one great nation, united by language, manners, and civil institutions, and equal to the weight of a powerful empire. The Republic gloried in her generous policy, and was frequently rewarded by the merit and services of her adopted sons. Had she always confined the distinction of Romans to the ancient families within the walls of the city, that immortal name would have been deprived of some of its most noble ornaments. Virgil was a native of Mantua. Horace was inclined to doubt whether he should call himself an Apulian or a Lucanian. It was in Padua that an historian was found worthy to record the majestic series of Roman victories. The patriot family of the Catos emerged from Tusculum. The little town of Arpinum claimed the double honor of producing Marius and Cicero, the former of whom deserved, after Romulus and Camulus, to be styled the third founder of Rome, and the latter, after saving his country from the designs of Catiline, enabled her to contend with Athens for the palm of eloquence. The provinces of the empire, as they have been described in the preceding chapter, were destitute of any public force or constitutional freedom. And in Etruria, in Greece, and in Gaul, it was the first care of the Senate to dissolve those dangerous confederacies which taught mankind that, as the Roman arms prevailed by division, they might be resisted by union. Those princes whom the ostentation of gratitude or generosity permitted for a while to hold a precarious scepter were dismissed from their thrones as soon as they had performed their appointed task of fashioning to the yoke the vanquished nations. The free states and cities which had embraced the cause of Rome were rewarded with a nominal alliance and insensibly sunk into real servitude. The public authority was everywhere exercised by the ministers of the Senate and the emperors, and that authority was absolute and without control. 
but the same salutary maxims of government which had secured the peace and obedience of Italy were extended to the most distant conquests. A nation of Romans was gradually formed in the provinces by the double expedient of introducing colonies and of admitting the most faithful and deserving of the provincials to the freedom of Rome. Wheresoever the Roman conquers, he inhabits, is a very just observation of Seneca, confirmed by history and experience. The natives of Italy, allured by pleasure or by interest, hasten to enjoy the advantages of victory, and we may remark that, about forty years after the reduction of Asia, eighty thousand Romans were massacred in one day by the cruel orders of Mithridates. These voluntary exiles were engaged, for the most part, in the occupations of commerce, agriculture, and the farm of the revenue. But after the legions were rendered permanent by the emperors, the provinces were peopled by a race of soldiers, and the veterans, whether they received the reward of their service in land or in money, usually settled with their families in the country where they had honorably spent their youth. Throughout the empire, but more particularly in the western parts, the most fertile districts and the most convenient stations were reserved for the establishment of colonies, some of which were of a civil and others of a military nature. In their manners and internal policy, the colonies formed a perfect representation of their great parent, and they were soon endeared to the natives by the ties of friendship and alliance. They effectually diffused a reverence for the Roman name and a desire which was seldom disappointed of sharing in due time its honors and advantages. The municipal cities insensibly equaled the rank and splendor of the colonies, and in the reign of Hadrian it was disputed which was the preferable condition of those societies which had issued from, or those which had been received into, the bosom of Rome. The right of Latium, as it was called, conferred on the cities to which it had been granted a more partial favor. The magistrates only, at the expiration of their office, assumed the quality of Roman citizens, but as these offices were annual, in a few years they circulated round the principal families. Those of the provincials who were permitted to bear arms in the legions, those who exercised any civil employment, all, in a word, who performed any public service or displayed any personal talents, were rewarded with a present whose value was continually diminished by the increasing liberality of the emperors. Yet even in the age of the Antonines, when the freedom of the city had been bestowed on the greater number of their subjects, it was still accompanied with very solid advantages. The bulk of the people acquired, with that title, the benefit of the Roman laws, particularly in the interesting articles of marriage, testaments, and inheritance, and the road of fortune was open to those whose pretensions were seconded by favor or merit. The grandsons of the Gauls, who had besieged Julius Caesar in Alcia, commanded legions, governed provinces, and were admitted into the Senate of Rome. Their ambition, instead of disturbing the tranquillity of the state, was intimately connected with its safety and greatness. So sensible were the Romans of the influence of language over national manners that it was their most serious care to extend, with the progress of their arms, the use of the Latin tongue. The ancient dialects of Italy, the Sabine, the Etruscan, and the Venetian, sunk into oblivion. But in the provinces, the East was less docile than the West to the voice of its victorious preceptors. This obvious difference marked the two portions of the empire with a distinction of colors which, though it was in some degree concealed during the meridian splendor of prosperity, became gradually more visible as the shades of night descended upon the Roman world. The western countries were civilized by the same hands which subdued them. As soon as the barbarians were reconciled to obedience, their minds were open to any new impressions of knowledge and politeness. The language of Virgil and Cicero, though with some inevitable mixture of corruption, was so universally adopted in Africa, Spain, Gaul, Britain, and Pannonia, that the faint traces of the Punic or Celtic idioms were preserved only in the mountains or among the peasants. Education and study insensibly inspired the natives of those countries with the sentiments of Rome, and Italy gave fashions as well as laws to her Latin provincials. They solicited with more ardor and obtained with more faculty the freedom and honors of the state, supported the national dignity in letters and in arms, and at length, in the person of Trajan, produced an emperor whom the Scipios would not have disowned for their countrymen. The situation of the Greeks was very different from that of the barbarians. The former had been long civilized and corrupted, 
they had too much taste to relinquish their language, and too much vanity to adopt any foreign institutions. Still preserving the prejudices after they had lost the virtues of their ancestors, they affected to despise the unpolished manners of the Roman conquerors, whilst they were compelled to respect their superior wisdom and power. Nor was the influence of the Grecian language and sentiments confined to the narrow limits of that once celebrated country. Their empire, by the progress of colonies and conquest, had been diffused from the Adriatic to the Euphrates and the Nile. Asia was covered with Greek cities, and the long reign of the Macedonian kings had introduced a silent revolution into Syria and Egypt. In their pompous courts, those princes united the elegance of Athens with the luxury of the East, and the example of the court was imitated at an humble distance by the higher ranks of their subjects. Such was the general division of the Roman Empire into the Latin and Greek languages. To these we may add a third distinction for the body of the natives in Syria, and especially in Egypt. The use of their ancient dialects, by secluding them from the commerce of mankind, checked the improvements of those barbarians. The slothful effeminacy of the former exposed them to the contempt, the sullen ferociousness of the latter excited the aversion of the conquerors. Those nations had submitted to the Roman power, but they seldom desired or deserved the freedom of the city, and it was remarked that more than two hundred and thirty years elapsed after the ruin of the Ptolemies before an Egyptian was admitted into the Senate of Rome. It is a just, though trite, observation that victorious Rome was herself subdued by the arts of Greece. Those immortal writers who still command the admiration of modern Europe soon became the favorite object of study and imitation in Italy and the western provinces. But the elegant amusements of the Romans were not suffered to intervene with their sound maxims of policy. Whilst they acknowledged the charms of the Greek, they asserted the dignity of the Latin tongue, and the exclusive use of the latter was inflexibly maintained in the administration of civil as well as military government. The two languages exercised at the same time their separate jurisdiction throughout the empire, the former as the natural idiom of science, the latter as the legal dialect of public transactions. Those who united letters with business were equally conversant with both, and it was almost impossible in any province to find a Roman subject of a liberal education who was at once a stranger to the Greek and to the Latin language. It was by such institutions that the nations of the empire insensibly melted away into the Roman name and people. But there still remained in the center of every province and of every family an unhappy condition of men who endured the weight without sharing the benefits of society. In the free states of antiquity, the domestic slaves were exposed to the wanton rigor of despotism. The perfect settlement of the Roman empire was preceded by ages of violence and rapine. The slaves consisted, for the most part, of barbarian captives, taken in thousands by the chance of war, purchased at a vile price, accustomed to a life of independence, and impatient to break and to revenge their fetters. Against such internal enemies, whose desperate insurrections had more than once reduced the Republic to the brink of destruction, the most severe regulations and the most cruel treatment seemed almost justified by the great law of self-preservation. But when the principal nations of Europe, Asia, and Africa were united under the laws of one sovereign, the source of foreign supplies flowed with much less abundance, and the Romans were reduced to the milder but more tedious method of propagation. In their numerous families, and particularly in their country estates, they encouraged the marriage of their slaves. The sentiments of nature, the habits of education, and the possession of a dependent species of property contributed to alleviate the hardships of servitude. The existence of a slave became an object of greater value, and though his happiness still depended on the temper and circumstances of the master, the humanity of the latter, instead of being restrained by fear, was encouraged by the sense of his own interest. The progress of manners was accelerated by the virtue or policy of the emperors, and by the edicts of Hadrian and the Antonines, the protection of the laws was extended to the abject part of mankind. The jurisdiction of life and death over the slaves, a power long exercised and often abused, was taken out of private hands, and reserved to the magistrates alone. The subterraneous prisons were abolished, and upon a just complaint of intolerable treatment, the injured slave obtained either his deliverance or a less cruel master. Hope, 
the best comfort of our imperfect condition, was not denied to the Roman slave, and if he had any opportunity of rendering himself either useful or agreeable, he might very naturally expect that the diligence and fidelity of a few years would be rewarded with the inestimable gift of freedom. The benevolence of the master was so frequently prompted by the meaner suggestions of vanity and avarice, that the laws found it more necessary to restrain than encourage a profuse and undistinguishing liberty, which might degenerate into a very dangerous abuse. It was a maxim of ancient jurisprudence that a slave had not any country of his own. He acquired, with his liberty, an admission into the political society of which his patron was a member. The consequences of this maxim would have prostituted the privileges of the Roman city to a mean and promiscuous multitude. Some seasonable exceptions were therefore provided, and the honorable distinction was confined to such slaves only as, for just causes, and with the approbation of the magistrate, should receive a solemn and legal manumission. Even these chosen freedmen obtained no more than the private rights of citizens, and were rigorously excluded from civil or military honors. Whatever might be the merit or fortune of their sons, they likewise were esteemed unworthy of a seat in the Senate, nor were the traces of a servile origin allowed to be completely obliterated till the third or fourth generation. Without destroying the distinction of ranks, a distant prospect of freedom and honors was presented, even to those whom pride and prejudice almost disdained to number among the human species. It was once proposed to discriminate the slaves by a peculiar habit, but it was justly apprehended that there might be some danger in acquainting them with their own numbers. Without interpreting, in their utmost strictness, the liberal appellations of legions and myriads, we may venture to pronounce that the proportion of slaves who were valued as property was more considerable than that of servants, who can be computed only as an expense. The youths of a promising genius were instructed in the arts and sciences, and their price was ascertained by the degree of their skill and talents. Almost every profession, either liberal or mechanical, might be found in the household of an opulent senator. The ministers of pomp and sensuality were multiplied beyond the conception of modern luxury. It was more for the interest of the merchant or manufacturer to purchase than to hire his workmen, and in the country slaves were employed as the cheapest and most laborious instruments of agriculture. To confirm the general observation and to display the multitude of slaves, we might allege a variety of peculiar instances. It was discovered on a very melancholy occasion that four hundred slaves were maintained in a single palace of Rome. The same number of four hundred belonged to an estate which an African widow of a very private condition resigned to her son, whilst she reserved for herself a much larger share of her property. A freedman under the name of Augustus, though his fortune had suffered great losses in the civil wars, left behind him three thousand six hundred yoke of oxen, two hundred and fifty thousand head of smaller cattle, and what was almost included in the description of cattle, four thousand one hundred and sixteen slaves. The number of subjects who acknowledge the laws of Rome, of citizens, of provincials, and slaves, cannot now be fixed with such a degree of accuracy as the importance of the object would deserve. We are informed that when the Emperor Claudius exercised the office of censor, he took an account of six millions nine hundred and forty-five thousand Roman citizens, who, with the proportion of women and children, must have amounted to about twenty millions of souls. The multitude of objects of an inferior rank was uncertain and fluctuating, but after weighing with attention every circumstance which could influence the balance, it seems probable that there existed in the time of Claudius about twice as many provincials as there were citizens of either sex and of every age, and that the slaves were at least equal in number to the free inhabitants of the Roman world. The total amount of this imperfect calculation would rise to about one hundred and twenty millions of persons a degree of population which possibly exceeds that of modern Europe, and forms the most numerous society that has ever been united under the same system of government. End of Part 2 Chapter 2, Part 3 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon Chapter 2 
the internal prosperity in the age of the Antonines. Part three. Domestic peace and union were the natural consequences of the modern and comprehensive policy embraced by the Romans. If we turn our eyes towards the monarchies of Asia, we shall behold despotism in the center and weakness in the extremities, the collection of the revenue or the administration of justice enforced by the presence of an army, hostile barbarians established in the heart of the country, hereditary satraps usurping the domination of the provinces, and subjects inclined to rebellion, though incapable of freedom. But the obedience of the Roman world was uniform, voluntary, and permanent. The vanquished nations, blended into one great people, resigned the hope, nay, even the wish, of resuming their independence, and scarcely considered their own existence as distinct from the existence of Rome. The established authority of the emperors pervaded without an effort the wide extent of their dominions, and was exercised with the same faculty on the banks of the Thames or of the Nile as on those of the Tiber. The legions were destined to serve against the public enemy, and the civil magistrate seldom required the aid of a military force. In this state of general security, the leisure as well as opulence, both of prince and people, were devoted to improve and to adorn the Roman Empire. Among the innumerable monuments of architecture constructed by the Romans, how many have escaped the notice of history, how few have resisted the ravages of time and barbarism. And yet, even the majestic ruins that are still scattered over Italy and the provinces would be sufficient to prove that these countries were once the seat of a polite and powerful empire. Their greatness alone, or their beauty, might deserve our attention, but they are rendered more interesting by two important circumstances which connect the agreeable history of the arts with the more useful history of human manners. Many of these works were erected at private expense, and almost all were intended for public benefit. It is natural to suppose that the greatest number, as well as the most considerable of the Roman edifices, were raised by the emperors who possessed so unbounded a command both of men and money. Augustus was accustomed to boast that he had found his capital of brick, and that he had left it of marble. The strict economy of Vespasian was the source of his magnificence. The works of Trajan bear the stamp of his genius. The public monuments with which Hadrian adorned every province of the empire were executed not only by his orders, but under his immediate inspection. He was himself an artist, and he loved the arts, as they conduced to the glory of the monarch. They were encouraged by the Antonines, as they contributed to the happiness of the people. But if the emperors were the first, they were not the only architects of their dominions. Their example was universally imitated by their principal subjects, who were not afraid of declaring to the world that they had spirit to conceive and wealth to accomplish the noblest undertakings. Scarcely had the proud structure of the Colosseum been dedicated at Rome before the edifices of a smaller scale indeed, but of the same design and materials, were erected for the use and at the expense of the cities of Capua and Verona. The inscription of the stupendous bridge of Alcantara attests that it was thrown over the Tagus by the contribution of a few Lusitanian communities. When Pliny was entrusted with the government of Bithynia and Pontus, provinces by no means the richest or most considerable of the empire, he found the cities within his jurisdiction striving with each other in every useful and ornamental work that might deserve the curiosity of strangers or the gratitude of their citizens. It was the duty of the proconsul to supply their deficiencies, to direct their taste, and sometimes to moderate their emulation. The opulent senators of Rome and the provinces esteemed it an honor, and almost an obligation, to adorn the splendor of their age and country, and the influence of fashion very frequently supplied the want of taste or generosity. Among a crowd of these private benefactors we may select Herodus Atticus, an Athenian citizen who lived in the age of the Antonines. Whatever might be the motive of his conduct, his magnificence would have been worthy of the greatest kings. The family of Herod, at least after it had been favored by fortune, was lineally descended from Simon and Miltiades, Theseus and Cecrops, Asus and Jupiter. But the posterity of so many gods and heroes was fallen into the most abject state. His grandfather had suffered by the hands of justice, and Julius Atticus, his father, must have ended his life in poverty and contempt, had he not discovered an immense treasure buried under an old house, the last remains of his patrimony. According to the rigor of the law, the emperor might have asserted his claim, and the prudent Atticus prevented, by a frank confession, the officiousness of informers. 
But the equitable Nerva, who then filled the throne, refused to accept any part of it, and commanded him to use without scruple the present of fortune. The cautious Athenian still insisted that the treasure was too considerable for a subject, and that he knew not how to use it. Abuse it, then, replied the monarch, with a good-natured peevishness, for it is your own. Many will be of the opinion that Atticus literally obeyed the emperor's last instructions, since he expended the great part of his fortune, which was much increased by an advantageous marriage, in the service of the public. He had obtained for his son Herod the prefecture of the free cities of Asia, and the young magistrate, observing that the town of Troas was indifferently supplied with water, obtained from the munificence of Hadrian three hundred myriads of drachmas, about a hundred thousand pounds, for the construction of a new aqueduct. But in the execution of the work, the charge amounted to more than double the estimate, and the officers of the revenue began to murmur till the generous Atticus silenced their complaints by requesting that he might be permitted to take upon himself the whole additional expense. The ablest preceptors of Greece and Asia had been invited by liberal rewards to direct the education of young Herod. Their pupil soon became a celebrated orator, according to the useless rhetoric of that age, which, confining itself to the schools, disdained to visit either the Forum or the Senate. He was honored with the consulship at Rome, but the greatest part of his life was spent in a philosophic retirement at Athens, and his adjacent villas, perpetually surrounded by sophists, who acknowledged without reluctance the superiority of a rich and generous rival. The monuments of his genius have perished. Some considerable ruins still preserve the fame of his taste and munificence, Modern travelers have measured the remains of the stadium which he constructed at Athens. It was six hundred feet in length, built entirely of white marble, capable of admitting the whole body of the people, and finished in four years, whilst Herod was president of the Athenian Games. To the memory of his wife Regula he dedicated a theater, scarcely to be paralleled in the empire. No wood except cedar, very curiously carved, was employed in any part of the building. The odium, designed by Pericles for musical performances, and the rehearsal of new tragedies, have been a trophy of the victory of the arts over barbaric greatness, as the timbers employed in the construction consisted chiefly of the masts of the Persian vessels. Notwithstanding the repairs bestowed on that ancient edifice by a king of Cappadocia, it was again fallen to decay. Herod restored its ancient beauty and magnificence, nor was the liberality of that illustrious citizen confined to the walls of Athens. The most splendid ornaments bestowed on the temple of Neptune in Isthmus, at a theater in Corinth, a stadium at Delphi, a bath at Thermopylae, and an aqueduct at Canusium in Italy, were insufficient to exhaust his treasures. The people of Epirus, Thessaly, Eboa, Boeotia, and Peloponnesus experienced his favors, and many inscriptions of the cities of Greece and Asia gratefully style Herodus Atticus their patron and benefactor. In the commonwealths of Athens and Rome, the modest simplicity of private houses announced the equal condition of freedom, whilst the sovereignty of the people was represented in the majestic edifices designed to the public use. Nor was this republican spirit totally extinguished by the introduction of wealth and monarchy. It was in the works of national honor and benefit that the most virtuous of the emperors affected to display their magnificence. The golden palace of Nero excited a just indignation, but the vast extent of ground which had been usurped by his selfless luxury was more nobly filled under the succeeding reigns by the Colosseum, the Baths of Titus, the Claudian Portico, and the temples dedicated to the goddess of peace and to the genius of Rome. These monuments of architecture, the property of the Roman people, were adorned with the most beautiful productions of Grecian painting and sculpture, and in the Temple of Peace a very curious library was opened to the curiosity of the learned. At a small distance from thence was situated the Forum of Trajan. It was surrounded by a lofty portico in the form of a quadrangle into which four triumphal arches opened a noble and spacious entrance. In the center arose a column of marble whose height of one hundred and ten feet denoted the elevation of the hill that had been cut away. This column, which still subsists in its ancient beauty, exhibited an exact representation of the Dacian victories of its founder. The veteran soldier contemplated the story of his own campaigns, and by an easy illustration of national victory the peaceful citizen associated himself to the honors of the triumph. 
All the other quarters of the capital and all the provinces of the empire were embellished by the same liberal spirit of public magnificence and were filled with amphitheaters, theaters, temples, porticos, triumphal arches, baths, and aqueducts, all variously conducive to the health, the devotion, and the pleasures of the meanest citizen. The last mentioned of those edifices deserve our peculiar attention. The boldness of the enterprise, the solidity of the execution, and the uses to which they were subservient rank the aqueducts among the noblest monuments of Roman genius and power. The aqueducts of the capital claim a just preeminence, but the curious traveler who, without the light of history, should examine those of Spoleto, of Metz, or of Segovia, would very naturally conclude that those provincial towns had formerly been the residence of some potent monarch. The solitudes of Asia and Africa were once covered with flourishing cities, whose populousness and even whose existence was derived from such artificial supplies of a perennial stream of fresh water. We have computed the inhabitants and contemplated the public works of the Roman Empire. The observation of the number and greatness of its cities will serve to confirm the former and to multiply the latter. It may not be unpleasing to collect a few scattered instances relative to that subject, without forgetting, however, that from the vanity of nations and the poverty of language the vague appellation of city has been indifferently bestowed on Rome and upon Laurentium. 1. Ancient Italy is said to have contained 1,197 cities, and for whatsoever era of antiquity that expression might be intended, there is not any reason to believe the country less populous in the age of the Antonines than in that of Romulus. The petty states of Latium were contained within the metropolis of the empire, by whose superior influence they had been attracted. Those parts of Italy which have so long languished under the lazy tyranny of priests and viceroys had been afflicted only by the more tolerable calamities of war, and the first symptoms of decay which they experienced were amply compensated by the rapid movements of the Cisalpine Gaul. The splendor of Verona may be traced in its remains, yet Verona was less celebrated than Aquileia or Padua, Milan or Ravenna. 2. The spirit of improvement had passed the Alps and had been felt even in the woods of Britain, which were gradually cleared away to open a free space for convenient and elegant habitations. York was the seat of government. London was already enriched by commerce, and Bath was celebrated for the salutary effects of its medicinal waters. Gaul could boast of her twelve hundred cities, and though in the northern parts many of them, without excepting Paris itself, were little more than the rude and imperfect townships of a rising people, the southern provinces imitated the wealth and elegance of Italy. Many were the cities of Gaul, Marseille, Arles, Narbonne, Toulouse, Bordeaux, Autun, Vienna, Lyon, Langres, and Treves whose ancient condition might sustain an equal and perhaps advantageous comparison with their present state. With regard to Spain, that country flourishes a province, and has declined as a kingdom. Exhausted by the abuse of her strength, by America, and by superstition, her pride might possibly be confounded if we require such a list of 360 cities as Pliny has exhibited under the reign of Vespasian. 3. 300 African cities had once acknowledged the authority of Carthage. Nor is it likely that their numbers diminished under the administration of the emperors. Carthage itself rose with new splendor from its ashes, and that capital, as well as Capua and Corinth, soon recovered all the advantages which can be separated from independent sovereignty. 4. The provinces of the East present the contrast of Roman magnificence with Turkish barbarism. The ruins of antiquity scattered over uncultivated fields and ascribed by ignorance to the power of magic scarcely afford a shelter to the oppressed peasant or wandering Arab. Under the reign of the Caesars, the proper Asia alone contained five hundred populous cities, enriched with all the gifts of nature and adorned with all the refinements of art. Eleven cities of Asia had once disputed the honor of dedicating a temple of Tiberius, and their respective merits were examined by the Senate. Four of them were immediately rejected as unequal to the burden, and among these was Laodicea, whose splendor is still displayed in its ruins. Laodicea collected a very considerable revenue from its flocks of sheep, celebrated for the fineness of their wool, and had received, a little before the contest, a legacy of above 400,000 pounds by the testament of a generous citizen. If such was the poverty of Laodicea, 
What must have been the wealth of those cities whose claim appeared preferable, and particularly of Pergamus, of Smyrna, and of Ephesus, who so long disputed with each other the titular primacy of Asia? The capitals of Syria and Egypt held a still superior rank in the empire. Antioch and Alexandria looked down with disdain on a crowd of dependent cities, and yielded with reluctance to the majesty of Rome itself. End of Part 3 Chapter 2, Part 4 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon Chapter 2, The Internal Prosperity in the Age of the Antonines Part 4 all these cities were connected with each other and with the capital by the public highways, which, issuing from the Forum of Rome, traversed Italy, pervaded the provinces, and were terminated only by the frontiers of the empire. If we carefully trace the distance from the wall of Antoninus to Rome, and from thence to Jerusalem, it will be found that the great chain of communication from the northwest to the southeast point of the empire was drawn out to the length of four thousand and eighty Roman miles. The public roads were accurately divided by milestones, and ran in a direct line from one city to another, with very little respect for the obstacles either of nature or private property. Mountains were perforated, and bold arches thrown over the broadest and most rapid streams. The middle part of the road was raised into a terrace which commanded the adjacent country, consisted of several strata of sand, gravel, and cement, and was paved with large stones, or in some places, near the capital, with granite. Such was the solid construction of the Roman highways, whose firmness has not entirely yielded to the effort of fifteen centuries. They united the subjects of the most distant provinces by an easy and familiar intercourse. Out their primary object had been to facilitate the marches of their legions, nor was any country considered as completely subdued till it had been rendered in all its parts pervious to the arms and authority of the conqueror. The advantage of receiving the earliest intelligence and of conveying their orders with celerity, induced the emperors to establish, throughout their extensive dominions, the regular institution of posts. Houses were everywhere erected at the distance of only five or six miles. Each of them was constantly provided with forty horses, and by the help of these relays, it was easy to travel a hundred miles in a day along the Roman roads. The use of post was allowed to those who claimed it by an imperial mandate, but though originally intended for the public service, it was sometimes indulged to the business or conveniency of private citizens. Nor was the communication of the Roman Empire less free and open by sea than it was by land. The provinces surrounded and enclosed the Mediterranean, and Italy, in the shape of an immense promontory, advanced into the midst of that gray lake. The coasts of Italy are, in general, destitute of safe harbors, but human industry had corrected the deficiencies of nature, and the artificial port of Ostia, in particular, situated at the mouth of the Tiber, and formed by the Emperor Claudius, was a useful monument of Roman greatness. From this port, which was only sixteen miles from the capital, a favorable breeze carried vessels in seven days to the columns of Hercules, and in nine or ten to Alexandria in Egypt." Whatever evils either reason or declamation have imputed to extensive empire, the power of Rome was attended with some beneficial consequences to mankind, and the same freedom of intercourse which extended the vices diffused likewise the improvements of social life. In the more remote ages of antiquity, the world was unequally divided. The East was in the immemorable possession of arts and luxury, whilst the West was inhabited by rude and warlike barbarians, who either disdained agriculture or to whom it was totally unknown. Under the protection of an established government, the productions of happier climates and the industry of more civilized nations were gradually induced into the western countries of Europe, and the natives were encouraged by an open and profitable commerce to multiply the former, as well as to improve the latter. It would be almost impossible to enumerate all the articles, either of the animal or the vegetable rain, which were successively imported into Europe from Asia and Egypt. But it will not be unworthy of the dignity, and much less of the utility, of an historical work, slightly to touch on a few of the principal heads. 1. 
Almost all the flowers, the herbs, and the fruits that grow in our European gardens are of foreign extraction, which, in many cases, is betrayed even by their names. The apple was a native of Italy, and when the Romans had tasted the richer flavor of the apricot, the peach, the pomegranate, the citron, and the orange, they contented themselves with applying to all these new fruits the common denomination of apple, discriminating them from each other by the additional epithet of their country. In the time of Homer, the vine grew wild in the island of Sicily, and most probably in the adjacent continent but it was not improved by the skill, nor did it afford a liquor grateful to the taste of the savage inhabitants. A thousand years afterwards, Italy could boast that of the fourscore most generous and celebrated wines, more than two-thirds were produced from her soil. The blessing was soon communicated to the Narbonese province of Gaul, but so intense was the cold to the north of the Savinese, that in the time of Strabo it was thought impossible to ripen the grapes in those parts of Gaul. This difficulty, however, was gradually vanquished, and there is some reason to believe that the vineyards of Burgundy are as old as the age of the Antonines. 3. The olive in the western world followed the progress of peace, of which it was considered as the symbol. Two centuries after the foundation of Rome, both Italy and Africa were strangers to that useful plant. It was naturalized in those countries, and at length carried into the heart of Spain and Gaul the timid errors of the ancients that it required a certain degree of heat and could only flourish in the neighborhood of the sea were insensibly exploded by industry and experience four the cultivation of flax was transported from egypt to gaul and enriched the whole country however it might impoverish the particular lands on which it was sown five the use of artificial grasses became familiar to the farmers both of italy and the provinces particularly the lucerne which derived its name and origin from Medea. The assured supply of wholesome and plentiful food for the cattle during winter multiplied the number of the docks and herds, which in their turn contributed to the fertility of the soil. To all these improvements may be added an assiduous attention to mines and fisheries, which, by employing a multitude of laborious hands, serve to increase the pleasures of the rich and the subsistence of the poor. The elegant treatise of Columella describes the advanced state of the Spanish husbandry under the reign of Tiberius, and it may be observed that those famines which so frequently afflicted the infant republic were seldom or never experienced by the extensive empire of Rome. The accidental scarcity in any single province was immediately relieved by the plenty of its more fortunate neighbors. Agriculture is the foundation of manufactures, since the productions of nature are the materials of art. Under the Roman Empire, the labor of an industrious and ingenious people was variously but incessantly employed in the service of the rich. In their dress, their table, their houses, and their furniture, the favors of fortune united every refinement of conveniency, of elegance, and of splendor, whatever could soothe their pride or gratify their sensuality. Such refinements, under the odious name of luxury, have been severely arraigned by the moralists of every age and it might perhaps be more conducive to the virtue as well as happiness of mankind if all possessed the necessities and none the superfluities of life. But in the present imperfect condition of society, luxury, though it may proceed from vice or folly, seems to be the only means that can correct the unequal distribution of poverty. The diligent mechanic and the skillful artist who have obtained no share in the division of the earth receive a voluntary tax from the possessors of land, and the latter are prompted by a sense of interest to improve these estates with whose produce they may purchase additional pleasures. This operation, the particular effects of which are felt in every society, acted with much more diffusive energy in the Roman world. The provinces would soon have been exhausted of their wealth if the manufactures and commerce of luxury had not insensibly restored to the industrious subjects the sums which were extracted from them by the arms and authority of Rome. As long as the circulation was confined within the bounds of the empire, it impressed the political machine with a new degree of activity, and its consequences, sometimes beneficial, could never become pernicious. But it is no easy task to confine luxury within the limits of an empire. The most remote countries of the ancient world were ransacked to supply the pomp and delicacy of Rome. The forests of Scythia afforded some valuable furs. Amber was brought over land from the shores of the Baltic to the Danube, and the barbarians were astonished at the price which they received in exchange for so useless a commodity. There was a considerable demand for Babylonian carpets, 
and other manufactures of the East, but the most important and unpopular branch of foreign trade was carried on with Arabia and India. Every year, about the time of the summer solstice, a fleet of 120 vessels sailed from Mios Hormos, a port of Egypt on the Red Sea. By the periodical assistance of the monsoons, they traversed the ocean in about 40 days. The coast of Malabar, or the island of Ceylon, was the usual term of their navigation, and it was in those markets that the merchants from the more remote countries of Asia expected their arrival. The return of the fleet of Egypt was fixed to the months of December or January, and as soon as their rich cargo had been transported on the backs of camels from the Red Sea to the Nile, and had descended that river as far as Alexandria, it was poured without delay into the capital of the empire. The objects of oriental traffic were splendid and trifling, silk, a pound of which was esteemed not inferior in value to a pound of gold, precious stones, among which the pearl claimed the first rank after the diamond, and a variety of aromatics that were consumed in religious worship and the pomp of funerals. The labor and risk of the voyage was rewarded with almost incredible profit, but the profit was made upon Roman subjects, and a few individuals were enriched at the expense of the public. As the natives of Arabia and India were contented with the productions and manufacture of their own country, silver on the side of the Romans was the principal, if not the only, instrument of commerce. It was a complaint worthy of the gravity of the Senate, that, in the purchase of female ornaments, the wealth of the state was irrevocably given away to foreign and hostile nations. The annual loss is computed by a writer of an inquisitive but censorious temper at upwards of 800,000 pounds sterling. Such was the style of discontent, brooding over the dark prospect of approaching poverty. And yet if we compare the proportion between gold and silver, as it stood in the time of Pliny, and as it was fixed in the reign of Constantine, we shall discover within that period a very considerable increase. There is not the least reason to suppose that gold was become more scarce. It is therefore evident that silver was grown more common, that whatever might be the amount of the Indian and Arabian exports, they were far from exhausting the wealth of the Roman world, and that the produce of the mines abundantly supplied the demands of commerce. Notwithstanding the propensity of mankind to exalt the past and to depreciate the present, the tranquil and prosperous state of the empire was warmly felt and honestly confessed by the provincials as well as Rome. They acknowledged that the true principles of social life, laws, agriculture, and science, which had been first invented by the wisdom of Athens, were now firmly established by the power of Rome, under whose auspicious influence the fiercest barbarians were united by an equal government and common language. They affirmed that with the improvement of arts the human species were visibly multiplied. They celebrate the increasing splendor of the cities, the beautiful face of the country, cultivated and adorned like an immense garden, and the long festival of peace which was enjoyed by so many nations, forgetful of the ancient animosities and delivered from the apprehension of future danger. Whatever suspicions may be suggested by the air of rhetoric and declamation which seems to prevail in these passages, the substance of them is perfectly agreeable to historical truth. It was scarcely possible that the eyes of contemporaries should discover in the public felicity the latent causes of decay and corruption. This long peace and the uniform government of the Romans introduced a slow and secret poison into the vitals of the empire. The minds of men were gradually reduced to the same level, the fire of genius was extinguished, and even the military spirit evaporated. The natives of Europe were brave and robust. Spain, Gaul, Britain, and Illyricum supplied the legions with excellent soldiers and constituted the real strength of the monarchy. Their personal valor remained, but they no longer possessed that public courage which is nourished by the love of independence, the sense of national honor, the presence of danger, and the habit of command. They received laws and governors from the will of their sovereign and trusted for their defense to a mercenary army. The posterity of their boldest leaders was contented with the rank of citizens and subjects. The most aspiring spirits resorted to the court or standard of the emperors, and the deserted provinces, deprived of political strength or union, insensibly sunk into the languid indifference of private life. The love of letters, almost inseparable from peace and refinement, was fashionable among the subjects of Hadrian and the Antonines, who were themselves men of learning and curiosity. 
It was diffused over the whole extent of their empire. The most northern tribes of Britons had acquired a taste for rhetoric. Homer, as well as Virgil, were transcribed and studied on the banks of the Rhine and Danube, and the most liberal rewards sought out the faintest glimmerings of literary merit. The sciences of physic and astronomy were successfully cultivated by the Greeks. The observations of Ptolemy and the writings of Galen are studied by those who have improved their discoveries and corrected their errors. But if we accept the inimitable Lucian, this age of indolence passed away without having produced a single writer of original genius or who excelled in the arts of elegant composition. The authority of Plato and Aristotle, of Zeno and Epicurus, still reigned in the schools, and their systems, transmitted with blind deference from one generation of disciples to another, precluded every generous attempt to exercise the powers or enlarge the limits of the human mind. The beauties of the poets and orators, instead of kindling a fire like their own, inspired only cold and servile mitations, or if any ventured to deviate from these models, they deviated at the same time from good sense and propriety. On the revival of letters, the youthful vigor of the imagination, after a long repose, national emulation, a new religion, new languages, and a new world, called forth the genius of Europe. But the provincials of Rome, trained by a uniform artificial foreign education, were engaged in a very unequal competition with those bold ancients who, by expressing their genuine feelings in their native tongue, had already occupied every place of honor. The name of poet was almost forgotten. That of orator was usurped by the sophists. A cloud of critics, of compilers, of commentators, darkened the face of learning, and the decline of genius was soon followed by the corruption of taste. The sublime Longinus, who, in somewhat a later period, and in the court of a Syrian queen, preserved the spirit of ancient Athens, observes and laments this degeneracy of his contemporaries, which debased their sentiments, enervated their courage, and depressed their talents. In the same manner, says he, as some children always remain pygmies, whose infant limbs have been too closely confined, thus our tender minds, fettered by the prejudices and habits of a just servitude, are unable to expand themselves, or to attain that well-proportioned greatness which we admire in the ancients, who, living under a populous government, wrote with the same freedom as they acted. This diminutive stature of mankind, if we pursue the metaphor, was daily sinking below the old standard, and the Roman world was indeed peopled by a race of pygmies, when the fierce giants of the north broke in and mended the puny breed. They restored a manly spirit of freedom, and after the revolution of ten centuries, freedom became the happy parent of taste and science. End of Part 4 Chapter 3, Part 1 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L I B R I V O X dot O R G. Recording by Christy Nowak. Chapter 3 The Constitution in the Age of the Antonines, Part 1 of The Constitution of the Roman Empire in the Age of the Antonines. The obvious definition of a monarchy seems to be that of a state in which a single person, by whatsoever name he may be distinguished, is entrusted with the execution of the laws, the management of the revenue, and the command of the army. But, unless public liberty is protected by intrepid and vigilant guardians, the authority of so formidable a magistrate will soon degenerate into despotism. The influence of the clergy, in an age of superstition, might be usefully employed to assert the rights of mankind, but so intimate is the connection between the throne and the altar that the banner of the church has very seldom been seen on the side of the people. A martial nobility and stubborn commons, possessed of arms, tenacious of property, and collected into constitutional assemblies, form the only balance capable of preserving a free constitution against enterprises of an aspiring prince. Every barrier of the Roman constitution had been leveled by the vast ambition of the dictator. Every fence had been extirpated by the cruel hand of the triumvir. After the victory of Actium, the fate of the Roman world depended on the will of Octavianus, surnamed Caesar by his uncle's adoption, and afterwards Augustus, by the flattery of the Senate. 
the conqueror was at the head of forty-four veteran legions conscious of their own strength and of the weakness of the constitution habituated during twenty years civil war to every act of blood and violence and passionately devoted to the house of caesar from whence alone they had received and expected the most lavish rewards the provinces long oppressed by the ministers of the republic sighed for the government of a single person who would be the master not the accomplice of those petty tyrants the people of rome viewing with a secret pleasure the humiliation of the aristocracy demanded only bread and public shows and were supplied with both by the liberal hand of augustus the rich and polite italians who had almost universally embraced the philosophy of epicurus enjoyed the present blessings of ease and tranquillity and suffered not the pleasing dream to be interrupted by the memory of their old tumultuous freedom with its power the senate had lost its dignity many of the most noble families were extinct the republicans of spirit and ability had perished in the field of battle or in the proscription the door of the assembly had been designedly left open for a mixed multitude of more than a thousand persons who reflected disgrace upon their rank instead of deriving honor from it the reformation of the senate was one of the first steps in which augustus laid aside the tyrant and professed himself the father of his country he was elected censor and in concert with his faithful agrippa he examined a list of the senators expelled a few members whose vices or whose obstinacy required a public example persuaded near two hundred to prevent the shame of an expulsion by a voluntary retreat raised the qualification of a senator to about ten thousand pounds created a sufficient number of patrician families and accepted for himself the honorable title of prince of the senate which had always been bestowed by the censors on the citizen most eminent for his honors and services but whilst he thus restored the dignity he destroyed the independence of the senate the principles of a free constitution are irrevocably lost when the legislative power is nominated by the executive before an assembly thus modeled and prepared augustus pronounced a studied oration which displayed his patriotism and disguised his ambition Quote, he lamented yet excused his past conduct filial piety had required at his hands the revenge of his father's murder the humanity of his own nature had sometimes given way to the stern laws of necessity and to a forced connection with two unworthy colleagues as long as antony lived the republic forbade him to abandon her to a degenerate roman and a barbarian queen he was now at liberty to satisfy his duty and his inclination he solemnly restored the senate and people to all their ancient rights and wished only to mingle with the crowd of his fellow-citizens and to share the blessings which he had obtained for his country it would require the pen of tacitus if tacitus had assisted at this assembly to describe the various emotions of the senate those that were suppressed and those that were affected it was dangerous to trust the sincerity of augustus to seem to distrust it was still more dangerous the respective advantages of monarchy and a republic have often divided speculative inquirers the present greatness of the roman state the corruption of manners and the license of the soldiers supplied new arguments to the advocates of monarchy and these general views of government were again warped by the hopes and fears of each individual amidst this confusion of sentiments the answer of the senate was unanimous and decisive they refused to accept the resignation of augustus they conjured him not to desert the republic which he had saved after a decent resistance the crafty tyrant submitted to the orders of the senate and consented to receive the government of the provinces and the general command of the roman armies under the well-known names of proconsul and imperator but he would receive them only for ten years even before the expiration of that period he hoped that the wounds of civil discord would be completely healed and that the republic restored to its pristine health and vigor would no longer require the dangerous interposition of so extraordinary a magistrate the memory of this comedy repeated several times during the life of augustus was preserved to the last ages of the empire by the peculiar pomp by which the perpetual monarchs of rome always solemnized the ten years of their reign without any violation of the principles of the constitution the general of the roman armies might receive and exercise an authority almost despotic over the soldiers the enemies and the subjects of the republic with regard to the soldiers the jealousy of freedom had even from the earliest ages of rome given way to the hopes of conquest and a just sense of military discipline the dictator or consul had a right to command the services of the roman youth 
and to punish an obstinate or cowardly disobedience by the most severe and ignominious penalties, by striking the offender out of the list of citizens, by confiscating his property, and by selling his person into slavery. The most sacred rights of freedom, confirmed by the Portian and Sempronian laws, were suspended by military engagement. In his camp, the general exercised an absolute power of life and death. His jurisdiction was not confined by any forms of trial or rules of proceeding, and the execution of the sentence was immediate and without appeal. The choice of the enemies of Rome was regularly decided by the legislative authority. The most important resolutions of peace and war were seriously debated in the Senate and solemnly ratified by the people. But when the arms of the legions were carried to a great distance from Italy, the general assumed the liberty of directing them against whatever people and in whatever manner they judged most advantageous for the public service. It was from the success, not from the justice, of their enterprises that they expected the honors of a triumph. In the use of victory, especially after they were no longer controlled by the commissioners of the Senate, they exercised the most unbounded despotism. When Pompey commanded in the East, he rewarded his soldiers and allies, dethroned princes, divided kingdoms, founded colonies, and distributed the treasures of the Mithridates. On his return to Rome, he obtained, by a single act of the Senate and people, the universal ratification of all his proceedings. Such was the power over the soldiers and over the enemies of Rome, which was either granted to or assumed by the generals of the Republic. They were, at the same time, the governors, or rather monarchs, of the conquered provinces, united the civil with the military character, administered justice as well as the finances, and exercised both the executive and legislative power of the state. From what has already been observed in the first chapter of this work, some notion may be formed of the armies and provinces thus entrusted to the ruling hand of Augustus. But, as it was impossible that he could personally command the regions of so many distant frontiers, he was indulged by the Senate, as Pompey had already been, in the permission of devolving the execution of his great office on a sufficient number of lieutenants. In rank and authority these officers seemed not inferior to the ancient proconsuls, but their station was dependent and precarious. They received and held their commissions at the will of a superior, to whose auspicious influence the merit of their action was legally attributed. They were the representatives of the emperor. The emperor alone was the general of the republic, and his jurisdiction, civil as well as military, extended over all the conquests of Rome. It was some satisfaction, however, to the Senate, that he always delegated his power to the members of their body. The imperial lieutenants were of consular or praetorian dignity, the legions were commanded by senators, and the prefecture of Egypt was the only important trust committed to a Roman knight. Within six days after Augustus had been compelled to accept so very liberal a grant, he resolved to gratify the pride of the Senate by an easy sacrifice. He represented to them that they had enlarged his powers even beyond that degree which might be required by the melancholy condition of their times. They had not permitted him to refuse the laborious command of the armies and the frontiers, but he must insist on being allowed to restore the more peaceful and secure provinces to the mild administration of the civil magistrate. In the division of the provinces, Augustus provided for his own power and for the dignity of the Republic. The proconsuls of the Senate, particularly those of Asia, Greece, and Africa, enjoyed a more honorable character than the lieutenants of the emperor, who commanded in Gaul or Syria. The former were attended by lictors, the latter by soldiers. A law was passed that wherever the emperor was present, his extraordinary commission should supersede the ordinary jurisdiction of the governor, a custom was introduced that the new conquests belonged to the imperial portion, and it was soon discovered that the authority of the prince, the favorite epithet of Augustus, was the same in every part of the empire. In return for this imaginary concession, Augustus obtained an important privilege, which rendered him master of Rome and Italy. By a dangerous exception to the ancient maxims, he was authorized to preserve his military command, supported by a numerous body of guards, even in a time of peace, and in the heart of the capital. His command, indeed, was confined to those citizens who were engaged in the service by the military oath, but such was the propensity of the Romans to servitude that the oath was voluntarily taken by the magistrates, the senators, and the equestrian order, till the homage of flattery was insensibly converted into an annual and solemn protestation of fidelity. Although Augustus considered a military force as the firmest foundation, he wisely rejected it as a very odious instrument of government. 
it was more agreeable to his temper as well as to his policy to reign under the venerable names of ancient magistracy and artfully to collect in his own person all the scattered rays of civil jurisdiction with this in view he permitted the senate to confer upon him for his life the powers of the consular and tribunitian offices which were in the same manner continued to all his successors the consuls had succeeded to the kings of rome and represented the dignity of the state they superintended the ceremonies of religion levied and commanded the legions gave audience to foreign ambassadors and presided in the assemblies both of the senate and people the general control of the finances was entrusted to their care and though they seldom had leisure to administer justice in person they were considered as the supreme guardians of law equity and the public peace such was their ordinary jurisdiction but whenever the senate empowered the first magistrate to consult the safety of the commonwealth he was raised by that decree above the laws and exercised in the defence of liberty a temporary despotism the character of the tribunes was in every respect different from that of the consuls the appearance of the former was modest and humble but their persons were sacred and inviolable their force was suited rather for opposition than for action they were instituted to defend the oppressed to pardon offences to arraign the enemies of the people and when they judged it necessary to stop by a single word the whole machine of government as long as the republic subsisted the dangerous influence which either the council or the tribune might derive from their respective jurisdiction was diminished by several important restrictions their authority expired with the year in which they were elected the former office was divided between two the latter among ten persons and as both in their private and public interest they were averse to each other their mutual conflicts contributed for the most part to strengthen rather than to destroy the balance of the constitution but when the consular and tribunitian powers were united when they were vested for life in a single person when the general of the army was at the same time the minister of the senate and the representative of the roman people it was impossible to resist the exercise nor was it easy to define the limits of his imperial prerogative to these accumulated honours the policy of augustus soon added the splendid as well as important dignities of supreme pontiff and of censor by the former he acquired the management of the religion and by the latter a legal inspection over the manners and fortunes of the roman people if so many distinct and independent powers did not exactly unite with each other the complacence of the senate was prepared to supply every deficiency by the most ample and extraordinary concessions the emperors as the first ministers of the republic were exempted from the obligation and penalty of many inconvenient laws they were authorized to convoke the senate to make several motions in the same day to recommend candidates for the honors of the state to enlarge the bounds of the city to employ the revenue at their discretion to declare peace and war to ratify treaties and by a most comprehensive clause they were empowered to execute whatsoever they should judge advantageous to the empire and agreeable to the majesty of things private or public human or divine when all the various powers of executive government were committed to the imperial magistrate the ordinary magistrates of the commonwealth languished in obscurity without vigour and almost without business the names and forms of the ancient administration were preserved by augustus with the most anxious care the usual number of consuls praetors and tribunes were annually invested with their respective ensigns of office and continued to discharge some of their least important functions those honours still attracted the vain ambition of the romans and the emperors themselves though invested for life with the powers of the consulship frequently aspired to the title of that annual dignity which they condescended to share with the most illustrious of their fellow-citizens in the election of these magistrates the people during the reign of augustus were permitted to expose all the inconveniences of a wild democracy that artful prince instead of discovering the least symptom of impatience humbly solicited their suffrages for himself or his friends and scrupulously practised all the duties of an ordinary candidate but we may venture to ascribe to his counsels the first measure of the succeeding reign by which the elections were transferred to the senate the assemblies of the people were forever abolished and the emperors were delivered from a dangerous multitude who without restoring liberty might have disturbed and perhaps endangered the established government by declaring themselves the protectors of the people marius and caesar had subverted the constitution of their country 
But as soon as the Senate had been humbled and disarmed, such an assembly, consisting of five or six hundred persons, was found a much more tractable and useful instrument of dominion. It was on the dignity of the Senate that Augustus and his successors founded their new empire, and they affected, on every occasion, to adopt the language and principles of patricians. In the administration of their own powers, they frequently consulted the great national council, and seemed to refer to its decisions the most important concerns of peace and war. Rome, Italy, and the internal provinces were subject to the immediate jurisdiction of the Senate. With regard to civil objects, it was the supreme court of appeal. With regard to criminal matters, a tribunal, constituted for the trial of all offenses that were committed by men in any public station, or that affected the peace and majesty of the Roman people. The exercise of the judicial power became the most frequent and serious occupation of the Senate, and the important causes that were pleaded before them afforded a last refuge to the spirit of ancient eloquence. As a council of state, and as a court of justice, the Senate possessed very considerable prerogatives. But, in its legislative capacity, in which it was supposed virtually to represent the people, the rights of sovereignty were acknowledged to reside in that assembly. Every power was derived from their authority every law was ratified by their sanction their regular meetings were held on three stated days in every month the calends the nones and the ides the debates were conducted with decent freedom and the emperors themselves who gloried in the name of senators sat voted and divided with their equals to resume in a few words the system of imperial government as it was instituted by Augustus, and maintained by those princes who understood their own interest and that of the people, it may be defined an absolute monarchy disguised by the forms of a commonwealth. The masters of the Roman world surrounded their throne with darkness, concealed their irresistible strength, and humbly professed themselves the accountable ministers of the Senate, whose supreme decrees they dictated and obeyed. The face of the court corresponded with the forms of the administration. The emperors, if we accept those tyrants whose capricious folly violated every law of nature and decency, disdained the pomp and ceremony which might offend their countrymen but could add nothing to their real power. In all the offices of life they affected to confound themselves with their subjects, and maintained with them an equal intercourse of visit and entertainments. Their habit, their palace, their table, were suited only to the rank of an opulent senator. Their family, however numerous or splendid, was composed entirely of their domestic slaves and freed men. Augustus or Trajan would have blushed at employing the meanest of Romans in those menial offices which, in the household and bedchamber of a limited monarch, are so eagerly solicited by the proudest nobles of Britain. The deification of the emperors is the only instance in which they departed from their accustomed prudence and modesty. The Asiatic Greeks were the first inventors and successors of Alexander the first objects of this servile and impious mode of adulation. It was easily transferred from the kings to the governors of Asia, and the Roman magistrates very frequently were adored as provincial deities with the pomp of altars and temples, of festivals and sacrifices. It was natural that the emperors should not refuse what the proconsuls had accepted, and the divine honors which both the one and the other received from the provinces attested rather the despotism than the servitude of Rome. But the conquerors soon imitated the vanquished nations in the arts of flattery, and the imperious spirit of the first Caesar too easily consented to assume, during his lifetime, a place among the tutelar deities of Rome. The milder temper of his successor declined so dangerous an ambition which was never afterwards revived, except by the madness of Caligula and Domitian. Augustus permitted, indeed, some of the provincial cities to erect temples to his honor, on condition that they should associate the worship of Rome with that of the sovereign. He tolerated private superstition, of which he might be the object, but he contented himself with being revered by the Senate and the people in his human character, and wisely left to his successor the care of his public deification. A regular custom was introduced that on the decease of every emperor who had neither lived nor died like a tyrant, the senate, by a solemn decree, would place him in the number of the gods, and the ceremonies of his apotheosis were blended with those of his funeral. This legal, and, it would seem, injudicious profanation, so abhorrent to their stricter principles, was received with a very faint murmur by the easy nature of polytheism. But it was received as an institution, not of religion, but of policy. We should disgrace the virtues of the Antonines by comparing them with the vices of Hercules or Jupiter. 
Even the characters of Caesar or Augustus were far superior to those of the popular deities. But it was the misfortune of the former to live in the enlightened age, and their actions were too faithfully recorded to admit of such a mixture of fable and mystery as the devotion of the vulgar requires. As soon as their divinity was established by law, it sunk into oblivion, without contributing either to their own fame or to the dignity of succeeding princes. In the consideration of the imperial government, we have frequently mentioned the artful founder, under his well-known title of Augustus, which was not, however, conferred upon him till the edifice was almost completed. The obscure name of Octavianus he derived from a mean family in the little town of Aricia. It was stained with the blood of the proscription, and he was desirous, had it been possible, to erase all memory of his former life. The illustrious surname of Caesar he had assumed as the adopted son of the dictator, but he had too much good sense either to hope to be confounded or to wish to be compared with that extraordinary man. It was proposed in the Senate to dignify their minister with a new appellation, and after a serious discussion, that of Augustus was chosen, among several others, as being the most expressive of the character of peace and sanctity which he uniformly affected. Augustus was therefore a personal, Caesar a family, distinction. The former should naturally have expired with the prince on whom it was bestowed, and however the latter was diffused by adoption and female alliance, Nero was the last prince who could allege any hereditary claim to the honors of the Julian line. But, at the time of his death, the practice of a century had inseparably connected those appellations with the imperial dignity, and they have been preserved by a long succession of emperors, Romans, Greeks, Franks, and Germans, from the fall of the Republic to the present time. A distinction was, however, soon introduced. The sacred title of Augustus was always reserved for the monarch, whilst the name of Caesar was more freely communicated to his relations, and, from the reign of Hadrian at least, was appropriated to the second person in the state, who was considered as the presumptive heir of the empire. End of chapter 3, part 1《ハッチャー3、2、of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire、Volume 1。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L I B R I V O X dot O R G. Recording by Christy Nowak. Chapter 3 The Constitution in the Age of the Antonines, Part 2. The tender respect of Augustus for a free constitution which he had destroyed can only be explained by an attentive consideration of the character of that subtle tyrant. A cool head, an unfeeling heart, and a cowardly disposition prompted him at the age of nineteen to assume the mask of hypocrisy, which he never afterwards laid aside. With the same hand, and probably with the same temper, he signed the proscription of Cicero and the pardon of Cinna. His virtues, and even his vices, were artificial, and according to the various dictates of his interest, he was at first the enemy, and at last the father of the Roman world. When he framed the artful system of the imperial authority, his moderation was inspired by his fears. He wished to deceive the people by an image of civil liberty, and the armies by an image of civil government. 1. The death of Caesar was ever before his eyes. He had lavished wealth and honors on his adherents, but the most favored friends of his uncle were in the number of the conspirators. The fidelity of the legions might defend his authority against open rebellion, but their vigilance could not secure his person from the dagger of a determined republican, and the Romans, who revered the memory of Brutus, would applaud the imitation of his virtue. Caesar had provoked his fate as much as by the ostentation of his power as by his power itself. The consul or the tribune might have reigned in peace. The title of king had armed the Romans against his life. Augustus was sensible that mankind is governed by names, nor was he deceived in his expectation that the senate and people would submit to slavery, provided they were respectfully assured that they still enjoyed their ancient freedom. A feeble senate and an enervated people cheerfully acquiesced in the pleasing illusion, as long as it was supported by the virtue or even by the prudence, of the successors of Augustus. It was a motive of self-preservation, not a principle of liberty, that animated the conspirators against Caligula, Nero, and Domitian. They attacked the person of the tyrant, without aiming their blow at the authority of the emperor. 
There appears indeed one memorable occasion in which the Senate, after seventy years of patience, made an ineffectual attempt to reassume its long-forgotten rights. When the throne was vacant by the murder of Caligula, the consuls convoked that assembly in the capital, condemned the memory of the Caesars, gave the watchword liberty to the few cohorts who faintly adhered to their standard, and during the eight and forty hours acted as the independent chiefs of a free commonwealth. But while they deliberated, the Praetorian guards had resolved. The stupid Claudius, brother of Germanicus, was already in their camp, invested with the imperial purple, and prepared to support his election by arms. The dream of liberty was at an end, and the Senate awoke to all the horrors of inevitable servitude. Deserted by the people and threatened by a military force, that feeble assembly was compelled to ratify the choice of the Praetorians and to embrace the benefit of amnesty, which Claudius had the prudence to offer and the generosity to observe. Note: See the capital. When the throne was vacant by the murder of Caligula, the consuls convoked that assembly in the capital. End note. Two. The insolence of the armies inspired Augustus with fears of a still more alarming nature. The despair of the citizens could only attempt what the power of the soldiers was at any time able to execute. How precarious was his own authority over men whom he had taught to violate every social duty! He had heard their seditious clamors. He dreaded their calmer moments of reflection. One revolution had been purchased by immense rewards, but a second revolution might double those rewards. The troops professed the fondest attachment to the house of Caesar, but the attachments of the multitude are capricious and inconstant. Augustus summoned to his aid whatever remained in those fierce minds of the Roman prejudices, enforced the rigor of discipline by the sanction of law, and interposing the majesty of the Senate between the emperor and the army, boldly claimed their allegiance as the first magistrate of the republic. During a long period of two hundred and twenty years, from the establishment of this artful system to the death of Commodus, the dangers inherent to a military government were, in a great measure, suspended. The soldiers were seldom roused to that fatal sense of their own strength and of the weakness of the civil authority, which was, before and afterwards, productive of such dreadful calamities. Caligula and Domitian were assassinated in their palace by their own domestics. The convulsions which agitated Rome on the death of the former were confined to the walls of the city, but Nero involved the whole empire in his ruin. In the space of eighteen months, four princes perished by the sword, and the Roman world was shaken by the fury of the contending armies. Excepting only this short, though violent eruption of military license, the two centuries from Augustus to Commodus passed away unstained with civil blood and undisturbed by revolutions. The emperor was elected by the authority of the senate and the consent of the soldiers. The legions respected their oath of fidelity, and it requires a minute inspection of the Roman annals to discover three inconsiderable rebellions, which were all suppressed in a few months and without even the hazard of a battle. In elective monarchies, the vacancy of the throne is a moment big with danger and mischief. The Roman emperors, desirous to spare the legions that interval of suspense and the temptation of an irregular choice, invested their designed successor with so large a share of present power as should enable him, after their decease, to assume the remainder without suffering the empire to perceive the change of masters. Thus, Augustus. After all his fairer prospects had been snatched from him by untimely deaths, rested his last hopes on Tiberius, obtained for his adopted son the censorial and tribunitian powers, and dictated a law by which the future prince was invested with an authority equal to his own over the provinces and the armies. Thus, Vespasian subdued the generous mind of his eldest son. Titus was adored by the Eastern legions, which, under his command, had recently achieved the conquest of Judea. His power was dreaded, and as his virtues were clouded by the intemperance of youth, his designs were suspected. Instead of listening to such unworthy suspicion, the prudent monarch associated Titus to the full powers of the imperial dignity, and the grateful son ever approved himself the humble and faithful minister of so indulgent a father. The good sense of Vespasian engaged him indeed to embrace every measure that might confirm his recent and precarious elevation. 
the military oath, and the fidelity of the troops had been consecrated by the habits of a hundred years to the name and family of the Caesars, and although that family had been continued only by the fictitious right of adoption, the Romans still revered, in the person of Nero, the grandson of Germanicus, and the lineal successor of Augustus. It was not without reluctance and remorse that the Praetorian guards had been persuaded to abandon the cause of the tyrant. The rapid downfall of Galba, Otho, and Vitellius taught the armies to consider the emperors as the creatures of their will and the instruments of their license. The birth of Vespasian was mean. His grandfather had been a private soldier, his father a petty officer of the revenue. His own merit had raised him in an advanced age to the empire, but his merit was rather useful than shining, and his virtues were disgraced by a strict and even sordid parsimony. Such a prince consulted his true interest by the association of a son whose more splendid and amiable character might turn the public attention from the obscure origin to the future glories of the Flavian house. Under the mild administration of Titus, the Roman world enjoyed a transient felicity, and his beloved memory served to protect, above fifteen years, the vices of his brother Domitian. Nerva had scarcely accepted the purple from the assassins of Domitian before he discovered that his feeble age was unable to stem the torrent of public disorders which had multiplied under the long tyranny of his predecessor. His mild disposition was respected by the good, but the degenerate Romans required a more vigorous character, whose justice should strike terror into the guilty. Though he had several relations, he fixed his choice on a stranger. He adopted Trajan, then about forty years of age, who commanded a powerful army in the lower Germany, and immediately, by a decree of the Senate, declared him his colleague and successor in the empire. It is sincerely to be lamented that whilst we are fatigued with the disgustful relation of Nero's crimes and follies, we are reduced to collect the actions of Trajan from the glimmerings of an abridgment or the doubtful light of a panegyric. There remains, however, one panegyric far removed beyond the suspicion of flattery. Above two hundred and fifty years after the death of Trajan, the Senate, in pouring out the customary acclamations on the accession of a new emperor, wished that he might surpass the felicity of Augustus and the virtue of Trajan. We may readily believe that the father of his country hesitated whether he ought to entrust the various and doubtful character of his kinsman Hadrian with sovereign power. In his last moments, the arts of the Empress Plotina either fixed the irresolution of Trajan or boldly supposed a fictitious adoption, the truth of which could not be safely disputed, and Hadrian was peaceably acknowledged as his lawful successor. Under his reign, as had been already mentioned, the empire flourished in peace and prosperity. He encouraged the arts, reformed the laws, asserted military discipline, and visited all his provinces in person. His vast and active genius was equally suited to the most enlarged views and the minute details of civil policy. But the ruling passions of his soul were curiosity and vanity. As they prevailed, and as they were attracted by different objects, Hadrian was, by turns, an excellent prince, a ridiculous sophist, and a jealous tyrant. The general tenor of his conduct deserved praise for its equity and moderation. Yet in the first days of his reign he put to death four councillor senators, his personal enemies, and men who had been judged worthy of empire, and the tediousness of a painful illness rendered him at last peevish and cruel. The Senate doubted whether they should pronounce him a god or a tyrant, and the honors decreed to his memory were granted to the prayers of the pious Antoninus. The caprice of Hadrian influenced his choice of a successor. After revolving in his mind several men of distinguished merit, whom he esteemed and hated, he adopted Aelius Verus, a gay and voluptuous nobleman, recommended by uncommon beauty to the lover of Antoninus. But whilst Hadrian was delighting himself with his own applause and the acclamations of the soldiers, whose consent had been secured by an immense donative, the new Caesar was ravished from his embraces by an untimely death. He left only one son. Hadrian commended the boy to the gratitude of the Antonines. He was adopted by Pius, and, on the accession of Marcus, was invested with an equal share of sovereign power. Among the many vices of this younger Verus, he possessed one virtue, a dutiful reverence to his wiser colleague, to whom he willingly abandoned the ruder cares of empire. The philosophic emperor dissembled his follies, lamented his early death, and cast a decent veil over his memory." As soon as Hadrian's passion was either gratified or disappointed, he resolved to deserve the thanks of posterity by placing the most exalted merit on the Roman throne. 
His discerning eye easily discovered a senator about fifty years of age, blameless in all the offices of life, and a youth of about seventeen whose riper years opened a fair prospect of every virtue. The elder of these was declared the son and successor of Hadrian, on condition, however, that he himself should immediately adopt the younger. The two Antonines, for it is of them we are now speaking, governed the Roman world forty two years with the same invariable spirit of wisdom and virtue. Although Pius had two sons, he preferred the welfare of Rome to the interest of his family, gave his daughter Faustina in marriage to young Marcus, obtained from the Senate the tribunician and proconsular powers, and, with a noble disdain, or rather ignorance of jealousy, associated him to all the labors of government. Marcus, on the other hand, revered the character of his benefactor, loved him as a parent, obeyed him as his sovereign, and, after he was no more, regulated his own administration by the example and maxims of his predecessor. Their united reigns are possibly the only period of history in which the happiness of a great people was the sole object of government. Titus Antoninus Pius has been justly denominated a second Numa. The same love of religion, justice, and peace was the distinguishing characteristic of both princes, but the situation of the latter opened a much larger field for the exercise of those virtues. Numa could only prevent a few neighboring villages from plundering each other's harvests. Antoninus diffused order and tranquility over the greatest part of the earth. His reign is marked by the rare advantage of furnishing very few materials for history, which is indeed little more than the register of crimes, follies, and misfortunes of mankind. In private life, he was an amiable as well as a good man. The native simplicity of his virtue was a stranger to vanity or affectation. He enjoyed with moderation the conveniences of his fortune and the innocent pleasures of society, and the benevolence of his soul displayed itself in a cheerful serenity of temper. The virtue of Marcus Aurelius Antoninus was of a severer and more laborious kind. It was the well earned harvest of many a learned conference, of many a patient lecture, and many a midnight lucubration. At the age of twelve years, he embraced the rigid system of the Stoics, which taught him to submit his body to his mind, his passions to his reason, to consider virtue as the only good, vice as the only evil, all things external as things indifferent. His meditations, composed in the tumult of camp, are still extant, and he even condescended to give lessons of philosophy in a more public manner than was perhaps consistent with the modesty of a sage or the dignity of an emperor. But his life was the noblest commentary on the precepts of Zeno. He was severe to himself, indulgent to the imperfection of others, just and beneficent to all mankind. He regretted that Avidius Cassius, who excited a rebellion in Syria, had disappointed him by a voluntary death of the pleasure of converting an enemy to a friend, and he justified the sincerity of that sentiment by moderating the zeal of the Senate against the adherence of the traitor. War he detested, as the disgrace and calamity of human nature, but when the necessity of a just defense called upon him to take up arms, he readily exposed his person to eight winter campaigns on the frozen banks of the Danube, the severity of which was at last fatal to the weakness of his constitution. His memory was revered by a grateful posterity, and above a century after his death, many persons preserved the image of Marcus Antoninus among those of their household gods. If a man were called to fix the period in the history of the world during which the condition of the human race was most happy and prosperous, he would, without hesitation, name that which elapsed from the death of Domitian to the accession of Commodus. The vast extent of the Roman Empire was governed by absolute power, under the guidance of virtue and wisdom. The armies were restrained by the firm but gentle hand of four successive emperors whose characters and authority commanded involuntary respect. The forms of the civil administration were carefully preserved by Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, and the Antonines, who delighted in the image of liberty and were pleased with considering themselves as the accountable ministers of the laws. Such princes deserved the honor of restoring the Republic, had the Romans of their days been capable of enjoying a rational freedom. The labors of these monarchs were overpaid by the immense reward that inseparably waited on their success, by the honest pride of virtue, and by the exquisite delight of beholding the general happiness of which they were the authors. A just but melancholy reflection embittered, however, the noblest of human enjoyments. They must often have recollected the instability of a happiness which depended on the character of a single man. 
The fatal moment was perhaps approaching when some licentious youth or some jealous tyrant would abuse to the destruction that absolute power which they had exerted for the benefit of their people. The ideal restraints of the Senate and the laws might serve to display the virtues, but could never correct the vices of the emperor. The military force was a blind and irresistible instrument of oppression, and the corruption of Roman manners would always supply flatterers eager to applaud and ministers prepared to serve the fear or the avarice, the lust or the cruelty of their masters. These gloomy apprehensions had been already justified by the experience of the Romans. The annals of the emperors exhibit a strong and various picture of human nature, which we should vainly seek among the mixed and doubtful characters of modern history. In the conduct of those monarchs, we may trace the utmost lines of vice and virtue, the most exalted perfection, and the meanest degeneracy of our own species. The golden age of Trajan and the Antonines had been preceded by an age of iron. It is almost superfluous to enumerate the unworthy successors of Augustus. Their unparalleled vices and the splendid theatre on which they were acted have saved them from oblivion. The dark, unrelenting Tiberius, the furious Caligula, the feeble Claudius, the profligate and cruel Nero, the beastly Vitellius, and the timid, inhuman Domitian are condemned to everlasting infamy. During fourscore years, excepting only the short and doubtful respite of Vespasian's reign, Rome groaned beneath the unremitting tyranny which exterminated the ancient families of the Republic and was fatal to almost every virtue and every talent that arose in that unhappy period. Under the reign of these monsters, the slavery of the Romans was accompanied by two peculiar circumstances, the one occasioned by their former liberty, the other by their extensive conquests, which rendered their condition more completely wretched than that of the victims of tyranny in any other age or country. From these causes were derived, one, the exquisite sensibility of the sufferers, and two, the impossibility of escaping from the hand of the oppressor. One. When Persia was governed by the descendants of Sephi, the race of princes whose wanton cruelty often stained their divan, their table, and their bed with the blood of their favorites, there is a saying recorded of a young nobleman that he never departed from the sultan's presence without satisfying himself whether his head was still on his shoulders. The experience of every day might almost justify the skepticism of Rustan, yet the fatal sword, suspended above him by a single thread, seems not to have disturbed the slumbers or interrupted the tranquillity of the Persian. The monarch's frown, he well knew, could level him with the dust, but the stroke of lightning or apoplexy might be equally fatal, and it was the part of a wise man to forget the inevitable calamities of human life in the enjoyment of the fleeting hour. He was dignified with the appellation of the king's slave, had perhaps been purchased from obscure parents in a country which he had never known, and was trained up from his infancy in the severe discipline of the seraglio. His name, his wealth, his honors were the gift of a master who might, without injustice, resume what he had bestowed. Rustan's knowledge, if he possessed any, could only serve to confirm his habits by prejudices. His language afforded not words for any form of government except absolute monarchy. The history of the East informed him that such had ever been the condition of humankind. The Koran and the interpreters of that divine book inculcated to him that the Sultan was the descendant of the Prophet and the vicegerent of Heaven, that patience was the first virtue of a Muslim and unlimited obedience the great duty of a subject. The minds of the Romans were very differently prepared for slavery. Oppressed beneath the weight of their own corruption and of military violence, they, for a long while, preserved the sentiments, or at least the ideas, of their free-born ancestors. The education of Helvidius and Thracia, of Tacitus and Pliny, was the same as that of Cato and Cicero. From Grecian philosophy they had imbibed the justest and most liberal notions of the dignity of human nature and the origin of civil society. The history of their own country had taught them to revere a free, a virtuous, and a victorious commonwealth, to abhor the successful crimes of Caesar and Augustus, and inwardly to despise those tyrants whom they adored with the same abject flattery. As magistrates and senators, they were admitted into the great council, which had once dictated laws to the earth, whose authority was so often prostituted to the vilest purposes of tyranny. Tiberius and those emperors who adopted his maxims attempted to disguise their murders by the formalities of justice, and perhaps enjoyed a secret pleasure in rendering the Senate their accomplice as well as their victim. 
By this assembly, the last of the Romans were condemned for imaginary crimes and real virtues. Their infamous accusers assumed the language of independent patriots who arraigned a dangerous citizen before the tribunal of his country, and the public service was rewarded by riches and honors. The servile judges professed to assert the majesty of the commonwealth, violated the person of its first magistrate, whose clemency they most applauded when they trembled the most at his inexorable and impending cruelty. The tyrant beheld their baseness with just contempt, and encountered their secret sentiments of detestation with sincere and avowed hatred for the whole body of the Senate. 2. The division of Europe into a number of independent states, connected, however, with each other by the general resemblance of religion, language, and manners, is productive of the most beneficial consequences to the liberty of mankind. A modern tyrant, who should find no resistance either in his own breast or in his people, would soon experience a gentle restraint from the example of his equals, the dread of present censure, the advice of his allies, and the apprehension of his enemies. The object of his displeasure, escaping from the narrow limits of his dominions, would easily obtain, in a happier climate, a secret refuge, a new fortune adequate to his merit, the freedom of complaint, and perhaps the means of revenge. But the empire of the Romans filled the world, and when the empire fell into the hands of a single person, the world became a safe and dreary prison for his enemies." The slave of imperial despotism, whether he was condemned to drag his gilded chain in Rome in the Senate, or were to live out a life of exile on the barren rock of Seraphis, or the frozen bank of the Danube, expected his fate in silent despair. To resist was fatal, and it was impossible to fly. On every side he was encompassed with a vast extent of sea and land, which he could never hope to traverse without being discovered, seized, and restored to his irritated master." Beyond the frontiers, his anxious view could discover nothing, except the ocean, inhospitable deserts, hostile tribes of barbarians, of fierce manners and unknown language, or dependent kings who would gladly purchase the emperor's protection by the sacrifice of an obnoxious fugitive. "'Wherever you are,' said Cicero to the exiled Marcellus, "'remember that you are equally within the power of the conqueror.'" End of Chapter 3, Part 2 Chapter 4, Part 1 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter 4. THE CRUELTY, FOLLIES, AND MURDER OF COMMODUS PART 1 CONTENTS THE CRUELTY, FOLLIES, AND MURDER OF COMMODUS ELECTION OF PERTINAX HIS ATTEMPTS TO REFORM THE STATE HIS ASSASSINATION BY THE PRAETORIAN GUARDS THE MILDNESS OF MARCUS, WHICH THE RIGID DISCIPLINE OF THE STOICS WAS UNABLE TO ERADICATE, formed at the same time the most amiable and the only defective part of his character. His excellent understanding was often deceived by the unsuspecting goodness of his heart. Artful men who study the passions of princes and conceal their own approached his person in the disguise of philosophic sanctity and acquired riches and honors by affecting to despise them. His excessive indulgence to his brother his wife and his son, exceeded the bounds of private virtue and became a public injury by the example and consequences of their vices. Faustina, the daughter of Pius and wife of Marcus, has been as much celebrated for her gallantries as for her beauty. The grave simplicity of the philosopher was ill-calculated to engage her wanton levity or to fix that unbounded passion for variety, which often discovered personal merit in the meanest of mankind. The Cupid of the ancients was, in general, a very sensual deity, and the armors of an empress, as they exact on her side the plainest advances, are seldom susceptible of much sentimental delicacy. Marcus was the only man in the empire who seemed ignorant or insensible, of the irregularities of Faustina, 
which, according to the prejudices of every age, reflected some disgrace on the injured husband. He promoted several of her lovers to posts of honour and profit, and during a connection of thirty years invariably gave her proofs of the most tender confidence, and of a respect which ended not with her life. In his meditations he thanks the gods, who had bestowed on him a wife so faithful, so gentle, and of such a wonderful simplicity of manners. The obsequious senate, at his earnest request, declared her a goddess. She was represented in her temples with the attributes of Juno, Venus, and Ceres, and it was decreed that, on the day of their nuptials, the youth of either sex should pay their vows before the altar of their chaste patroness. The monstrous vices of the son have cast a shade on the purity of the father's virtues. It has been objected to Marcus that he sacrificed the happiness of millions to a fond partiality for a worthless boy, and that he chose a successor in his own family rather than in the Republic. Nothing, however, was neglected by the anxious father and by the men of virtue and learning whom he summoned to his assistance, to expand the narrow mind of young Commodus, to correct his growing vices, and to render him worthy of the throne for which he was designed. But the power of instruction is seldom of much efficacy, except in those happy dispositions where it is almost superfluous. The distasteful lesson of a grave philosopher was in a moment obliterated by the whisper of a profligate favourite, and Marcus himself blasted the fruits of his laboured education by admitting his son, at the age of fourteen or fifteen, to a full participation of the imperial power. He lived but four years afterwards, but he lived long enough to repent a rash measure, which raised the impetuous youth above the restraint of reason and authority. Most of the crimes which disturb the internal peace of society are produced by the restraints which the necessary but unequal laws of property have imposed on the appetites of mankind, by confining to a few the possession of those objects that are coveted by many. Of all our passions and appetites, the love of power is the most imperious and unsociable nature since the pride of one man requires the submission of the multitude. In the tumult of civil discord, the laws of society lose their force, and their place is seldom supplied by those of humanity. The ardour of contention, the pride of victory, the despair of success, the memory of past injuries, and the fear of future dangers, all contribute to inflame the mind and to silence the voice of pity. From such motives, almost every page of history has been stained with civil blood, but these motives will not account for the unprovoked cruelties of Commodus, who had nothing to wish and everything to enjoy. The beloved son of Marcus succeeded to his father amidst the acclamations of the senate and armies, and when he ascended the throne, the happy youth saw round him neither competitor to remove nor enemies to punish. In this calm, elevated station, it was surely natural that he should prefer the love of mankind to their detestation, the mild glories of his five predecessors, to the ignominious fate of Nero and Domitian. Yet Commodus was not, as he had been represented, a tiger born with an insatiate thirst of human blood, and capable, from his infancy, of the most inhuman actions. Nature had formed him of a weak rather than a wicked disposition. His simplicity and timidity rendered him the slave of his attendants, who gradually corrupted his mind. His cruelty, which at first obeyed the dictates of others, degenerated into habit, and at length, became the ruling passion of his soul. Upon the death of his father, Commodus found himself embarrassed with the command of a great army, and the conduct of a difficult war against the Quadi and the Marcomanni. The servile and profligate youths, 
whom Marcus had banished, soon regained their station and influence about the new emperor. They exaggerated the hardships and dangers of a campaign in the wild countries beyond the Danube, and they assured the indolent prince that the terror of his name and the arms of his lieutenants would be sufficient to complete the conquest of the dismayed barbarians or to impose such conditions as were more advantageous than any conquest. By a dexterous application to his sensual appetites, they compared the tranquillity, the splendor, the refined pleasures of Rome, with the tumult of a Pannonian camp, which afforded neither leisure nor materials for luxury. Commodus listened to the pleasing advice, but whilst he hesitated between his own inclination and the awe which he still retained for his father's counsellors, the summer insensibly collapsed, and his triumphal entry into the capital was deferred till the autumn. His graceful person, popular address, and imagined virtues attracted the public favour. The honourable peace which he had recently granted to the barbarians diffused a universal joy. His impatience to revisit Rome was fondly ascribed to the love of his country, and his dissolute course of amusements was faintly condemned in a prince of nineteen years of age. During the three first years of his reign, the forms and even the spirit of the old administration were maintained by those faithful counsellors to whom Marcus had recommended his son, and for whose wisdom and integrity Commodus still entertained a reluctant esteem. The young prince and his profligate favourites revelled in all the licence of sovereign power, but his hands were yet unstained with blood, and he had even displayed a generosity of sentiment, which might perhaps have ripened into solid virtue. A fatal incident decided his fluctuating character. One evening, as the emperor was returning to the palace, through a dark and narrow portico in the amphitheatre, an assassin, who waited his passage, rushed upon him with a drawn sword, loudly exclaiming, The Senate sends you this! The menace prevented the deed. The assassin was seized by the guards, and immediately revealed the authors of the conspiracy. It had been formed not in the state, but within the walls of the palace. Lucilla, the emperor's sister and widow of Lucius Verus, impatient of the second rank and jealous of the reigning empress, had armed the murderer against her brother's life. She had not ventured to communicate the black design to her second husband, Claudius Pompeius, a senator of distinguished merit and unshaken loyalty, but among the crowd of her lovers, for she imitated the manners of Faustina, she found men of desperate fortunes and wild ambition, who were prepared to serve her more violent as well as her tender passions. The conspirators experienced the rigour of justice, and the abandoned princess was punished first with exile and afterwards with death. But the words of the assassin sunk deep into the mind of Commodus, and left an indelible impression of fear and hatred against the whole body of the Senate. Those whom he had dreaded as importunate ministers he now suspected as secret enemies. The delators, a race of men discouraged and almost extinguished under the former reigns, again became formidable, as soon as they discovered that the emperor was desirous of finding disaffection and treason in the senate. That assembly, whom Marcus had ever considered as the great council of the nation, was composed of the most distinguished of the Romans, and distinction of every kind soon became criminal. The possession of wealth stimulated the diligence of the informers. Rigid virtue implied a tacit censure of the irregularities of Commodus. Important services implied a dangerous superiority of merit, and the friendship of the father always ensured the aversion of the son. Suspicion was equivalent to proof, trial to condemnation. The execution of a considerable senator was attended with the death of all who might lament or revenge his fate. And when Commodus had once tasted human blood, he became incapable of pity or remorse. 
In those innocent victims of tyranny, none died more lamented than the two brothers of the Quintilian family, Maximus and Condianus, whose fraternal love had saved their names from oblivion and endeared their memory to posterity. Their studies and their occupations, their pursuits and their pleasures were still the same. In the enjoyment of a great estate they never admitted the idea of a separate interest. Some fragments are now extant of a treatise which they composed in common, and in every action of life it was observed that their two bodies were animated by one soul. The Antonines, who valued their virtues and delighted in their union, raised them in the same year to the consulship, and Marcus afterwards entrusted to their joint care the civil administration of Greece and a great military command, in which they obtained a signal victory over the Germans. The kind cruelty of Commodus united them in death. The tyrant's rage, after having shed the noblest blood of the Senate, at length recoiled on the principal instrument of his cruelty. Whilst Commodus was immersed in blood and luxury, he devolved the detail of the public business on Perennis, a servile and ambitious minister, who had obtained his post by the murder of his predecessor, but who possessed a considerable share of vigour and ability. By acts of extortion, and the forfeited estates of the nobles, sacrificed to his avarice, he had accumulated an immense treasure. The Praetorian guards were under his immediate command, and his son, who already discovered a military genius, was at the head of the Illyrian legions. Perennis aspired to the empire, or what in the eyes of Commodus amounted to the same crime, he was capable of aspiring to it, had he not been prevented, surprised, and put to death. The fall of a minister is a very trifling incident in the general history of the empire, but it was hastened by an extraordinary circumstance which proved how much the nerves of discipline were already relaxed. The legions of Britain, contented with the administration of Perennis, formed a deputation of fifteen hundred select men, with instructions to march to Rome and lay their complaints before the emperor. These military petitioners, by their own determined behaviour, by inflaming the divisions of the guards, by exaggerating the strength of the British army, and by alarming the fears of Commodius, exacted and obtained the minister's death, as the only redress of their grievances. This presumption of a distant army, and their discovery of the weakness of government, was a sure presage of the most dreadful convulsions. The negligence of the public administration was betrayed soon afterwards by a new disorder which arose from the smallest beginning. A spirit of desertion began to prevail among the troops, and the deserters, instead of seeking their safety in flight or concealment, infested the highways. Maternus, a private soldier of a daring boldness above his station, collected these bands of robbers into a little army, set open the prisons, invited the slaves to assert their freedom, and plundered with impunity the rich and defenceless cities of Gaul and Spain. The governors of the provinces, who had long been the spectators, and perhaps the partners, of his depredations, were at length roused from their supine indolence by the threatening commands of the emperor. Maternus found that he was encompassed and foresaw that he must be overpowered. A great effort of despair was his last resource. He ordered his followers to disperse, to pass the Alps in small parties and various disguises, and to assemble at Rome during the licentious tumult of the festival of Sibylle. To murder Commodus and to ascend the vacant throne was the ambition of no vulgar robber. His measures were so ably concerted that his concealed troops already filled the streets of Rome. The envy of an accomplice discovered and ruined this singular enterprise in a moment when it was ripe for execution. Suspicious princes often promote the last of mankind from a vain persuasion that those who have no dependence, except on their favour, will have no attachment except to the person of their benefactor. Cleander, the successor of Perennis, was a Phrygian by birth. 
of a nation over whose stubborn but servile temper blows only could prevail. He had been sent from his native country to Rome in the capacity of a slave. As a slave he entered the imperial palace, rendered himself useful to his master's passions, and rapidly ascended to the most exalted station which a subject could enjoy. His influence over the mind of Commodus was much greater than that of his predecessor, for Cleander was devoid of any ability or virtue which could inspire the emperor with envy or distrust. Avarice was the reigning passion of his soul, and the great principle of his administration. The rank of consul, of patrician, of senator, was exposed to public sale, and it would have been considered as disaffection if any one had refused to purchase these empty and disgraceful honours with the greatest part of his fortune. In the lucrative provincial employments, the minister shared with the government the spoils of the people. The execution of the laws was penal and arbitrary. A wealthy criminal might obtain not only the reversal of the sentence by which he was justly condemned, but might likewise inflict whatever punishment he pleased on the accuser, the witnesses, and the judge. By these means, Cleander, in the space of three years, had accumulated more wealth than had ever yet been possessed by any freedman. Commodus was perfectly satisfied with the magnificent presence which the artful courtier laid at his feet in the most seasonable moments. To divert the public envy, Cleander, under the emperor's name, erected baths, porticos, and places of exercise for the use of the people. He flattered himself that the Romans, dazzled and amused by his apparent liberality, would be less affected by the bloody scenes which were daily exhibited, that they would forget the deaths of Pyrrhus, a senator to whose superior merit the late emperor had granted one of his daughters, and that they would forgive the execution of Arius Antoninus, the last representative of the name and virtues of the Antonines. The former, with more integrity than prudence, had attempted to disclose to his brother-in-law the true character of Cleander. An equitable sentence pronounced by the latter, when proconsul of Asia, against a worthless creature of the favourite, proved fatal to him. After the fall of Perennis, the traitors of Commodus had, for a short time, assumed the appearance of a return to virtue. He repealed the most odious of his acts, loaded his memory with the public execration, and ascribed to the pernicious counsels of that wicked minister all the errors of his inexperienced youth. But his repentance lasted only thirty days, and under Cleander's tyranny, the administration of Perennis was often regretted. End of chapter 4, part 1 Recorded by Gazina in January 2007《Chapter 4, Part 2 of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pestilence and famine contributed to fill up the measure of the calamities of Rome. The first could only be imputed to the just indignation of the gods, but a monopoly of corn supported by the riches and power of the minister, was considered as the immediate cause of the second. The popular discontent, after it had long circulated in whispers, broke out in the assembled circus. The people quitted their favorite amusements for the more delicious pleasure of revenge, rushed in crowds towards a palace in the suburbs, one of the emperor's retirements, and demanded, with angry clamors, the head of the public enemy. Cleander, who had commanded the Praetorian guards, ordered a body of cavalry to sally forth and disperse the seditious multitude. The multitude fled with precipitation towards the city. Several were slain, and many more were trampled to death. But when the cavalry entered the streets, their pursuit was checked by a shower of stones and darts from the roofs and windows of the houses. The foot guards, who had been long jealous of the prerogatives and insolence of the Praetorian cavalry, embraced the party of the people, 
the tumult became a regular engagement and threatened a general massacre. The Praetorians at length gave way, oppressed with numbers, and the tide of popular fury returned with redoubled violence against the gates of the palace, where Commodus lay dissolved in luxury and alone unconscious of the civil war. It was death to approach his person with unwelcome news. He would have perished in this supine security had not two women, his eldest sister Fidilla and Marcia, the most favorite of his concubines, ventured to break into his presence. Bathed in tears and with disheveled hair, they threw themselves at his feet, and, with all the pressing eloquence of fear, discovered to the affrighted emperor the crimes of the minister, the rage of the people, and the impending ruin which in a few minutes would burst over his palace and person. Commodus started from his dream of pleasure, and commanded that the head of Cleander should be thrown out to the people. The desired spectacle instantly appeased the tumult, and the son of Marcus might even yet have regained the affection and confidence of his subjects. But every sentiment of virtue and humanity was extinct in the mind of Commodus. Whilst he thus abandoned the reins of empire to these unworthy favorites, he valued nothing in sovereign power except the unbounded license of indulging his sensual appetites. His hours were spent in a seraglio, with three hundred beautiful women and as many boys of every rank and of every province, and wherever the arts of seduction proved ineffectual, the brutal lover had recourse to violence. The ancient historians have expiated on these abandoned scenes of prostitution, which scorned every restraint of nature or modesty, but it would not be easy to translate their too faithful descriptions into the decency of modern language. The intervals of lust were filled up with the basest amusements. The influence of a polite age and the labor of an attentive education had never been able to infuse into his rude and brutish mind the least tincture of learning, and he was the first of the Roman emperors totally devoid of taste for the pleasures of the understanding. Nero himself excelled, or affected to excel, in the elegant arts of music and poetry. Nor should we despise his pursuits, had he not converted the pleasing relaxation of a leisure hour into the serious business and ambition of his life. But Commodus, from his earliest infancy, discovered an aversion to whatever was rational or liberal, and a fond attachment to the amusements of the populace, the sports of the circus and amphitheater, the combat of gladiators, and the hunting of wild beasts. The masters in every branch of learning, whom Marcus provided for his son, were heard with inattention and disgust, whilst the Moors and Parthians, who taught him to dart the javelin and shoot with the bow, found a disciple who delighted in his application, and soon equaled the most skillful of his instructors in the steadiness of the eye and dexterity of the hand. The servile crowd, whose fortune depended on their master's vices, applauded these ignoble pursuits. The perfidious voice of flattery reminded him that, by exploits of the same nature, by the defeat of the Nemean lion and the slaughter of the wild boar of Arimanthus, the Grecian Hercules had acquired a place among the gods and an immortal memory among men. They only forgot to observe that, in the first ages of society, when the fiercer animals often dispute with man the possession of an unsettled country, a successful war against these savages is one of the most innocent and beneficial labors of heroism. In the civilized state of the Roman Empire, the wild beasts had long since retired from the face of man and the neighborhood of populous cities. To surprise them in their solitary haunts, and to transport them to Rome, that they might be slain in pomp by the hand of an emperor, was an enterprise equally ridiculous for the prince and oppressive for the people. Ignorant of these distinctions, Commodus eagerly embraced the glorious resemblance, and styled himself, as we still read on his medals, the Roman Hercules. The club and the lion's hide were placed by the sign of the throne amongst the ensigns of sovereignty, and statues were erected, in which Commodus were rep was represented in the character and with the attributes of the god, whose valor and dexterity he endeavored to emulate in the daily course of his ferocious amusements. Elated with these praises, which gradually extinguished the innate sense of shame, Commodus resolved to exhibit, before the eyes of the Roman people, those exercises which till then he had decently confined within the walls of his palace, and the presence of a very few favorites. On the appointed day, the various motives of flattery, fear, and curiosity attracted to the amphitheater an innumerable multitude of spectators, and some degree of applause was deservedly bestowed on the uncommon skill of the imperial performer. Whether he aimed at the heart or head of the animal, 
the wound was alike certain and mortal. With arrows, whose point was shaped into the form of a crescent, Commodus often intercepted the rapid career and cut asunder the long, bony neck of the ostrich. A panther was let loose, and the archer waited till he had leapt upon a trembling malefactor. In the same instant, the shaft flew, and the beast dropped dead, and the man remained unhurt. The dens of the amphitheater disgorged at once a hundred lions. A hundred darts from the unerring hand of Commodus laid them dead as they ran, raging around the arena. Neither the huge bulk of the elephant nor the scaly hide of the rhinoceros could defend them from his stroke. Ethiopia and India yielded their most extraordinary productions, and several animals were slain in the amphitheater, which had only been seen in the representations of art, or perhaps of fancy. In all these exhibitions, the sharpest precautions were used to protect the person of the Roman Hercules from the desperate spring of any savage who might possibly disregard the dignity of the emperor and sanctity of the god. But the meanest of the populace were affected with shame and indignation when they beheld their sovereign enter the lists as a gladiator and professed glory in a profession which the laws and manners of the Romans had branded with the justest note of infamy. He chose the habit and arms of the Secutor, whose combat with the Retiarius formed one of the most lively scenes in the bloody sports of the amphitheater. The Secutor was armed with a helmet, sword, and buckler. His naked antagonist had only a large net and trident. With the one he endeavored to entangle, with the other to dispatch his enemy. If he missed the first throw, he was obliged to fly from the pursuit of the Secutor, to where he had prepared his net for a second cast. The emperor fought in this character 735 several times. These glorious achievements were carefully recorded in the public acts of the empire, and that he might omit no circumstance of infamy, he received from the common fund of gladiators a stipend so exorbitant that it became a new and most ignominious tax upon the Roman people. It may be easily supposed that in these entanglements the master of the world was always successful. In the amphitheater his victories were not often sanguinary, but when he exercised his skill in the school of gladiators, or in his own palace, his wretched antagonists were frequently honored with a mortal wound from the hand of Commodus, and obliged to seal their flattery with their blood. He now disdained the appellation of Hercules. The name of Paulus, a celebrated secutor, was the only one which delighted his ear. It was inscribed on his Colossus statues, and repeated in the redoubled acclamations of the mournful and applauding Senate. Claudius Pompeianus, the virtuous husband of Lucilla, was the only senator who asserted the honor of his rank. As a father, he permitted his sons to consult their safety by attending the amphitheater. As a Roman, he declared that his own life was in the emperor's hands, but that he would never behold the son of Marcus prostituting his person and dignity. Notwithstanding his manly resolution, Pompeianus escaped the resentment of the tyrant, and with his honor had the good fortune to preserve his life. Commodus had now attained the summit of vice and infamy. Amidst the acclamations of a flattering court, he was unable to disguise from himself that he deserved the contempt and hatred of every man of sense and virtue in his empire. His ferocious spirit was irritated by the consciousness of that hatred, by the envy of every kind of merit, by the just apprehension of danger, and by the habit of slaughter which he contracted in his daily amusements. History has preserved a long list of consular senators sacrificed to his wanton suspicion, which sought out, with peculiar anxiety, those unfortunate persons connected, however remotely, with the family of the Antonines, without sparing even the ministers of his crimes or pleasures. His cruelty proved at last fatal to himself, he had shed with impunity the noblest blood of Rome. He perished as soon as he was dreaded by his own domestics. Marcia, his favorite concubine, Electus, his chamberlain, and Lytus, his praetorian prefect, alarmed by the fate of their companions and predecessors, resolved to prevent the destruction which every hour hung over their heads, either from the mad caprice of the tyrant or the sudden indignation of the people. Marcia seized the occasion by presenting a draught of wine to her lover, after he had fatigued himself with hunting some wild beasts. Commodus retired to sleep, but whilst he was laboring with the effects of poison and drunkenness, a robust youth, by profession a wrestler, entered his chamber and strangled him without resistance. 
the body was secretly conveyed out of the palace, before the least suspicion was entertained in the city, or even in the court of the emperor's death. Such was the fate of the son of Marcus, and so easy was it to destroy a hated tyrant, who, by the artificial powers of government, had oppressed, during thirteen years, so many millions of subjects, every one of whom was equal to their master in personal strength and personal abilities. The measures of the conspirators were conducted with the deliberate coolness and celerity which the greatness of the occasion required. They resolved instantly to fill the vacant throne with an emperor whose character would justify and maintain the action that had been committed. They fixed on Pertinax, prefect of the city, an ancient senator of consular rank, whose conspicuous merit had broke through the obscurity of his birth and raised him to the first honors of the state. He had successfully governed most of the provinces of the empire, and in all of his great employments, military as well as civil, he had uniformly distinguished himself by the firmness, the prudence, and the integrity of his conduct. He now remained almost alone of the friends and ministers of Marcus, and when, at the late hour of the night, he was awakened with the news that the chamberlain and prefect were at his door, he received them with intrepid resignation, and desired that they would execute their master's orders. Instead of death, they offered him the throne of the Roman world. During some moments he distrusted their intentions and assurances. Convinced at length of the death of Commodus, he accepted the purple with sincere reluctance, the natural effect of his knowledge both of the duties and of the dangers of the supreme rank. Lytus conducted without delay the new emperor to the camp of the Praetorians, diffusing at the same time through the city a seasonable report that Commodus died suddenly of an apoplexy, and that the virtuous Perthanax had already succeeded to the throne. The guards were rather surprised than pleased with the suspicious death of a prince whose indulgence and liberality they alone had experienced. But the emergency of the occasion, the authority of the prefect, the reputation of Pertinax, and the clamors of the people, obliged them to stifle their secret discontents, to accept the donative promised by the new emperor, to swear allegiance to him, and, with joyful acclamations and laurels in their hands, to conduct him to the Senate House, that the military consent might be ratified by the civil authority. This important night was now far spent. With the dawn of day and the commencement of the new year, the senators expected a summons to attend an ignominious ceremony. In spite of all remonstrances, even those of his creatures who had not yet preserved any regard for prudence or decency, Commodus had resolved to pass the night in the gladiator's school, and from thence to take possession of the consulship, in the habit and with the attendance of that infamous crew. On a sudden, before the break of day, the Senate was called together in the Temple of Concord to meet the guards and to ratify the election of a new emperor. For a few minutes they sat in silent suspense, doubtful of their unexpected deliverance, and suspicious that the cruel artifices of Commodus. But when at length they were assured that the tyrant was no more, they resigned themselves to all the transports of joy and indignation. Pertinax, who modestly represented the meanness of his extraction, pointed out several noble senators more deserving than himself of the empire, was constrained by their dutiful violence to ascend the throne and receive all the titles of imperial power, confirmed by the most sincere vows of fidelity. The memory of Commodus was branded with internal infamy. The names of tyrant, of gladiator, of public enemy resounded in every corner of the house. They decreed in tumultuous votes that his honor should be reversed, his titles erased from the public monuments, his statues thrown down, his body dragged with a hook into the stripping room of the gladiators to satiate the public fury, and they even expressed some indignation about those officious servants who had already presumed to screen his remains from the justice of the Senate. But Pertinax could not refuse those last rites to the memory of Marcus and the fears of his first protector, Claudius Pompeianus, who lamented the cruel fate of his brother-in-law, and lamented still more that he had deserved it. These effusions of impotent rage against the dead emperor, whom the Senate had flattered when alive with the most abject servility, betrayed a just but ungenerous spirit of revenge. The legality of these decrees was, however, supported by the principles of the imperial constitution. To censure, to depose, or to punish with death, the first magistrate of the Republic, who had abused his delegated trust, was the ancient and undoubted prerogative of the Roman Senate. 
but that feeble assembly was obliged to content itself with inflicting on a fallen tyrant that public justice from which, during his life and reign, he had been shielded by the strong arm of military despotism. Pertinax found a nobler way of condemning his predecessor's memory, by the contrast of his own virtues with the vices of Commodus. On the day of his ascension, he resigned over to his wife and son his whole private fortune, that they might have no pretense to solicit favors at the expense of the state. He refused to flatter the vanity of the former with the title of Augusta, or to corrupt the inexperienced youth of the latter by the rank of Caesar. Accurately distinguishing between the duties of a parent and those of a sovereign, he educated his son with a severe simplicity, which, while it gave him no assured prospect of the throne, might in time have rendered him worthy of it. In public, the behavior of Pertinax was grave and affable. He lived with the virtuous part of the Senate, and, in a private station, he had been acquainted with the true character of each individual. Without either pride or jealousy, considered them as friends and companions, with whom he shared the dangers of the tyranny, and with whom he wished to enjoy the security of the present time. He very frequently invited them to familiar entertainments, the frugality of which was ridiculed by those who remembered and regretted the luxurious prodigality of Commodus. To heal, as far as it was possible, the wounds inflicted by the hands of tyranny was the pleasing but melancholy task of Pertinax. The innocent victims who yet survived were recalled from exile, released from prison, and restored to the full possession of their honors and fortunes. The unburied bodies of murdered senators, for the cruelty of Commodus endeavored to extend itself beyond death, were deposited in the sepulchres of their ancestors. The memories were justified, and every consolation was bestowed on their ruined and afflicted families. Among these consolations, one of the most grateful was the punishment of the delators, the common enemies of their master, of virtue, and of their country. Yet, in the inquisition of these legal assassins, Pertinex proceeded with a steady temper which gave everything to justice and nothing to popular prejudice and resentment. The finances of the state demanded the most vigilant care of the emperor, though every measure of injustice and extortion had been adopted which could collect the property of the subject into the coffers of the prince, the rapaciousness of Commodus had been so very inadequate to his extravagance that, upon his death, no more than eight thousand pounds were found in the exhausted treasury, to defray the current expenses of government, and to discharge the pressing demand of a liberal donative, which the new emperor had been obliged to promise to the Praetorian guards. Yet, under these distressed circumstances, Pertinax had the generous firmness to remit all the oppressive taxes invented by Commodus, and to cancel all the unjust claims of the treasury, declaring, in a decree of the Senate, that he was better satisfied to administer a poor republic with innocence than to acquire riches by the ways of tyranny and dishonor. Economy and industry he considered as the pure and genuine sources of wealth, and from them he soon derived a copious supply for the public necessities. The expense of the household was immediately reduced to one half. All the instruments of luxury, Pertinax exposed to public auction. Gold and silver plate, chariots of a singular construction, a superfluous wardrobe of silk and embroidery, and a great number of beautiful slaves of both sexes, excepting only and with attentive humanity those who were born in a state of freedom, and had been ravished from the arms of their weeping parents. At the same time that he obliged the worthless favorites of the tyrant to resign a part of their ill-gotten wealth, he satisfied the just creditors of the state, and unexpectedly discharged the long arrears of honest services. He removed the oppressive restrictions that had been laid upon commerce, and granted all the uncultivated lands in Italy and the provinces to those who would improve them, with an exemption from tribute during the term of ten years. Such an uniform conduct had already secured to Pertinax the noblest reward of a sovereign, the love and esteem of his people. Those who remembered the virtues of Marcus were happy to contemplate in their new emperor the features of that bright original, and flattered themselves that they should long enjoy the benign influence of his administration. A hasty zeal to reform the corrupted state, accompanied with less prudence than might have been expected from the years and experience of Pertinax, proved fatal to himself and to his country. His honest indiscretion united against him the servile crowd, who found their private benefit in the public disorders, and who preferred the favor of a tyrant to the inexorable equality of the laws. Amidst the general joy, the sullen and angry countenance of the Praetorian guards betrayed their inward dissatisfaction. They had reluctantly submitted to Pertinax, 
they dreaded the strictness of the ancient discipline, which he was preparing to restore, and they regretted the license of the former reign. Their discontents were secretly fomented by Lytus, their prefect, who found, when it was too late, that his new emperor would reward a servant, but would not be ruled by a favorite. On the third day of his reign, the soldiers seized on a noble senator, with a design to carry him to the camp and to invest him with the imperial purple. Instead of being dazzled by the dangerous honor, the affrighted victim escaped from the violence, and took refuge at the feet of Pertinax. A short time afterwards, Socius Falco, one of the consuls of the year, a rash youth, but of an ancient and opulent family, listened to the voice of ambition, and a conspiracy was formed during a short absence of Pertinax, which was crushed by a sudden return to Rome and his resolute behavior. Falco was on the point of being justly condemned to death as a public enemy, had he not been saved by the earnest and sincere entreaties of the injured emperor, who conjured the senate that the purity of his reign might not be stained by the blood even of a guilty senator. These disappointments served only to irritate the rage of the Praetorian guards. On the 28th of March, 86 days only after the death of Commodus, a general sedition broke out in camp, which the officers wanted either power or inclination to suppress. Two or three hundred of the most desperate soldiers marched at noonday, with arms in their hands and fury in their looks, towards the imperial palace. The gates were thrown open by their companions upon guard, and by the domestics of the old court, who had already formed a secret conspiracy against the life of the too virtuous emperor. On the news of their approach, Pertinax, disdaining either flight or concealment, advanced to meet his assassins, and recalled to their minds his own innocence and the sanctity of the recent oath. For a few moments they stood in silent suspense, ashamed of their atrocious design, and awed by the venerable aspect and majestic firmness of their sovereign, till at length, the despair of pardon reviving their fury, a barbarian of the country of Tongres leveled the first blow against Pertinax, who was instantly dispatched with a multitude of wounds. His head, separated from his body and placed on a lance, was carried in triumph to the Praetorian camp in the sight of a mournful and indignant people, who lamented the unworthy fate of that insolent prince and the transient blessings of a reign, the memory of which can serve only to aggravate their approaching misfortunes. End of chapter 4, part 2「Chapter 5, Part 1 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1, by Edward Gibbon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 5, Sale of the Empire to Didius Julianus. Part 1. The power of the sword is more sensibly felt in an extensive monarchy than in a small community. It has been calculated by the ablest politicians that no state, without being soon exhausted, can maintain above the hundredth part of its members in arms and idleness. But, although this relative proportion may be uniform, the influence of the army over the rest of the society will vary according to the degree of its positive strength. The advantages of military science and discipline cannot be exerted unless a proper number of soldiers are united into one body and actuated by one soul. With a handful of men such union would be ineffectual. With an unwieldy host it would be impracticable, and the powers of the machine would be alike destroyed by the extreme minuteness or the excessive weight of its springs. To illustrate this observation, we need only reflect that there is no superiority of natural strength, artificial weapons, or acquired skill, which would enable one man to keep in constant subjection one hundred of his fellow creatures. The tyrant of a single town or a small district would soon discover that a hundred armed followers were a weak defence against ten thousand peasants or citizens but a hundred thousand well-disciplined soldiers will command, with despotic sway, ten millions of subjects, and a body of ten or fifteen thousand guards will strike terror into the most numerous populace that ever crowded the streets of an immense capital. The Praetorian bands whose licentious fury 
was the first symptom and cause of the decline of the Roman Empire, scarcely amounted to the last mentioned number. They derived their institution from Augustus, that crafty tyrant, sensible that laws might colour, but that arms alone could maintain his usurped dominion, had gradually formed this powerful body of guards, in constant readiness to protect his person, to awe the senate, and either to prevent or to crush the first motions of rebellion. He distinguished these favoured troops by a double pay and superior privileges, but as their formidable aspect would at once have alarmed and irritated the Roman people, three cohorts only were stationed in the capital, whilst the remainder was dispersed in the adjacent towns of Italy. But after fifty years of peace and servitude, Tiberius ventured on a decisive measure which for ever riveted the fetters of his country. Under the fair pretences of relieving Italy from the heavy burden of military quarters, and of introducing a stricter discipline among the guards, he assembled them at Rome in a permanent camp, which was fortified with skilful care, and placed on a commanding situation. Such formidable servants are always necessary, but often fatal to the throne of despotism by thus introducing the Praetorian guards, as it were, into the palace and the senate, the emperors taught them to perceive their own strength and the weakness of the civil government, to view the vices of their master with familiar contempt, and to lay aside that reverential awe which distance only and mystery can preserve toward an imaginary power. In the luxurious idleness of an opulent city, their pride was nourished by the sense of their irresistible weight, nor was it possible to conceal from them that the person of the sovereign, the authority of the senate, the public treasure, and the seat of empire were all in their hands. To divert the praetorian bands from these dangerous reflections, the firmest and best established princes were obliged to mix blandishments with commands, rewards with punishments, to flatter their pride, indulge their pleasures, connive at their irregularities, and to purchase their precarious faith by a liberal donative, which, since the elevation of Claudius, was enacted as a legal claim on the accession of every new emperor. The advocate of the guards endeavoured to justify by arguments the power which they asserted by arms, and to maintain that, according to the purest principles of the constitution, their consent was essentially necessary in the appointment of an emperor. The election of consuls, of generals, and of magistrates, however it had been recently usurped by the senate, was the ancient and undoubted right of the Roman people. But where was the Roman people to be found? Not surely amongst the mixed multitude of slaves and strangers that filled the streets of Rome. A servile populace, as devoid of spirit, as destitute of property, the defenders of the state, selected from the flower of the Italian youth, and trained in the exercise of arms and virtue, were the genuine representatives of the people, and the best entitled to elect the military chief of the republic. These assertions, however defective in reason, became unanswerable when the fierce Praetorians increased their weight by throwing, like the barbarian conqueror of Rome, their swords into the scale. The Praetorians had violated the sanctity of the throne by the atrocious murder of Pertinax. They dishonoured the majesty of it by their subsequent conduct. The camp was without a leader, for even the perfect Cletius, who had excited the tempest, prudently declined the public indignation. Amidst the wild disorder, Sulpicianus, the emperor's father-in-law and governor of the city, who had been sent to the camp on the first alarm of mutiny, was endeavouring to calm the fury of the multitude when he was silenced by the clamorous return of the murderers, bearing on a lance the head of Pertinax. Though history has accustomed us to observe every principle and every passion, yielding to the imperious dictates of ambition, it is scarcely credible that in these moments of horror Sulpicianus should have aspired to ascend a throne polluted with the recent blood of so near a relation, and so excellent a prince. He had already begun to use the only effectual argument, and to treat from the imperial dignity. 
but the more prudent of the Praetorians, apprehensive that in this private contract they should not obtain a just price for so valuable a commodity, ran out upon the ramparts, and with a loud voice proclaimed that the Roman world was to be disposed of to the best bidder by public auction. This infamous offer, the most insolent excess of military license, diffused a universal grief, shame, and indignation throughout the city. It reached at length the ears of Didius Julianus, a wealthy senator, who, regardless of the public calamities, was indulging himself in the luxury of the table. His wife and his daughter, his freedman and his parasites, easily convinced him that he deserved the throne and earnestly conjured him to embrace so fortunate an opportunity. The vain old man hastened to the Praetorian camp, where Sulpicianus was still in treaty with the guards, and began to bid against him from the foot of the rampart. The unworthy negotiation was transacted by faithful emissaries, who passed, alternately, from one candidate to the other, and acquainted each of them with the offers of his rival. Sulpicianus had already promised a donative of five thousand drachmas, above one hundred and six pounds, to each soldier, when Julian, eager for the prize, rose at once to the sum of six thousand two hundred and fifty drachmas, or upwards of two hundred pounds sterling. The gates of the camp were instantly thrown open to the purchaser. He was declared emperor, and received an oath of allegiance from the soldiers, who retained humanity enough to stipulate that he should pardon and forget the competition of Sulpicianus. It was now incumbent on the Praetorians to fulfil the conditions of the sale. They placed their new sovereign, whom they served and despised, in the centre of their ranks, surrounded him on every side with their shields, and conducted him in close order of battle through the deserted streets of the city. The Senate was commanded to assemble, and those who had been the distinguished friends of Pertinax, or the personal enemies of Julian, found it necessary to effect a more than common share of satisfaction at this happy revolution. After Julian had filled the Senate House with armed soldiers, he expatiated on the freedom of his election, his own eminent virtues, and his full assurance of the affections of the Senate. The obsequious assembly congratulated their own, and the public felicity engaged their allegiance and conferred on him all the several branches of the imperial power. From the senate Julian was conducted by the same military procession to take possession of the palace. The first objects that struck his eyes were the abandoned trunk of Pertinax and the frugal entertainment prepared for his supper. The one he viewed with indifference, the other with contempt. A magnificent feast was prepared by his order, and he amused himself till a very late hour with dice, and the performance of Pylades, a celebrated dancer. Yet it was observed that after the group of flatterers dispersed, and left him to darkness, solitude, and terrible reflection, he passed a sleepless night revolving most probably in his own mind his own rash folly, the fate of his virtuous predecessor, and the doubtful and dangerous tenure of an empire which had not been acquired by merit, but purchased by money. He had reason to tremble. On the throne of the world he found himself, without a friend, and even without an adherent. The guards themselves were ashamed of the prince, whom their avarice had persuaded them to accept. Nor was there a citizen who did not consider his elevation with horror as the last insult on the Roman name. The nobility, whose conspicuous station and ample possessions exacted the strictest caution, dissembled their sentiments, and met the affected civility of the emperor with smiles of complacency and professions of duty. But the people secure in their numbers and obscurity, gave a free vent to their passions. The streets and public places of Rome resounded with clamours and imprecations. The enraged multitude affronted the person of Julian, rejected his liberality, and conscious of the impotence of their own resentment, 
they called aloud on the legions of the frontiers to assert the violated majesty of the Roman Empire. The public discontent was soon diffused from the centre to the frontiers of the empire. The armies of Britain, of Syria, and of Illyricum lamented the death of Pertinax, in whose company or under whose command they had so often fought and conquered. They received with surprise, with indignation, and perhaps with envy, the extraordinary intelligence that the Praetorians had disposed of the empire by public auction, and they sternly refused to ratify the ignominious bargain. Their immediate and unanimous revolt was fatal to Julian, but it was fatal at the same time to the public peace. As the generals of the respective armies, Clodius, Albinus, Phasenius, Niger, and Septimius, Severus, were still more anxious to succeed than to revenge the murdered Pertinax. Their forces were exactly balanced. Each of them was at the head of three legions, with a numerous train of auxiliaries, and however different in their characters, they were all soldiers of experience and capacity. Clodius Albinus, governor of Britain, surpassed both his competitors in the nobility of his extraction which he derived from some of the most illustrious names of the old empire. But the branch from which he claimed his descent was sunk into mean circumstances, and transplanted into a remote province. It is difficult to form a just idea of his true character. Under the philosophic cloak of austerity, he stands accused of concealing most of the vices which degrade human nature. But his accusers are those venal writers who adored the fortune of Severus, and trampled on the ashes of an unsuccessful rival. Virtue, or the appearances of virtue, recommended Albinus to the confidence and good opinion of Marcus, and his preserving with the son the same interest which he had acquired with the father, is a proof at least that he was possessed of a very flexible disposition. The favour of a tyrant does not always suppose a want of merit in the object of it, he may, without attending it, reward a man of worth and ability, or he may find such a man useful to his own service. It does not appear that Albinus served the son of Marcus, either as the minister of his cruelties, or even as the associate of his pleasures. He was employed in a distant, honourable command. When he received a confidential letter from the emperor, acquainting him of the treasonable designs of some discontented generals, and authorising him to declare himself the guardian and successor of the throne, by assuming the title and ensigns of Caesar, the governor of Britain wisely declined the dangerous honour, which would have marked him for the jealousy, or involved him in the approaching ruin of Commodus. He courted power by nobler, or at least by more specious arts. On a premature report of the death of the emperor, he assembled his troops, and in an eloquent discourse, deplored the inevitable mischiefs of despotism, described the happiness and glory which their ancestors had enjoyed under the consular government, and declared his firm resolution to reinstate the Senate and people in their legal authority. This popular harangue was answered by the loud acclamations of the British legions, and received at Rome with a secret murmur of applause. Safe in the possession of his little world, and in the command of an army less distinguished indeed for discipline than for numbers and valour, Albinus braved the menaces of Commodus, maintained towards Pertinax a stately ambiguous reserve, and instantly declared against the usurpation of Julian. The convulsions of the capital added new weight to his sentiments, or rather to his professions of patriotism. A regard to decency induced him to decline the lofty titles of Augustus and Emperor, and he imitated perhaps the example of Galba, who on a similar occasion had styled himself the lieutenant of the Senate and people. Personal merit alone had raised Persenius Niger from an obscure birth and station to the government of Syria, a lucrative and important command, which in times of civil confusion gave him a near prospect of the throne. Yet his part seemed to have been better suited to the second than to the first rank. He was an unequal rival, though he might have proved himself an excellent lieutenant to Severus, 
who afterwards displayed the greatness of his mind by adopting several useful institutions from a vanquished enemy. In his government, Niger acquired the esteem of the soldiers and the love of the provincials. His rigid discipline fortified the valour and confirmed the obedience of the former, while the voluptuous Syrians were less delighted with the mild firmness of his administration than with the affability of his manners, and the apparent pleasure with which he attended their frequent and pompous festivals. As soon as the intelligence of the atrocious murder of Pertinax had reached Antioch, the wishes of Asia invited Niger to assume the imperial purple and revenge his death. The legions of the eastern frontier embraced his cause. The opulent but unarmed provinces from the frontiers of Ethiopia to the Hadriatic cheerfully submitted to his power, and the kings beyond the Tigris and the Euphrates congratulated his election and offered him their homage and services. The mind of Niger was not capable of receiving this sudden tide of fortune. He flattered himself that his accession would be undisturbed by competition and unstained by civil blood, and whilst he enjoyed the vain pomp of triumph, he neglected to secure the means of victory. Instead of entering into an effectual negotiation with the powerful armies of the West, whose resolution might decide, or at least must balance, the mighty contest, Instead of advancing without delay towards Rome and Italy, where his presence was impatiently expected, Niger trifled away in the luxury of Antioch those irretrievable moments, which were diligently improved by the decisive activity of Severus. The country of Pannonia and Dalmatia, which occupied the space between the Danube and the Hadriatic, was one of the last and most difficult conquests of the Romans. In the defence of national freedom, Two hundred thousand of these barbarians had once appeared in the field, alarmed the declining age of Augustus, and exercised the vigilant prudence of Tiberius, at the head of the collected force of the empire. The Pannonians yielded at length to the arms and institutions of Rome. Their recent subjection, however, the neighbourhood and even the mixture of the unconquered tribes, and perhaps the climate, adapted, as it has been observed, to the production of great bodies and slow minds, all contributed to preserve some remains of their original ferocity, and under the tame and uniform countenance of Roman provincials, the hardy features of the natives were still to be discerned. Their warlike youth afforded an exhaustible supply of recruits to the legions stationed on the banks of the Danube, and which from a perpetual warfare against the Germans and Samazons were deservedly esteemed the best troops in the service. The Pannonian army was at this time commanded by Septimius Severus, a native of Africa, who in the gradual ascent of private honours had concealed his daring ambition, which was never diverted from its steady course by the allurements of pleasure, the apprehension of danger, or the feelings of humanity. On the first news of the murder of Pertinax, he assembled his troops, painted in the most lively colours the crime, the insolence, and the weakness of the Praetorian guards, and animated the legions to arms and to revenge. He concluded, and the peroration was thought extremely eloquent, with promising every soldier about four hundred pounds, an honourable donative, double in value to the infamous bribe with which Julian had purchased the empire. The acclamations of the army immediately saluted Severus, with the names of Augustus, Pertinax, and Emperor, and he thus attained the lofty station to which he was invited, by conscious merit and a long train of dreams and omens, the fruitful offsprings, either of his superstition or policy. The new candidate for empire saw and improved the peculiar advantage of his situation. His province extended to the Julian Alps, which gave an easy access into Italy, and he remembered the saying of Augustus, that a Pannonian army might in ten days appear in sight of Rome. By a celerity, proportioned to the greatness of the occasion, he might reasonably hope to revenge Pertinax, punish Julian, and receive the homage of the Senate and people as their lawful emperor, before his competitors, separated from Italy by an immense tract of sea and land, were apprised of his success. 
or even of his election. During the whole expedition, he scarcely allowed himself any moments for sleep or food. Marching on foot and in complete armour at the head of his columns, he insinuated himself into the confidence and affection of his troops, pressed their diligence, revived their spirits, animated their hopes, and was well satisfied to share the hardships of the meanest soldier, whilst he kept in view the infinite superiority of his reward. The wretched Julian had expected and thought himself prepared to dispute the empire with the governor of Syria. But in the invincible and rapid approach of the Pannonian legions, he saw his inevitable ruin. The hasty arrival of every messenger increased his just apprehensions. He was successively informed that Severus had passed the Alps, that the Italian cities, unwilling or unable to oppose his progress, had received him with the warmest professions of joy and duty, that the important place of Ravenna had surrendered without resistance, and that the Hadriatic fleet was in the hands of the conqueror. The enemy was now within two hundred and fifty miles of Rome, and every moment diminished the narrow span of life and empire allotted to Julian. He attempted, however, to prevent, or at least to protract, his ruin. He implored the venal faith of the Praetorians, filled the city with unavailing preparations for war, drew lines round the suburbs, and even strengthened the fortifications of the palace, as if those last entrenchments could be defended, without hope of relief against the victorious invader. Fear and shame prevented the guards from deserting his standard, but they trembled at the name of the Pannonian legions, commanded by an experienced general, and accustomed to vanquish the barbarians on the frozen Danube. They quitted with a sigh the pleasures of the baths and theatres, to put on arms whose use they had almost forgotten, and beneath the weight of which they were oppressed. The unpractised elephants, whose uncouth appearance, it was hoped, would strike terror into the army of the north through their unskilful riders, and the awkward evolutions of the marines, drawn from the fleet of Mycenaeum, were an object of ridicule to the populace, whilst the senate enjoyed with secret pleasure the distress and weakness of the usurper. Every motion of Julian betrayed his trembling perplexity. He insisted that Severus should be declared a public enemy by the Senate. He entreated that the Pannonian general might be associated to the empire. He sent public ambassadors of consular rank to negotiate with his rival. He dispatched private assassins to take away his life. He designed that the Vestal Virgins and all the colleges of priests, in their sacerdotal habits, and bearing before them the sacred pledges of the Roman religion, should advance in solemn procession to meet the Pannonian legions, and at the same time he vainly tried to interrogate or to appease the fates by magic ceremonies and unlawful sacrifices. End of chapter 5, part 1「5, Part 2 of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sale of the Empire to Didius Julianus, Part 2. Severus, who dreaded neither his arms nor his enchantments, guarded himself from the only danger of secret conspiracy, by the faithful attendance of six hundred chosen men, who never quitted his person or their cuirasses, either by night or by day, during the whole march. Advancing with a steady and rapid course, he passed, without difficulty, the defiles of the Apennine, received into his party the troops and ambassadors sent to retard his progress, and made a short halt at Interamnia, about seventy miles from Rome, his victory was already secure, but the despair of the Praetorians might have rendered it bloody, and Severus had the laudable ambition of ascending the throne without drawing his sword. His emissaries, dispersed in the capital, assured the guards that, provided they would abandon their worthless prince, 
and the perpetrators of the murder of Pertinax to the justice of the conqueror, he would no longer consider that melancholy event as the act of the whole body, the faithless Praetorians, whose resistance was supported only by sullen obstinacy, gladly complied with the easy conditions, seized the greatest part of the assassins, and signified to the Senate that they no longer defended the cause of Julian. That assembly, convoked by the consul, unanimously acknowledged Severus as lawful emperor, decreed divine honours to Pertinax, and pronounced a sentence of deposition and death against his unfortunate successor. Julian was conducted into a private apartment of the baths of the palace, and beheaded as a common criminal, after having purchased, with an immense treasure, an anxious and precarious reign of only sixty-six days. The almost incredible expedition of Severus, who in so short a space of time conducted a numerous army from the banks of the Danube to those of the Tiber, proves at once the plenty of provisions, provided by agriculture and commerce, the goodness of the roads, the discipline of the legions, and the indolent, subdued temper of the provinces. The first cares of Severus were bestowed on two measures, the one dictated by policy, the other by decency, the revenge and the honours due to the memory of Pertinax. Before the new emperor entered Rome, he issued his commands to the Praetorian guards, directing them to wait his arrival on a large plain near the city, without arms, but in the habits of ceremony, in which they were accustomed to attend their sovereign. He was obeyed by those haughty troops, whose contrition was the effect of their just terrors. A chosen part of the Illyrian army encompassed them with levelled spears. Incapable of flight or resistance, they expected their fate in silent consternation. Severus mounted the tribunal, sternly reproached them with perfidy and cowardice, dismissed them with ignominy from the trust which they had betrayed, despoiled them of their splendid ornaments, and banished them on pain of death to the distance of a hundred miles from the capital. During the transaction, another detachment had been sent to seize their arms, occupy their camp, and prevent the hasty consequences of their despair. The funeral and consecration of Pertinax was next solemnized with every circumstance of sad magnificence. The Senate, with a melancholy pleasure, performed the last rites to that excellent prince, whom they had loved and still regretted. The concern of his successor was probably less sincere. He esteemed the virtues of Pertinax, but those virtues would forever have confined his ambition to a private station. Severus pronounced his funeral oration with studied eloquence, inward satisfaction, and well-acted sorrow, and by this pious regard to his memory convinced the credulous multitude that he alone was worthy to supply his place. Sensible, however, that arms, not ceremonies, must assert his claim to the empire, he left Rome at the end of thirty days, and without suffering himself to be elated by this easy victory, prepared to encounter his more formidable rivals. The uncommon abilities and fortune of Severus have induced an elegant historian to compare him with the first and greatest of the Caesars. The parallel is at least imperfect. Where shall we find in the character of Severus the commanding superiority of soul, the generous clemency, and the various genius, which could reconcile and unite the love of pleasure, the thirst of knowledge, and the fire of ambition. In one instance only they may be compared, with some degree of propriety, in the celerity of their motions and their civil victories. In less than four years Severus subdued the riches of the East and the valour of the West. He vanquished two competitors of reputation and ability, and defeated numerous armies, provided with weapons and discipline equal to his own. In that age, the art of fortification and the principles of tactics were well understood by all the Roman generals, and the constant superiority of Severus was that of an artist, who uses the same instruments with more skill and industry than his rivals. 
I shall not, however, enter into a minute narrative of these military operations. But as the two civil wars against Niger and against Albinus were almost the same in their conduct, event, and consequences, I shall collect into one point of view the most striking circumstances tending to develop the character of the conqueror and the state of the empire. Falsehood and insincerity, unsuitable as they seem to the dignity of public transactions, offenders with a less degrading idea of meanness than when they are found in the intercourse of private life. In the latter they discover a want of courage, in the other only a defect of power, and as it is impossible for the most able statesmen to subdue millions of followers and enemies by their own personal strength, the world under the name of policy seems to have granted them a very liberal indulgence of craft and dissimulation. Yet the arts of Severus cannot be justified by the most ample privileges of state reason. He promised only to betray, he flattered only to ruin, and however he might occasionally bind himself by oaths and treaties, his conscience, obsequious to his interest, always released him from the inconvenient obligation. If his two competitors, reconciled by their common danger, had advanced upon him without delay, perhaps Severus would have sunk under their united effort. Had they even attacked him at the same time, with separate views and separate armies, the contest might have been long and doubtful. But they fell, singly and successively, an easy prey to the arts as well as arms of their subtle enemy, lulled into security by the moderation of his professions, and overwhelmed by the rapidity of his action. He first marched against Niger, whose reputation and power he the most dreaded. But he declined any hostile declarations, suppressed the name of his antagonist, and only signified to the Senate and people his intention of regulating the eastern provinces. In private he spoke of Niger, his old friend and intended successor, with the most affectionate regard, and highly applauded his generous design of revenging the murder of Pertinax. To punish the vile usurper of the throne was the duty of every Roman general. To persevere in arms and to resist a lawful emperor acknowledged by the Senate, would alone render him criminal. The sons of Niger had fallen into his hands among the children of the provincial governors, detained at Rome as pledges for the loyalty of their parents. As long as the power of Niger inspired terror, or even respect, they were educated with the most tender care, with the children of Severus himself. But they were soon involved in their father's ruin, and removed first by exile, and afterwards by death, from the eye of public compassion. While Severus was engaged in his eastern war, he had reason to apprehend that the governor of Britain might pass the sea and the Alps, occupy the vacant seat of empire, and oppose his return with the authority of the Senate and the forces of the West. The ambiguous conduct of Albinus, in not assuming the imperial title, left room for negotiation. Forgetting at once his professions of patriotism and the jealousy of sovereign power, he accepted the precarious rank of Caesar as a reward for his fatal neutrality. Till the first contest was decided, Severus treated the man, whom he had doomed to destruction, with every mark of esteem and regard. Even in the letter in which he announced his victory over Niger, he styles Albinus the brother of his soul and empire, sends him the affectionate salutations of his wife Julia and his young family, and entreats him to preserve the armies and the republic faithful to their common interest. The messengers charged with this letter were instructed to accost the Caesar with respect, to desire a private audience and to plunge their daggers into his heart. The conspiracy was discovered, and the two credulous Albinus at length passed over to the continent, and prepared for an unequal contest with his rival, who rushed upon him at the head of a veteran and victorious army. The military labours 
of Severus seem inadequate to the importance of his conquests. Two engagements, the one near the Hellespont, the other in the narrow defiles of Cilicia, decided the fate of his Syrian competitor, and the troops of Europe asserted their usual ascendant of the effeminate natives of Asia. The Battle of Lyon, where one hundred and fifty thousand Romans were engaged, was equally fatal to Albinus. The valour of the British army maintained, indeed, a sharp and doubtful contest, with the hardy discipline of the Illyrian legions. The fame and person of Severus appeared during a few moments irrecoverably lost, till that warlike prince rallied his fainting troops and led them on to a decisive victory. The war was finished by that memorable day. The civil wars of modern Europe have been distinguished not only by the fierce animosity, but likewise by the obstinate perseverance of the contending factions. They have generally been justified by some principle, or at least coloured by some pretext of religion, freedom, or loyalty. The leaders were nobles of independent property and hereditary influence. The troops fought like men interested in the decision of the quarrel, and as military spirit and party zeal was strongly diffused throughout the whole community, a vanquished chief was immediately supplied with new adherents, eager to shed their blood in the same cause. But the Romans, after the fall of the Republic, combated only for the choice of masters. Under the standard of a popular candidate for empire, a few enlisted from affection, some from fear, many from interest, none from principle. The legions, uninflamed by party zeal, were allured into civil war by liberal donatives, and still more liberal promises. A defeat by disabling the chief from the performance of his engagements dissolved the mercenary allegiance of his followers, and left them to consult their own safety by a timely desertion of an unsuccessful cause. It was of little moment to the provinces under whose name they were oppressed or governed. They were driven by the impulsion of the present power, and as soon as that power yielded to a superior force, they hastened to implore the clemency of the conqueror, who, as he had an immense debt to discharge, was obliged to sacrifice the most guilty countries to the avarice of his soldiers. In the vast extent of the Roman Empire, there were few fortified cities capable of protecting a rooted army, nor was there any person or family or order of men whose natural interest, unsupported by the powers of government, was capable of restoring the cause of a sinking party. Yet in the contest between Niger and Severus, a single city deserves an honourable exception, as Byzantium was one of the greatest passages from Europe into Asia. It had been provided with a strong garrison, and a fleet of five hundred vessels was anchored in the harbour. The impetuosity of Severus disappointed this prudent scheme of defence. He left to his generals the siege of Byzantium, forced the less guarded passage of the Hellespont, and impatient of a meaner enemy, pressed forward to encounter his rival. Byzantium, attacked by a numerous and increasing army, and afterwards by the whole naval power of the empire, sustained a siege of three years, and remained faithful to the name and memory of Niger. The citizens and soldiers, we know not from what cause, were animated with equal fury. Several of the principal officers of Niger, who despaired of, or who disdained a pardon, had thrown themselves into this last refuge. The fortifications were esteemed impregnable, and in the defence of the place, a celebrated engineer displayed all the mechanic powers known to the ancients. Byzantium at length surrendered to famine. The magistrates and soldiers were put to the sword, the walls demolished, the privileges suppressed, and the destined capital of the East subsisted only as an open village, subject to the insulting jurisdiction of Perinthus. The historian Dion, who had admired the flourishing and lamented the desolate state of Byzantium, accused the revenge of Severus for depriving the Roman people of the strongest bulwark against the barbarians of Pontus and Asia. The truth of this observation was but too well justified in the succeeding age, when the Gothic fleets covered the Euxine, and passed through the undefined Bosphorus to the centre of the Mediterranean.
both Niger and Albinus were discovered and put to death in their flight from the field of battle. Their fate excited neither surprise nor compassion. They had staked their lives against the chance of empire, and suffered what they would have inflicted. Nor did Severus claim the arrogant superiority of suffering his rivals to live in a private station. But his unforgiving temper, stimulated by avarice, indulged a spirit of revenge, where there was no room for apprehension. The most considerable of the provincials, who, without any dislike to the fortunate candidate, had obeyed the governor under whose authority they were accidentally placed, were punished by death, exile, and especially by the confiscation of their estates. Many cities of the east were stripped of their ancient honours, and obliged to pay into the treasury of Severus four times the amount of the sums contributed by them for the service of Niger. Till the final decision of the war, the cruelty of Severus was in some measure restrained by the uncertainty of the event, and his pretended reverence for the senate. The head of Albinus, accompanied with a menacing letter, announced to the Romans that he was resolved to spare none of the adherents of his unfortunate competitors. He was irritated by the just suspicion that he had never possessed the affections of the Senate, and he concealed his old malevolence under the recent discovery of some treasonable correspondences. Thirty-five senators, however, accused of having favoured the party of Albinus, he freely pardoned, and by his subsequent behaviour, endeavoured to convince him that he had forgotten, as well as forgiven, their supposed offences. But at the same time he condemned forty-one other senators, whose names history has recorded, their wives, children, and clients, attended them in death. And the noblest provincials of Spain and Gaul were involved in the same ruin. Such rigid justice, for so he termed it, was, in the opinion of Severus, the only conduct capable of ensuring peace to the people, or stability to the prince, and he condescended slightly to lament that to be mild it was necessary that he should first be cruel. The true interest of an absolute monarch generally coincides with that of his people. Their numbers, their wealth, their order, and their security are the best and only foundations of his real greatness. And were he totally devoid of virtue, Prudence might supply its place, and would dictate the same rule of conduct. Severus considered the Roman Empire as his property, and had no sooner secured the possession than he bestowed his care on the cultivation and improvement of so valuable an acquisition. Salutary laws executed with inflexible firmness soon corrected most of the abuses with which, since the death of Marcus, every part of the government had been infected. In the administration of justice, the judgments of the emperor were characterized by attention, discernment, and impartiality. And whenever he deviated from the strict line of equity, it was generally in favor of the poor and oppressed. Not so much indeed from any sense of humanity, as from the natural propensity of a despot to humble the pride of greatness and to sink all his subjects to the same common level of absolute dependence. His expensive taste for building magnificent shows, and above all a constant and liberal distribution of corn and provisions, were the surest means of captivating the affection of the Roman people. The misfortunes of civil discord were obliterated. The clam of peace and prosperity was once more experienced in the provinces, and many cities, restored by the munificence of Severus, assumed the title of his colonies, and attested by public monuments their gratitude and felicity. The fame of the Roman arms was revived by that warlike and successful emperor, and he boasted with a just pride that having received the empire oppressed with foreign and domestic wars, he left it established in profound, universal, and honourable peace. Although the wounds of civil war appeared completely healed, its mortal poison still lurked in the vitals of the constitution. Severus possessed a considerable share of vigour and ability, 
but the daring soul of the first Caesar, or the deep policy of Augustus, was scarcely equal to the task of curbing the insolence of the victorious legions. By gratitude, by misguided policy, by seeming necessity, Severus was reduced to relax the nerves of discipline. The vanity of his soldiers was flattered with the honour of wearing gold rings. Their ease was indulged in the permission of living with their wives in the idleness of quarters. He increased their pay beyond the example of former times, and taught them to expect, and soon to claim, extraordinary donatives on every public occasion of danger or festivity. Elated by success, enervated by luxury, and raised above the level of subjects by their dangerous privileges, they soon became incapable of military fatigue, oppressive to the country, and impatient of a just subordination. Their officers asserted the superiority of rank by a more profuse and elegant luxury. There is still extant a letter of Severus lamenting the licentious stage of the army, and exhorting one of his generals to begin the necessary reformations from the tribunes themselves, since, as he justly observes, the officer who has forfeited the esteem will never command the obedience of his soldiers. Had the emperor pursued the train of reflection, he would have discovered that the primary cause of this general corruption might be ascribed not indeed to the example, but to the pernicious indulgence, however, of the commander-in-chief. The Praetorians who murdered their emperor and sold the empire had received the just punishment of their treason, but the necessary, though dangerous, institution of guards was soon restored on a new model by Severus, and increased to four times the ancient number. Formerly these troops had been recruited in Italy, and as the adjacent provinces gradually imbibed the softer manners of Rome, the levies were extended to Macedonia, Noricum, and Spain. In the room of these elegant troops, better adapted to the pomp of courts than to the uses of war, it was established by Severus that from all the legions of the frontiers, the soldiers most distinguished for strength, valour, and fidelity, should be occasionally drafted and promoted as an honour and reward into the more eligible service of the guards. By this new institution, the Italian youth were diverted from the exercise of arms, and the capital was terrified by the strange aspect and manners of a multitude of barbarians. But Severus flattered himself that the legions would consider these chosen praetorians as the representatives of the whole military order, and that the present aid of fifty thousand men, superior in arms and appointments to any force that could be brought into the field against them, would forever crush the hopes of rebellion, and secure the empire to himself and his posterity. The command of these favoured and formidable troops soon became the first office of the empire. As the government degenerated into military despotism, the Praetorian prefect, who in his origin had been a simple captain of the guards, was placed not only at the head of the army, but of the finances, and even of the law, in every department of administration he represented the person and exercised the authority of the emperor. The first prefect, who enjoyed and abused this immense power, was Plotianus, the favourite minister of Severus. His reign lasted above ten years, till the marriage of his daughter, with the eldest son of the emperor, which seemed to assure his fortune, proved the occasion of his ruin. The animosities of the palace, by irritating the ambition and alarming the fears of Plotinus, threatened to produce a revolution, and obliged the emperor, who still loved him, to consent with reluctance to his death. After the fall of Plotinus, an eminent lawyer, the celebrated Papinian, was appointed to execute the motley office of Praetorian prefect. Till the reign of Severus, the virtue, and even the good sense of the emperors, had been distinguished by the zeal, or affected reverence for the Senate, and by a tender regard to the nice frame of civil policy instituted by Augustus. But the youth of Severus had been trained in the implicit obedience of camps, 
and his riper years spent in the despotism of military command, his haughty and inflexible spirit could not discover, or would not acknowledge, the advantage of preserving an intermediate power, however imaginary, between the emperor and the army. He disdained to profess himself the servant of an assembly that detested his person, and trembled at his frown. He issued his commands, where his requests would have proved as effectual, assumed the conduct and style of a sovereign and a conqueror, and exercised without disguise the whole legislative, as well as the executive power. The victory over the Senate was easy and inglorious. Every eye and every passion were directed to the supreme magistrate, who possessed the arms and treasure of the state, whilst the Senate, neither elected by the people, nor guided by military force, nor animated by public spirit, rested its declining authority on the frail and crumbling basis of ancient opinion. The fine theory of a republic insensibly vanished, and made way for the more natural and substantial feelings of monarchy. As the freedom and honours of Rome were successively communicated to the provinces, in which the old government had been either unknown or was remembered with abhorrence, the tradition of republican maxims was gradually obliterated. The Greek historians of the age of the Antonines observe, with a malicious pleasure, that although the sovereign of Rome, in compliance with an obsolete prejudice, abstained from the name of king, he possessed the full measure of regal power. In the reign of Severus, the Senate was filled with polished and eloquent slaves from the eastern provinces, who justified personal flattery by speculative principles of servitude. These new advocates of prerogative were heard with pleasure by the court, and with patience by the people, when they inculcated the duty of passive obedience, and descanted on the inevitable mischiefs of freedom. The lawyers and historians concurred in teaching that the imperial authority was held not by the delegated commission, but by the irrevocable resignation of the senate, that the emperor was freed from the restraint of civil laws, could command by his arbitrary will the lives and fortunes of his subjects, and might dispose of the empire as of his private patrimony. The most eminent of the civil lawyers, and particularly Papinian, Paulus, and Uppian, flourished under the house of Severus, and the Roman jurisprudence, having closely united itself with the system of monarchy, was supposed to have attained its full majority and perfection. The contemporaries of Severus, in the enjoyment of the peace and glory of his reign, forgave the cruelties by which it had been introduced. Posterity, who experienced the fatal effects of his maxims and example, justly considered him as the principal author of the decline of the Roman Empire. End of chapter 5, part 2《Chapter Six, Part One of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Death of Severus, Tyranny of Caracalla, Usurpation of Macrinus, Follies of Elagalibus, Virtues of Alexander Severus, Licentiousness of the Army, General State of the Roman Finances, Tax and Tribute. The ascent to greatness, however steep and dangerous, may entertain an active spirit with the consciousness and exercise of its own powers, but the possession of a throne can never afford a lasting satisfaction to an ambitious mind. This melancholy truth was felt and acknowledged by Severus. Fortune and merit had, from an humble station, elevated him to the first place among mankind. He had been all things, as he said himself, and all was of little value. Distracted with the care, not of acquiring, but of preserving an empire, oppressed with age and infirmities, careless of fame, insatiated with power, all his prospects of life were closed. The desire of perpetuating the greatness of his family was the only remaining wish of his ambition and paternal tenderness. 
Like most Africans, Severus was passionately addicted to the vain studies of magic and divination, deeply versed in the interpretations of dreams and omens, and perfectly acquainted with the science of judicial astrology, which, in almost every age, except the present, has maintained its dominion over the mind of man. He had lost his first wife while he was governor of the Leonese Gaul. In the choice of a second, he sought only to connect himself with some favorite of fortune, and, as soon as he had discovered that a young lady of Emesa in Syria had a royal nativity, he solicited and obtained her hand. Julia Domna, for that was her name, deserved all that the stars could promise her. She possessed, even in an advanced age, the attractions of beauty, and united to a lively imagination, a firmness of mind, a strength of judgment, seldom bestowed on her sex. Her amiable qualities never made any deep impression on the dark and jealous temper of her husband. But, in her son's reign, she administered the principal affairs of the empire with a prudence that supported his authority, and with a moderation that sometimes corrected his wild extravagances. Julia applied herself to letters and philosophy, with some success, and with the most splendid reputation. She was the patroness of every art, and the friend of every man of genius. The grateful flattery of the learned had celebrated her virtues, but, if we may credit the scandal of ancient history, chastity was very far from being the most conspicuous virtue of the Empress Julia. Two sons, Caracula and Geta, was the fruit of her marriage, and the destined heirs of the empire. The fond hopes of the father, and of the Roman world, were soon disappointed by these vain youths, who displayed the indolent security of hereditary princes, and a presumption that fortune would supply the place of merit and application. Without any emulation of virtue or talents, they discovered, almost from their infancy, a fixed and implacable antipathy for each other. Their aversion, confirmed by years, and fermented by the arts of their interested favorites, broke out in childish and gradually in more serious competitions, and at length divided the theater, the circus, and the court into two factions, actuated by the hopes and fears of their respected leaders. The prudent emperor endeavored, by every expedient of advice and authority, to allay this growing animosity. The unhappy discord of his sons clouded all his prospects, and threatened to overturn a throne raised by so much labor, cemented with so much blood, and guarded with every defense of arms and treasure. With an impartial hand he maintained between them an exact balance of favor, conferred on both the rank of Augustus, and the revered name of Antoninus, and for the first time the Roman world beheld three emperors. Yet even this equal conduct served only to inflame the contest, whilst the fierce Caracula asserted the right of primogenitor, the milder Geta courted the affections of the people and the soldiers. In the anguish of a disappointed father, Severus foretold that the weaker of his sons would fall sac a sacrifice to the stronger, who in his turn would be ruined by his own vices. In these circumstances, the intelligence of a war in Britain, and of an invasion of the provinces by the barbarians of the north, was received with pleasure by Severus. Though the vigilance of his lieutenants might have been sufficient to repel the distant enemy, he resolved to embrace the honorable pretext of withdrawing his sons from the luxury of Rome, which enervated their minds and irritated their passions, and of ignoring their youth to the toils of war and government. Notwithstanding his advanced age, for he was about threescore, and his gout, which obliged him to be carried in a litter, he transported himself in person into that remote island, attended by his two sons, his whole court, and a formidable army. He immediately passed the walls of Hadrian and Antonidas, and entered the enemy's country, with the design of completing the long-attempted conquest of Britain. He penetrated to the northern extremity of the island without meeting an enemy, but the concealed ambuscades of the Caledonians, who hung unseen on the rear and flanks of his army, the coldness of the climate, and the severity of a winter march across the hills and morasses of Scotland, are reported to have cost the Romans above fifty thousand men. The Caledonians at length yielded to the powerful and obstinate attack, sued for peace, surrendered a part of their arms, and a large tract of territory. But their apparent submission lasted no longer than the present terror. As soon as the Roman legions had retired, they resumed their hostile independence. Their restless spirit provoked Severus to send a new army into Caledonia, with the most bloody orders not to subdue, but to extirpate the natives. They were saved by the death of their haughty enemy. 
This Caledonian war, neither marked by decisive events, nor attended with any important consequences, would ill deserve our attention, but it is supposed, not without a considerable degree of probability, that the invasion of Severus is connected with the most shining period of the British history or fable. Fingal, whose fame, with that of his heroes and bards, has been revived in our language by a recent publication, is said to have commanded the Caledonians in that memorable junction, to have eluded the power of Severus, and to have obtained a signal victory on the banks of the Karan, in which the son of the king of the world, Caracol, fled from his arms across the fields of his pride. Something of a doubtful myth still hangs over these highland traditions, nor can it be entirely dispelled by the most ingenious researches of modern criticism. But if we could, with safety, indulge the pleasing supposition that Fingal lived and that Ossian sung, the striking contrast of the situation and manners of the contending nations might amuse a philosophic mind. The parallel would be of little advantage to the more civilized people if we compare the unrelenting revenge of Severus with the generous clemency of Fingal, the timid and brutal cruelty of Caracalla, with the bravery, the tenderness, the elegant genius of Ossian, the mercenary chiefs who, for motives of fear or interest, served under the imperial standard, with the free-born warriors who started to arms at the voice of the king of the Morvan. If, in a word, we contemplated the untutored Caledonians, glowing with the warm virtues of nature, and the degenerate Romans, polluted with the mean vices of wealth and slavery. The declining health and illness of Severus inflamed the wild ambition and black passions of Caracalla's soul. Impatient of any delay or division of empire, he attempted more than once to shorten the small remainder of his father's days, and endeavored, but without success, to excite a mutiny among the troops. The old emperor had often censured the misguided lenity of Marcus, who, by a single act of justice, might have saved the Romans from the tyranny of his worthless son. Placed in the same situation, he experienced how easily the rigor of a judge dissolves away in the tenderness of a parent. He deliberated, he threatened, but he could not punish. And this last and only instance of mercy was more fatal to the empire than a long series of cruelty. The disorder of his mind irritated the pains of his body. He wished impatiently for death, and hastened the instant by his own impatience. He expired at York in the sixty-fifth year of his life, in the eighteenth of a glorious and successful reign. In his last moments, he recommended concord to his sons, and his sons to the army. The salutary advice never reached the heart, or even the understanding of the impetuous youths. But the more obedient troops, mindful of their oath of allegiance and the authority of their deceased master, resisted the solicitations of Caracalla, and proclaimed both brothers emperors of Rome. The new princes soon left the Caledonians in peace, returned to the capital, celebrated their father's funeral with divine honors, and were cheerfully acknowledged as lawful sovereigns by the Senate, the people, and the provinces. Some preeminence of rank seems to have been allowed to the elder brother, but they both administered the empire with equal and independent power. Such a divided former government would have proved a source of discord between the most affectionate brothers. It was impossible that it could long subsist between two implacable enemies, who neither desired nor can trust a reconciliation. It was visible that only one could reign, and the other must fall. And each of them, judging of his rival's designs by his own, guarded his life with the most jealous vigilance from the repeated attacks of poison or the sword. Their rapid journey through Gaul and Italy, during which they never ate at the same table or slept in the same house, displayed to the provinces the odious spectacle of fraternal discord. On their arrival at Rome, they immediately divided the vast extent of the imperial palace, no communication was allowed between their apartments. The doors and passages were digilently fortified, and guards were posted and relieved with the same strictness as in a besieged place. The emperors met only in public, in the presence of their afflicted mother, and each surrounded by a numerous train of armed followers. Even on these occasions of ceremony, the dissimulation of courts could ill disguise the rancor of their hearts. This latent civil war already distracted the whole government when a scheme was suggested that seemed of mutual benefit to the hostile brothers. It was proposed that, since it was impossible to reconcile their minds, they should separate their interest and divide the empire between them. The conditions of the treaty were already drawn with some accuracy. 
it was agreed that Caracalla, as the elder brother, should remain in possession of Europe and the western Africa, and that he should relinquish the sovereignty of Asia and Egypt to Geta, who might fix his residence at Alexandria or Antioch, cities little inferior to Rome itself in wealth and greatness, that numerous armies should be constantly encamped on either side of the Thracian Bosphorus to guard the frontiers of the rival monarchies, and that the senators of European extraction should acknowledge the sovereignty of Rome, whilst the natives of Asia followed the emperor of the East. The tears of the empress Julia interrupted the negotiation, the first idea of which filled every Roman breast with surprise and indignation. The mighty mass of conquest was so intimately connected by the hand of time and policy that it required the most forcible violence to rend it asunder. The Romans had reason to dread that the disjointed members would soon be reduced by a civil war under the dominion of one master. But, if the separation was permanent, the division of the provinces must terminate in the dissolution of an empire whose unity hitherto remained inviolate. Had the treaty been carried into execution, the sovereign of Europe might soon have been the conqueror of Asia. But Caracalla obtained an easier, though more guilty, victory. He artfully listened to his mother's entreaties, and consented to meet his brother in her apartment, on terms of peace and reconciliation. In the midst of their conversation, some centurions, who had contrived to conceal themselves, rushed with drawn swords upon the unfortunate Geta. His distracted mother strove to protect him in her arms, but in the unveiling struggle she was wounded in the hand and covered with the blood of her younger son, while she saw the elder animating and assisting the fury of the assassins. As soon as the deed was perpetrated, Caracalla, with heavy steps and horror in his countenance, ran towards the Praetorian camp as his only refuge, and threw himself on the ground before the statues of the tutelar deities. The soldiers attempted to raise and comfort him. In broken and disordered words he informed them of his imminent danger and fortunate escape, insinuating that he had prevented the designs of his enemy, and declared his resolution to live and die with his faithful troops. Geta had been the favorite of the soldiers, but the complaint was useless, revenge was dangerous, and they still reverenced the son of Severus. Their discontent died away in idle murmurs, and Caracalla soon convinced them of the justice of his cause, by distributing in one lavish donative the accumulated treasures of his father's reign. The real sentiments of the soldiers alone were of importance to his safety or power. Their declaration in his favor commanded the dutiful professions of the Senate. The obsequious assembly was always prepared to ratify the decision of fortune, but as Caracalla wished to assuage the first emotions of public indignation, the name of Geta was mentioned with decency, and he received the funeral honors of a Roman emperor. Posterity, in pity to his misfortune, has cast a veil over his vices. We consider that young prince as the innocent victim of his brother's ambition, without recollecting that he himself wanted power, rather than inclination, to consummate the same attempts of murder and revenge. The crime went not unpunished. Neither business, nor pleasure, nor flattery could defend Cracula from the stings of a guilty conscience. He confessed, in the anguish of a tortured mind, that his disordered fancy often beheld the angry forms of his father and his brother rising into life to threaten and upbraid him. The consciousness of his crime should have induced him to convince mankind, by the virtues of his reign, that the bloody deed had been the involuntary effect of fatal necessity but the repentance of Caracalla only prompted him to remove from the world whatever could remind him of his guilt, or recall the memory of his murdered brother. On his return from the senate to the palace, he found his mother in the company of several noble matrons, weeping over the untimely fate of her younger son. The jealous emperor threatened them with instant death. The sentence was executed against Fidilla, the last remaining daughter of the emperor Marcus, and even the afflicted Julia was obliged to silence her lamentations to suppress her sighs, and to receive the assassin with smiles of joy and approbation. It was computed that, under the vague appellation of the friends of Geta, above twenty thousand persons of both sexes suffered death. His guards and freedmen, the ministers of his serious business, and the companions of his looser hours, those who by his interest had been promoted to any commands in the army or provinces, with the long connected chain of their dependents, were included in the prescription which endeavored to reach every one who had maintained the smallest correspondence with Geta, who lamented his death, or even mentioned his name. 
Helvius Pertinax, son to the prince of that name, lost his life by an unseasonable witticism. It was a sufficient crime of Thracia Priscus to be descended from a family in which the love of liberty seemed to be an hereditary quality. The particular causes of calumny and suspicion were at length exhausted, and when a senator was accused of being a secret enemy to the government, the emperor was satisfied with the general proof that he was a man of property and virtue. From this well-grounded principle, he frequently drew the most bloody inferences. End of chapter 6, part 1「during the last seven years of Severus, he had exercised the most important offices of the state, and, by his salutary influence, guided the emperor's steps in the paths of justice and moderation. In full assurance of his virtues and abilities, Severus, on his deathbed, had conjured him to watch over the prosperity and union of the imperial family. The honest labors of Pepinian served only to inflame the hatred which Caracula had already conceived against his father's minister. After the murder of Geta, the prefect was commanded to exert the powers of his skill and eloquence in a studied apology for that atrocious deed. The philosophic Seneca had condescended to compose a similar epistle to the Senate, in the name of the son and assassin of Agrippina. Quote, that it was easier to commit than to justify a parricide, unquote, was the glorious reply of Pepinian, who did not hesitate between the loss of life and that of honor. Such intrepid virtue, which had escaped pure and unsullied from the intrigues of courts, the habits of business, and the arts of his profession, reflects more luster on the memory of Pepinian than all his great employments, his numerous writings, and the superior reputation as a lawyer, which he has preserved through every age of Roman jurisprudence. It had hitherto been the particular felicity of the Romans, and in the worst of times their consolation, that the virtue of the emperors was active, their vice indolent. Augustus, Trajan, Hadrian, and Marcus had visited their extensive dominions in person. Their progress was marked by acts of wisdom and beneficence. The tyranny of Tiberius, Nero, and Domitian, who resided almost constantly at Rome or in the adjacent villas, was confined to the senatorial and equestrian orders. But Caracalla was the common enemy of mankind. He left the capital, and he never returned to it, about a year after the murder of Geta. The rest of his reign was spent in the several provinces of the empire, particularly those of the east, and every province was, by turns, the scene of his rapine and cruelty. The senators, compelled by fear to attend his capricious motions, were obliged to provide daily entertainments at an immense expense, which he abandoned with contempt to his guards, and to erect, in every city, magnificent palaces and theaters, which he either disdained to visit or ordered to be immediately thrown down. The most wealthy families were ruined by partial fines and confiscations, and the great body of his subjects oppressed by ingenious and aggravated taxes. In the midst of peace, and upon the slightest provocation, he issued his commands at Alexandria in Egypt for a general massacre. From a secure post in the temple of Serapis, he viewed and directed the slaughter of many thousand citizens, as well as strangers, without distinguishing either the numbers or the crimes of the sufferers. Since, as he coolly informed the Senate, all the Alexandrians, those who had perished and those who had escaped, were alike guilty. The wise instructions of Severus never made any lasting impression on the mind of his son, who, although not destitute of imagination and eloquence, was equally devoid of judgment and humanity. One dangerous maxim, worthy of a tyrant, was remembered and abused by Caracalla. To secure the affections of the army and esteem the rest of his subjects as of little moment. But the liberality of the father had been restrained by prudence, and his indulgence to the troop was tempered by firmness and authority. The careless profusion of the son was the policy of one reign, and the inevitable ruin of the army and of the empire. The vigor of the soldiers, instead of being confirmed by the severe discipline of the camps, melted away in the luxury of cities. 
The excessive increase of their pay and donatives exhausted the state to enrich the military order, whose modesty in peace and service in war is best secured by an honorable poverty. The demeanor of Caracalla was haughty and full of pride, but with the troops he forgot even the proper dignity of his rank, encouraged their insolent familiarity, and, neglecting the essential duties of a general, affected to imitate their dress and manners of a common soldier. It was impossible that such a character and such a conduct as that of Caracalla could inspire either love or esteem, but as long as his vices were beneficial to the armies, he was secure from the danger of rebellion. A secret conspiracy, provoked by his own jealousy, was fatal to the tyrant. The Praetorian Prefecture was divided between two ministers. The military department was entrusted to Aventus, an experienced rather than an able soldier, and the civil affairs was transacted by Apilius Macrinus, who, by his dexterity in business, had raised himself with a fair character to that high office. But his favor varied with the caprice of the emperor, and his life might depend on the slightest suspicion or the most casual circumstance. Malice or fanaticism had suggested to an African, deeply skilled in the knowledge of futurity, a very dangerous prediction, that Macrinus and his son were destined to reign over the empire. Their report was soon diffused through the province, and when the man was sent in chains to Rome, he still asserted, in the presence of the prefect of the city, the faith of his prophecy. That magistrate, who had received the most pressing instructions to inform himself of the successors of Caracalla, immediately communicated the examination of the African to the imperial court, which at that time resided in Syria. Notwithstanding the diligence of the public messengers, the friends of Macrinus found means to apprise him of the approaching danger. The emperor received the letters from Rome, and, as he was then engaged in the conduct of a chariot race, he delivered them unopened to the Praetorian prefect, directing him to dispatch the ordinary affairs, and to report the more important business that might be contained in them. Macrinus read his fate and resolved to prevent it. He inflamed the discontents of some inferior officers, and employed the hand of Martialis, a desperate soldier who had been refused the rank of centurion. The devotion of Caracalla had prompted him to make a pilgrimage from Edessa to the celebrated Temple of the Moon at Cairai. He was attended by a body of cavalry, but had stopped on the road for some necessary occasion. His guards preserved a respectful distance, and Martialis, approaching his person under a pretense of duty, stabbed him with a dagger. The bold assassin was instantly killed by a Scythian archer of the Imperial Guard. Such was the end of a monster whose life disgraced human nature and whose reign accused the patience of the Romans. The grateful soldiers forgot their vices, remembered only his partial liberality, and obliged the Senate to prostitute their own dignity and that of religion by granting him a place among the gods. Whilst he was upon earth, Alexander the Great was the only hero whom this god deemed worthy his admiration. He assumed the name and ensigns of Alexander, formed a Macedonian phalanx of guards, persecuted the disciples of Aristotle, and displayed with a puerile enthusiasm the only sentiment by which he discovered any regard for virtue or glory. We can easily conceive that, after the Battle of Narva and the conquest of Poland, Charles the Twelfth, although he still wanted the more elegant accomplishments of the son of Philip, might boast of having rivaled his valor and magnanimity. But in no one action of his life did Caracalla express the faintest resemblance of the Macedonian hero, except in the murder of a great number of his own and his father's friends. After the extinction of the house of Severus, the Roman world remained three days without a master. The choice of the army, for the authority of a distant and feeble senate was little regarded, hung in anxious suspense, as no candidate presented himself whose distinguished birth and merit could engage their attachment and unite their suffrages, the decisive weight of the Praetorian guards elevated the hopes of their prefects, and these powerful ministers began to assert their legal claim to fill the vacancy of the imperial throne. Aventus, however, the senior prefect, conscious of his age and infirmities, of his small reputation and his smaller abilities, resigned the dangerous honor to the crafty ambition of his colleague Macrinus, whose well-dissembled grief removed all suspicions of his being accessory to his master's death. The troops neither loved nor esteemed his character. They cast their eyes around in search of a competitor, and at last yielded with reluctance to his promises of unbounded liberality and indulgence. 
A short time after his accession, he conferred on his son, Diadumenianus, at the age of only ten years, the imperial title and the popular name of Antoninus. The beautiful figure of the youth, assisted by an additional donative, for which the ceremony furnished a pretext, might attract, it was hoped, the favor of the army and secure the doubtful throne of Macrinus. The authority of the new sovereign had been ratified by the cheerful submission of the Senate and provinces. They exulted in their unexpected deliverance from a hated tyrant, and it seemed of little consequence to examine into the virtues of the successor of Caracalla. But as soon as the first transports of joy and surprise had subsided, they began to scrutinize the merits of Macrinus with a critical severity, and to arraign the hasty choice of the army. It had hitherto been considered as a fundamental maxim of the Constitution that the Emperor must always be chosen in the Senate, and the sovereign power, no longer exercised by the whole body, was always delegated to one of its members. But Macrinus was not a senator. The sudden elevation of the Praetorian prefects betrayed the meanness of their origin, and the equestrian order was still in possession of that great office, which commanded with arbitrary sway the lives and fortunes of the Senate. A murmur of indignation was heard that a man whose obscure extraction had never been illustrated by any signal service should dare to invest himself with the purple instead of bestowing it on some distinguished senator, equal in birth and dignity to the splendor of the imperial station. As soon as the character of Macrinus was surveyed by the sharp eye of discontent, some vices and many defects were easily discovered. The choice of his ministers was in several instances justly censored, and the dissatisfied people, with their usual candor, accused at once his indolent tameness and his excessive severity. His rash ambition had climbed a height where it was difficult to stand with firmness and impossible to fall without instant destruction. Trained in the arts of courts and the forms of civil business, he trembled in the presence of the fierce and undisciplined multitude over whom he had assumed the command. His military talents were despised and his personal courage suspected. A whisper that circulated in the camp disclosed the fatal secret of the conspiracy against the late emperor, aggravated the guilt of murder by the baseness of hypocrisy, and heightened contempt by detestation. To alienate the soldiers and to provoke inevitable ruin, the character of a reformer was only wanting, and such was the peculiar hardship of his fate that Macrinus was compelled to exercise that invidious office. The prodigality of Caracalla had left behind it a long train of ruin and disorder, and if that worthless tyrant had been capable of reflecting on the sure consequences of his own conduct, he would perhaps have enjoyed the dark prospect of the distress and calamities which he bequeathed to his successors. In the management of this necessary reformation, Macrinus proceeded with a cautious prudence, which would have restored health and vigor to the Roman army in an easy and almost imperceptible manner. To the soldiers already engaged in the service, he was constrained to leave the dangerous privileges and extravagant pay given by Caracalla. But the new recruits were received on the more moderate, though liberal, establishment of Severus, and gradually formed to modesty and obedience. One fatal error destroyed the salutary effects of this judicious plan. The numerous army, assembled in the east by the late emperor, instead of being immediately dispersed by Macrinus through the several provinces, was suffered to remain united in Syria during the winter that followed his elevation. In the luxurious idleness of their quarters, the troops viewed their strength in numbers, communicated their complaints, and revolved in their minds the advantages of another revolution. The veterans, instead of being flattered by the advantageous distinction, were alarmed by the first steps of the emperor, which they considered as the presage of his future intentions. The recruits, with sullen reluctance, entered on his servants, whose labors were increased while his rewards were diminished by a covetous and unwarlike sovereign. The murmurs of the army swelled with impunity into seditious clamors, and the partial mutinies betrayed a spirit of discontent and disaffection that waited only for the slightest occasion to break out on every side into a general rebellion. To minds thus disposed, the occasion soon presented itself. The Empress Julia had experienced all the vicissitudes of fortune. From a humble station, she had been raised to greatness, only to taste the superior bitterness of an exalted rank. She was doomed to weep over the death of one of her sons, and over the life of the other. The cruel fate of Caracalla, though her good sense must have long taught her to expect it, awakened the feelings of a mother and of an empress. Notwithstanding the respectful civility expressed by the usurper towards the widow of Severus, she descended with a painful struggle into the condition of a subject, 
and soon withdrew herself by a voluntary death from the anxious and humiliating dependence. Julia Misa, her sister, was ordered to leave the court and Antioch. She retired to Emesa with an immense fortune, the fruit of twenty years' labor, accompanied by her two daughters, Somaius and Mamaya, each of whom was a widow, and each had an only son. Basianus, for that was the name of the son of Soimius, was consecrated to the honorable ministry of high priest of the sun, and this holy vocation, embraced either from prudence or superstition, contributed to raise the Syrian youth to the empire of Rome. A numerous body of troops were stationed at Emesa, and, as the severe discipline of Macrinus had constrained them to pass the winter encamped, they were eager to revenge the cruelty of such unaccustomed hardships. The soldiers, who resorted in crowds to the Temple of the Sun, beheld with veneration and delight the elegant dress and figure of the young pontiff. They recognized, or thought they had recognized, the features of Caracalla, whose memory they now adored. The artful Misa saw and cherished their rising partiality, and, readily sacrificing her daughter's reputation to the fortunes of her grandson, she insinuated that Basianus was the natural son of their murdered sovereign. The sums distributed by her emissaries with a lavish hand silenced every objection, and the profusion sufficiently proved the affinity, or at least the resemblance of Basianus, with the great original. The young Antoninus, for he had assumed and polluted that respectable name, was declared emperor by the troops of Emesa, asserted his hereditary right, and called aloud on the armies to follow the standard of a young and liberal prince who had taken up arms to revenge his father's death in the oppression of the military order. Whilst a conspiracy of women and eunuchs was concerted with prudence and conducted with rapid vigor, Macrinus, who by decisive motion might have crushed his infant enemy, floated between the opposite extremes of terror and security, which alike fixed him inactive at Antioch. A spirit of rebellion diffused itself through all the camps and garrisons of Syria. Successive detachments murdered their officers and joined the party of the rebels, and the tardy restitution of military pay and privileges was imputed to the acknowledged weakness of Macrinus. At length he marched out of Antioch to meet the increasing and zealous army of the young pretender. His own troops seemed to take the field with faintness and reluctance, but in the heat of battle the Praetorian guards, almost by an involuntary impulse, asserted the superiority of their valor and discipline. The rebel ranks were broken. When the mother and grandmother of the Syrian prince, who, according to their eastern custom, had attended the army, threw themselves from their covered chariots, and by exciting the compassion of the soldiers, endeavored to animate their drooping courage. Antoninus himself, who in the rest of his life never acted like a man, in this important crisis of his fate approved himself a hero, mounted his horse, and, at the head of his rallied troops, charged sword in hand among the thickest of the enemy, whilst the eunuch, Ganyes, whose occupation had been confined to female cares and the soft luxury of Asia, displayed the talents of an able and experienced general. The battle still raged with doubtful violence, and Macrinus might have obtained the victory had he not betrayed his own cause by a shameful and precipitate flight. His cowardice served only to protract his life a few days and to stamp deserved ignominy on his misfortunes. It is scarcely necessary to add that his son, Diadumenianus, was involved in the same fate, as soon as the stubborn Praetorians could be convinced that they fought for a prince who had basely deserted them, they surrendered to the conqueror. The contending parties of the Roman army, mingling tears of joy and tenderness, united under the banners of the imagined son of Caracalla, and the East acknowledged with pleasure the first emperor of Asiatic extraction. The letters of Macrinus had condescended to inform the Senate of the slight disturbance occasioned by an impostor in Syria, and a decree immediately passed, declaring the rebel and his family public enemies. With a promise of pardon, however, to such of his deluded adherents as should merit it by an immediate return to their duty. During the twenty days that elapsed from the declaration to the victory of Antoninus, for in so short an interval was the fate of the Roman world decided, the capital and the provinces, more especially those of the east, were distracted with hopes and fears, agitated with tumult, and stained with a useless effusion of civil blood. Since, whosoever of the rivals prevailed in Syria must reign over the empire. The specious letters in which the young conqueror announced his victory to the obedient senate were filled with professions of virtue and moderation, the shining examples of Marcus and Augustus he should ever consider as his great rule of his administration, 
and he affected to dwell with pride on the striking resemblance of his own age and fortunes with those of Augustus, who, in the earliest youth, had revenged by a successful war the murder of his father. By adopting the style of Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, son of Antoninus, grandson of Severus, he tacitly asserted his hereditary claim to empire. But, by assuming the tribunician and proconsular powers before they had been conferred on him by a decree of the Senate, he offended the delicacy of Roman prejudice. This new and injudicious violation of the Constitution was probably dictated either by the ignorance of his Syrian courtiers or the fierce disdain of his military followers. As the attention of the new emperor was diverted by the most trifling amusements, he wasted many months in his luxurious progress from Syria to Italy, passed at Nicomedia the first winter after his victory, and deferred till the ensuing summer his triumphal entry into the capital. A faithful picture, however, which preceded his arrival, and was placed by his immediate order over the altar of victory in the Senate House, conveyed to the Romans the just but unworthy resemblance of his person and manners. He was drawn in his sacerdotal robes of silk and gold, after the loose-flowing fashion of the Medes and Phoenicians. His head was covered with a lofty tiara. His numerous collars and bracelets were adorned with gems of inestimable value. His eyebrows were tinged with black, and his cheeks painted with an artificial red and white. The grave senators confessed with a sigh that, after having long experienced the stern tyranny of their own countrymen, Rome was at length humbled beneath the effeminate luxury of Oriental despotism. The sun was worshipped at Emesa under the name of Elagalibus, and under the form of a black conical stone, which, as it was universally believed, had fallen from heaven on that sacred place. To this protecting deity, Antoninus, not without some reason, ascribed his elevation to the throne. The display of superstitious gratitude was the only serious business of his reign. The triumph of the god of Emesa over all the religions of the earth was the great object of his zeal and vanity, and the appellation of Elagalibus, for he presumed as pontiff and favorite to adopt that sacred name, was dearer to him than all the titles of imperial greatness. In a solemn procession through the streets of Rome, the way was stewed with gold dust. The black stone, set in precious gems, was placed on a chariot drawn by six milk-white horses, richly comparisoned. The pious emperor held the reins, and, supported by his ministers, moved slowly backwards that he might perpetually enjoy the felicity of the divine presence. In a magnificent temple raised on the Palatine Mount, the sacrifices of the god Elagalibus were celebrated with every circumstance of cost and solemnity. The richest wines, the most extraordinary victims, and the rarest aromatics were profusely consumed on his altar. Around the altar, a chorus of Syrian damsels performed their lascivious dances to the rhythm of barbarian music, whilst the grave personages of the state and army, clothed in long Phoenician tunics, officiated in the meanest functions with affected zeal and secret indignation. End of chapter 6, part 2「Chapter Six, Part Three of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To this temple, as to the common center of religious worship, the imperial fanatic attempted to remove the Ancilia, the Palladium, and all the sacred pledges of the faith of Numa. A crowd of inferior deities attended in various stations the majesty of the god of Emesa, but his court was still imperfect, till a female of distinguished rank was admitted to his bed. Pallas had first been chosen for his consort, but it was dreaded that a warlike terrors might affright the soft delicacy of a Syrian deity. The moon, adored by the Africans under the name of Astarte, was deemed a more suitable companion for the sun. Her image, with the rich offerings of her temple, as a marriage portion, was transported with solemn pomp from Carthage to Rome, and the day of these mystic nuptials was a general festival in the capital and throughout the empire. A rational voluptuary adheres with invariable respect to the temperate dictates of nature, and improves the gratifications of sense by social intercourse, endearing connections, and the soft coloring of taste and imagination. But Elagalibus, 
I speak of the emperor of that name, corrupted by his youth, his country, and his fortune, abandoned himself to the grossest pleasures with ungoverned fury, and soon found disgust and satiety in the midst of his enjoyments. The inflammatory powers of art were summoned to his aid. The confused multitude of women, of wines, and of dishes, and the studied variety of attitudes and sauces, served to revive his languid appetites. New terms and new inventions in these sciences, the only ones cultivated and patronized by the monarch, signalized his reign and transmitted his infamy to succeeding times. A capricious prodigality supplied the want of taste and elegance, and whilst Elagalibus lavished away the treasures of his people in the wildest extravagance, his own voice and that of his flatterers applauded a spirit and magnificence unknown to the tameness of his predecessors. To confound the order of seasons and climates, to sport with the passions and prejudices of his subjects, and to subvert every law of nature and decency, were in the number of his most delicious amusements. A long train of concubines, and a rapid succession of wives, among whom was a vestal virgin, ravished by force from her sacred asylum, were insufficient to satisfy the impotence of his passions. The master of the Roman world affected to copy the dress and manners of the female sex, preferred the distaff to the scepter, and dishonored the principal dignities of the empire by distributing them among his numerous lovers, one of whom was publicly invested with the title and authority of the emperor's, or, as he more properly styled himself, of the empress's husband. It may seem probable the vices and follies of Elagalibus have been adorned by fancy and blackened by prejudice. Yet, confining ourselves to the public scenes displayed before the Roman people, and attested by grave and contemporary historians, their inexpressible infamy suppresses that of any other country or age. The license of an eastern monarch is secluded from the eye of curiosity by the inaccessible walls of the seraglio. The sentiments of honor and gallantry have introduced a refinement of pleasure, a regard for decency, and a respect for the public opinion into the modern courts of Europe. But the corrupt and opulent nobles of Rome gratified every vice that could be collected from the mighty conflux of nations and manners. Secure of impunity, careless of censure, they lived without restraint in the patient and humble society of their slaves and parasites. The emperor, in his turn, viewing every rank of his subjects with the same contemptuous indifference, asserted without control his sovereign privilege of lust and luxury. The most worthless of mankind are not afraid to condemn in others the same disorders which they allow in themselves, and can readily discover some nice differences of age, character, or station to justify the partial distinction. The licentious soldiers, who had raised to the throne the dissolute son of Caracalla, blushed at their ignominious choice, and turned with disgust from that monster to contemplate with pleasure the opening virtues of his cousin Alexander, the son of Mamaya. The crafty Mysa, sensible that her grandson Elagalibus must inevitably destroy himself by his own vices, had provided another and surer support of her family. Embracing a favorable moment of fondness and devotion, she had persuaded the young emperor to adopt Alexander, and to invest him with the title of Caesar, that his own divine occupations might be no longer interrupted by the care of the earth. In the second rank, that amiable prince soon acquired the affections of the public, and excited the tyrant's jealousy, who resolved to terminate the dangerous competition, either by corrupting the manners, or by taking away the life of his rival. His arts proved unsuccessful. His vain designs were constantly discovered by his own loquacious folly, and disappointed by those virtuous and faithful subjects whom the prudence of Mamaya had placed above the persons of her son. In a hasty sally of passion, Elagalibus resolved to execute by force what he had been unable to compass by fraud, and by a despotic sentence degraded his cousin from the rank and honors of Caesar. The message was received in the Senate with silence, and in the camp with fury. The Praetorian guards swore to protect Alexander, and to revenge the dishonored majesty of the throne. The tears and promises of the trembling Elagalibus, who only begged them to spare his life and to leave him in the possession of his beloved Heracles, diverted their just indignation, and they contented themselves with empowering their prefects to watch over the safety of Alexander and the conduct of the emperor. It was impossible that such a reconciliation should last, 
or that even the mean soul of Elagabalus could hold an empire on such humiliating terms of dependence. He soon attempted, by a dangerous experiment, to try the temper of the soldiers. The report of the death of Alexander, and the natural suspicion that he had been murdered, inflamed their passions into fury, and the tempest of the camp could only be appeased by the presence and authority of the popular youth. Provoked at this new instance of their affection for his cousin, and their contempt for his person, the emperor ventured to punish some of the leaders of the mutiny. His unseasonable severity proved instantly fatal to his minions, his mother, and himself. Elagalibus was massacred by the indignant praetorians, his mutilated corpse dragged through the streets of the city and thrown into the Tiber. His memory was branded with eternal infamy by the Senate, and the justice of whose decree has been ratified by posterity. In the room of Elagalibus, his cousin Alexander was raised to the throne by the Praetorian guards. His relation to the family of Severus, whose name he assumed, was the same as that of his predecessor. His virtue and his danger had already endeared him to the Romans, and the eager liberality of the Senate conferred upon him in one day the various titles and powers of the imperial dignity. But, as Alexander was a modest and dutiful youth, and only seventeen years of age, the reins of government were in the hands of two women, his mother, Memaya, and of Mysa, his grandmother. After the death of the latter, who survived but a short time the elevation of Alexander, Memaya remained the sole regent of her son and of the empire. In every country and age, the wiser, or at least the stronger of the two sexes, has usurped the powers of the state, and confined the others to the cares and pleasures of domestic life. In hereditary monarchies, however, and especially in those of modern Europe, the gallant spirit of chivalry and the law of secession have accustomed us to allow a singular exception, and a woman is often acknowledged the absolute sovereign of a great kingdom, in which she would be deemed incapable of exercising the smallest employment, civil or military. But as the Roman emperors were still considered as the generals and magistrates of the republic, their wives and mothers, although distinguished by the name of Augusta, were never associated to their personal honors, and a female reign would have appeared an inexpiable prodigy in the eyes of those primitive Romans, who married without love, or who loved without delicacy and respect. The haughty Agrippina aspired, indeed, to share the honors of the empire, which she had conferred on her son, but her mad ambition, detested by every citizen who felt for the dignity of Rome, was disappointed by the artful firmness of Seneca and Burrhus. The good sense, or the indifference of succeeding princes, restrained them from offending the prejudices of their subjects, and it was reserved for the profligate Elagalibus to disgrace the acts of the Senate with the name of his mother, Somaius, who was placed by the side of the consuls and subscribed, as a regular member, the decrees of the legislative assembly. Her more prudent sister, Memaya, declined the useless and odious prerogative, and a solemn law was enacted, excluding women forever from the Senate, and devoting to the infernal gods the head of the wretch by whom this sanction should be violated. The substance, not the pageantry of power, was the object of Memaya's manly ambition. She maintained an absolute and lasting empire over the mind of her son, and in his affection the mother could not brook a rival. Alexander, with her consent, married the daughter of her patrician, but his respect for his father-in-law and love for the empress were inconsistent with the tenderness or interest in Memaya. The patrician was executed on the ready accusation of treason, and the wife of Alexander was driven with ignominy from the palace and banished into Africa. Notwithstanding this act of jealous cruelty, as well as some instances of avarice, with which Memaya is charged, the general tenor of her administration was equally for the benefit of her son and of the empire. With the approbation of the Senate, she chose sixteen of the wisest and most virtuous senators, as a perpetual council of state, before whom every public business and moment was debated and determined. The celebrated Opian, equally distinguished by his knowledge of and his respect for the laws of Rome, was at their head, and the prudent firmness of this aristocracy restored order and authority to the government. As soon as they had purged the city from foreign superstition and luxury, the remains of the capricious tyranny of Elagalibus, they applied themselves to remove his worthless creatures from every department of the public administration, and to supply their places with men of virtue and ability. 
Learning and the love of justice became the only recommendation for civil offices, valor and the love of discipline the only qualification for military appointments. But the most important care of Amaya and her wise counselors was to form the character of the young emperor, on whose personal qualities the happiness or misery of the Roman world must ultimately depend. The fortunate soil assisted and even prevented the hand of cultivation. An excellent understanding soon convinced Alexander of the advantages of virtue, the pleasure of knowledge, and the necessity of labor. A natural mildness and moderation of temper preserved him from the assaults of passion and the allurements of vice. His unalterable regard for his mother and his esteem for the wise Ulpian guarded his inexperienced youth from the poison of flattery. The simple journal of his ordinary occupations exhibits a pleasing picture of an accomplished emperor, and, with some allowance for the difference of manners, might well deserve the imitation of modern princes. Alexander rose early. The first moments of the day were consecrated to private devotion, and his domestic chapel was filled with the images of those heroes who, by improving or reforming human life, had deserved the grateful reverence of posterity. But, as he deemed the service of mankind the most acceptable worship of the gods, the greatest part of his morning hours was employed in his council, where he discussed public affairs and determined private causes with the patience and discretion above his years. The dryness of business was relieved by the charms of literature, and a portion of time was always set apart for his favorite studies of poetry, history, and philosophy. The works of Virgil and Horace, the republics of Plato and Cicero, formed his taste, enlarged his understanding, and gave him the noblest ideas of man and government. The exercises of the body seceded to those of the mind, and Alexander, who was tall, active, and robust, surpassed most of his equals in the gymnastic arts. Refreshed by the use of the bath and a slight dinner, he resumed with new vigor the business of the day, and, till the hour of supper, the principal meal of the Romans, he was attended by his secretaries, with whom he read and answered the multitude of letters, memorials, and petitions that must have been addressed to the master of the greatest part of the world. His table was served with the most frugal simplicity, and whenever he was at liberty to consult his own inclination, the company consisted of a few select friends, men of learning and virtue, amongst whom Ulpian was constantly invited. Their conversation was familiar and instructive, and the pauses were occasionally enlivened by the recital of some pleasing composition, which supplied the place of dancers and comedians, and even gladiators, so frequently summoned to the tables of the rich and luxurious Romans. The dress of Alexander was plain and modest, his demeanor courteous and affable. At the proper hours his palace was open to all his subjects, but the voice of a crier was heard, as in the Eleusian Mysteries, pronouncing the same salutary admonition. Let none enter these holy walls, unless he is conscious of a pure and innocent mind. Such a uniform tenor of life, which left not a moment for vice or folly, is a better proof of the wisdom and justice of Alexander's government than all the trifling details preserved in the compilations of Limpridius. Since the accession of Commodus, the Roman world had experienced, during a term of forty years, the successive and various vices of four tyrants. From the death of Elagalibus, it had enjoyed an auspicious calm of thirteen years. The provinces, relieved from the oppressive taxes invented by Caracalla and his pretended son, flourished in peace and prosperity under the administration of magistrates, who were convinced by experience that to deserve the love of the subjects was their best and only method of obtaining the favor of their sovereign. While some gentle restraints were imposed on the innocent luxury of the Roman people, the price of provisions and the interest of money were reduced by the paternal care of Alexander, whose prudent liberality, without distressing the industrious, supplied the wants and amusements of the populace. The dignity, the freedom, the authority of the Senate was restored, and every virtuous senator might approach the person of the emperor without a fear and without a blush. The name of Antoninus, ennobled by the virtues of Pius and Marcus, had been communicated by adoption to the dissolute Verus, and by descent to the cruel Commodus. It became the honorable appellation of the sons of Severus, was bestowed on young Diadumenianus, and at length prostituted to the infamy of the high priest of Emesa. Alexander, though pressed by the studied and perhaps sincere importunity of the Senate, nobly refused the borrowed luster of a name, whilst in his whole conduct he labored to restore the glory and felicity 
of the age of the genuine Antonines. In the civil administration of Alexander, wisdom was enforced by power, and the people, sensible of the public felicity, repaid their benefactor with their love and gratitude. There still remained a greater, a more necessary, but more difficult enterprise, the reformation of the military order, whose interest and temper, confirmed by long impunity, rendered them impatient of the restraints of discipline, and careless of the blessings of public tranquility. On the execution of his design, the emperor affected to display his love and to conceal his fear of the army. The most rigid economy in every other branch of the administration supplied a fund of gold and silver for the ordinary pay and the extraordinary rewards of the troops. In their marches, he relaxed the severe obligation of carrying seventeen days' provisions on their shoulders. Ample magazines were formed along the public roads, and as soon as they entered the enemy's country, a numerous train of mules and camels waited on their haughty laziness. As Alexander despaired of correcting the luxury of his soldiers, he attempted, at least, to direct it to objects of martial pomp and ornament, fine horses, splendid armor, and shields enriched with silver and gold. He shared whatever fatigues he was obliged to impose, visited, in person, the sick and wounded, preserved an exact register of their services and his own gratitude, and expressed, on every occasion, the warmest regard for a body of men whose welfare, as he affected to declare, was so closely connected with that of the state. By the most gentle arts he labored to inspire the fierce multitude with a sense of duty, and to restore at least a faint image of that discipline to which the Romans owed their empire over so many other nations, as warlike and more powerful than themselves. But his prudence was vain, his courage fatal, and the attempt towards a reformation served only to inflame the ills it was meant to cure. The Praetorian guards were attached to the youth of Alexander. They loved him as a tender pupil, whom they had saved from a tyrant's fury and placed on the imperial throne. That amiable prince was sensible of the obligation, but, as his gratitude was restrained within the limits of reason and justice, they soon were more dissatisfied with the virtues of Alexander than they had ever been with the vices of Elagalibus. Their prefect, the wise Ulpian, was a friend of the laws and of the people. He was considered as the enemy of the soldiers, and his pernicious counsels, every scheme of reformation was imputed. Some trifling accident blew up their discontent into a furious mutiny, and a civil war raged during three days in Rome, whilst the life of that excellent minister was defended by the grateful people. Terrified at length by the sight of some houses in flames, and by the threats of a general conflagration, the people yielded with a sigh, and left the virtuous but unfortunate Ulpian to his fate. He was pursued into the imperial palace, and massacred at the feet of his master, who vainly strove to cover him with the purple, and to obtain his pardon from the inexorable soldiers. Such was the deplorable weakness of government, that the emperor was unable to revenge his murdered friend and his insulted dignity, without stooping to the arts of patience and dissimulation. Epagathus, the principal leader of the mutiny, was removed from Rome by the honorable employment of prefect of Egypt. From that high rank he was gently degraded to the government of Crete, and when, at length, his popularity among the guards was effaced by time and absence, Alexander ventured to inflict the tardy but deserved punishment of his crimes. Under the reign of a just and virtuous prince, the tyranny of the army threatened with instant death his most faithful ministers, who were suspected of an intention to correct their intolerable disorders. The historian, Dion Cassius, had commanded the Pannonian legions with the spirit of ancient discipline. Their brethren of Rome, embracing the common cause of military license, demanded the head of the reformer. Alexander, however, instead of yielding to their seditious clamors, showed a just sense of his merit and services by appointing him his colleague in the consulship and defraying from his own treasury the expense of that vain dignity. But, as it was justly apprehended, that if the soldiers beheld him with the ensigns of his office, they would revenge the insult in his blood, the nominal first magistrate of the state retired, by the emperor's advice, from the city, and spent the greatest part of his consulship at his villas, and Campania. End of chapter 6, part 3. Chapter 6, part 4 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org
The lenity of the emperor confirmed the insolence of the troops. The legions imitated the example of the guards, and defended the prerogative of licentiousness with the same furious obstinacy. The administration of Alexander was an unavailing struggle against the corruption of his age. In Illyricum, in Mauritania, in Armenia, in Mesopotamia, in Germany, fresh mutinies perpetually broke out. His officers were murdered, his authority was insulted, and his life at last sacrificed to the fierce discontents of the army. One particular fact well deserves to be recorded, as it illustrates the manners of the troops and exhibits a singular instance of their return to a sense of duty and obedience. Whilst the emperor lay at Antioch in his Persian expedition, the particulars of which we shall hereafter relate, the punishment of some soldiers who had been discovered in the baths of women excited a sedition in the legion to which they belonged. Alexander ascended his tribunal, and with a modest firmness represented to the armed multitude the absolute necessity, as well as his inflexible resolution of correcting the vices introduced by his impure predecessor, and of maintaining the discipline which could not be relaxed without the ruin of the Roman name and empire. Their clamors interrupted his mild expostulation. Reserve your shouts, said the undaunted emperor, till you take the field against the Persians, the Germans, and the Sarmatians. Be silent in the presence of your sovereign and benefactor, who bestows upon you the corn, the clothing, and the money of the provinces. Be silent, or I shall no longer style you soldiers, but citizens. If those indeed who disclaim the laws of Rome deserve to be ranked among the meanest of the people. His menaces inflamed the fury of the legion, and their brandished arms already threatened his person. Your courage, resumed the intrepid Alexander, would be more nobly displayed in the field of battle. Me you may destroy, you cannot intimidate, and the severe justice of the Republic would punish your crime and revenge my death. The legion still persisted in clamorous sedition, when the emperor pronounced with a loud voice the decisive sentence, Citizens, lay down your arms and depart in peace to your respective habitations. The tempest was instantly appeased. The soldiers, filled with grief and shame, silently confessed the justice of their punishment and the power of discipline, yielded up their arms and military ensigns, and retired in confusion, not to their camp, but to the several inns of the city. Alexander enjoyed, during thirty days, the edifying spectacle of their repentance. Nor did he restore them to their former rank in the army, till he had punished with death those tribunes whose connivance had occasioned the mutiny. The grateful legion served the emperor whilst living, and revenged him when dead. The resolutions of the multitude generally depend on a moment, and the caprice of passion might equally determine the seditious legion to lay down their arms at the emperor's feet, or to plunge them into his breast. Perhaps, if this singular transaction had been investigated by the penetration of a philosopher, we should discover the secret causes which, on that occasion, authorized the boldness of the prince and commanded the obedience of the troops. And, perhaps, if it had been related by a judicious historian, we should find this action worthy of Caesar himself, reduced nearer to the level of probability and the common standard of the character of Alexander Severus. The abilities of that amiable prince seems to have been inadequate to the difficulties of his situation, the firmness of his conduct inferior to the purity of his intentions. His virtues, as well as the vices of Alagalibus, contracted a tincture of weakness and effeminacy from the soft climate of Syria, of which he was a native, though he blushed at his foreign origin, and listened with a vain complacency to the flattering genealogists who derived his race from the ancient stock of Roman nobility. The pride and avarice of his mother cast a shade on the glories of his reign, and by exacting from his riper years the same dutiful obedience which she had justly claimed from his inexperienced youth, Memaya exposed to public ridicule both her son's character and her own. The fatigues of the Persian War irritated the military discontent. The unsuccessful event degraded the reputation of the emperor as a general and even as a soldier. Every cause prepared, and every circumstance hastened a revolution which distracted the Roman Empire with a long series of intestine calamities. The dissolute tyranny of Commodus, the civil wars occasioned by his death, and the new maxims of policy introduced by the House of Severus, 
had all contributed to increase the dangerous power of the army, and to obliterate the faint image of laws and liberty which still impressed on the minds of the Romans. This internal change, which undermined the foundations of the empire, we have endeavored to explain with some degree of order and perspicuity. The personal characters of the emperors, their victories, laws, follies, and fortunes, can interest us no further than as they are connected with the general history of the decline and fall of the monarchy. Our constant attention to that great object will not suffer us to overlook a most important edict of Antoninus Caracalla, which communicated to all free inhabitants of the empire the name and privileges of Roman citizens. His unbounded liberality flowed not, however, from the sentiments of a generous mind. It was the sordid result of avarice, and will naturally be illustrated by some observations on the finances of that state, from the victorious ages of the commonwealth to the reign of Alexander Severus. The siege of Veii in Tuscany, the first considerable enterprise of the Romans, was protracted to the tenth year, much less by the strength of the place than by the unskillfulness of the besiegers. The unaccustomed hardships of so many winter campaigns, at the distance of near twenty miles from home, acquired more than common encouragements, and the Senate wisely prevented the clamors of the people, by the institution of a regular pay for the soldiers, which was levied by a general tribute, assessed according to the equitable proportion on the property of the citizens. During more than two hundred years after the conquest of Veii, the victories of the Republic added less to the wealth than to the power of Rome. The states of Italy pay their tribute in military service only, and the vast force both by sea and land, which was exerted in the Punic Wars, was maintained at the expense of the Romans themselves. That high-spirited people, such as often the generous enthusiasm of freedom, cheerfully submitted to the most excessive but voluntary burdens, in the just confidence that they should speedily enjoy the rich harvest of their labors. Their expectations were not disappointed. In the course of a few years the riches of Syracuse, of Carthage, of Macedonia, and of Asia were brought in triumph to Rome. The treasures of Perseus alone amounted to near two million sterling, and the Roman people, the sovereign of so many nations, was forever delivered from the weight of taxes. The increasing revenue of the provinces was found sufficient to defray the ordinary establishment of war and government, and the superfluous mass of gold and silver was deposited in the temple of Saturn and reserved for any unforeseen emergency of the state. History has never, perhaps, suffered a greater or more irreparable injury than in the loss of that curious register bequeathed by Augustus to the Senate, in which that experienced prince so accurately balanced the revenues and expenses of the Roman Empire. Deprived of this clear and comprehensive estimate, we are reduced to collect a few imperfect hints from such of the ancients as have accidentally turned aside from the splendid to the more useful parts of history. We are informed that, by the conquests of Pompeii, the tributes of Asia were raised from fifty to one hundred and thirty-five millions of drachms, or about four millions and one-half of sterling. Under the last and most indolent of the Ptolemies, the revenue of Egypt is said to have amounted twelve thousand five hundred talents, a sum equivalent to more than two millions and a half of our money, but which was afterwards considerably improved by the more exact economy of the Romans and the increase of trade of Ethiopia and India. Gaul was enriched by rapine, as Egypt was by commerce, and the tributes of those two great provinces have been compared as nearly equal to each other in value. The 10,000 Euboic or Phoenician talents, about 4 million sterling, which vanquished Carthage, was condemned to pay within a term of 50 years, were a slight acknowledgment to the superiority of Rome and cannot bear the least proportion with the taxes afterwards raised both on the lands and on the persons of the inhabitants, when the fertile coast of Africa was reduced into a province. Spain, by a very singular fatality, was the Peru and Mexico of the Old World. The discovery of the rich western continent by the Phoenicians, and the oppression of the simple natives, who were compelled to labor in their own mines for the benefit of strangers, form an exact type of the more recent history of Spanish America. The Phoenicians were acquainted only with the seacoast of Spain. Avarice, as well as ambition, carried the arms of Rome and Carthage into the heart of the country, and almost every part of the soil was found pregnant with copper, silver, and gold. Mention is made of a mine 
near Carthagena, which yielded every day 25,000 drachms of silver, or about 300,000 pounds a year. 20,000 pounds weight of gold was annually received from the provinces of Asturia, Galicia, and Lusitania. We want both leisure and materials to pursue this curious inquiry through the many potent states which were annihilated in the Roman Empire. Some notion, however, may be formed of the revenue of the provinces, where considerable wealth had been deposited by nature or collected by man, if we observe the severe attention that was directed to the abodes of solitude and sterility. Augustus once received a petition from the inhabitants of Gyrus, humbly praying that they may be relieved from one-third of their excessive impositions. Their whole tax amounted indeed to no more than 150 drachms, or about five pounds. But Gyarus was a little island, or rather a rock, in the Aegean Sea, destitute of fresh water and every necessity of life, and inhabited by only a few wretched fishermen. From the faint glimmerings of such doubtful and scattered lights, we should be inclined to believe, first, that, with every fair allowance for the difference of times and circumstances, the general income of the Roman provinces could seldom amount to less than fifteen or twenty millions of our money, and, secondly, that so ample a revenue must have been fully adequate to all the expenses of the moderate government instituted by Augustus, whose court was the modest family of a private senator, and whose military establishment was calculated for the defense of the frontiers without any aspiring views of conquest or any serious apprehension of a foreign invasion. Notwithstanding the seeming probability of both these conclusions, the latter of them at least is positively disowned by the language and conduct of Augustus. It is not easy to determine whether, on this occasion, he acted as the common father of the Roman world, or as the oppressor of liberty, whether he wished to relieve the provinces, or to impoverish the senate and the equestrian order. But no sooner had he assumed the reins of government than he frequently intimated the insufficiency of the tribunes, and the necessity of throwing an equitable proportion of the public burden upon Rome and Italy. In the prosecution of this unpopular design, he advanced, however, by cautious and well-weighted steps. The introduction of customs was followed by the establishment of an excise, and the scheme of taxation was compelled by an artful assessment on the real and personal property of the Roman citizens, who had been exempted from any kind of contribution above a century and a half. 1. In a great empire, like that of Rome, a natural balance of money must have gradually established itself. It had already been observed that, as the wealth of the provinces was attracted to the capital by the strong hand of conquest and power, so a considerable part of it was restored to the industrious provinces by the gentle influence of commerce and arts. In the reign of Augustus and his successors, duties were imposed on every kind of merchandise, which through a thousand channels flowed to the great center of opulence and luxury. In whatsoever manner the law was expressed, it was the Roman purchaser and not the provincial merchant who paid the tax. The rate of the customs varied from the eighth to the fortieth part of the value of the commodity, and we have a right to suppose that the variation was directed by the unalterable maximums of policy, that a higher duty was fixed on the articles of luxury than on those of necessity, and that the productions raised or manufactured by the labor of the subjects of the empire, were treated with more indulgence than was shown to the pernicious, or at least the unpopular commerce of Arabia and India. There is still extant a long but imperfect catalogue of eastern commodities. About the time of Alexander Severus were subject to the payment of duties, cinnamon, myrrh, pepper, ginger, and the whole tribe of aromatics, a great variety of precious stones, among which the diamond was the most remarkable for its price, and the emerald for its beauty. Parthian and Babylonian leather, cottons, silks, both raw and manufactured, ebony, ivory, and eunuchs. We may observe that the use and value of those infeminate slaves gradually rose with the decline of the empire. 2. The excise, introduced by Augustus after the civil wars, was extremely moderate, but it was general. It seldom exceeded one per cent but it comprehended whatever was sold in the markets or by public auction, from the most considerable purchases of land and houses to those minute objects which can only derive a value from their infinite multitude and daily consumption. Such a tax, as it affects the body of the people, has ever been the occasion of clamor and discontent. An emperor, well acquainted with the wants and resources of the state, was obliged to declare 
by a popular edict that the support of the army depended in a great measure on the produce of the excise. 3. When Augustus resolved to establish a permanent military force for the defense of his government against foreign and domestic enemies, he instituted a peculiar treasury for the pay of the soldiers, the rewards of the veterans, and the extraordinary expenses of war. The ample revenue of the excise, though peculiarly apportioned to the uses, was found inadequate. To supply the deficiency, the emperor suggested a new tax of 5% on all legacies and inheritances, but the nobles of Rome were more tenacious of property than of freedom. Their indignant murmurs were received by Augustus with his usual temper. He candidly referred the whole business to the Senate and exhorted them to provide for the public service by some other expedient of a less odious nature. They were divided and perplexed. He insinuated to them that their obstinacy would oblige him to propose a general land tax and capitation. They acquiesced in silence. The new imposition on legacies and inheritances was, however, mitigated by some restrictions. It did not take place unless the object was of a certain value, most probably a fifty or a hundred pieces of gold. Nor can it be exacted from the nearest kin on the father's side. When the rights of nature and property were thus secured, it seemed reasonable that a stranger or a distant relation, who acquired an unexpected acquisition of fortune, should cheerfully resign a twentieth part of it for the benefit of the state. Such a tax, plentiful as it must prove in every wealthy community, was most happily suited to the situation of the Romans, who could frame their arbitrary wills according to the dictates of reason or caprice without any restraint from the modern fetters of entails and settlements. From various causes, the partiality of paternal affection often lost its influence over the stern patriots of the commonwealth and the dissolute nobles of the empire, and if the father bequeathed to a son a fourth part of his estate, he removed all grounds of legal complaint. But a rich, childless old man was a domestic tyrant, and his power increased with his years and infirmities. A servile crowd, in which he frequently reckoned praetors and consuls, courted his smiles, pampered his avarice, and applauded his follies, served his passions, and waited with impatience for his death. The arts of attendance and flattery were formed into a most lucrative science, and those who professed it acquired a peculiar appellation, and the whole city, according to the lively descriptions of satire, were divided into two parties, the hunters and their game. Yet while so many unjust and extravagant wills were every day dictated with cunning and subscribed by folly, a few were the result of rational esteem and virtuous gratitude. Cicero, who had so often defended the lives and fortunes of his fellow citizens, was rewarded with legacies to the amount of 170,000 pounds. Nor do the friends of the younger Pliny seem to have been less generous to that amiable orator. Whatever was the motive of the testator, the treasury claimed without distinction the twentieth part of his estate, and in the course of two or three generations the whole property of the subject must have gradually passed through the coffers of the state. In the first and golden years of the reign of Nero, that prince, from a desire of popularity, and perhaps from a blind impulse of benevolence, conceived a wish of abolishing the oppression of the customs and excise. The wisest senators applauded his magnanimity, but they diverted him from the execution of a design which would have dissolved the strength and resources of the republic. Had it indeed been possible to realize this dream of fancy. Such princes as Trajan and the Antonines would surely have embraced with ardor the glorious opportunity of conferring so signal of obligation on mankind. Satisfied, however, with alleviating the public burden, they attempted not to remove it. The mildness and precision of their laws ascertained the rule and measure of taxation, and protected the subject of every rank against arbitrary interpretations antiquated claims, and the insolent vexation of the farmers of the revenue. For it is somewhat singular that, in every age, the best and wisest of the Roman governors persevered in this pernicious method of collecting the principal branches, at least of the excise and customs. The sentiments, and indeed the situation of Caracalla, were very different from those of the Antonines. Inattentive, or rather averse to the welfare of his people, he found himself under the necessity of gratifying the insatiate avarice which he had excited in the army. Of the several impositions introduced by Augustus, the twentieth on inheritances and the legacies was the most fruitful as well as the most comprehensive. As its influence was not confined to Rome or Italy, the produce continually increased with the gradual extension of the Roman city. 
The new citizens, though charged on equal terms with the payment of new taxes which had not affected them as subjects, derived an ample compensation from the rank they obtained, the privileges they acquired, and the fair prospect of honors and fortune which was thrown open to their ambition. But the favor which implied a distinction was lost in the prodigality of Caracalla, and the reluctant provincials were compelled to assume the vain title and real obligations of Roman citizens. Nor was the rapacious son of Severus contented with such a measure of taxation as had appeared sufficient to his moderate predecessors. Instead of a twentieth, he exacted a tenth of all legacies and inheritances. And during his reign, for the ancient proportion was restored after his death, he crushed alike every part of the empire under the weight of his iron scepter. When all the provincials became liable to the peculiar impositions of Roman citizens, they seemed to acquire a legal exemption from the tributes which they had paid in their former conditions of subjects. Such were not the maxims of government adapted by Caracalla and his pretended son. The old, as well as the new taxes, were, at the same time, levied in the provinces. It was reserved for the virtue of Alexander to relieve them in a great measure from this intolerable grievance by reducing the tributes to a thirteenth part of the sum exacted at the time of his accession. It is impossible to conjecture the motive that engaged him to spare so trifling a remnant of the public evil, but the noxious weed, which had not been totally eradicated, again sprang up with the most luxuriant growth, and in the succeeding age darkened the Roman world with its deadly shade. In the course of this history, we shall be too often summoned to explain the land tax, the capitation, and the heavy contributions of corn, wine, oil, and meat which were exacted from the provinces for the use of the court, the army, and the capital. As long as Rome and Italy were respected as the center of government, a national spirit was preserved by the ancient and insensibly imbibed by the adopted citizens. The principal commands of the army were filled by men who had received a liberal education and were well instructed in the advantages of laws and letters, and who had risen by equal steps through the regular succession of civil and military honors. To their influence and example, we may partly ascribe the modest obedience of the legions during the first two centuries of the imperial history. But when the last enclosure of the Roman constitution was trampled down by Caracalla, the separation of possessions gradually seceded to the division of ranks. The more polished citizens of the internal provinces were alone qualified to act as lawyers and magistrates. The rougher trade of arms were abandoned to the peasants and barbarians of the frontiers, who knew no country but their camp no science but that of war, no civil laws, and scarcely those of military discipline. With bloody hands, savage manners, and desperate resolutions, they sometimes guarded, but more often are subverted, the throne of the emperors. End of chapter 6, part 4of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elevation and Tyranny of Maximin, Rebellion in Africa and Italy, Under the Authority of the Senate, Civil Wars and Seditions, violent deaths of Maximin and his son, of Maximus and Balbinus, and of the three Gordians, usurpation and secular games of Philip. Of the various forms of government which have prevailed in the world, an hereditary monarchy seems to present the fairest scope for ridicule. Is it possible to relate without an indignant smile that on the father's decease the property of a nation like that of a drove of oxen, descends to his infant son, as yet unknown to mankind and to himself, and that the bravest warriors and the wisest statesmen, relinquishing their natural right to empire, approach the royal cradle with bended knees and protestations of inviolable fidelity? Satire and declamation may paint these obvious topics in the most dazzling colors, but our most serious thoughts will respect a useful prejudice that establishes a rule of succession independent of the passions of mankind, 
and we shall cheerfully acquiesce in any expedient which deprives the multitude of the dangerous and indeed the ideal power of giving themselves a master. In the cool shade of retirement, we may easily devise imaginary forms of government in which the sceptre shall be constantly bestowed on the most worthy by the free and incorrupt suffrage of the whole community. Experience overturns these airy fabrics and teaches us that in a large society the election of a monarch can never devolve to the wisest or to the most numerous part of the people. The army is the only order of men sufficiently united to concur in the same sentiments and powerful enough to impose them on the rest of their fellow citizens. But the temper of soldiers, habituated at once to violence and to slavery, renders them very unfit guardians of a legal or even a civil constitution. Justice, humanity, or political wisdom are qualities they are too little acquainted with in themselves to appreciate them in others. Valor will acquire their esteem, and liberality will purchase their suffrage. But the first of these merits is often lodged in the most savage breasts. The latter can only exert itself at the expense of the public, and both may be turned against the possessor of the throne by the ambition of a daring rival. The superior prerogative of birth, when it has obtained the sanction of time and popular opinion, is the plainest and least invidious of all distinctions among mankind. The acknowledged right extinguishes the hopes of faction, and the conscious security disarms the cruelty of the monarch. To the firm establishment of this idea, we owe the peaceful succession and mild administration of European monarchies. To the defect of it, we must attribute the frequent civil wars through which an Asiatic despot is obliged to cut his way to the throne of his fathers. Yet, even in the East, the sphere of contention is usually limited to the princes of the reigning house, and as soon as the more fortunate competitor has removed his brethren by the sword and the bowstring, he no longer entertains any jealousy of his meaner subjects. But the Roman Empire, after the authority of the Senate had sunk into contempt, was a vast scene of confusion. The royal and even noble families of the provinces had long since been led in triumph before the car of the haughty republicans. The ancient families of Rome had successively fallen beneath the tyranny of the Caesars, and whilst those princes were shackled by the forms of a commonwealth and disappointed by the repeated failure of their posterity, it was impossible that any idea of hereditary succession should have taken root in the minds of their subjects. The right to the throne, which none could claim from birth, everyone assumed from merit. The daring hopes of ambition were set loose from the salutary restraints of law and prejudice, and the meanest of mankind might, without folly, entertain a hope of being raised by valour and fortune to a rank in the army in which a single crime would enable him to wrest the sceptre of the world from his feeble and unpopular master. After the murder of Alexander Severus and the elevation of Maximin, no emperor could think himself safe upon the throne, and every barbarian peasant of the frontier might aspire to that august but dangerous station. About thirty-two years before that event, the Emperor Severus, returning from an eastern expedition, halted in Thrace to celebrate with military games the birthday of his younger son, Geta. The country flocked in crowds to behold their sovereign, and a young barbarian of gigantic stature earnestly solicited, in his rude dialect, that he might be allowed to contend for the prize of wrestling. As the pride of discipline would have been disgraced in the overthrow of a Roman soldier by a Thracian peasant, he was matched with the stoutest followers of the camp, sixteen of whom he successively laid on the ground. His victory was rewarded by some trifling gifts and a permission to enlist in the troops. The next day, the happy barbarian was distinguished above a crowd of recruits, dancing and exulting after the fashion of his country. As soon as he perceived that he had attracted the emperor's notice, he instantly ran up to his horse and followed him on foot without the least appearance of fatigue in a long and rapid career. Thracian, said Severus with astonishment, art thou disposed to wrestle after thy race? 
"'Most willingly, sir,' replied the unwearied youth, and almost in a breath overthrew seven of the strongest soldiers in the army. A gold collar was the prize of his matchless vigour and activity, and he was immediately appointed to serve in the horse guards who always attended on the person of the sovereign. Maximin, for that was his name, though born on the territories of the empire, descended from a mixed race of barbarians. His father was a Goth, and his mother of the nation of the Alani. He displayed on every occasion a valour equal to his strength, and his native fierceness was soon tempered or disguised by the knowledge of the world. Under the reign of Severus and his son, he obtained the rank of centurion, with the favour and esteem of both those princes, the former of whom was an excellent judge of merit. Gratitude forbade Maximin to serve under the assassin of Caracalla. Honour taught him to decline the effeminate insults of Elagabalus. On the accession of Alexander, he returned to court and was placed by the prince in a station useful to the service and honourable to himself. The fourth legion, to which he was appointed tribune, soon became, under his care, the best disciplined of the whole army, with the general applause of the soldiers who bestowed on their favourite hero the names of Ajax and Hercules, he was successively promoted to the first military command, and had not he still retained too much of his savage origin, the emperor might perhaps have given his own sister and marriage to the son of Maximin. Instead of securing his fidelity, these favours served only to inflame the ambition of the Thracian peasant, who deemed his fortune inadequate to his merit, as long as he was constrained to acknowledge a superior. Though a stranger to real wisdom, he was not devoid of a selfish cunning, which showed him that the emperor had lost the affection of the army, and taught him to improve their discontent to his own advantage. It is easy for faction and calumny to shed their poison on the administration of the best of princes, and to accuse even their virtues by artfully confounding them with those vices to which they bear the nearest affinity. The troops listened with pleasure to the emissaries of Maximin. They blushed at their own ignominious patience, which, during thirteen years, had supported the vexatious discipline imposed by an effeminate Syrian, the timid slave of his mother and of the Senate. It was time, they cried, to cast away that useless phantom of the civil power and to elect for their prince and general a real soldier educated in camps, exercised in war, who would assert the glory and distribute among his companions the treasures of the empire. A great army was at that time assembled on the banks of the Rhine under the command of the emperor himself, who, almost immediately after his return from the Persian War, had been obliged to march against the barbarians of Germany. The important care of training and reviewing the new levies was entrusted to Maximin. One day, as he entered the field of exercise, the troops, either from a sudden impulse or a formed conspiracy, saluted him empire, silenced by their loud acclamations, his obstinate refusal, and hastened to consummate their rebellion by the murder of Alexander Severus. The circumstances of his death are variously related. The writers, who suppose that he died in ignorance of the ingratitude and ambition of Maximin, affirm that, after taking a frugal repast in the sight of the army, he retired to sleep, and that, about the seventh hour of the day, a part of his own guards broke into the imperial tent, and, with many wounds, assassinated their virtuous and unsuspecting prince. If we credit another, and indeed a more probable account, Maximin was invested with the purple by a numerous detachment at the distance of several miles from the headquarters, and he trusted for success rather to the secret wishes than to the public declarations of the army. Alexander had sufficient time to awaken a faint sense of loyalty among the troops, but their reluctant professions of fidelity quickly vanished on the appearance of Maximin, who declared himself the friend and advocate of the military order, and was unanimously acknowledged emperor of the Romans by the applauding legions.
the son of Mamia, betrayed and deserted, withdrew into his tent, desirous at least to conceal his approaching fate from the insults of the multitude. He was soon followed by a tribune and some centurions, the ministers of death. But instead of receiving with manly resolution the inevitable stroke, his unavailing cries and entreaties disgraced the last moments of his life and converted into contempt some portion of the just pity which his innocence and misfortunes must inspire. His mother, Mamiya, whose pride and avarice he loudly accused as the cause of his ruin, perished with her son. The most faithful of his friends were sacrificed to the first fury of the soldiers. Others were reserved for the more deliberate cruelty of the usurper, and those who experienced the mildest treatment were stripped of their employments and ignominiously driven from the court and army. The former tyrants Caligula and Nero, Commodus and Caracalla, were dissolute and unexperienced youths educated in the purple and corrupted by the pride of the empire, the luxury of Rome, and the perfidious voice of flattery. The cruelty of Maximin was derived from a different source, the fear of contempt. Though he depended on the attachment of the soldiers who loved him for virtues like their own, he was conscious that his mean and barbarian origin, his savage appearance, and his total ignorance of the arts and institutions of civil life formed a very unfavorable contrast with the amiable manners of the unhappy Alexander. He remembered that, in his humbler fortune, he had often waited before the door of the haughty nobles of Rome, and had been denied admittance by the insolence of their slaves. He recollected, too, the friendship of a few who had relieved his poverty and assisted his rising hopes. But those who had spurned and those who had protected the Thracian were guilty of the same crime, the knowledge of his original obscurity. For this crime many were put to death and by the execution of several of his benefactors, Maximin published, in characters of blood, the indelible history of his baseness and ingratitude. The dark and sanguinary soul of the tyrant was open to every suspicion against those among his subjects who were the most distinguished by their birth or merit. Whenever he was alarmed with the sound of treason, his cruelty was unbounded and unrelenting. A conspiracy against his life was either discovered or imagined, and Magnus, a consular senator, was named as the principal author of it. Without a witness, without a trial, and without an opportunity to defense, Magnus, with four thousand of his supposed accomplices, was put to death. Italy and the whole empire were infested with innumerable spies and informers. On the slightest accusation, the first of the Roman nobles who had governed provinces, commanded armies, and been adorned with the consular and triumphal ornaments were chained on the public carriages and hurried away to the emperor's presence. Confiscation, exile, or simple death were esteemed uncommon instances of his lenity. Some of the unfortunate sufferers he ordered to be sewed up in the hides of slaughtered animals, others to be exposed to wild beasts, others again to be beaten to death with clubs. During the three years of his reign, he disdained to visit either Rome or Italy. His camp, occasionally removed from the banks of the Rhine to those of the Danube, was the seat of his stern despotism, which trampled on every principle of law and justice, and was supported by the evolved power of the sword. No man of noble birth, elegant accomplishments, or knowledge of civil business was suffered near his person, and the court of a Roman emperor revived the idea of those ancient chiefs of slaves and gladiators whose savage power had left a deep impression of terror and detestation. As long as the cruelty of Maximin was confined to the illustrious senators, or even to the bold adventurers, who, in the court of army, exposed themselves to the caprice of fortune, the body of the people viewed their sufferings with indifference, or perhaps with pleasure. But the tyrant's avarice, stimulated by the insatiate desires of the soldiers, at length attacked the public property. Every city of the empire was possessed of an independent revenue, 
destined to purchase corn for the multitude and to supply the expenses of the games and entertainments. By a single act of authority, the whole mass of wealth was at once confiscated for the use of the imperial treasury. The temples were stripped of their most valuable offerings of gold and silver, and the statues of gods, heroes, and emperors were melted down and coined into money. These impious orders could not be executed without tumults and massacres, as in many places the people chose rather to die in the defense of their altars than to behold in the midst of peace their cities exposed to the rapine and cruelty of war. The soldiers themselves, among whom the sacrilegious plunder was distributed, received it with a blush, and hardened as they were in acts of violence, they dreaded the just reproaches of their friends and relations. Throughout the Roman world, a general cry of indignation was heard, imploring the vengeance on the common enemy of humankind, and at length, by an act of private oppression, a peaceful and unarmed province was driven into rebellion against him. The procurator of Africa was a servant worthy of such a master, who considered the fines and confiscations of the rich as one of the most fruitful branches of the imperial revenue. An inquietous sentence had been pronounced against some opulent youths of that country, the execution of which would have stripped them of far the greater part of their patrimony. In this extremity, a resolution that must either complete or prevent their ruin was dictated by despair. A respite of three days, obtained with difficulty from the rapacious treasurer, was employed in collecting from their estates a great number of slaves and peasants, blindly devoted to the commands of their lords, and armed with the rustic weapons of clubs and axes. The leaders of the conspiracy, as they were admitted to the audience of the procurator, stabbed him with the daggers concealed under their garments, and, by the assistance of their tumultuary train, seized on the little town of Thaisdras, and erected the standard of rebellion against the sovereign of the Roman Empire. They rested their hopes on the hatred of mankind against Maximin, and they judiciously resolved to oppose to that detested tyrant an emperor whose mild virtues had already acquired the love and esteem of the Romans, and whose authority over the province would give weight and stability to the enterprise. Gordianus, their proconsul, and the object of their choice, refused, with unfeigned reluctance, the dangerous honor, and begged with tears that they would suffer him to terminate in peace a long and innocent life without staining his feeble age with civil blood. Their menaces compelled him to accept the imperial purple, his only refuge indeed, against the jealous cruelty of Maximin, since, according to the reasoning of tyrants, those who have been esteemed worthy of the throne deserve death, and those who deliberate have already rebelled. The family of Gordianus was one of the most illustrious of the Roman Senate. On the father's side, he was descended from the Gracchi, on his mother's, from the Emperor Trajan. A great estate enabled him to support the dignity of his birth, and, in the enjoyment of it, he displayed an elegant taste and beneficent disposition. The palace in Rome, formerly inhabited by the great Pompey, had been, during several generations, in the possession of Gordian's family. It was distinguished by ancient trophies of naval victories and decorated with the works of modern painting. His villa on the road to Prinest was celebrated for baths of singular beauty and extent, for three stately rooms of a hundred feet in length, and for a magnificent portico supported by two hundred columns of the four most curious and costly sorts of marble. The public shows exhibited at his expense, and in which the people were entertained with many hundreds of wild beasts and gladiators, seemed to surpass the fortune of a subject, and while the liberality of other magistrates was confined to a few solemn festivals at Rome, the magnificence of Gordian was repeated when he was idyle every month in the year, and extended during his consulship to the principal cities of Italy. He was twice elevated to the last-mentioned dignity by Caracalla and by Alexander. 
for he possessed the uncommon talent of acquiring the esteem of virtuous princes without alarming the jealousy of tyrants. His long life was innocently spent in the study of letters and the peaceful honors of Rome, and, till he was named proconsul of Africa by the voice of the Senate and the approbation of Alexander, he appears prudently to have declined the command of armies and the government of provinces. As long as that emperor lived, Africa was happy under the administration of his worthy representative. After the barbarous Maximin had usurped the throne, Gordianus alleviated the miseries which he was unable to prevent. When he reluctantly accepted the purple, he was above fourscore years old, a last and valuable remains of the happy age of the Antonines, whose virtues he revived in his own conduct and celebrated in an elegant poem of thirty books. With a venerable proconsul, his son, who had accompanied him into Africa as his lieutenant, was likewise declared emperor. His manners were less pure, but his character was equally amiable with that of his father. Twenty-two acknowledged concubines and a library of sixty-two thousand volumes attested the variety of his inclinations. And, from the productions which he left behind him, it appears that the former as well as the latter were designed for use rather than for ostentation. The Roman people acknowledged in the features of the younger Gordian the resemblance of Skypo Africanus recollected with pleasure that his mother was a granddaughter of Antoninus Pius, and rested the public hope on those Latin virtues which had hitherto, as they fondly imagined, lain concealed in the luxurious indolence of private life. As soon as the Gordians had appeased the first tumult of a popular election, they removed their court to Carthage. They were received with the acclamations of the Africans, who had honoured their virtues, and who, since the visit of Hadrian, had never beheld the majesty of a Roman emperor. But these vain acclamations neither strengthened nor confirmed the title of the Gordians. They were induced by principle as well as interest to solicit the approbation of the Senate, and a deputation of the noblest provincials was sent, without delay, to Rome to relate and justify the conduct of their countrymen, who, having long suffered with patience, were at length resolved to act with vigor. The letters of the new princess were modest and respectful, excusing the necessity which had obliged them to accept the imperial title. But submitting their election and their fate to the supreme judgment of the Senate, the inclinations of the Senate were neither doubtful nor divided. The birth and noble alliances of the Gordians had intimately connected them with the most illustrious houses of Rome. Their fortune had created many dependents in that assembly, their merit had acquired many friends. Their mild administration opened the flattering prospect of the restoration, not only of the civil, but even of the republican government. The terror of military violence which had first obliged the Senate to forget the murder of Alexander and to ratify the election of a barbarian peasant now produced a contrary effect and provoked them to assert the injured rights of freedom and humanity. The hatred of Maximin towards the Senate was declared and implacable. The tamest submission had not appeased his fury. The most cautious innocence would not remove his suspicions and even the care of their own safety urged them to share the fortune of an enterprise of which, if unsuccessful, they were sure to be the first victims. These considerations, and perhaps others of a more private nature, were debated in a previous conference of the consuls and the magistrates. As soon as their resolution was decided, they convoked in the temple of Castor the whole body of the senate, according to an ancient form of secrecy calculated to awaken their attention and to conceal their decrees. Conscript fathers, said the consul Silenus, the two Gordians, both of consular dignity, the one your proconsul, the other your lieutenant, have been declared emperors by the general consent of Africa. Let us return thanks, he boldly continued, to the youth of Thyestrus, 
Let us return thanks to the faithful people of Carthage, our generous deliverers from a horrid monster. Why do you hear me thus coolly, thus timidly? Why do you cast those anxious looks on each other? Why hesitate? Maximin is a public enemy. May his enmity soon expire with him, and may we long enjoy the prudence and felicity of Gordian the father, the valor and constancy of Gordian the son. The noble ardor of the consul revived the languid spirit of the senate. By a unanimous decree, the election of the Gordians was ratified. Maximin, his son, and his adherents were pronounced enemies of their country, and liberal rewards were offered to whomsoever had the courage and good fortune to destroy them. During the emperor's absence, a detachment of the Praetorian guards remained at Rome to protect, or rather to command, the capital. The prefect Vitalianus had signalized his fidelity to Maximin by the alacrity with which he had obeyed and even prevented the cruel mandates of the tyrant. His death alone could rescue the authority of the Senate and the lives of the senators from a state of danger and suspense. Before their resolves had transpired, a quester and some tribunes were commissioned to take his devoted life. They executed the order with equal boldness and success, and, with their bloody daggers in their hands, ran through the streets, proclaiming to the people and the soldiers the news of the happy revolution. The enthusiasm of liberty was seconded by the promise of a large donative in lands and money. The statues of Maximin were thrown down, the capital of the empire acknowledged, with transport the authority of two Gordians and the Senate, and the example of Rome was followed by the rest of Italy. A new spirit had arisen in that assembly whose long patience had been insulted by wanton despotism and military license. The Senate assumed the reins of government and, with a calm intrepidity, prepared to vindicate by arms the cause of freedom. Among the consular senators recommended by their merit and their services to the favor of the Emperor Alexander, it was easy to select twenty, not unequal to the command of an army and the conduct of a war. To these was the defense of Italy entrusted. Each was appointed to act in his respective department, authorized to enroll and discipline the Italian youth, and instructed to fortify the ports and highways against the impending invasion of Maximin. A number of deputies, chosen from the most illustrious of the senatorian and equestrian orders, were dispatched at the same time to the governors of the several provinces, earnestly conjuring them to fly to the assistance of their country and to remind the nations of their ancient ties of friendship with the Roman senate and people. The general respect with which these deputies were received, and the zeal of Italy and the provinces in favor of the Senate, sufficiently proved that the subjects of Maximin were reduced to that uncommon distress in which the body of the people has more to fear from oppression than from resistance. The consciousness of that melancholy truth inspires a degree of persevering fury seldom to be found in those civil wars which are artificially supported for the benefit of a few factious and designing leaders. For a while, the cause of the Gordians was embraced with such diffusive ardor the Gordians themselves were no more. The feeble court of Carthage was alarmed by the rapid approach of Cape Leanus, governor of Mauritania, who, with a small band of veterans, and a fierce host of barbarians attacked a faithful but unwarlike province. The younger guardian sallied out to meet the enemy at the head of a few guards, and a numerous undisciplined multitude educated in the peaceful luxury of Carthage. His useless valor served only to procure him an honorable death on the field of battle. His aged father, whose reign had not exceeded thirty-six days, put an end to his life on the first news of the defeat. Carthage, destitute of defense, opened her gates to the conqueror, and Africa was exposed to the rapacious cruelty of a slave obliged to satisfy his unrelenting master with a large account of blood and treasure. 
the fate of the Gordians filled Rome with just but unexpected terror. The Senate, convoked in the Temple of Concord, affected to transact the common business of the day, and seemed to decline with trembling anxiety the consideration of their own and the public danger. A silent consternation prevailed in the assembly till a senator of the name and family of Trajan awakened his brethren from their fatal lethargy. He represented to them that the choice of cautious dilatory measures had been long since out of their power, that Maximin, implacable by nature and exasperated by injuries, was advancing towards Italy at the head of the military force of the empire, and that their only remaining alternative was either to meet him bravely in the field or tamely to accept the tortures and ignominious death reserved for unsuccessful rebellion. We have lost, continued he, two excellent princes, but unless we desert ourselves, the hopes of the Republic have not perished with the Gordians. Many are the senators whose virtues have deserved and whose abilities would sustain the imperial dignity. Let us elect two emperors, one of whom may conduct the war against the public enemy, while his colleague remains at Rome to direct the civil administration. I cheerfully exposed myself to the danger and envy of the nomination, and give my vote in favor of Maximus and Balbinus. Ratify my choice, conscript fathers, or appoint in their place other more worthy of the empire." The general apprehension silenced the whispers of jealousy. The merit of the candidates was universally acknowledged, and the house resounded with the sincere acclamations of long live and victory to emperors Maximus and Balbinus. You are happy in the judgment of the Senate. May the Republic be happy under your administration. End of chapter 7, part 1 Recorded by Critical. Chapter 7, Part 2 of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, Toronto, Ontario, December 2006 The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1, by Edward Gibbon Chapter 7 Tyranny of Maximin, Rebellion, Civil Wars, Death of Maximin, Part 2 the virtues and the reputation of the new emperors justify the most sanguine hopes of the Romans. The various nature of their talents seem to appropriate to each his peculiar department of peace and war, without leaving room for jealous emulation. Balbinus was an admired orator, a poet of distinguished fame, and a wise magistrate, who had exercised with innocence and applause the civil jurisdiction in almost all the interior provinces of the empire. His birth was noble, his fortune affluent, his manners liberal and affable. In him the love of pleasure was corrected by a sense of dignity, nor had the habits of ease deprived him of a capacity for business. The mind of Maximus was formed in a rougher mould. By his valour and abilities he had raised himself from the meanest origin to the first employments of the state and army. His victories over the Sarmatians and the Germans, the austerity of his life, and the rigid impartiality of his justice, while he was a prefect of the city, commanded the esteem of a people whose affections were engaged in favor of the more amiable Balbinus. The two colleagues had both been consuls. Balbinus had twice enjoyed that honorable office. Both had been named among the twenty lieutenants of the Senate, and since the one was sixty and the other seventy-four years old, they had both attained the full maturity of age and experience. 
After the Senate had conferred on Maximus and Balbinus an equal portion of the consular and tribunitian powers, the title of fathers of their country, and the joint office of supreme pontiff, they ascended to the capital to return thanks to the gods, protectors of Rome. The solemn rites of sacrifice were disturbed by a sedition of the people. The licentious multitude neither loved the rigid Maximus, nor did they sufficiently fear the mild and humane Balbinus. Their increasing numbers surrounded the temple of Jupiter. With obstinate clamors they asserted their inherent right of consenting to the election of their sovereign, and demanded with an apparent moderation that besides the two emperors chosen by the Senate, a third should be added of the family of the Gordians, as a just return of gratitude to those princes who had sacrificed their lives for the Republic. At the head of the city guards and the youth of the equestrian order, Maximus and Balbinus attempted to cut their way through the seditious multitude. The multitude armed with sticks and stones drove them back into the capital. It is prudent to yield when the contest, whatever may be the issue of it, must be fatal to both parties. A boy, only thirteen years of age, the grandson of the elder, and nephew of the younger Gordian, was produced to the people, invested with the ornaments and title of Caesar. The tumult was appeased by this easy condescension, and the two emperors, as soon as they had been peaceably acknowledged in Rome, prepared to defend Italy against the common enemy. Whilst in Rome and Africa, revolutions succeeded each other, with such amazing rapidity that the mind of Maximin was agitated by the most furious passions. He is said to have received the news of the rebellion of the Gordians, and of the decree of the Senate against him, not with the temper of a man, but with the rage of a wild beast, which, as it could not discharge itself on the distant Senate, threatened the life of his son, of his friends, and of all who ventured to approach his person. The grateful intelligence of the death of the Gordians was quickly followed by the assurance that the Senate, laying aside all hopes of pardon or accommodation, had substituted in their room two emperors, with whose merit he could not be unacquainted. Revenge was the only consolation left to Maximin, and revenge could only be obtained by arms. The strength of the legions had been assembled by Alexander from all parts of the empire. Three successful campaigns against the Germans and the Sarmatians had raised their fame, confirmed their discipline, and even increased their numbers, by filling the ranks with the flower of the barbarian youth. The life of Maximin had been spent in war, and the candid severity of history cannot refuse him the valor of a soldier, or even the abilities of an experienced general. It might naturally be expected that a prince of such a character, instead of suffering the rebellion to gain stability by delay, should immediately have marched from the banks of the Danube to those of the Tiber, and that his victorious army, instigated by contempt for the Senate, and eager to gather the spoils of Italy, should have burned with impatience to finish the easy and lucrative conquest. Yet, as far as we can trust to the obscure chronology of that period, it appears that the operations of some foreign war deferred the Italian expedition till the ensuing spring. From the prudent conduct of Maximin, we may learn that the savage features of his character have been exaggerated by the pencil of party, that his passions, however impetuous, submitted to the force of reason, and that the barbarian possessed something of the generous spirit of Scylla, who subdued the enemies of Rome before he suffered himself to revenge his private injuries. When the troops of Maximin, advancing in excellent order, arrived at the foot of the Julian Alps, they were terrified by the silence and desolation that reigned on the frontiers of Italy. The villages and open towns had been abandoned on their approach by the inhabitants. The cattle was driven away, the provisions removed or destroyed, the bridges broken down, nor was anything left which could afford either shelter or subsistence to an invader. Such had been the wise orders of the generals of the Senate, whose design was to protract the war, to ruin the army of Maximin by the slow operation of famine, and to consume his strength in the sieges of the principal cities of Italy, 
which they had plentifully stored with men and provisions from the deserted country. Aquileia received and withstood the first shock of the invasion. The streams that issued from the head of the Hadriatic Gulf, swelled by the melting of the winter snows, opposed an unexpected obstacle to the arms of Maximin. At length, on a singular bridge, constructed with art and difficulty, of large hogsheads, he transported his army to the opposite bank, rooted up the beautiful vineyards in the neighborhood of Aquileia, demolished the suburbs, and employed the timber of the buildings in the engines and towers, with which on every side he attacked the city. The walls, fallen to decay during the security of a long peace, had been hastily repaired on this sudden emergency, but the firmest defense of Aquileia consisted in the constancy of the citizens, all ranks of whom, instead of being dismayed, were animated by the extreme danger and their knowledge of the tyrant's unrelenting temper. Their courage was supported and directed by Crispinus and Menophilus, two of the twenty lieutenants of the Senate, who, with a small body of regular troops, had thrown themselves into the besieged place. The army of Maximin was repulsed in repeated attacks, his machines destroyed by showers of artificial fire, and the generous enthusiasm of the Achilleans was exalted into a confidence of success by the opinion that Bellinus, their tutelar deity, combated in person in the defense of his distressed worshippers. The Emperor Maximus, who had advanced as far as Ravenna to secure that important place and to hasten the military preparations, beheld the event of the war in the more faithful mirror of reason and policy. He was too sensible that a single town could not resist the persevering efforts of a great army, and he dreaded lest the enemy, tired with the obstinate resistance of Aquileia, should on a sudden relinquish the fruitless siege and march directly towards Rome. The fate of the empire and the cause of freedom must then be committed to the chance of a battle. And what arms could he oppose to the veteran legions of the Rhine and Danube? Some troops newly levied among the generous but enervated youth of Italy, and a body of German auxiliaries, on whose firmness, in the hour of trial, it was dangerous to depend. In the midst of these just alarms, the stroke of domestic conspiracy punished the crimes of Maximin, and delivered Rome and the Senate from the calamities that would surely have attended the victory of an enraged barbarian. The people of Aquileia had scarcely experienced any of the common miseries of a siege. Their magazines were plentifully supplied, and several fountains within the walls assured them of an inexhaustible resource of fresh water. The soldiers of Maximin were, on the contrary, exposed to the inclemency of the season, the contagion of disease, and the horrors of famine. The open country was ruined, the rivers filled with the slain, and polluted with blood. A spirit of despair and disaffection began to diffuse itself among the troops, and as they were cut off from all intelligence, they easily believed that the whole empire had embraced the cause of the Senate, and that they were left as devoted victims to perish under the impregnable walls of Aquileia. The fierce temper of the tyrant was exasperated by disappointments, which he imputed to the cowardice of his army, and his wanton and ill-timed cruelty instead of striking terror, inspired hatred, and a just desire of revenge. A party of Praetorian guards, who trembled for their wives and children in the camp of Alba, near Rome, executed the sentence of the Senate. Maximin, abandoned by his guards, was slain at his tent with his son, whom he had associated to the honors of the purple, Anulinus, the prefect, and the principal ministers of his tyranny. The sight of their heads, borne on the point of spears, convinced the citizens of Aquileia that the siege was at an end. The gates of the city were thrown open, a liberal market was provided for the hungry troops of Maximin, and the whole army joined in solemn protestations of fidelity to the Senate and the people of Rome, and to their lawful emperors, Maximus and Balbinus. Such was the deserved fate of a brutal savage, destitute, as he has generally been represented, of every sentiment that distinguishes a civilized or even a human being. 
the body was suited to the soul. The stature of Maximin exceeded the measure of eight feet. The circumstances, almost incredible, are related of his matchless strength and appetite. Had he lived in a less enlightened age, tradition and poetry might well have described him as one of those monstrous giants whose supernatural power was constantly exerted for the destruction of mankind. It is easier to conceive than to describe the universal joy of the Roman world on the fall of the tyrant, the news of which is said to have been carried in four days from Aquileia to Rome. The return of Maximus was a triumphal procession. His colleague and young Gordian went out to meet him, and the three princes made their entry into the capital, attended by the ambassadors of almost all the cities of Italy, saluted with the splendid offerings of gratitude and superstition, and received with the unfeigned acclamations of the senate and people, who persuaded themselves that a golden age would succeed to an age of iron. The conduct of the two emperors corresponded with these expectations. They administered justice in person, and the rigor of the one was tempered by the other's clemency. The oppressive taxes with which Maximin had loaded the rights of inheritance and succession were repealed, or at least moderated. Discipline was revived, and with the advice of the Senate, many wise laws were enacted by their imperial ministers, who endeavored to restore a civil constitution on the ruins of military tyranny. What reward may we expect for delivering Rome from a monster, was the question asked by Maximus in a moment of freedom and confidence. Balbinus answered it without hesitation, the love of the Senate, of the people, and of all mankind. "'Alas!' replied his more penetrating colleague, "'alas! I dread the hatred of the soldiers, and the fatal effects of their resentment. His apprehensions were but too well justified by the event.' Whilst Maximus was preparing to defend Italy against the common foe, Balbinus, who remained at Rome, had been engaged in scenes of blood and intestine discord. Distrust and jealousy reigned in the Senate, and even in the temples where they assembled, every senator carried either open or concealed arms. In the midst of their deliberations, two veterans of the guards, actuated either by curiosity or a sinister motive, audaciously thrust themselves into the house, and advanced by degrees beyond the altar of victory. Gallicanus, a consular, and Messinus, a praetorian senator, viewed with indignation their insolent intrusion. Drawing their daggers, they laid the spies, for such they deemed them, dead at the foot of the altar, and then, advancing to the door of the senate, imprudently exhorted the multitude to massacre the praetorians, as the secret adherents of the tyrant. Those who escaped the first fury of the tumult took refuge in the camp, which they defended with superior advantage against the reiterated attacks of the people, assisted by the numerous bands of gladiators, the property of opulent nobles. The civil war lasted many days, with infinite loss and confusion on both sides. When the pipes were broken that supplied the camp with water, the Praetorians were reduced to intolerable distress, but in their turn they made desperate sallies into the city, set fire to a great number of houses, and filled the streets with the blood of the inhabitants. The Emperor Balbinus attempted, by ineffectual edicts and precarious truces, to reconcile the factions at Rome, but their animosity, though smothered for a while, burnt with redoubled violence. The soldiers, detesting the Senate and the people, despised the weakness of a prince, who wanted either the spirit or the power to command the obedience of his subjects. After the tyrant's death, his formidable army had acknowledged, from necessity rather than from choice, the authority of Maximus, who transported himself without delay to the camp before Aquileia. As soon as he had received their oath of fidelity, he addressed them in terms full of mildness and moderation, lamented rather than arraigned the wild disorders of the time, and assured the soldiers that of all their past conduct the Senate would remember only their generous desertion of the tyrant, and their voluntary return to their duty. Maximus enforced his exhortations by a liberal donative, 
purified the camp by a solemn sacrifice of expiation, and then dismissed the legions to their several provinces, impressed, as he hoped, with a lively sense of gratitude and obedience. But nothing could reconcile the haughty spirit of the Praetorians. They attended the emperors on the memorable day of their public entry into Rome, but amidst the general acclamations, the sullen, dejected countenance of the guards sufficiently declared that they considered themselves as the object, rather than the partners, of the triumph. When the whole body was united in their camp, those who had served under Maximin, and those who had remained at Rome, insensibly communicated to each other their complaints and apprehensions. The emperors chosen by the army had perished with the ignominy. Those elected by the Senate were seated on the throne. The long discord between the civil and military powers was decided by a war, in which the former had obtained a complete victory. The soldiers must now learn a new doctrine of submission to the Senate, and whatever clemency was effected by that politic assembly, they dreaded a slow revenge, colored by the name of discipline, and justified by fair pretenses of the public good. But their fate was still in their own hands, and if they had courage to despise the vain terrors of an impotent republic, it was easy to convince the world that those who were masters of the arms were masters of the authority of the state. When the Senate elected two princes, it is probable that, besides the declared reason of providing for the various emergencies of peace and war, they were actuated by the secret desire of weakening by division the despotism of the supreme magistrate. Their policy was effectual, but it proved fatal, both to their emperors and to themselves. The jealousy of power was soon exasperated by the difference of character. Maximus despised Balbinus as a luxurious noble, and was in his turn disdained by his colleague as an obscure soldier. Their silent discord was understood rather than seen, but the mutual consciousness prevented them from uniting in any vigorous measures of defense against their common enemies of the Praetorian camp. The whole city was employed in the Capitoline games, and the emperors were left almost alone in the palace. On a sudden they were alarmed by the approach of a troop of desperate assassins. Ignorant of each other's situation or designs, for they already occupied very distant apartments, afraid to give or to receive assistance, they wasted the important moments in idle debates and fruitless recriminations. The arrival of the guards put an end to the vain strife. They seized on these emperors of the Senate, for such they called them with malicious contempt, stripped them of their garments, and dragged them in insolent triumph through the streets of Rome, with the design of inflicting a slow and cruel death on these unfortunate princes. The fear of a rescue from the faithful Germans of the imperial guards shortened their tortures, and their bodies, mangled with a thousand wounds, were left exposed to the insults or to the pity of the populace. In the space of a few months, Six princes had been cut off by the sword. Gordian, who had already received the title of Caesar, was the only person that occurred to the soldiers as proper to fill the vacant throne. They carried him to the camp, and unanimously saluted him Augustus and Emperor. His name was dear to the Senate and people, his tender age promised a long impunity of military license, and the submission of Rome and the provinces to the choice of the Praetorian guards saved the Republic at the expense, indeed, of its freedom and dignity, from the horrors of a new civil war in the heart of the capital. As the third Gordian was only nineteen years of age at the time of his death, the history of his life, were it known to us with greater accuracy than it really is, would contain little more than the account of his education, and the conduct of the ministers, who by turns abused or guided the simplicity of his unexperienced youth. Immediately after his accession he fell into the hands of his mother's eunuchs, that pernicious vermin of the East, who, since the days of Elagabalus, had infested the Roman palace. By the artful conspiracy of these wretches, an impenetrable veil was drawn between an innocent prince and his oppressed subjects, the virtuous disposition of Gordian was deceived, and the honors of the empire sold without his knowledge, though in a very public manner to the most worthless of mankind. 
We are ignorant by what fortunate accident the emperor escaped from this ignominious slavery, and devolved his confidence on a minister, whose wise counsels had no object except the glory of his sovereign and the happiness of the people. It should seem that love and learning introduced Mesethius to the favor of Gordian. The young prince married the daughter of his master of rhetoric, and promoted his father-in-law to the first offices of the empire. Two admirable letters that passed between them are still extant. The minister, with the conscious dignity of virtue, congratulates Gordian that he is delivered from the tyranny of the eunuchs, and still more that he is sensible of his deliverance. The emperor acknowledges, with an amiable confusion, the errors of his past conduct, and laments with singular propriety the misfortune of a monarch, from whom a venal tribe of courtiers perpetually labor to conceal the truth. The life of Mesethius had been spent in the profession of letters, not of arms. Yet such was the versatile genius of that great man, that, when he was appointed Praetorian Prefect, he discharged the military duties of his place with vigor and ability. The Persians had invaded Mesopotamia and threatened Antioch. By the persuasion of his father-in-law, the young emperor quitted the luxury of Rome, opened for the last time recorded in history the temple of Janus, and marched in person into the east. On his approach, with a great army, the Persians withdrew their garrisons from the cities which they had already taken, and retired from the Euphrates to the Tigris. Gordian enjoyed the pleasure of announcing to the Senate the first success of his arms, which he ascribed, with a becoming modesty and gratitude, to the wisdom of his father and prefect. During the whole expedition, Mesethius watched over the safety and discipline of the army, whilst he prevented their dangerous murmurs by maintaining a regular plenty in the camp, and by establishing ample magazines of vinegar, bacon, straw, barley, and wheat in all the cities of the frontier. But the prosperity of Gordian expired with Mesethius, who died of a flux, not without very strong suspicions of poison. Philip, his successor in the prefecture, was an Arab by birth, and consequently, in the earlier part of his life, a robber by profession. His rise from so obscure a station to the first dignities of the empire seems to prove that he was a bold and able leader. But his boldness prompted him to aspire to the throne, and his abilities were employed to supplant, not to serve, his indulgent master. The minds of the soldiers were irritated by an artificial scarcity, created by his contrivance in the camp, and the distress of the army was attributed to the youth and incapacity of the prince. It is not in our power to trace the successive steps of the secret conspiracy and open sedition which were at length fatal to Gordian. A sepulchral monument was erected to his memory on the spot where he was killed, near the conflux of the Euphrates, with the little river Aboras. The fortunate Philip, raised to the empire by the votes of the soldiers, found a ready obedience from the Senate and the provinces. We cannot forbear transcribing the ingenious, though somewhat fanciful description, which a celebrated writer of our own times has traced of the military government of the Roman Empire. What in that age was called the Roman Empire was only an irregular republic, not unlike the aristocracy of Algiers, where the militia, possessed of the sovereignty, creates and deposes a magistrate, who is styled a day. Perhaps, indeed, it may be laid down as a general rule that a military government is, in some respects, more republican than monarchical. Nor can it be said that the soldiers only partook of the government by their disobedience and rebellions. The speeches made to them by the emperors, were they not at length of the same nature as those formerly pronounced to the people by the consuls and the tribunes? And although the armies had no regular place or forms of assembly, though their debates were short, their action sudden, and their resolves seldom the result of cool reflection, did they not dispose, with absolute sway, of the public fortune? What was the emperor, except the minister of a violent government, elected for the private benefit of the soldiers? When the army had elected Philip, who was praetorian prefect to the third Gordian, the latter demanded that he might remain sole emperor. He was unable to obtain it. He requested that the power might be equally divided between them, 
the army would not listen to his speech. He consented to be degraded to the rank of Caesar. The favor was refused him. He desired, at least, he might be appointed Praetorian prefect. His prayer was rejected. Finally, he pleaded for his life. The army, in these several judgments, exercised the supreme magistracy. According to the historian, whose doubtful narrative the President de Montesquieu has adopted, Philip, who, during the whole transaction, had preserved a sullen silence, was inclined to spare the innocent life of his benefactor, till, recollecting that his innocence might excite a dangerous compassion in the Roman world, he commanded, without regard to his suppliant cries, that he should be seized, stripped, and led away to instant death. After a moment's pause, the inhuman sentence was executed. End of chapter 7, part 2《ラプタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタルタル The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter 7 Tyranny of Maximin, Rebellion, Civil Wars, Death of Maximin. Part 3 On his return from the East to Rome, Philip, desirous of obliterating the memory of his crimes and of captivating the affections of the people, solemnized the secular games with infinite pomp. And magnificence. Since their institution or revival by Augustus, they had been celebrated by Claudius, by Domitian, and by Severus, and were now renewed the fifth time on the accomplishment of the full period of a thousand years from the foundation of Rome. Every circumstance of the secular games was skillfully adapted to inspire the superstitious mind with deep and solemn reverence. The long interval between them exceeded the term of human life, and as none of the spectators had already seen them, none could flatter themselves with the expectation of beholding them a second time. The mystic sacrifices were performed during three nights on the banks of the Tiber, and the campus Martius resounded with music and dances, and was illuminated with innumerable lamps and torches. Slaves and strangers were excluded from any participation in these national ceremonies. A chorus of twenty-seven youths, and as many virgins, of noble families, and whose parents were both alive, implored the propitious gods in favor of the present, and for the hope of the rising generation, requesting in religious hymns that according to the faith of their ancient oracles, they would still maintain the virtue, the felicity, and the empire of the Roman people. The magnificence of Philip's shows and entertainments dazzled the eyes of the multitude. The devout were employed in the rites of superstition, whilst the reflecting few revolved in their anxious minds the past history and the future fate of the empire. Since Romulus, with a small band of shepherds and outlaws, fortified himself in the hills near the Tiber, ten centuries had already elapsed. During the first four ages, the Romans and the laborious school of poverty had acquired the virtues of war and government. By the vigorous exertion of those virtues, and by the assistance of fortune, they had obtained, in the course of the three succeeding centuries, an absolute empire over many countries of Europe, Asia, and Africa. The last three hundred years had been consumed in apparent prosperity and internal decline. The nation of soldiers, magistrates, and legislators, who composed the thirty-five tribes of the Roman people, were dissolved into the common mass of mankind, and confounded with the millions of servile provincials who had received the name, without adopting the spirit of Romans. A mercenary army, levied among the subjects and barbarians of the frontier, was the only order of men who preserved and abused their independence. By their tumultuary election, a Syrian, a Goth, or an Arab, 
was exalted to the throne of Rome, and invested with despotic power over the conquests and over the country of the Scipios. The limits of the Roman Empire still extended from the western ocean to the Tigris, and from Mount Atlas to the Rhine and the Danube. To the undiscerning eye of the vulgar, Philip appeared a monarch no less powerful than Hadrian or Augustus had formerly been. The form was still the same, but the animating health and vigor were fled. The industry of the people was discouraged and exhausted by a long series of oppression. The discipline of the legions, which alone, after the extinction of every other virtue, had propped the greatness of the state, was corrupted by the ambition, or relaxed by the weakness, of the emperors. The strength of the frontiers, which had always consisted in arms rather than in fortifications, was insensibly undermined, and the fairest provinces were left exposed to the rapaciousness or ambition of the barbarians, who soon discovered the decline of the Roman Empire. End of chapter 7, part 3《Chapter Eight, Part One of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Julian Jameson. The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Volume One, by Edward Gibbon. Chapter Eight: State of Persian and Restoration of the Monarchy. Part One: Of the State of Persia after the Restoration of the Monarchy by Artaxerxes. Whenever Tacitus indulges himself in those beautiful episodes in which he relates some domestic transaction of the Germans or of the Parthians. His principal object is to relieve the attention of the reader from a uniform scene of vice and misery. From the reign of Augustus to the time of Alexander Severus, the enemies of Rome were in her bosom, the tyrants and the soldiers, and her prosperity had a very distant and feeble interest in the revolutions that might happen beyond the Rhine and the Euphrates. But when the military order had leveled, in wild anarchy, the power of the prince, the laws of the Senate, and even the discipline of the camp, the barbarians of the north and of the east, who had long hovered on the frontier, boldly attacked the provinces of a declining monarchy. Their vexatious inroads were changed into formidable eruptions, and after a long vicissitude of mutual calamities, many tribes of the victorious invaders established themselves in the provinces of the Roman Empire. To obtain a clearer knowledge of these great events, we shall endeavor to form a previous idea of the character, forces, and designs of those nations who avenged the cause of Hannibal and Mithridates. In the more early ages of the world, whilst the forest that covered Europe afforded a retreat to a few wandering savages, the inhabitants of Asia were already collected into populous cities and reduced under extensive empires, the seat of the arts, of luxury, and of despotism. The Assyrians reigned over the east, till the scepter of Ninus and Semiramis dropped from the hands of their enervated successors. The Medes and the Babylonians divided their power, and were themselves swallowed up in the monarchy of the Persians, whose arms could not be confined within the narrow limits of Asia. Followed, it is said, by two millions of men, Xerxes, the descendant of Cyrus, invaded Greece. Thirty thousand soldiers, under the command of Alexander, the son of Philip, who was entrusted by the Greeks with their glory and revenge, were sufficient to subdue Persia. The princes of the house of Seleucus usurped and lost the Macedonian command over the east. About the same time, that by an ignominious treaty, they resigned to the Romans the country on this side of Mount Taras. They were driven by the Parthians, an obscure horde of Scythian origin, from all the provinces of Upper Asia. The formidable power of the Parthians, which spread from India to the frontiers of Syria, was in its turn subverted by Ardshir, or Artaxerxes, the founder of a new dynasty, 
which, under the name of Sassanides, governed Persia till the invasion of the Arabs. This great revolution, whose fatal influence was soon experienced by the Romans, happened in the fourth year of Alexander Severus, two hundred and twenty-six years after the Christian era. Artaxerxes had served with great reputation in the armies of Artaban, the last king of the Parthians, and it appears that he was driven into exile and rebellion by royal ingratitude, the customary reward for superior merit. His birth was obscure, and the obscurity equally gave room to the aspersions of his enemies and the flattery of his adherents. If we credit the scandal of the former, Artaxerxes sprang from the illegitimate commerce of a tanner's wife with a common soldier. The latter represent him as descended from a branch of the ancient kings of Persia, though time and misfortune had gradually reduced his ancestors to the humble station of private citizens. As the lineal heir of the monarchy, he asserted his right to the throne, and challenged the noble task of delivering the Persians from the oppression under which they groaned above five centuries since the death of Darius. The Parthians were defeated in three great battles. In the last of these their king Artaban was slain, and the spirit of the nation was forever broken. The authority of Artaxerxes was solemnly acknowledged in a great assembly held at Balkh in Khorasan, Two younger branches of the royal house of Arsaces were confounded among the prostrate satraps. A third, more mindful of ancient grandeur than of present necessity, attempted to retire, with a numerous train of vessels, towards their kinsman, the king of Armenia. But this little army of deserters was intercepted and cut off, by the vigilance of the conqueror, who boldly assumed the double diadem, and the title of king of kings, which had been enjoyed by his predecessor. But these pompous titles, instead of gratifying the vanity of the Persian, served only to admonish him of his duty, and to inflame in his soul, and should the ambition of restoring in their full splendor the religion and empire of Cyrus. During the long servitude of Persia under the Macedonian and the Parthian yoke, the nations of Europe and Asia had mutually adopted and corrupted each other's superstitions. The Arsacides, indeed, practiced the worship of the Magi, but they disgraced and polluted it with a various mixture of foreign idolatry. The memory of Zoroaster, the ancient prophet and philosopher of the Persians, was still revered in the East, but the obsolete and mysterious language in which the Zandavesta was composed opened a field of dispute to seventy sects, who variously explained the fundamental doctrines of their religion, and were all indifferently derided by a crowd of infidels, who rejected the divine mission and miracles of the prophet. To suppress the idolaters, reunite the schismatics, and confute the unbelievers, by the infallible decision of a general council, the pious Artaxerxes summoned the Magi from all parts of his dominions. These priests, who had so long sighed in contempt and obscurity, obeyed the welcome summons, and on the appointed day appeared to the number of about eighty thousand. But as the debates of so tumultuous an assembly could not have been directed by the authority of reason, were influenced by the art of policy, the Persian synod was reduced by successive operations to forty thousand, to four thousand, to four hundred, to forty, and at last to seven magi, the most respected for their learning and piety. One of these, Erdaviraf, a young but holy prelate, received from the hands of his brethren three cups of soporiferous wine. He drank them off, and instantly fell into a long and profound sleep. As soon as he waked, he related to the king and to the believing multitude his journey to heaven, and his intimate conferences with the deity. Every doubt was silenced by this supernatural evidence, and the articles of the faith of Zoroaster were affixed with equal authority and precision. A short delineation of that celebrated system will be found useful, not only to display the character of the Persian nation, but to illustrate many of their most important transactions, both in peace and war, with the Roman Empire. The great and fundamental article of the system was the celebrated doctrine of the two principles, a bold and injudicious attempt of Eastern philosophy to reconcile the existence of moral and physical evil with the attributes of a beneficent creator and governor of the world. The first and original being, in whom or by whom the universe exists, is denominated in the writings of Zoroaster, time without bounds but it must be confessed that this infinite substance seems rather a metaphysical abstraction of the mind 
than a real object endowed with self-consciousness, or possessed of moral perfections. From either the blind or the intelligent operation of this infinite time, which bears but too near an affinity with the chaos of the Greeks, the two secondary but active principles of the universe were from all eternity produced, Ormust and Ariman, each of them possessed of the powers of creation, but each disposed by his invariable nature to exercise them with different designs. The principle of good is eternally absorbed in light, the principle of evil eternally buried in darkness. The wise benevolence of Ormust formed man capable of virtue, and abundantly provided his fair habitation with the materials of happiness. By his vigilant providence, the motion of the planets, the order of the seasons, and the temperate mixture of the elements are preserved. But the malice of Ariman has long since pierced Ormust's egg, or, in other words, has violated the harmony of his works. Since that fatal eruption, the most minute articles of good and evil are intimately intermingled and agitated together. The rankest poisons spring up amidst the most salutary plants. Deluges, earthquakes, and conflagrations attest the conflict of nature, and the little world of man is perpetually shaken by vice and misfortune. Whilst the rest of humankind are led away captives in the chains of their infernal enemy, the faithful Persian alone reserves his religious adoration for his friend and protector, Ormuzd, and fights under his banner of light, in the full confidence that he shall in the last day share the glory of his triumph. At that decisive period, the enlightened wisdom of goodness will render the power of Ormuzd superior to the furious malice of his rival. Ahriman and his followers, disarmed and subdued, will sink into their native darkness, and virtue will maintain the eternal peace and harmony of the universe. End of chapter 8, part 1chapter eight part two of the decline and fall of the roman empire volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by julian jameson chapter eight state of persian and restoration of the monarchy Part two. The theology of Zoroaster was darkly comprehended by foreigners, and even by the far greater number of his disciples. But the most careless observers were struck with the philosophic simplicity of the Persian worship. That people, said Herodotus, rejects the use of temples, of altars, and of statues, and smiles at the folly of those nations who imagine that the gods are sprung from, or bear any affinity with, the human nature. The tops of the highest mountains are the places chosen for sacrifices. Hymns and prayers are the principal worship. The supreme God, who fills the wide circle of heaven, is the object to whom they are addressed. Yet, at the same time, in the true spirit of a polytheist, he accuseth them of adoring earth, water, fire, the winds, and the sun and moon. But the Persians of every age have denied the charge, and explained the equivocal conduct which might appear to give a color to it. The elements, and more particularly fire, light, and the sun, whom they called Mithra, were the objects of their religious reverence because they considered them as the purest symbols, the noblest productions, and the most powerful agents of the divine power and nature. Every mode of religion, to make a deep and lasting impression on the human mind, must exercise our obedience, by enjoining practices of devotion for which we can assign no reason, and must acquire our esteem by inculcating moral duties analogous to the dictates of our own hearts. The religion of Zoroaster was abundantly provided with the former, and possessed a sufficient portion of the latter. At the age of puberty, the faithful Persian was invested with a mysterious girdle, the badge of the divine protection, and from that moment all the actions of his life, even the most indifferent, or the most necessary, were sanctified by their peculiar prayers, ejaculations, or genuflections, the omission of which, under any circumstances, was a grievous sin, not inferior in guilt to the violation of the moral duties. 
The moral duties, however, of justice, mercy, liberality, etc., were in their turn required of the disciples of Zoroaster, who wished to escape the persecution of Ahriman, and to live with Ormuzd in a blissful eternity, where the degree of felicity will be exactly proportioned to the degree of virtue and piety. But there are some remarkable instances in which Zoroaster lays aside the prophet, assumes the legislator, and discovers a liberal concern for private and public happiness, seldom to be found among the groveling or visionary schemes of superstition. Fasting and celibacy, the common means of purchasing the divine favor, he condemns with abhorrence, as a criminal rejection of the best gifts of providence. The saint, in the Magian religion, is obliged to beget children, to plant useful trees, to destroy noxious animals, to convey water to the dry lands of Persia, and to work out his salvation by pursuing all the labors of agriculture. We may quote from the Zendavesta, a wise and benevolent maxim, which compensates for many an absurdity. He who sows the ground with care and diligence acquires a greater stock of religious merit than he could gain by the repetition of ten thousand prayers. In the spring of every year a festival was celebrated, destined to represent the primitive equality and the present connection of mankind. The stately kings of Persia, exchanging their vain pomp for more genuine greatness, freely mingled with the humblest but most useful of their subjects. On that day the husbandmen were admitted, without distinction, to the table of the king and his satraps. The monarch accepted their petitions, inquired into their grievances, and conversed with them on the most equal terms. From your labors, was he accustomed to say, and to say with truth, if not with sincerity, from your labors we receive our subsistence, you derive your tranquillity from our vigilance. Since, therefore, we are mutually necessary to each other, let us live together like brothers, in concord and love. Such a festival must indeed have degenerated, in a wealthy and despotic empire, into a theatrical representation. But it was at least a comedy well worthy of a royal audience, and which might sometimes imprint a salutary lesson on the mind of a young prince. Had Zoroaster, in all his institutions, invariably supported this exalted character, his name would deserve a place with those of Numa and Confucius, and his system would be justly entitled to all the applause which it has pleased some of our divines, and even some of our philosophers, to bestow on it. But in that motley composition, dictated by reason and passion, by enthusiasm and by selfish motives, some useful and sublime truths were disgraced by a mixture of the most abject and dangerous superstition. The magi, or sacerdotal order, were extremely numerous, since, as we have already seen, fourscore thousand of them were convened in a general council. Their forces were multiplied by discipline. A regular hierarchy was diffused through all the provinces of Persia, and the Archimagus, who resided at Balkh, was respected as the visible head of the church, and the lawful successor of Zoroaster. The property of the Magi was very considerable. Besides the less invidious possession of a large tract of the most fertile lands of Medea, they levied a general tax on the fortunes and the industry of the Persians. Though your good works, says the interested prophet, exceed in number the leaves of the trees, the drops of rain, the stars in the heaven, or the sands on the seashore. They will all be unprofitable to you unless they are accepted by the destor, or priest. To obtain the acceptation of this guide to salvation, you must faithfully pay him tithes of all you possess, of your goods, of your lands, and of your money. If the destor be satisfied, your soul will escape hell tortures." You will secure praise in this world and happiness in the next. For the destores are the teachers of religion. They know all things, and they deliver all men. These convenient maxims of reverence and implicit were doubtless imprinted with care on the tender minds of youth. 
since the Magi were the masters of education in Persia, and to their hands the children even of the royal family were entrusted. The Persian priests, who were of a speculative genius, preserved and investigated the secrets of Oriental philosophy, and acquired, either by superior knowledge or superior art, the reputation of being well versed in some occult sciences, which have derived their appellation from the Magi. Those of more active dispositions mixed with the world in courts and cities, and it is observed that the administration of Artaxerxes was in a great measure directed by the councils of the sacerdotal order, whose dignity, either from policy or devotion, that prince restored to its ancient splendor. The first council of the Magi was agreeable to the unsociable genius of their faith, to the practice of ancient kings, and even to the example of their legislator, who had a victim to a religious war, excited by his own intolerant zeal. By an edict of Artaxerxes, the exercise of every worship, except that of Zoroaster, was severely prohibited. The temples of the Parthians, and the statues of their deified monarchs, were thrown down with ignominy. The sword of Aristotle, such was the name given by the Orientals, to the polytheism and philosophy of the Greeks, was easily broken. The flames of persecution soon reached the more stubborn Jews and Christians, nor did they spare the heretics of their own nation and religion. The majesty of Ormuzd, who was jealous of a rival, was seconded by the despotism of Artaxerxes, who could not suffer a rebel. And the schismatics within his vast empire were soon reduced to the inconsiderable number of eighty thousand. This spirit of persecution reflects dishonor on the religion of Zoroaster, but as it was not productive of any civil commotion, it served to strengthen the new monarchy by uniting all the various inhabitants of Persia in the bands of religious zeal. Artaxerxes, by his valor and conduct, had wrested the scepter of the east from the ancient royal family of Parthia. There still remained the more difficult task of establishing, throughout the vast extent of Persia, a uniform and vigorous administration. The weak indulgence of the Arsacides had resigned to their sons and brothers the principal provinces, and the greatest offices of the kingdom in the nature of hereditary possessions. The Vitax, or eighteen most powerful satraps, were permitted to assume the regal title, and the vain pride of the monarch was delighted with a nominal dominion over so many vassal kings. Even tribes of barbarians in their mountains, and the Greek cities of Upper Asia within their walls, scarcely acknowledged or seldom obeyed any superior, and the Parthian Empire exhibited under other names a lively image of the feudal system which has since prevailed in Europe. But the active victor, at the head of a numerous and disciplined army, visited in person every province of Persia. The defeat of the boldest rebels, and the reduction of the strongest fortifications, diffused the terror of his arms, and prepared the way for the peaceful reception of his authority. An obstinate resistance was fatal to the chiefs, but their followers were treated with lenity. A cheerful submission was rewarded with honors and riches. But the prudent Artaxerxes, suffering no person except himself to assume the title of king, abolished every intermediate power between the throne and the people. His kingdom, nearly equal in extent to modern Persia, was on every side bounded by the sea, or by great rivers, by the Euphrates, the Tigris, the Araxes, the Oxus, and the Indus, by the Caspian Sea and the Gulf of Persia. That country was computed to contain, in the last century, five hundred and fifty-four cities, sixty thousand villages, and about forty millions of souls. If we compare the administration of the House of Sasan with that of the House of Sefi, the political influence of the Magian with that of the Mahometan religion, we shall probably infer that the kingdom of Artaxerxes contained at least as great a number of cities, villages, and inhabitants. But it must likewise be confessed that in every age the want of harbors on the sea coast, and the scarcity of fresh water in the inland provinces, have been very unfavorable to the commerce and agriculture of the Persians, who, in the calculation of their numbers, seem to have indulged one of the nearest, though most common, artifices of national vanity. As soon as the ambitious mind of Artaxerxes had triumphed over the resistance of his vassals, he began to threaten the neighboring states, 
who, during the long slumber of his predecessors, had insulted Persia with impunity. He obtained some easy victories over the wild Scythians and the effeminate Indians, but the Romans were an enemy who, by their past injuries and present power, deserved the utmost efforts of his arms. A forty years' tranquillity, the fruit of valor and moderation, had succeeded the victories of Trajan. During the period that elapsed from the accession of Marcus to the reign of Alexander, the Roman and the Parthian empires were twice engaged in war, and although the whole strength of the Arsacides contended with a part only of the forces of Rome, the event was most commonly in favor of the latter. Macrinus, indeed, prompted by his precarious situation and pusillanimous temper, purchased a peace at the expense of near two millions of our money. But the generals of Marcus, the emperor Severus, and his son, erected many trophies in Armenia, Mesopotamia, and Assyria. Among their exploits, the imperfect relation of which would have unseasonably interrupted the more important series of domestic revolutions, we shall only mention the repeated calamities of the two great cities of Seleucia and Ctesiphon. Seleucia, on the western bank of the Tigris, about forty-five miles to the north of ancient Babylon, was the capital of the Macedonian conquests in Upper Asia. Many ages after the fall of their empire, Seleucia retained the genuine characters of a Grecian colony, arts, military virtue, and the love of freedom. The independent republic was governed by a senate of three hundred nobles. The people consisted of six hundred thousand citizens. The walls were strong, and as long as concord prevailed among the several orders of the state, they viewed with contempt the power of the Parthian. But the madness of faction was sometimes provoked to implore the dangerous aid of the common enemy, who was posted almost at the gates of the colony. The Parthian monarchs, like the Mughal sovereigns of Hindustan, delighted in the pastoral life of their Scythian ancestors, and the imperial camp was frequently pitched in the plain of Ctesiphon, on the eastern bank of the Tigris, at the distance of only three miles from Seleucia. The innumerable attendants on luxury and despotism resorted to the court, and the little village of Ctesiphon insensibly swelled into a great city. Under the reign of Marcus, the Roman generals penetrated as far as Ctesiphon and Seleucia. They were received as friends by the Greek colony. They attacked as enemies the seat of the Parthian kings. Yet both cities experienced the same treatment. The sack and conflagration of Seleucia, with the massacre of three hundred thousand of the inhabitants, tarnished the glory of the Roman triumph. Seleucia, already exhausted by the neighborhood of a too powerful rival, sunk under the fatal blow. But Ctesiphon, in about thirty-three years, had sufficiently recovered its strength to maintain an obstinate siege against the emperor Severus. The city was, however, taken by assault. The king, who defended it in person, escaped with precipitation. A hundred thousand captives, and a rich booty, rewarded the fatigues of the Roman soldiers. Notwithstanding these misfortunes, Ctesiphon succeeded to Babylon and to Seleucia, as one of the great capitals of the east. In summer, the monarch of Persia enjoyed at Ecbatana the cool breezes of the mountains of Medea, but the mildness of the climate engaged him to prefer Ctesiphon for his winter residence. From these successful inroads, the Romans derived no real or lasting benefit, nor did they attempt to preserve such distant conquests, separated from the provinces of the empire by a large tract of intermediate desert. The reduction of the kingdom of Osrone was an acquisition of less splendor indeed, but of a far more solid advantage. That little state occupied the northern and most fertile part of Mesopotamia, between the Euphrates and the Tigris. Edessa, its capital, was situated about twenty miles beyond the former of those rivers, and the inhabitants, since the time of Alexander, were a mixed race of Greeks, Arabs, Syrians, and Armenians. The feeble sovereigns of Osrone, placed on the dangerous verge of two contending empires, were attached from inclination to the Parthian cause, but the superior power of Rome exacted from them a reluctant homage, which is still attested by their medals. After the conclusion of the Parthian war under Marcus, it was judged prudent to secure some substantia, pledges of their doubtful fidelity. Forts were constructed in several parts of the country, and a Roman garrison was fixed in the strong town of Nisibis. During the troubles that followed the death of Commodus, the princes of Osrone attempted to shake off the yoke. 
but the stern policy of Severus confirmed their dependence, and the perfidy of Caracalla completed the easy conquest. Abgarus, the last king of Edessa, was sent in chains to Rome, his dominions reduced into a province, and his capital dignified with the rank of colony. And thus the Romans, about ten years before the fall of the Parthian monarchy, obtained a firm and permanent establishment beyond the Euphrates. Prudence, as well as glory, might have justified a war on the side of Artaxerxes, had his views been confined to the defense or acquisition of a useful frontier. But the ambitious Persian openly avowed a far more extensive design of conquest, and he thought himself able to support his lofty pretensions by the arms of reason as well as by those of power. Cyrus, he alleged, had first subdued, and his successors had for a long time possessed, the whole extent of Asia, as far as the Propontis and the Aegean Sea. The provinces of Caria and Ionia, under their empire, had been governed by Persian satraps, and all Egypt, to the confines of Ethiopia, had acknowledged their sovereignty. Their rights had been suspended, but not destroyed, by a long usurpation, and as soon as he received the Persian diadem, which birth and successful valor had placed upon his head, the first great duty of his station called upon him to restore the ancient limits and splendor of the monarchy. The great king, therefore, such was the haughty style of his embassies to the emperor Alexander, commanded the Romans instantly to depart from all the provinces of his ancestors and, yielding to the Persians the empire of Asia, to content themselves with the undisturbed possession of Europe. This haughty mandate was delivered by four hundred of the tallest and most beautiful of the Persians, who, by their fine horses, splendid arms, and rich apparel, displayed the pride and greatness of their master. Such an embassy was much less an offer of negotiation than a declaration of war. Both Alexander Severus, and Artaxerxes, collecting the military force of the Roman and Persian monarchies, resolved in this important contest to lead their armies in person. If we credit what should seem the most authentic of all records, an oration, still extant, and delivered by the emperor himself to the senate, we must allow that the victory of Alexander Severus was not inferior to any of those formerly obtained over the Persians by the son of Philip. The army of the great king consisted of one hundred and twenty thousand horse, clothed in complete armor of steel, of seven hundred elephants, with towers filled with archers on their backs, and of eighteen hundred chariots armed with scythes. This formidable host, the like of which is not to be found in Eastern history, and has scarcely been imagined in Eastern romance, was discomfited in a great battle, in which the Roman Alexander proved himself an intrepid soldier and a skilful general. The great king fled before his valor. An immense booty and the conquest of Mesopotamia were the immediate fruits of this signal victory. Such are the circumstances of this ostentatious and improbable relation, dictated, as it too plainly appears, by the vanity of the monarch, adorned by the unblushing servility of his flatterers and received, without contradiction, by a distant and obsequious senate. Far from being inclined to believe that the arms of Alexander obtained any memorable advantage over the Persians, we are induced to suspect that all this blaze of imaginary glory was designed to conceal some real disgrace. Our suspicions are confirmed by the authority of a contemporary historian, who mentions the virtues of Alexander with respect, and his faults with candor. He describes the judicious plan which had been formed for the conduct of the war. Three Roman armies were destined to invade Persia at the same time, and by different roads. But the operations of the campaign, though wisely concerted, were not executed either with ability or success. The first of these armies, as soon as it had entered the marshy plains of Babylon, towards the artificial conflux of the Euphrates and the Tigris, was encompassed by the superior numbers and destroyed by the arrows of the enemy. The alliance of Khosros, king of Armenia, and the long tract of mountainous country in which the Persian cavalry was of little service, opened a secure entrance into the heart of Medea, to the second of the Roman armies. These brave troops laid waste the adjacent provinces, and by several successful actions against Artaxerxes gave a faint color to the emperor's vanity. But the retreat of this victorious army was imprudent, or at least unfortunate. 
in repassing the mountains great numbers of soldiers perished by the badness of the roads and the severity of the winter season it had been resolved that whilst these two great detachments penetrated into the opposite extremes of the persian dominions the main body under the command of alexander himself should support their attack by invading the centre of the kingdom but the unexperienced youth influenced by his mother's counsels and perhaps by his own fears deserted the bravest troops and the fairest prospect of victory and after consuming in mesopotamia an inactive and inglorious summer he led back to antioch an army diminished by sickness and provoked by disappointment the behaviour of artaxerxes had been different flying with rapidity from the hills of medea to the marshes of the euphrates he had everywhere opposed the invaders in person and in either fortune had united with the ablest conduct the most undaunted resolution. But in several obstinate engagements against the veteran legions of Rome, the Persian monarch had lost the flower of his troops. Even his victories had weakened his power. The favorable opportunities of the absence of Alexander, and of the confusions that followed that emperor's death, presented themselves in vain to his ambition. Instead of expelling the Romans, as he pretended, from the continent of Asia, he found himself unable to wrest from their hands the little province of Mesopotamia. The reign of Artaxerxes, which from the last defeat of the Parthians lasted only fourteen years, forms a memorable era in the history of the East, and even in that of Rome. His character seems to have been marked by those bold and commanding features that generally distinguish the princes who conquer from those who inherit an empire. Till the last period of the Persian monarchy, his code of laws was respected as the groundwork of their civil and religious policy. Several of his sayings are preserved. One of them in particular discovers a deep insight into the constitution of government. The authority of the prince, said Artaxerxes, must be defended by a military force. That force can only be maintained by taxes. All taxes must, at last, fall upon agriculture, and agriculture can never flourish except under the protection of justice and moderation. Artaxerxes bequeathed his new empire and his ambitious designs against the Romans to Sapor, a son not unworthy of his great father, but those designs were too extensive for the power of Persia, and served only to involve both nations in a long series of destructive wars and reciprocal calamities. The Persians, long since civilized and corrupted, were very far from possessing the martial independence and the intrepid hardiness, both of mind and body, which have rendered the northern barbarians masters of the world. The science of war, that constituted the more rational force of Greece and Rome, as it now does of Europe, never made any considerable progress in the East. Those disciplined evolutions which harmonize and animate a confused multitude were unknown to the Persians. They were equally unskilled in the arts of constructing, besieging, or defending regular fortifications. They trusted more to their numbers than to their courage, more to their courage than to their discipline. The infantry was a half-armed, spiritless crowd of peasants, levied in haste by the allurements of plunder and as easily dispersed by a victory as by a defeat. The monarch and his nobles transported into the camp the pride and luxury of the seraglio. Their military operations were impeded by a useless train of women, eunuchs, horses, and camels, and in the midst of a successful campaign the Persian host was often separated or destroyed by an unexpected famine. But the nobles of Persia, in the bosom of luxury and despotism, preserved a strong sense of personal gallantry and national honor. From the age of seven years they were taught to speak truth, to shoot with the bow, and to ride. And it was universally confessed that in the two last of these arts they had made a more than common proficiency. The most distinguished youth were educated under the monarch's eye, practiced their exercises in the gate of his palace, and were severely trained up to the habits of temperance and obedience in their long and laborious parties of hunting. In every province the satrap maintained a like school of military virtue. The Persian nobles, so natural is the idea of feudal tenures, received from the king's bounty lands and houses, on the condition of their service in war. 
they were ready on the first summons to mount on horseback, with a martial and splendid train of followers, and to join the numerous bodies of guards, who were carefully selected from among the most robust slaves, and the bravest adventurers of Asia. These armies, both of light and of heavy cavalry, equally formidable by the impetuosity of their charge, and the rapidity of their motions, threatened, as an impeding cloud, the eastern provinces of the declining empire of Rome. End of chapter 8, part 2《Chapter Nine, Parts One and Two of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon, Volume One, Chapter Nine: State of Germany until the Barbarians. Part One. The State of Germany till the invasion of the barbarians in the time of the Emperor Decius. The government and religion of Persia have deserved some notice from their connection with the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. We shall occasionally mention the Scythian or Sarmatian tribes, which with their arms and horses, their flocks and herds, their wives and families, wandered over the immense plains which spread themselves from the Caspian Sea to the Vistula, from the confines of Persia to those of Germany. But the warlike Germans, who first resisted, then invaded, and at length overturned the western monarchy of Rome, will occupy a much more important place in this history, and possess a stronger, and if we may use the expression, a more domestic claim to our attention and regard. The most civilized nations of modern Europe issued from the woods of Germany, and in the rude institutions of those barbarians we may still distinguish the original principles of our present laws and manners. In their primitive state of simplicity and independence, the Germans were surveyed by the discerning eye and delineated by the masterly pencil of Tacitus, the first of historians who applied the science of philosophy to the study of facts. The expressive conciseness of his descriptions has served to exercise the diligence of innumerable antiquarians and to excite the genius and penetration of the philosophic historians of our own times. The subject, however various and important, has already been so frequently, so ably, and so successfully discussed that it is now grown familiar to the reader and difficult to the writer. We shall therefore content ourselves with observing, and indeed with repeating, some of the most important circumstances of climate, of manners, and of institutions which rendered the wild barbarians of Germany such formidable enemies to the Roman power. Ancient Germany, excluding from its independent limits the province westward of the Rhine, which had submitted to the Roman yoke, extended itself over a third part of Europe. Almost the whole of modern Germany, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Livonia, Prussia, and the greater part of Poland were peopled by the various tribes of one great nation, whose complexion, manners, and language denoted a common origin and preserved a striking resemblance. On the west, ancient Germany was divided by the Rhine from the Gallic, and on the south by the Danube, from the Illyrian provinces of the empire. A ridge of hills rising from the Danube and called the Carpathian Mountains covered Germany on the side of Dacia, or Hungary. The eastern frontier was faintly marked by the mutual fears of the Germans and the Sarmatians, and was often confounded by the mixture of warring and confederating tribes of the two nations. In the remote darkness of the north, the ancients imperfectly descried a frozen ocean that lay beyond the Baltic Sea, and beyond the peninsula or islands of Scandinavia. Some ingenious writers have suspected that Europe was much colder formerly than it is at present, and the most ancient descriptions of the climate of Germany tend exceedingly to confirm their theory. The general complaints of intense frost and eternal winter are perhaps little to be regarded, since we have no method of reducing to the accurate standard of the thermometer the feelings or the expressions of an orator born in the happier regions of Greece or Asia. But I shall select two remarkable circumstances of a less equivocal nature. 1. The great rivers which covered the Roman provinces, the Rhine and the Danube, were frequently frozen over, and capable of supporting the most enormous weights. 
the barbarians, who often chose that severe season for their inroads, transported, without apprehension or danger, their numerous armies, their cavalry, and their heavy wagons, over a vast and solid bridge of ice. Modern ages have not presented an instance of a like phenomenon. 2. The reindeer, that useful animal, from whom the savage of the north derives the best comforts of his dreary life, is of a constitution that supports, and even requires, the most intense cold. He is found on the rock of Spitzberg, within ten degrees of the pole. He seems to delight in the snows of Lapland and Siberia, but at present he cannot subsist, much less multiply, in any country to the south of the Baltic. In the time of Caesar, the reindeer, as well as the elk and the wild bull, was a native of the Hercynian forest, which then overshadowed a great part of Germany and Poland. The modern improvements sufficiently explain the causes of the diminution of the cold. These immense woods have been gradually cleared, which intercepted from the earth the rays of the sun. The morasses have been drained, and in proportion as the soil has been cultivated, the air has become more temperate. Canada, at this day, is an exact picture of ancient Germany. Although situated in the same parallel with the finest provinces of France and England, that country experiences the most rigorous cold. The reindeer are very numerous. The ground is covered with deep and lasting snow, and the great river of St. Lawrence is regularly frozen, in a season when the waters of the Seine and the Thames are usually free from ice. It is difficult to ascertain, and easy to exaggerate, the influence of the climate of ancient Germany over the minds and bodies of the natives. Many writers have supposed, and most have allowed, though as it should seem without any adequate proof, that the rigorous cold of the north was favorable to long life and generative vigor, that the women were more fruitful and the human species more prolific than in warmer or more temperate climates. We may assert with greater confidence that the keen air of Germany formed the large and masculine limbs of the natives, who were in general of a more lofty stature than the people of the south, gave them a kind of strength better adapted to violent exertions than to patient labor, and inspired them with constitutional bravery, which is the result of nerves and spirits. The severity of a winter campaign that chilled the courage of the Roman troops was scarcely felt by these hardy children of the north, who, in their turn, were unable to resist the summer heats and dissolved away in languor and sickness under the beams of an Italian sun. Chapter 9 Part 2 There is not anywhere upon the globe a large tract of country which we have discovered destitute of inhabitants, or whose first population can be fixed with any degree of historical certainty. And yet, as the most philosophic minds can seldom refrain from investigating the infancy of great nations, our curiosity consumes itself in toilsome and disappointed efforts. When Tacitus considered the purity of the German blood and the forbidding aspect of the country, he was disposed to pronounce those barbarians indigen or natives of the soil. We may allow with safety, and perhaps with truth, that ancient Germany was not originally peopled by any foreign colonies already formed into a political society, but that the name and nation received their existence from the gradual union of some wandering savages of the Hercynian woods. To assert those savages to have been the spontaneous production of the earth which they inhabited would be a rash inference, condemned by religion and unwarranted by reason. Such rational doubt is but ill-suited with the genius of popular vanity. Among the nations who have adopted the mosaic history of the world, the Ark of Noah has been of the same use, as was formerly to the Greeks and Romans, the siege of Troy. On a narrow basis of acknowledged truth, an immense but rude superstructure of fable has been erected, and the wild Irishman, as well as the wild Tartar, could point out the individual son of Japhet, from whose loins his ancestors were lineally descended. The last century abounded with antiquarians of profound learning and easy faith, who, by the dim light of legends and traditions, of conjectures and etymologies, conducted the great-grandchildren of Noah from the Tower of Babel to the extremities of the globe. Of these judicious critics, one of the most entertaining was Oas Rudbeck, professor in the University of Upsal. Whatever is celebrated either in history or fable, this zealous patriot ascribes to his country. 
from Sweden, which formed so considerable a part of ancient Germany, the Greeks themselves derived their alphabetical characters, their astronomy, and their religion. Of that delightful region, for such it appeared to the eyes of a native, the Atlantis of Plato, the country of the Hyperboreans, the Garden of the Hesperides, the Fortunate Islands, and even the Elysian Fields, were all but faint and imperfect transcripts. A clime so profusely favored by nature could not long remain desert after the flood. The learned Rudbeck allows the family of Noah a few years to multiply from eight to about twenty thousand persons. He then disperses them into small colonies to replenish the earth and to propagate the human species. The German or Swedish detachment, which marched, if I am not mistaken, under the command of Askenaz, the son of Gomer, the son of Shaphet, distinguished itself by a more than common diligence in the prosecution of this great work. The northern hive cast its swarms over the greatest part of Europe, Africa, and Asia, and, to use the author's metaphor, the blood circulated from the extremities to the heart. But all this well-labored system of German antiquities is annihilated by a single fact, too well attested to admit of any doubt, and of too decisive a nature to leave room for any reply. The Germans, in the age of Tacitus, were unacquainted with the use of letters, and the use of letters is the principal circumstance that distinguishes a civilized people from a herd of savages incapable of knowledge or reflection. Without that artificial help, the human memory soon dissipates or corrupts the ideas entrusted to her charge, and the nobler faculties of the mind, no longer supplied with models or with materials, gradually forget their powers. The judgment becomes feeble and lethargic, the imagination languid or irregular. Fully to apprehend this important truth, let us attempt, in an improved society, to calculate the immense distance between the man of learning and the illiterate peasant. The former, by reading and reflection, multiplies his own experience and lives in distant ages and remote countries, whilst the latter, rooted to a single spot and confined to a few years of existence, surpasses but very little his fellow laborer, the ox, in the exercise of his mental faculties. The same, and even a greater difference, will be found between nations than between individuals, and we may safely pronounce that without some species of writing, no people has ever preserved the faithful annals of their history, ever made any considerable progress in the abstract sciences, or ever possessed in any tolerable degree of perfection the useful and agreeable arts of life. Of these arts, the ancient Germans were wretchedly destitute. They passed their lives in a state of ignorance and poverty, which it has pleased some declaimers to dignify with the appellation of virtuous simplicity. Modern Germany is said to contain about 2,300 walled towns. In a much wider extent of country, the geographer Ptolemy could discover no more than 90 places which he decorates with the name of cities, though, according to our ideas, they would but ill-deserve that splendid title. We can only suppose them to have been rude fortifications, constructed in the center of the woods, and designed to secure the women, children, and cattle, whilst the warriors of the tribe marched out to repel a sudden invasion. But Tacitus asserts, as a well-known fact, that the Germans in his time had no cities, and that they affected to despise the works of Roman industry as places of confinement rather than of security. Their edifices were not even contiguous or formed into regular villas. Each barbarian fixed his independent dwelling on the spot to which a plain, a wood, or a stream of fresh water had induced him to give the preference. Neither stone, nor brick, nor tiles were employed in these slight habitations. They were, indeed, no more than low huts of a circular figure, built of rough timber, thatched with straw, and pierced at the top to leave a free passage for the smoke. In the most inclement weather, the hardy German was satisfied with a scanty garment made of the skin of some animal. The nations who dwelt towards the north clothed themselves in furs, and the women manufactured for their own use a coarse kind of linen. The game of various sorts, with which the forests of Germany were plentifully stocked, supplied its inhabitants with food and exercise. Their monstrous herds of cattle, less remarkable indeed for their beauty than for their utility, formed the principal object of their wealth. A small quantity of corn was the only produce exacted from the earth. The use of orchards or artificial meadows was unknown to the Germans, 
nor can we expect any improvements in agriculture from a people whose prosperity every year experienced a general change by a new division of the arable lands, and who, in that strange operation, avoided disputes by suffering a great part of their territory to lie waste and without tillage. Gold, silver, and iron were extremely scarce in Germany. Its barbarous inhabitants wanted both skill and patience to investigate those rich veins of silver which have so liberally rewarded the attention of the princes of Brunswick and Saxony. Sweden, which now supplies Europe with iron, was equally ignorant of its own riches, and the appearance of the arms of the Germans furnished a sufficient proof how little iron they were able to bestow on what they must have deemed the noblest use of that metal. The various transactions of peace and war had introduced some Roman coins, chiefly silver, among the borderers of the Rhine and Danube, but the more distant tribes were absolutely unacquainted with the use of money, carried on their confined traffic by the exchange of commodities, and prized their rude earthen vessels as of equal value with the silver vases, the presence of Rome to their princes and ambassadors. To a mind capable of reflection, such leading facts convey more instruction than a tedious detail of subordinate circumstances. The value of money has been settled by general consent to express our wants and our property, as letters were invented to express our ideas. And both these institutions, by giving a more active energy to the powers and passions of human nature, have contributed to multiply the objects they were designed to represent. The use of gold and silver is in a great measure factitious, but it would be impossible to enumerate the important and various services which agriculture and all the arts have received from iron, when tempered and fashioned by the operation of fire and the dexterous hand of man. Money, in a word, is the most universal incitement, iron the most powerful instrument of human industry, and it is very difficult to conceive by what means a people, neither actuated by the one nor seconded by the other, could emerge from the grossest barbarism. If we contemplate a savage nation in any part of the globe, a supine indolence and a carelessness of futurity will be found to constitute their general character. In a civilized state, every faculty of man is expanded and exercised, and the great chain of mutual dependence connects and embraces the several members of society. The most numerous portion of it is employed in constant and useful labor. The select few, placed by fortune above that necessity, can, however, fill up their time by the pursuits of interest or glory, by the improvement of their estate or of their understanding, by the duties, the pleasures, and even the follies of social life. The Germans were not possessed of these varied resources. The care of the house and family, the management of the land and cattle, were delegated to the old and the infirm, to women and slaves. The lazy warrior, destitute of every art that might employ his leisure hours, consumed his days and nights in the animal gratifications of sleep and food. And yet, by a wonderful diversity of nature, according to the remark of a writer who had pierced into its darkest recesses, the same barbarians are by turns the most indolent and the most restless of mankind. They delight in sloth, they detest tranquility. The languid soul, oppressed with its own weight, anxiously required some new and powerful sensation, and war and danger were the only amusements adequate to its fierce temper. The sound that summoned the German to arms was grateful to his ear. It roused him from his uncomfortable lethargy, gave him an active pursuit, and by strong exercise of the body and violent emotions of the mind, restored him to a more lively sense of his existence. In the dull intervals of peace, these barbarians were immoderately addicted to deep gaming and excessive drinking, both of which, by different means, the one by inflaming their passions, the other by extinguishing their reason, alike relieved them from the pain of thinking. They gloried in passing whole days and nights at table, and the blood of friends and relations often stained their numerous and drunken assemblies. Their debts of honor, for in that light they have transmitted to us those of play, they discharged with the most romantic fidelity. The desperate gamester, who had staked his person and liberty on a last throw of the dice, patiently submitted to the decision of fortune, and suffered himself to be bound, chastised, and sold into remote slavery by his weaker but more lucky antagonist. Strong beer, a liquor extracted with very little art from wheat or barley, 
and corrupted, as it is strongly expressed by Tacitus, into a certain semblance of wine, was sufficient for the gross purposes of German debauchery. But those who had tasted the rich wines of Italy, and afterwards of Gaul, sighed for that more delicious species of intoxication. They attempted not, however, as has since been executed with so much success, to naturalize the vine on the banks of the Rhine and Danube, nor did they endeavor to procure by industry the materials of an advantageous commerce. To solicit by labor what might be ravished by arms was esteemed unworthy of the German spirit. The intemperate thirst of strong liquors often urged the barbarians to invade the provinces on which art or nature had bestowed those more envied presents. The Tuscan who betrayed his country to the Celtic nations attracted them into Italy by the prospect of the rich fruits and delicious wines, the productions of a happier climate. And in the same manner, the German auxiliaries, invited into France during the civil wars of the sixteenth century, were allured by the promise of plenteous quarters in the provinces of Champagne and Burgundy. Drunkenness, the most illiberal, but not the most dangerous of our vices, was sometimes capable, in a less civilized state of mankind, of occasioning a battle, a war, or a revolution. The climate of ancient Germany has been modified, and the soil fertilized by the labor of ten centuries from the time of Charlemagne. The same extent of ground which at present maintains, in ease and plenty, a million of husbandmen and artificers, was unable to supply a hundred thousand lazy warriors with the simple necessities of life. The Germans abandoned their immense forests to the exercise of hunting, employed in pasturage the most considerable part of their lands, bestowed on the small remainder a rude and careless cultivation, and then accused the scantiness and sterility of a country that refused to maintain the multitude of its inhabitants. When the return of famine severely admonished them of the importance of the arts, the national distress was sometimes alleviated by the emigration of a third, perhaps, or a fourth part of their youth. The possession and the enjoyment of property are the pledges which bind a civilized people to an improved country. But the Germans, who carried with them what they most valued, their arms, their cattle, and their women, cheerfully abandoned the vast silence of their woods for the unbounded hopes of plunder and conquest. The innumerable swarms that issued, or seemed to issue, from the great storehouse of nations were multiplied by the fears of the vanquished and by the credulity of the succeeding ages and from facts thus exaggerated, an opinion was gradually established, and has been supported by writers of distinguished reputation, that, in the age of Caesar and Tacitus, the inhabitants of the North were far more numerous than they are in our days. A more serious inquiry into the causes of population seems to have convinced modern philosophers of the falsehood, and indeed the impossibility of the supposition. To the names of Mariana and of Machiavel, we can oppose the equal names of Robertson and Hume. A warlike nation like the Germans, without either cities, letters, arts, or money, found some compensation for this savage state in the enjoyment of liberty. Their poverty secured their freedom, since our desires and our possessions are the strongest fetters of despotism. Among the Suyones, says Tacitus, riches are held in honor. They are therefore subject to an absolute monarch who, instead of entrusting his people with the free use of arms, as is practiced in the rest of Germany, commits them to the safe custody, not of a citizen, or even of a freedman, but of a slave. The neighbors of the Suyons, the Cytones, are sunk even below servitude. They obey a woman. In the mention of these exceptions, the great historian sufficiently acknowledges the general theory of government. We are only at a loss to conceive by what means riches and despotism could penetrate into a remote corner of the north, and extinguish the generous flame that blazed with such fierceness on the frontier of the Roman provinces, or how the ancestors of those Danes and Norwegians, so distinguished in latter ages by their unconquered spirit, could thus tamely resign the great character of German liberty. Some tribes, however, on the coast of the Baltic, acknowledged the authority of kings, though without relinquishing the rights of men, but in the far greater part of Germany, the form of government was a democracy, tempered, indeed, and controlled, not so much by general and positive laws, as by the occasional ascendant of birth or valor, of eloquence or superstition. 
Civil governments, in their first institution, are voluntary associations for mutual defense. To obtain the desired end, it is absolutely necessary that each individual should conceive himself obliged to submit his private opinions and actions to the judgment of the greater number of his associates. The German tribes were contented with this rude but liberal outline of political society. As soon as a youth, born of free parents, had attained the age of manhood, he was introduced into the general council of his countrymen, solemnly invested with a shield and spear, and adopted as an equal and worthy member of the military commonwealth. The assembly of the warriors of the tribe was convened at stated seasons or on sudden emergencies. The trial of public offenses, the election of magistrates, and the great business of peace and war were determined by its independent voice. Sometimes, indeed, these important questions were previously considered and prepared in a more select council of the principal chieftains. The magistrates might deliberate and persuade. The people could only resolve and execute and the resolutions of the Germans were for the most part hasty and violent. Barbarians accustomed to place their freedom in gratifying the present passion, and their courage in overlooking all future consequences, turned away with indignant contempt from the remonstrances of justice and policy, and it was the practice to signify by a hollow murmur their dislike of such timid counsels. But whenever a more popular orator proposed to vindicate the meanest citizen from either foreign or domestic injury, whenever he called upon his fellow countrymen to assert the national honor, or to pursue some enterprise full of danger and glory, a loud clashing of shields and spears expressed the eager applause of the assembly. For the Germans always met in arms, and it was constantly to be dreaded, lest an irregular multitude, inflamed with faction and strong liquors, should use those arms to enforce— as well as to declare their furious resolves. We may recollect how often the diets of Poland have been polluted with blood, and the more numerous party has been compelled to yield to the more violent and seditious. A general of the tribe was elected on occasions of danger, and if the danger was pressing and extensive, several tribes concurred in the choice of the same general. The bravest warrior was named to lead his countrymen into the field, by his example rather than by his commands. But this power, however limited, was still invidious. It expired with the war, and in time of peace the German tribes acknowledged not any supreme chief. Princes were, however, appointed in the General Assembly to administer justice, or rather to compose differences in their respective districts. In the choice of these magistrates, as much regard was shown to birth as to merit. To each was assigned by the public a guard, and a council of a hundred persons, and the first of the princes appears to have enjoyed a preeminence of rank and honor which sometimes tempted the Romans to compliment him with the regal title. The comparative view of the powers of the magistrates in two remarkable instances is alone sufficient to represent the whole system of German manners. The disposal of the landed property within their district was absolutely vested in their hands, and they distributed it every year according to a new division. At the same time, they were not authorized to punish with death, to imprison, or even to strike a private citizen. A people thus jealous of their persons, and careless of their possessions, must have been totally destitute of industry and the arts, but animated with a high sense of honor and independence. End of chapter 9, parts 1 and 2《ハプニング》第9部分第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9章第9The Germans respected only those duties which they imposed on themselves. The most obscure soldier resisted with disdain the authority of the magistrates. The noblest youths blushed not to be numbered among the faithful companions of some renowned chief, to whom they devoted their arms and service. A noble emulation prevailed among the companions to obtain the first place in the esteem of their chief, amongst the chiefs to acquire the greatest number of valiant companions. 
To be ever surrounded by a band of select youths was the pride and strength of the chiefs, their ornament in peace, their defense in war. The glory of such distinguished heroes diffused itself beyond the narrow limits of their own tribe. Presents and embassies solicited their friendship, and the fame of their arms often ensured victory to the party which they espoused. In the hour of danger it was shameful for the chief to be surpassed in valor by his companions, shameful for the companions not to equal the valor of their chief. To survive his fall in battle was indelible infamy. To protect his person and to adorn his glory with the trophies of their own exploits were the most sacred of their duties. The chiefs combated for victory, the companions for the chief. The noblest warriors, whenever their native country was sunk into the laziness of peace, maintained their numerous bands in some distant scene of action to exercise their restless spirit and to acquire renown by voluntary dangers. Gifts worthy of soldiers, the warlike steed, the bloody and even victorious lance, were the rewards which the companions claimed from the liberality of their chief. The rude plenty of his hospitable board was the only pay that he could bestow, or they would accept. War, rapine, and the free-will offerings of his friends supplied the materials of this beneficence. This institution, however it might accidentally weaken the several republics, invigorated the general character of the Germans, and even ripened amongst them all the virtues of which barbarians are susceptible, the faith and valor, the hospitality and the courtesy, so conspicuous long afterwards in the ages of chivalry. The honorable gifts bestowed by the chief on his brave companions have been supposed, by an ingenious writer, to contain the first rudiments of the fiefs, distributed after the conquest of the Roman provinces by the barbarian lords among their vassals, with a similar duty of homage and military service. These conditions are, however, very repugnant to the maxims of the ancient Germans who delighted in mutual presence, but without either imposing or accepting the weight of obligations. In the days of chivalry, or more properly of romance, all the men were brave, and all the women were chaste. And notwithstanding the latter of these virtues is acquired and preserved with much more difficulty than the former, it is ascribed, almost without exception, to the wives of the ancient Germans. Polygamy was not in use, except among the princes, and among them only for the sake of multiplying their alliances. Divorces were prohibited by manners rather than by laws. Adulteries were punished as rare and inexpiable crimes, nor was seduction justified by example and fashion. We may easily discover that Tacitus indulges an honest pleasure in the contrast of barbarian virtue with the dissolute conduct of the Roman ladies. Yet there are some striking circumstances that give an air of truth, or at least probability, to the conjugal faith and chastity of the Germans. Although the progress of civilization has undoubtedly contributed to assuage the fiercer passions of human nature, it seems to have been less favorable to the virtue of chastity, whose most dangerous enemy is the softness of the mind. The refinements of life corrupt while they polish the intercourse of the sexes. The gross appetite of love becomes most dangerous when it is elevated, or rather indeed disguised, by sentimental passion. The elegance of dress, of motion, and of manners gives a luster to beauty, and inflames the senses through the imagination. Luxurious entertainments, midnight dances, and licentious spectacles present at once temptation and opportunity to female frailty. From such dangers the unpolished wives of the barbarians were secured by poverty, solitude, and the painful cares of a domestic life. The German huts, open on every side to the eye of indiscretion or jealousy, were a better safeguard of conjugal fidelity than the walls, the bolts, and the eunuchs of a Persian harem. To this reason another may be added, of a more honorable nature. The Germans treated their women with esteem and confidence, consulted them on every occasion of importance, and fondly believed that in their breast resided a sanctity and wisdom more than human. Some of the interpreters of fate, such as Valida, in the Batvian War, governed, in the name of the deity, the fiercest nations of Germany. The rest of the sex, without being adored as goddesses, were respected as the free and equal companions of soldiers, associated even by the marriage ceremony to a life of toil, of danger, and of glory. In their great invasions, the camps of the barbarians were filled with a multitude of women, 
who remained firm and undaunted amidst the sound of arms, the various forms of destruction, and the honorable wounds of their sons and husbands. Fainting armies of Germans have, more than once, been driven back upon the enemy by the generous despair of the women, who dreaded death much less than servitude. If the day was irrevocably lost, they well knew how to deliver themselves and their children, with their own hands, from an insulting victor. Heroines of such a caste may claim our admiration, but they were most assuredly neither lovely nor very susceptible of love. Whilst they affected to emulate the stern virtues of man, they must have resigned that attractive softness in which principally consists the charm and weakness of woman. Conscious pride taught the German females to suppress every tender emotion that stood in competition with honor, and the first honor of the sex has ever been that of chastity. The sentiments and conduct of these high-spirited matrons may at once be considered as a cause, as an effect, and as a proof of the general character of the nation. Female courage, however it may be raised by fanaticism or confirmed by habit, can be only a faint and imperfect imitation of the manly valor that distinguishes the age or country in which it may be found. The religious system of the Germans, if the wild opinions of savages can deserve that name, was dictated by their wants, their fears, and their ignorance. They adored the great visible objects and agents of nature, the sun and the moon, the fire and the earth, together with those imaginary deities who were supposed to preside over the most important occupations of human life. They were persuaded that, by some ridiculous arts of divination, they could discover the will of the superior beings, and that human sacrifices were the most precious and acceptable offering to their altars. Some applause has been hastily bestowed on the sublime notion, entertained by that people, of the deity whom they neither confined within the walls of the temple nor represented by any human figure. But when we recollect that the Germans were unskilled in architecture and totally unacquainted with the art of sculpture, we shall readily assign the true reason of a scruple which arose not so much from a superiority of reason as from a want of ingenuity. The only temples in Germany were dark and ancient groves, consecrated by the reverence of succeeding generations. Their secret gloom, the imagined residence of an invisible power, by presenting no distinct object of fear or worship, impressed the mind with a still deeper sense of religious horror. And the priests, rude and illiterate as they were, had been taught by experience the use of every artifice that could preserve and fortify impressions so well suited to their own interest. The same ignorance, which renders barbarians incapable of conceiving or embracing the useful restraints of laws, exposes them naked and unarmed to the blind terrors of superstition. The German priests, improving this favorable temper of their countrymen, had assumed a jurisdiction even in temporal concerns, which the magistrate could not venture to exercise, and the haughty warrior patiently submitted to the lash of correction when it was inflicted not by any human power, but by the immediate order of the god of war. The defects of civil policy were sometimes supplied by the interposition of ecclesiastical authority. The latter was constantly exerted to maintain silence and decency in the popular assemblies, and was sometimes extended to a more enlarged concern for the national welfare. A solemn procession was occasionally celebrated in the present countries of Mecklenburg and Pomerania. The unknown symbol of the earth, covered with a thick veil, was placed on a carriage drawn by cows, and in this manner the goddess, whose common residence was in the Isles of Rugen, visited several adjacent tribes of her worshippers. During her progress the sound of war was hushed, quarrels were suspended, arms laid aside, and the restless Germans had an opportunity of tasting the blessings of peace and harmony. The truce of God, so often and so ineffectually proclaimed by the clergy of the eleventh century, was an obvious imitation of this ancient custom. But the influence of religion was far more powerful to inflame than to moderate the fierce passions of the Germans. Interest and fanaticism often prompted its ministers to sanctify the most daring and the most unjust enterprises by the approbation of heaven and full assurances of success. The consecrated standards, long revered in the groves of superstition, were placed in the front of the battle, 
and the hostile army was devoted with dire execrations to the gods of war and of thunder. In the faith of soldiers, and such were the Germans, cowardice is the most unpardonable of sins. A brave man was the worthy favorite of their martial deities. The wretch who had lost his shield was alike banished from the religious and civil assemblies of his countrymen. Some tribes of the North seem to have embraced the doctrine of transmigration. Others imagined a gross paradise of immortal drunkenness. All agreed that a life spent in arms and a glorious death in battle were the best preparations for a happy futurity, either in this or in another world. The immortality so vainly promised by the priests was, in some degree, conferred by the bards. That singular order of men has most deservedly attracted the notice of all who have attempted to investigate the antiquities of the Celts, the Scandinavians, and the Germans. Their genius and character, as well as the reverence paid to that important office, have been sufficiently illustrated. But we cannot so easily express, or even conceive, the enthusiasm of arms and glory which they kindled in the breast of their audience. Among a polished people, a taste for poetry is rather an amusement of the fancy than a passion of the soul. And yet, when in calm retirement we peruse the combats described by Homer or Tasso, we are insensibly seduced by the fiction and feel a momentary glow of martial ardor. But how faint, how cold is the sensation which a peaceful mind can receive from solitary study. It was in the hour of battle, or in the feast of victory, that the bards celebrated the glory of the heroes of ancient days, the ancestors of those warlike chieftains who listened with transport to their artless but animated strains. The view of arms and of danger heightened the effect of the military song, and the passions which it tended to excite, the desire of fame and the contempt of death, were the habitual sentiments of a German mind. Such was the situation, and such were the manners of the ancient Germans. Their climate, their want of learning, of arts and of laws, their notions of honor, of gallantry, and of religion, their sense of freedom, impatience of peace, and thirst of enterprise, all contributed to form a people of military heroes. And yet we find that during more than 250 years that elapsed from the defeat of Varus to the reign of Decius, these formidable barbarians made few considerable attempts, and not any material impression, on the luxurious and enslaved provinces of the empire. Their progress was checked by their want of arms and discipline, and their fury was diverted by the intestine divisions of ancient Germany. It has been observed with ingenuity, and not without truth, that the command of iron soon gives a nation the command of gold. But the rude tribes of Germany— alike destitute of both those valuable metals, were reduced slowly to acquire by their unassisted strength the possession of the one as well as the other. The face of a German army displayed their poverty of iron. Swords, and the longer kind of lances, they could seldom use. Their frame, as they called them in their own language, were long spears headed with a sharp but narrow iron point, and which, as occasion required, they either darted from a distance or pushed in close onset. With this spear, and with a shield, their cavalry was contented. A multitude of darts, scattered with incredible force, were an additional resource of the infantry. Their military dress, when they wore any, was nothing more than a loose mantle. A variety of colors was the only ornament of their wooden or austere shields. Few of the chiefs were distinguished by cuirasses, scarcely any by helmets. Though the horses of Germany were neither beautiful, swift, nor practiced in the skillful evolutions of the Roman menege, several of the nations obtained renown by their cavalry, but in general, the principal strength of the Germans consisted in their infantry, which was drawn up in several deep columns, according to the distinction of the tribes and families. Impatient of fatigue and delay, these half-armed warriors rushed to battle with dissonant shouts and disordered ranks, and sometimes, by the effort of native valor, prevailed over the constrained and more artificial bravery of the Roman mercenaries. But as the barbarians poured forth their whole souls on the first onset, they knew not how to rally or to retire. A repulse was a sure defeat, and a defeat was most commonly total destruction. When we recollect the complete armor of the Roman soldiers, their discipline, 
exercises, evolutions, fortified camps, and military engines, it appears a just matter of surprise how the naked and unassisted valor of the barbarians could dare to encounter in the field the strength of the legions and the various troops of the auxiliaries which seconded their operations. The contest was too unequal till the introduction of luxury had enervated the vigor and a spirit of disobedience and sedition had relaxed the discipline of the Roman armies. The introduction of barbarian auxiliaries into those armies was a measure attended with very obvious dangers, as it might gradually instruct the Germans in the arts of war and of policy. Although they were admitted in small numbers and with the strictest precaution, the example of civilis was proper to convince the Romans that the danger was not imaginary, and that their precautions were not always sufficient. During the civil wars that followed the death of Nero, that artful and intrepid Batavian, whom his enemies condescended to compare with Hannibal and Sertorius, formed a great design of freedom and ambition. Eight Batavian cohorts, renowned in the wars of Britain and Italy, repaired to his standard. He introduced an army of Germans into Gaul, prevailed on the powerful cities of Treves and Langres to embrace his cause, defeated the legions, destroyed their fortified camps, and employed against the Romans the military knowledge which he had acquired in their service. When at length, after an obstinate struggle, he yielded to the power of the empire, Civilis secured himself and his country by an honorable treaty. The Batavians still continued to occupy the islands of the Rhine, the allies, not the servants, of the Roman monarchy. The strength of ancient Germany appears formidable, when we consider the effects that might have been produced by its united effort. The wide extent of country might very possibly contain a million of warriors, as all who were of age to bear arms were of a temper to use them. But this fierce multitude, incapable of concerting or executing any plan of national greatness, was agitated by various and often hostile intentions. Germany was divided into more than forty independent states, and even in each state, the union of the several tribes was extremely loose and precarious. The barbarians were easily provoked. They knew not how to forgive an injury, much less an insult. Their resentments were bloody and implacable. The casual disputes that so frequently happened in their tumultuous parties of hunting or drinking were sufficient to inflame the minds of whole nations. The private feuds of any considerable chieftains diffused itself among their followers and allies. To chastise the insolent, or to plunder the defenseless, were alike causes of war. The most formidable states of Germany affected to encompass their territories with a wide frontier of solitude and devastation. The awful distance preserved by their neighbors attested the terror of their arms, and in some measure defended them from the danger of unexpected incursions. The Bructeri, it is Tacitus who now speaks, were totally exterminated by the neighboring tribes, provoked by their insolence, allured by the hopes of spoil, and perhaps inspired by the tutelar deities of the empire. Above sixty thousand barbarians were destroyed, not by the Roman arms, but in our sight and for our entertainment. May the nations, enemies of Rome, ever preserve this enmity to each other. We have now attained the utmost verge of prosperity, and have nothing left to demand of fortune, except the discord of the barbarians. These sentiments, less worthy of the humanity than of the patriotism of Tacitus, express the invariable maxims of the policy of his countrymen. They deemed it a much safer expedient to divide than to combat the barbarians, from whose defeat they could derive neither honor nor advantage. The money and negotiations of Rome insinuated themselves into the heart of Germany, and every art of seduction was used with dignity to conciliate those nations whom their proximity to the Rhine or Danube might render the most useful friends as well as the most troublesome enemies. Chiefs of renown and power were flattered by the most trifling presents, which they received either as marks of distinction or as the instruments of luxury. In civil dissensions the weaker faction endeavored to strengthen its interest by entering into secret connections with the governors of the frontier provinces. Every quarrel among the Germans was fomented by the intrigues of Rome, and every plan of union and public good was defeated by the stronger bias of private jealousy and interest. 
The general conspiracy which terrified the Romans under the reign of Marcus Antonius comprehended almost all the nations of Germany, and even Sarmatia from the mouth of the Rhine to that of the Danube. It is impossible for us to determine whether this hasty confederation was formed by necessity, by reason, or by passion, but we may rest assured that the barbarians were neither allured by the indolence nor provoked by the ambition of the Roman monarch. This dangerous invasion required all the firmness and vigilance of Marcus. He fixed generals of ability in the several stations of attack, and assumed in person the conduct of the most important province on the upper Danube. After a long and doubtful conflict, the spirit of the barbarians was subdued. The Quadi and the Marcomanni, who had taken the lead in the war, were the most severely punished in its catastrophe. They were commanded to retire five miles from their own banks of the Danube, and to deliver up the flower of the youth, who were immediately sent into Britain, a remote island, where they might be secure as hostages, and useful as soldiers. On the frequent rebellions of the Quadi and the Marcomanni, the irritated emperor resolved to reduce their country into the form of a province. His designs were disappointed by death. This formidable league, however, the only one that appears in the two first centuries of the imperial history, was entirely dissipated without leaving any traces behind in Germany. In the course of this introductory chapter, we have confined ourselves to the general outlines of the manners of Germany, without attempting to describe or to distinguish the various tribes which filled that great country in the time of Caesar, of Tacitus, or of Ptolemy. As the ancient, or as new tribes, successively present themselves in the series of this history, we shall concisely mention their origin, their situation, and their particular character. Modern nations are fixed and permanent societies, connected among themselves by laws and government, bound to their native soil by arts and agriculture. The German tribes were voluntary and fluctuating associations of soldiers, almost of savages. The same territory often changed its inhabitants in the tide of conquest and emigration. The same communities, uniting in a plan of defense or invasion, bestowed a new title on their new confederacy. The dissolution of an ancient confederacy restored to the independent tribes their peculiar but long-forgotten appellation. A victorious state often communicated its own name to a vanquished people. Sometimes crowds of volunteers flocked from all parts to the standard of a favorite leader. His camp became their country, and some circumstance of the enterprise soon gave a common denomination to the mixed multitude. The distinctions of the ferocious invaders were perpetually varied by themselves, and confounded by the astonished subjects of the Roman Empire. Wars and the administration of public affairs are the principal subjects of history. But the number of persons interested in these busy scenes is very different, according to the different condition of mankind. In great monarchies, millions of obedient subjects pursue their useful occupations in peace and obscurity. The attention of the writer, as well as of the reader, is solely confined to a court, a capital, a regular army, and the districts which happen to be the occasional scene of military operations. But a state of freedom and barbarism, the season of civil commotions, or the situation of petty republics, raises almost every member of the community into action, and consequently into notice. The irregular divisions and the restless motions of the people of Germany dazzle our imagination, and seem to multiply their numbers. The profuse enumeration of kings, of warriors, of armies and nations, inclines us to forget that the same subjects are continually repeated under a variety of appellations, and that the most splendid appellations have been frequently lavished on the most inconsiderable objects. End of chapter 9, part 3《Chapter 10, Part 1 of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. The Emperors Decius, Gallus, Emilianus, Valerian, and Gallienus. The General Inruption of the Barbarians. Thirty tyrants. 
From the great secular games celebrated by Philip, to the death of the Emperor Gallienus, there elapsed twenty years of shame and misfortune. During that calamitous period, every instant of time was marked, every province of the Roman world was afflicted, by barbarous invaders and military tyrants, and the ruined empire seemed to approach the last and fatal moment of its dissolution. The confusion of the times, and the scarcity of authentic memorials, oppose equal difficulty to the historian, who attempts to preserve a clear and unbroken thread of narration. Surrounded with imperfect fragments, always concise, often obscure, and sometimes contradictory, he is reduced to collect, to compare, and to conjecture, and though he ought never to place his conjectures in the rank of facts, yet to the knowledge of human nature, and of the sure operation of its fierce and unrestrained passions, might, on some occasions, supply the want of historical materials. There is not, for instance, any difficulty in conceiving that the successive murders of so many emperors had loosened all the ties of allegiance between the prince and the people, that all the generals of Philip were disposed to imitate the example of their master, and that the caprice of armies, long since habituated to frequent and violent revolutions, might every day raise to the throne the most obscure of their fellow-soldiers. History can only add that the rebellion against the Emperor Philip broke out in the summer of the year 249, among the legions of Mercia, and that a subaltern officer named Marinus was the object of their sedacious choice. Philip was alarmed. He dreaded, lest the treason of the Mercian army should prove the first spark of a general conflagration. Distracted with the consciousness of his guilt and of his danger, he communicated the intelligence to the Senate. A gloomy silence prevailed, the effect of fear, and perhaps of disaffection, till, at length, Decius, one of the assembly, assuming a spirit worthy of his noble extraction, ventured to discover more intrepidity than the emperor seemed to possess. He treated the whole business with contempt, as a hasty and inconsiderate tumult, and Philip's rival as a phantom of royalty, who, in a very few days, would be destroyed by the same inconsistency that had created him. The speedy completion of the prophecy inspired Philip with a just esteem for so able a counsellor, and Decius appeared to him the only person capable of restoring peace and discipline to an army whose tumultuous spirit did not immediately subside after the murder of Marinus. Decius, who long resisted his own nomination, seems to have insinuated the danger of presenting a leader of merit to the angry and apprehensive minds of the soldiers, and his prediction was again confirmed by the event. The legions of Mercia forced their judge to become their accomplice. They left him only the alternative of death or the purple. His subsequent conduct, after that decisive measure, was unavoidable. He conducted, or followed, his army to the confines of Italy, whither Philip, collecting all his force to repel the formidable competitor, whom he had raised up, advanced to meet him. The imperial troops were superior in number, but the rebels formed an army of veterans, commanded by an able and experienced leader. Philip was either killed in the battle, or put to death a few days after, at Verona. His son, an associate in the empire, was massacred at Rome, by the Praetorian guards. And the victorious Decius, with more favourable circumstances than the ambition of that age can usually plead, was universally acknowledged by the Senate and provinces. It is reported that immediately after his reluctant acceptance of the title of Augustus, he had assured Philip, by a private message, of his innocence and loyalty, solemnly protesting that on his arrival on Italy he would resign the imperial ornaments and return to the condition of an obedient subject. His professions might be sincere, but in the situation where fortune had placed him, it was scarcely possible that he could either forgive or be forgiven. The Emperor Decius had employed a few months in the works of peace and the administration of justice, when he was summoned to the banks of the Danube by the invasion of the Goths. This is the first considerable occasion in which history mentions that great people, who afterwards broke the Roman power, sacked the capital, and reigned in Gaul, Spain, and Italy. 
So memorable was the part which they acted in the subversion of the Western Empire, that the name of Goths is frequently but improperly used as a general appellation of rude and warlike barbarism. In the beginning of the sixth century, and after the conquest of Italy, the Goths, in possession of present greatness, very naturally indulged themselves in the prospect of past and of future glory. They wished to preserve the memory of their ancestors, and to transmit to posterity their own achievements. The principal minister of the court of Ravenna, the learned Cassiodorus, gratified the inclination of the conquerors in a Gothic history, which consisted of twelve books, now reduced to the imperfect abridgment of Jornandes. These writers passed with the most artful consciousness over the misfortunes of the nation, celebrated its successful valour, and adorned the triumph with many Asiatic trophies, that more properly belonged to the people of Scythia. On the faith of ancient songs, the uncertain, but the only memorials of barbarians, they deduced the first origin of the Goths from the vast island or peninsula of Scandinavia. That extreme country of the north was not unknown to the conquerors of Italy. The ties of ancient consanguinity had been strengthened by recent offices of friendship, and a Scandinavian king had cheerfully abdicated his savage greatness, that he might pass the remainder of his days in the peaceful and polished court of Ravenna. Many vestiges, which cannot be ascribed to the arts of popular vanity, attest the ancient residence of the Goths in the countries beyond the Rhine. From the time of the geographer Ptolemy, the southern part of Sweden seems to have continued in the possession of the less enterprising remnant of the nation, and a large territory is even at present divided into east and west Gothland. During the Middle Ages, from the ninth to the twelfth century, whilst Christianity was advancing with a slow progress into the north, the Goths and the Swedes composed two distinct and sometimes hostile members of the same monarchy. The latter of these two names has prevailed without extinguishing the former. The Swedes, who might well be satisfied with their own fame in arms, have, in every age, claimed the kindred glory of the Goths. In a moment of discontent against the court of Rome, Charles the Twelfth insinuated that his victorious troops were not degenerated from their brave ancestors, who had already subdued to the mistress of the world. Till the end of the eleventh century, a celebrated temple subsisted at Upassel, the most considerable town of the Swedes and Goths. It was enriched with the gold which the Scandinavians had acquired in their piratical adventures, and sanctified by the uncouth representations of the three principal deities, the god of war, the goddess of generation, and the god of thunder. In the general festival that was solemnized every ninth year, nine animals of every species, without excepting the human, were sacrificed, and their bleeding bodies suspended in the sacred grove adjacent to the temple. The only traces that now subsist of this barbaric superstition are contained in the Edda, a system of mythology compiled in Iceland about the thirteenth century, and studied by the learned of Denmark and Sweden, as most valuable remains of their ancient traditions. Notwithstanding the mysterious obscurity of the Edda, we can easily distinguish two persons confounded under the name of Odin, the god of war and the great legislator of Scandinavia. The latter, the great Mohammed of the north, instituted a religion adapted to the climate and to the people. Numerous tribes on either side of the Baltic were subdued by the invincible valour of Odin, by his persuasive eloquence, and by the fame which he acquired of a most skilful magician. The faith that he had propagated, during a long and prosperous life, he confirmed by a voluntary death. Apprehensive of the ignominious approach of disease and infirmity, he resolved to expire as become a warrior. In a solemn assembly of the Swedes and Goths, he wounded himself in nine mortal places, hastening away, as he asserted with his dying voice, to prepare the feast of heroes in the palace of the god of war. The native and proper habitation of Odin is distinguished by the appellation of Asgard. The happy resemblance of that name with Asberg, or as of, words of a similar signification, have given rise to an historical system of so pleasing a contexture, that we could almost wish to persuade ourselves of its truth. 
It is supposed that Odin was the chief of a tribe of barbarians who dwelt on the banks of the Lake Meotis, till the fall of Mithridates and the arms of Pompey menaced the north with servitude. That Odin, yielding with indignant fury to a power which he was unable to resist, conducted his tribe from the frontiers of the Asiatic Sarmatia into Sweden, with the great design of forming, in that inaccessible retreat of freedom, a religion and a people, which, in some remote age, might be subservient to his immortal revenge. When his invincible Goths, armed with martial fanaticism, should issue in numerous swarms from the neighbourhood of the polar circle, to chastise the oppressors of mankind. If so many successive generations of Goths were capable of preserving a faint tradition of their Scandinavian origin, we must not expect, from such unlettered barbarians, any distinct account of the time and circumstances of their immigration. To cross the Baltic was an easy and natural attempt. The inhabitants of Sweden were masters of a sufficient number of large vessels, with oars, and the distance is little more than one hundred miles from Kalskren to the nearest ports of Pomerania and Prussia. Here, at length, we land on firm and historic ground, at least as early as the Christian era, and as late as the age of the Antonines. The Goths were established towards the mouth of the Vistula, and in that fertile province where the commercial cities of Thorn, Elbing, Konigsberg, and Danzig were long afterwards founded. Westward of the Goths, the numerous tribes of the Vandals were spread along the banks of the Alder, and to the sea coast of Pomerania and Mecklenburg. A striking resemblance of manners, complexion, religion, and language seemed to indicate that the Vandals and the Goths were originally one great people. The latter appear to have been subdivided into Ostrogoths, Visgoths, and Gepedia. The distinction among the Vandals was more strongly marked by the independent names of Herulii, Burgundians, Lombards, and a variety of other petty states, many of which, in a future age, expanded themselves into powerful monarchies. In the age of the Antonines, the Goths were still seated in Prussia. About the reign of Alexander Severus, the Roman province of Decia had already experienced their proximity by frequent and destructive inroads. In this interval, therefore, of about seventy years, we must place the second migration of the Goths from the Baltic to the Euxine. But the cause that produced it lies concealed among the various motives which actuate the conduct of unsettled barbarians. Either a pestilence or a famine, a victory or a defeat, an oracle of the gods or the eloquence of a daring leader, were sufficient to impel the Gothic arms on the milder climates of the south. Besides the influence of martial religion, the numbers and spirit of the Goths were equal to the most dangerous adventures. The use of round bucklers and short swords rendered them formidable in a close engagement. The manly obedience which they yielded to hereditary kings gave uncommon union and stability to their councils, and the renowned Amala, the hero of that age, and the tenth ancestor of Theodoric, king of Italy, enforced, by the ascendance of personal merit, the prerogative of his birth, which he derived from the ancestors or demigods of the Gothic nation. The fame of a great enterprise excited the bravest warriors from all the Vandalic states of Germany, many of whom are seen a few years afterwards combating under the common standard of the Goths. The first motions of the emigrants carried them to the banks of the Prepesh, a river universally conceived by the ancients to be the southern branch of the Borysthenes. The windings of that great stream through the plains of Poland and Russia gave a direction to their line of march, and a constant supply of fresh water and pasturage to their numerous herds of cattle. They followed the unknown course of the river, confident in their valour and careless of whatever power might oppose their progress. The Bastani and the Venedi were the first who presented themselves, and the flower of their youth, either from choice or compulsion, increased the Gothic army. The Bastani dwelt on the northern side of the Carpathian Mountains. The immense tract of land that separated the Bastani from the savages of Finland was possessed, or rather wasted, by the Venedi. We have some reason to believe that the first of these nations, which distinguished itself in the Macedonian War, 
and was afterwards divided into the formidable tribes of the Pusini, the Borani, and the Carpi, etc., derived its origin from the Germans. With better authority a Sumatian extraction may be assigned to the Venedi, who rendered themselves so famous in the Middle Ages, but the confusion of blood and manners on that doubtful frontier often perplexed the most accurate observers. As the Goths advanced near the Euxine Sea, they encountered a purer race of Sumatians, the Jusages, the Alani, and the Roxolani, and they were probably the first Germans who saw the mouths of the Borysthianus and of the Tanas. If we inquire into the characteristic marks of the people of Germany and of Sumatia, we shall discover that these two great portions of humankind were principally distinguished by fixed huts or movable tents, by a close dress or flowing garments, by the marriage of one or of several wives, by a military force consisting for the most part either of infantry or cavalry, and above all by the use of the Teutonic or of the Sclavonian language, the last of which has been diffused by conquest from the confines of Italy to the neighbourhood of Japan. End of chapter 10, part 1 Chapter 10, part 2 Of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Lizzie Driver Chapter 10 Emperors Decius, Gallus, Aemilianus, Valerian, and Gallienus. Part 2 The Goths were now in possession of the Ukraine, a country of considerable extent and uncommon fertility, intersected with navigable rivers, which, from either side, discharged themselves into the Borysthianus, and it dispersed with large and leafy forests of oak. The plenty of game and fish the innumerable beehives deposited in the hollow of old trees, and in the cavities of rock, and forming, even in that rude age, a valuable branch of commerce, the size of the cattle, the temperature of the air, the aptness of the soil for every species of grain, and the luxuriancy of the vegetation, all displayed the liberality of nature, and tempted the industry of man. But the Goths withstood all these temptations, and still adhered to a life of idleness, of poverty, and a raping. The Scythian hordes, which, towards the east, bordered on the new settlements of the Goths, presented nothing to their arms, except the doubtful chance of an unprofitable victory. But the prospect of the Roman territories was far more alluring, and the fields of Dacia were covered with rich harvests, sown by the hands of an industrious and exposed to be gathered by those of a warlike people. It is probable that the conquests of Trajan, maintained by his successors, less for any real advantage than for idle dignity, had contributed to weaken the empire on that side. The new and unsettled province of Dacia was neither strong enough to resist, nor rich enough to satiate, the rapaciousness of the barbarians. As long as the remote banks of the Niester were considered as the boundary of the Roman power, the fortifications of the lower Danube were more carelessly guarded, and the inhabitants of Mercia lived in supine security, fondly conceiving themselves at an inaccessible distance from any barbarian invaders. The eruptions of the Goths under the reign of Philip fatally convinced them of their mistake. The king, or leader of that fierce nation, traversed with contempt the province of Dacia, and passed both the Niester and the Danube, without encountering any opposition capable of retarding his progress. The relaxed discipline of the Roman troops betrayed the most important posts where they were stationed, and the fear of deserved punishment induced great numbers of them to enlist under the Gothic standard. The various multitude of barbarians appeared at length under the walls of the Marcianopolis, a city built by Trajan in honour of his sister, and at that time the capital of the second Mercia. The inhabitants consented to ransom their lives and property by the payment of a large sum of money, and the invaders retreated back into their deserts, animated rather than satisfied, 
with the first success of their arms against an opulent but feeble country. Intelligence was soon transmitted to the Emperor Decius that Canava, king of the Goths, had passed the Danube a second time, with more considerable forces, that his numerous detachments scattered devastation over the province of Mercia, whilst the main body of the army, consisting of seventy thousand Germans and Sarmatians, a force equal to the most daring achievements, required the presence of the Roman monarch, and the exertion of military power. Decius found the Goths engaged before Nicopolis, one of the many monuments of Trajan's victories. On his approach they raised a siege, but with a design only of marching away to a conquest of greater importance, the siege of Philippopolis, a city of Thrace founded by the father of Alexander near the foot of Mount Hamus. Decius followed them through a difficult country and by forced marches. But when he imagined himself at a considerable distance from the rear of the Goths, Canavar turned with rapid fury on his pursuers. The camp of the Romans was surprised and pillaged, and for the first time their emperor fled in disorder before a troop of half-armed barbarians. After a long resistance, Philippopolis, destitute of succour, was taken by storm. A hundred thousand persons are reported to have been massacred in the sack of the great city. Many prisoners of consequence became a valuable accession to the spoil, and Prisicus, a brother of the late Emperor Philip, blushed not to assume the purple under the protection of the barbarous enemies of Rome. The time, however, consumed in that tedious siege, enabled Decius to revive the courage, restore the discipline, and recruit the numbers of his troops. He intercepted several parties of Capari, and other Germans, who were hastening to share the victory of their countrymen, entrusted the passes of the mountains to officers of approved valour and fidelity, repaired and strengthened the fortifications of the Danube, and exerted his utmost vigilance to oppose either the progress or the retreat of the Goths. Encouraged by the return of fortune, he anxiously waited for an opportunity to retrieve, by a great and decisive blow, his own glory and that of the Roman arms. At the same time when Decius was struggling with the violence of the tempest, his mind, calm and deliberate amidst the tumult of war, investigated the more general causes, that, since the age of the Antonines, had so impetuously urged the decline of the Roman greatness. He soon discovered that it was impossible to replace that greatness on a permanent basis, without restoring public virtue, ancient principles and manners, and the oppressed majesty of the law. To execute this noble but arduous design, he first resolved to revive the obsolete office of censor, an office which, as long as it had subsisted in its pristine integrity, had so much contributed to the perpetuity of the state, till it was usurped and gradually neglected by the Caesars. Conscious that the favour of the sovereign may confer power, but that the esteem of the people can alone bestow authority, he submitted the choice of the censor to the unbiased voice of the senate. By their unanimous vote, or rather acclamations, Valerian, who was afterwards emperor, and who then served with the distinction in the army of Decius, was declared the most worthy of that exalted honour. As soon as the decree of the senate was transmitted to the emperor, he assembled a great council in his camp, and before the investiture of the censor-elect, he appraised him of the difficulty and importance of his great office. "'Happy Valerian,' said the prince to his distinguished subject, "'happy in the general approbation of the Senate and of the Roman Republic, "'accept the censorship of mankind, and judge of our manners. "'You will select those who deserve to continue members of the Senate. "'You will restore the equestrian order to its ancient splendour. "'You will improve the revenue, yet moderate the public burdens.' You will distinguish into regular classes the various and infinite multitudes of citizens, and accurately view the military strength, the wealth, the virtue, and the resources of Rome. Your decisions shall obtain the force of laws. The army, the palace, the ministers of justice, and the great officers of the empire are all subject to your tribunal. None are exempt, excepting only the ordinary councils, the prefect of the city, 
the king of the sacrifices, and, as long as she preserves her chastity inviolate, the eldest of the vestal virgins. Even these few, who may not dread the severity, will anxiously solicit the esteem of the Roman censor. A magistrate, invested with such extensive powers, would have appeared not so much the minister as the colleague of his sovereign. Valerian justly dreaded an elevation so full of envy and of suspicion. He modestly argued the alarming greatness of the trust, his own insufficiency, and the incurable corruption of the times. He artfully insinuated that the office of censure was inseparable from the imperial dignity, and that the feeble hands of a subject were unequal to the support of such an immense weight of cares and of power. The approaching event of war soon put an end to the prosecution of a project so specious, but so impracticable, and whilst it preserved Valerian from the danger, saved the Emperor Decius from the disappointment, which would most probably have attended it. A censor may maintain he can never restore the morals of a state. It is impossible for such a magistrate to exert his authority with benefit, or even with effect, unless he is supported by a quick sense of honour and virtue in the minds of the people, by a decent reverence for the public opinion, and by a train of useful prejudices combating on the side of national manners. In a period when these principles are annihilated, the censorial jurisdiction must either sink into empty pageantry, or be converted into a partial instrument of vexatious oppression. It was easier to vanquish the Goths than to eradicate the public vices. Yet even in the first of these enterprises, Decius lost his army and his life. The Goths were now, on every side, surrounded and pursued by the Roman arms. The flower of their troops had perished in the long siege of Philippopolis, and the exhausted country could no longer afford subsistence for the remaining multitude of licentious barbarians. Reduced to this extremity, the Goths would gladly have purchased, by the surrender of all their booty and prisoners, the permission of an undisturbed retreat. But to the emperor, confident of victory, and resolving, by the chastisement of these invaders, to strike a solitary terror into the nations of the north, refused to listen to any terms of accommodation. The high-spirited barbarians preferred to death to slavery. An obscure town of Macia, called Forum Terraboni, was the scene of the battle. The Gothic army was drawn up in three lines, and either from choice or accident, the front of the third line was covered by a morass. In the beginning of the action, the son of Decius, a youth of the fairest hopes, and already associated to the honours of the purple, was slain by an arrow in the sight of his afflicted father, who, summoning all his fortitude, admonished the dismayed troops, that the loss of a single soldier was of little importance to the Republic. The conflict was terrible. It was the combat of despair against grief and rage. The first line of the Goths at length gave way in disorder. The second, advancing to sustain it, shared its fate. And the third only remained entire, prepared to dispute the passage of the morass, which was imprudently attempted by the presumption of the enemy. Here the fortune of the day turned, and all things became adverse to the Romans. The place deep with ooze, sinking under those who stood, slippery to such an advance. Their armour heavy, the waters deep, nor could they wield, in that uneasy situation, their weighty javelins. The barbarians, on the contrary, were inured to encounter in the bogs, their persons tall, their spears long, such as could wound at a distance. In this morass the Roman army, after an ineffectual struggle, was irrevocably lost. Nor could the body of the emperor ever be found. Such was the fate of Decius, in the fiftieth year of his age. An accomplished prince, active in war and affable in peace, who, together with his son, had deserved to be compared, both in life and death, with the brightest examples of ancient virtue. This fatal blow humbled, for a very little time, the insolence of the legions. They appeared to have patiently expected, and submissively obeyed, the decree of the senate which regulated the succession to the throne. From a just regard for the memory of Decius, the imperial title was conferred on Hostilianus, his only surviving son, 
but an equal rank with more effectual power was granted to Gallus, whose experience and ability seemed equal to the great trust of guardian to the young prince and the distressed empire. The first care of the new emperor was to deliver the Illyrian provinces from the intolerable weight of the victorious Goths. He consented to leave in their hands the rich fruits of their invasion, an immense booty, and what was still more disgraceful, a great number of prisoners of the highest merit and quality. He plentifully supplied their camp with every conveniency that could assuage their angry spirits, or facilitate their so much wished for departure and he even promised to pay them annually a large sum of gold, on condition they should never afterwards infest the Roman territories by their incursions. In the age of the Scipius, the most opulent kings of the earth, who courted the protection of the virtuous commonwealth, were gratified with such trifling presents as could only derive a value from the hand that bestowed them. An ivory chair, a coarse garment of purple, an inconsiderable piece of plate— or a quantity of copper coin. After the wealth of nations had centred in Rome, the emperors displayed their greatness, and even their policy, by the regular exercise of a steady and moderate liberality towards the allies of the state. They relieved the poverty of the barbarians, honoured their merit, and recompensed their fidelity. These voluntary marks of bounty were understood to flow, not from the fears, but merely from the generosity or the gratitude of the Romans. And whilst presents and subsidies were liberally distributed among friends and suppliants, they were sternly refused to such as claimed them as a debt. But this stipulation of an annual payment to a victorious enemy appeared without disguise in the light of an ignominious tribute. The minds of the Romans were not yet accustomed to accept such unequal laws from a tribe of barbarians and the prince, who by a necessary concession had probably saved his country, became the object of general contempt and aversion. The death of Philistianus, though it happened in the midst of a raging pestilence, was interpreted as the personal crime of Gallus, and even the defeat of the later emperor was ascribed by the voice of suspicion to the perfidious counsels of his hated successor. The tranquillity which the empire enjoyed during the first year of his administration served rather to inflame than to appease the public discontent. And as soon as the apprehensions of war were removed, the infamy of the peace was more deeply and more sensibly felt. But the Romans were irritated to a still higher degree, when they discovered that they had not even secured their repose, though at the expense of their honour. The dangerous secret of the wealth and weakness of the empire had been revealed to the world. New swarms of barbarians, encouraged by the success, and not conceiving themselves bound by the obligations of their brethren, spread devastation through the Illyrian provinces, and terror as far as the gates of Rome. The defence of the monarchy, which seemed abandoned by the pusillanimous emperor, was assumed by Aemilianus, governor of Pannonia and Maesia, who rallied the scattered forces, and revived the fainting spirits of the troops. The barbarians were unexpectedly attacked, routed, chased, and pursued beyond the Danube. The victorious leader distributed, as a donative, the money collected for the tribute, and the acclamations of the soldiers proclaimed him emperor on the field of battle. Gallus, who, careless of the general welfare, indulged himself in the pleasures of Italy, was almost in the same instant informed of the success of the revolt and of the rapid approach of his aspiring lieutenant. He advanced to meet him as far as the plains of Spoleto. When the armies came in sight of each other, the soldiers of Gallus compared the ignominious conduct of their sovereign with the glory of his rival. They admired the valour of Aemilianus. They were attracted by his liberality, for he offered a considerable increase of pay to all deserters. The murder of Gallus, and of his son Volusianus, put an end to the civil war, and the senate gave a legal sanction to the rights of conquest. The letters of Aemilianus to that assembly displayed a mixture of moderation and vanity. He assured them that he should resign to their wisdom the civil administration, and contenting himself with the quality of their general, would in a short time assert the glory of Rome, and deliver the empire from all the barbarians, both of the north and of the east. 
His pride was flattered by the applause of the Senate, and medals are still exact, representing him with the name and attributes of Hercules the victor, and Mars the avenger. If the new monarch possessed the abilities, he wanted the time necessary to fulfil these splendid promises. Less than four months intervened between his victory and his fall. He had vanquished Gallus. He sank under the weight of a competitor more formidable than Gallus. That unfortunate prince had sent Valerian, already distinguished by the honourable title of censor, to bring the legions of Gaul and Germany to his aid. Valerian executed that commission with zeal and fidelity, and as he arrived too late to save his sovereign, he resolved to avenge him. The troops of Aemilianus, who still lay encamped in the plains of Spoleto, were awed by the sanctity of his character, but much more by the superior strength of his army. And as they were now become as incapable of personal attachment as they had always been of constitutional principle, they readily embrued their hands in the blood of a prince who so lately had been the object of their partial choice. The guilt was theirs, but the advantage of it was Valerian's, who obtained the possession of the throne by the means indeed of a civil war, but with a degree of innocence singular in that age of revolutions, since he owed neither gratitude nor allegiance to his predecessor whom he dethroned. Valerian was about sixty years of age when he was invested with the purple, not by the caprice of the populace or the clamours of the army, but by the unanimous voice of the Roman world. In his gradual ascent through the honours of the state, he had deserved the favour of virtuous princes, and had declared himself the enemy of tyrants. His noble birth, his mild but unblemished manners, his learning, prudence, and experience, were revered by the senate and people, and if mankind, according to the observation of an ancient writer, had been left at liberty to choose a master, their choice would most assuredly have fallen on Valerian. Perhaps the merit of this emperor was inadequate to his reputation. Perhaps his abilities, or at least his spirit, were affected by the languor and coldness of old age. The consciousness of his decline engaged him to share the throne with a younger and more active associate. The emergency of the times demanded a general no less than a prince, and the experience of the Roman censure might have directed him where to bestow the imperial purple as the reward of military merit. But instead of making a judicious choice, which would have confirmed his reign and endeared his memory, Valerian, consulting only the dictates of affection or vanity, immediately invested with the supreme honours his son, Gallienus, a youth whose effeminate vices had been hitherto concealed by the obscurity of a private station. The joint government of the father and the son subsisted about seven, and the sole administration of Galilean continued about eight years. But the whole period was one uninterrupted series of confusion and calamity. As the Roman Empire was at the same time, on every side, attacked by the blind fury of foreign invaders, and the wild ambition of domestic usurpers, we shall consult order and perspicuity by pursuing not so much the doubtful arrangement of dates as the more natural distribution of subjects. The most dangerous enemies of Rome, during the reigns of Valerian and Gallienus, were 1. the Franks, 2. the Aelmeni, 3. the Goths, and 4. the Persians. Under these general appellations, we may comprehend the adventures of less considerable tribes, whose obscure and uncouth names would only serve to repress the memory and perplex the attention of the reader. End of chapter 10, part 2「10, Part 3 of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver Chapter 10 Emperors Decius, Gallus, Aemilianus, Valerian, and Gallienus Part 3 one. As the prosperity of the Franks composed one of the greatest and most enlightened nations of Europe, 
the powers of learning and ingenuity had been exhausted in the discovery of their unlettered ancestors. To the tales of credulity have succeeded the systems of fancy. Every passage has been sifted, every spot has been surveyed, that might possibly reveal some faint traces of their origin. It has been supposed that Pannonia, that Gaul, that the northern parts of Germany, gave birth to that celebrated colony of warriors. At length the most rational critics, rejecting the fictitious immigrants of ideal conquerors, have acquiesced in a sentiment whose simplicity persuades us of its truth. They suppose that about the year 240 a new confederacy was formed under the name of Franks, by the old inhabitants of the Lower Rhine and the Weiser. The present circle of Westphalia, the Landgraviate of Hesse, and the duchies of Brunswick and Lüneburg, were the ancient of the Chorsi, who, in their inaccessible morasses, defied the Roman arms, of the Cherusci, proud of the fame of Armenius, of the Catai, formidable by their firm and intrepid infantry, and of several other tribes of inferior power and renown. The love of liberty was the ruling passion of these Germans, the enjoyment of it their best treasure. The word that expressed that enjoyment, the most pleasing to the ear, they deserved, they assumed, they maintained the honourable appellation of Franks, or freemen, which concealed, though it did not extinguish, the peculiar names of the several states of the Confederacy. Tacit consent and mutual advantage dictated the first laws of the Union. It was gradually cemented by habit and experience. The League of the Franks may admit of some comparison with the Helvetic body, in which every canton, retaining its independent sovereignty, consults with its brethren in the common cause, without acknowledging the authority of any supreme head, or representative assembly. But the principle of the two confederacies was extremely different. A peace of two hundred years has rewarded the wise and honest policy of the Swiss. An inconsistent spirit, the thirst of rapine, and a disregard to the most solemn treaties, disgraced the character of the Franks. The Romans had long experienced the daring valour of the people of Lower Germany. The union of their strength threatened Gaul with a more formidable invasion, and required the presence of Gallienus, the heir and colleague of imperial power. Whilst that prince, and his infant son Salonis, displayed in the court of Treves, the majesty of the empire, its armies, were ably conducted by their general, Posthumus who, though he afterwards betrayed the family of Valerian, was ever faithful to that great interests of the monarchy. The treacherous language of panegyrics and medals darkly announces a long series of victories. Trophies and titles attest, if such evidence can attest, the fame of Posthumus, who is repeatedly styled the conqueror of the Germans and the saviour of Gaul. But a single fact, the only one indeed of which we have any distinct knowledge, erases in a great measure these monuments of vanity and adulation. The Rhine, though dignified with the title of safeguard of the provinces, was an imperfect barrier against the daring spirit of enterprise with which the Franks were actuated. Their rapid devastations stretched from the river to the foot of the Pyrenees. Nor were they stopped by these mountains. Spain, which had never dreaded, was unable to resist the inroads of the Germans. During twelve years, the greatest part of the reign of Gallienus, that opulent country was the theatre of unequal and destructive hostilities. Tarragona, the flourishing capital of a peaceful province, was sacked and almost destroyed. And so late as the days of Orosus, who wrote in the fifth century, Wretched cottages, scattered amidst the ruins of magnificent cities, still recorded the rage of the barbarians. When the exhausted country no longer supplied a variety of plunder, the Franks seized on some vessels in the ports of Spain, and transported themselves into Mauritania. The distant province was astonished with the fury of these barbarians, who seemed to fall from a new world, 
as their name, manners, and complexion, were equally unknown on the coast of Africa. 2. In that part of Upper Saxony, beyond the Elbe, which is at present called the Marquisat of Lusca, there existed in ancient times a sacred wood, the awful seat of the superstition of the Suavi. None were permitted to enter the holy precincts without confessing, by the servile bonds and suppliant posture, the immediate presence of the sovereign deity. Patriotism contributed, as well as devotion, to consecrate the sonny world, or wood of the Semnons. It was universally believed that the nation had received its first existence on that sacred spot. At stated periods, the numerous tribes who gloried in the Suavic blood resorted thither by their ambassadors, and the memory of their common extraction was perpetrated by barbaric rites and human sacrifices. The wide extended name of the Suavi filled the interior countries of Germany, from the banks of the Uder to those of the Danube. They were distinguished from the other Germans by their peculiar mode of dressing their long hair, which they gathered into a rude knot on the crown of their head, and they delighted in an ornament that showed their ranks more lofty and terrible in the eyes of the enemy. Jealous as the Germans were of military renown, they all confessed the superior valour of the Suavi, and the tribes of the Espetes and Tencteri, who, with a vast army, encountered the dictator Caesar, declared that they esteemed it not a disgrace to have fled before a people to whose arms the immortal gods themselves were unequal. In the reign of the Emperor Caracalla, an innumerable swarm of Servi appeared on the banks of the Main, and in the neighbourhood of the Roman provinces, in quest either of food, of plunder, or of glory. The hasty army of volunteers gradually coalesced into a great and permanent nation, and as it was composed from so many different tribes, assumed the name of Almany, or Olmen, to denote at once their various lineage and their common bravery. The latter was soon felt by the Romans in many a hostile inroad. The Olmany fought chiefly on horseback, but their cavalry was rendered still more formidable by a mixture of light infantry, selected from the bravest and most active of the youth, whom frequent exercise had inured to accompany the horsemen in the longest march, the most rapid charge, or the most precipitate retreat. This warlike people of Germans had been astonished by the immense preparations of Alexander Severus. They were dismayed by the arms of his successor, a barbarian equal in valour and fierceness to themselves. But still hovering on the frontiers of the empire, they increased the general disorder that ensued after the death of Decius. They inflicted severe wounds on the rich provinces of Gaul. They were the first who removed the veil that covered the feeble majesty of Italy. A numerous body of the Almany penetrated across the Danube and through the Riatine Alps into the plains of Lombardy, advanced as far as Ravenna, and displayed the victorious banners of barbarians almost in sight of Rome. The insult and danger rekindled in the Senate some sparks of their ancient virtue. Both the emperors were engaged in far distant wars, Valerian in the east and Gallienus on the Rhine. All the hopes and resources of the Romans were in themselves. In this emergency, the senators resumed the defiance of the Republic, drew out the Praetorian guards, who had been left to garrison the capital, and filled up their numbers by enlisting into the public service the stoutest and most willing of the plebeians. The Almany, astonished with the sudden appearance of an army more numerous than their own, retired into Germany, laden with spoil, and their retreat was esteemed as a victory by the unwarlike Romans. When Gallienus received the intelligence that his capital was delivered from the barbarians, he was much less delighted than alarmed with the courage of the Senate, since it might one day prompt them to rescue the public from domestic tyranny as well as from foreign invasion. His timid ingratitude was published to his subjects, 
in an edict which prohibited the senators from exercising any military employment, and even from approaching the camps of the legions. But his fears were groundless. The rich and luxurious nobles, sinking into their natural character, accepted as a favour this disgraceful exemption from military service. And as long as they were indulged in the enjoyment of their baths, their theatres, and their villas, they cheerfully resigned the more dangerous cares of the empire to the rough hands of peasants and soldiers. Another invasion of the Almany, of a more formidable aspect, but more glorious event, is mentioned by a writer of the lower empire. Three hundred thousand are said to have been vanquished in a battle near Milan, by Gallienus in person, at the head of only ten thousand Romans. We may, however, with great probability, ascribe this incredible victory, either to the credulity of the historian, or to some exaggerated exploits of one of the emperor's lieutenants. It was by arms of a very different nature that Gallienus endeavoured to protect Italy from the fury of the Germans. He espoused Pippa, the daughter of a king of the Marcomanni, a Suevic tribe, which was often confounded with the Almany in their wars and conquests. To the father, as the price of his alliance, he granted an ample settlement in Pannonia. The native charms of unpolished beauty seem to have fixed the daughter in the affections of the inconsistent emperor, and the bands of policy were more firmly connected by those of love. But the haughty prejudice of Rome still refused the name of marriage to the profane mixture of a citizen and a barbarian, and has stigmatized the German princess with the opprobrious title of concubine of Gallienus. 3. We have already traced the emigration of the Goths from Scandinavia, or at the least from Prussia, to the mouth of the Borysthianus, and have followed their victorious arms from the Borysthianus to the Danube. Under the reigns of Valerian and Gallienus, the frontier of the last-mentioned river was perpetually infested by the inroads of Germans and Sarmatians. But it was defended by the Romans with more than usual firmness and success. The provinces that were the seat of war recruited the armies of Rome with an inexhaustible supply of hardy soldiers, and more than one of these Illyrian peasants attained the station and displayed the abilities of a general. Though flying parties of the barbarians, who incessantly hovered on the banks of the Danube, penetrated sometimes to the confines of Italy and Macedonia, their progress was commonly checked, or their return intercepted, by the imperial lieutenants. But the great stream of the Gothic hostilities was diverted into a very different channel. The Goths, in their new settlement of the Ukraine, soon became masters of the northern coast of the Euxin. To the south of that inland sea was situated the soft and wealthy provinces of Asia Minor, which possessed all that could attract, and nothing that could resist a barbarian conqueror. The banks of the Borysianus are only sixty miles distant, from the narrow entrance of the peninsula of Crim Tartary, known to the ancients under the name of Chersonese Taurica. On that inhospitable shore, Euripides, embellishing with exquisite art the tales of antiquity, has placed the scene of one of his most affecting tragedies. The bloody sacrifices of Diana, the arrival of Orestes and Pallades, and the triumph of virtue and religion over savage fierceness, serve to represent an historical truth that the Tauri, the original inhabitants of the peninsula, were in some degree reclaimed from their brutal manners by a gradual intercourse with the Grecian colonies which settled along the maritime coast. The little kingdom of Bosphorus, whose capital was situated on the straits, through which the Meotis communicates itself to the Euxin, was composed of degenerate Greeks and half-civilized barbarians. It subsisted, as an independent state, from the time of the Philippinesian War, was, at last, swallowed up by the ambition of Mithridates, and, with the rest of his dominions, sunk under the weight of the Roman arms. 
From the reign of Augustus, the kings of Bosphorus were the humble, but not useless, allies of the empire. By presents, by arms, and by a slight fortification drawn across the isthmus, they effectually guarded against the roving plunderers of Sumatia, the axis of a country which, from its peculiar situation and convenient harbours, commanded the Euxine Sea and Asia Minor. As long as the sceptre was possessed by a lineal succession of kings, they acquitted themselves of their important charge with vigilance and success. Domestic factions and the fears, or private interest, of obscure observers who seized on the vacant throne, admitted the Goths into the heart of Bosphorus. With the acquisition of a superfluous waste of fertile soil, the conquerors obtained the command of a naval force, sufficient to transport their armies to the coast of Asia. The ships used in the navigation of the Euxin were of a very singular construction. They were slight, flat-bottomed barks framed of timber only, without the least mixture of iron, and occasionally covered with a shelving roof, on the appearance of a tempest. In these floating houses the Goths carelessly trusted themselves to the mercy of an unknown sea, under the conduct of sailors pressed into the service, and whose skill and fidelity were equally suspicious. But the hopes of plunder had banished every idea of danger, and a natural fearlessness of temper supplied in their minds the more rational confidence, which is the just result of knowledge and experience. Warriors of such a daring spirit must have often murmured against the cowardice of their guides, who required the strongest assurances of a settled calm before they would venture to embark, and would scarcely ever be tempted to lose sight of the land. Such, at least, is the practice of the modern Turks, and they are probably not inferior in the art of navigation to the ancient inhabitants of Borosphorus. The fleet of Goths, leaving the coast of Circassa on the left hand, first appeared before Pytus, the utmost limits of the Roman provinces. A city provided with a convenient port, and fortified with a strong wall. Here they met with a resistance more obstinate than they had reason to expect from the feeble garrison of a distant fortress. They were repulsed, and their disappointment seemed to diminish the terror of the Gothic name. As long as Circesianus, an offer of superior rank and merit, defended that frontier, all their efforts were ineffectual. But as soon as he was removed by Valerian to a more honourable but less important station, they resumed the attack of Pytheus, and by the destruction of that city, obliterated the memory of their former disgrace. Circling round the eastern extremity of the Euxine Sea, the navigation from Piteus to Trabzond is about three hundred miles. The course of the Goths carried them in sight of the country of Colchis, so famous by the expedition of the Argonauts, and they even attempted, though without success, to pillage a rich temple at the mouth of the river Phasis. Trebzond, celebrated in the retreat of the Ten Thousand as an ancient colony of Greeks, derived its wealth and splendour from the magnificence of the Emperor Hadrian, who had constructed an artificial port on a coast left destitute by nature of secure harbours. The city was large and populous. A double enclosure of walls seemed to defy the fury of the Goths, and the usual garrison had been strengthened by a reinforcement of ten thousand men. But there are not any advantages capable of supplying the absence of discipline and vigilance. The numerous garrison of Trebzond, dissolved in riot and luxury, disdained to guard their impregnable fortifications. The Goths soon discovered the supine negligence of the besieged, erected a lofty pile of fascines, ascended the walls in the silence of the night, and entered the defenceless city sword in hand. A general massacre of the people ensued, whilst the affrighted soldiers escaped through the opposite gates of the town. The most holy temples and the most splendid edifices were involved in a common destruction. The booty that fell into the hands of the Goths was immense. 
The wealth of the adjacent countries had been deposited in Tresbond, as in a secure place of refuge. The number of captives was incredible, as the victorious barbarians ranged, without opposition, through the extensive province of Pontus. The rich spoils of Trebzond filled a great fleet of ships that had been found in the port. The robust youth of the sea coast were chained to the oar, and the Goths, satisfied with the success of their first naval expedition, returned in triumph to their new establishment in the kingdom of Bosphorus. The second expedition of the Goths was undertaken with greater powers of men and ships, but they steered a different course and disdaining the exhausted provinces of Pontus, followed the western coast of the Euxine, passed before the wide mouth of the Brucianus, the Niester, and the Danube, and increasing their fleet by the capture of a great number of fishing barks, they approached the narrow outlet through which the Euxine Sea pours its waters into the Mediterranean, and divides the continents of Europe and Asia. The garrison of Chalcedon was encamped near the temple of Jupiter Urius, on a promontory that commanded the entrance of the strait. And so inconsiderable were the dreaded invasions of the barbarians, that this body of troops surpassed in number the Gothic army. But it was in numbers alone that they surpassed it. They deserted with precipitation their advantageous post, and abandoned the town of Chalcedon, most plentifully stored with arms and money, to the discretion of the conquerors. Whilst they hesitated whether they should prefer the sea, or land of Europe or Asia, for the scene of their hostilities, a perfidious fugitive pointed out Nicomedia, once the capital of the kings of Bithynia, as a rich and easy conquest. He guided the march, which was only sixty miles from the camp of Chalcedon, directed the resistless attack, and partook of the booty for the Goths had learned sufficient policy to reward the traitor whom they detested. Nice, Prussia, Apamia, Caius, cities that had sometimes rivalled or intimidated the splendour of Nicomedia, were involved in the same calamity, which, in a few weeks, raged without control through the whole province of Bithynia. Three hundred years of peace, enjoyed by the soft inhabitants of Asia, had abolished the excise of arms and removed the apprehension of danger. The ancient walls were suffered to moulder away, and all the revenue of the most opulent cities was resolved for the construction of baths, temples, and theatres. When the city of Cyzicus withstood the utmost effort of Mithridates, it was distinguished by wise laws, a naval power of two hundred galleys, and three arsenals, of arms, of military engines, and of corn. It was still the seat of wealth and luxury, but of its ancient strength nothing remained except the situation, in a little island off the Propontis, connected with the continent of Asia only by two bridges. From the recent sack of Prussia, the Goths advanced within eighteen miles of the city, which they had devoted to destruction. But the ruin of Cyzicus was delayed by a fortunate accident. The season was rainy, and the lake Apollonatis, the reservoir of all springs of Mount Olympus, rose to an uncommon height. The little river of Rhindacus, which issued from the lake, swelled into a broad and rapid stream, and stopped the progress of the Goths. Their retreat to the maritime city of Heraclea, where the fleet had probably been stationed, was attended by a long train of wagons laden with the spoils of Bithynia and was marked by the flames of Nice and Nicomedia, which they wantonly burnt. Some obscure hints are mentioned of a doubtful combat that secured their retreat. But even a complete victory would have been of little moment, as the approach of the autumn equinox summoned them to hasten their return. To navigate the Euxine before the month of May, or after that of September, is esteemed by the modern Turks the most unquestionable instance of rashness and folly. When we are informed that the third fleet, equipped by the Goths in the port of Bosphorus, consisted of five hundred sails of ships, our ready imagination instantly computes and multiplies the formidable armament. 
but, as we are assured by the judicious Starbo, that the piratical vessels used by the barbarians of Pontus and the lesser Scythia were not capable of containing more than twenty-five or thirty men, we may safely affirm that fifteen thousand warriors at the most embarked in this great expedition. Impatient at the limits of the Euxine, they steered their destructive course from the Chimerian to the Thracian Bosphorus. When they had almost gained the middle of the straits, they were suddenly driven back to the entrance of them, till a favourable wind, springing up the next day, carried them in a few hours into the placid sea, or rather lake, of the Propontius. Their landing on the little island of Sisychus was attended with the ruin of that ancient and noble city. From thence, issuing again through the narrow passage of the Hellespont, they pursued the winding navigation amidst the numerous islands scattered over the archipelago, or the Aegean Sea. The assistance of captives and deserters must have been very necessary to pilot their vessels, and to direct their various incursions, as well on the coast of Greece as on that of Asia. At length the Gothic fleet anchored in the port of Piraeus, five miles distant from Athens, which had attempted to make some preparations for a vigorous defence. Cleodamus, one of the engineers employed by the emperor's orders to fortify the maritime cities against the Goths, had already begun to repair the ancient walls, fallen to decay since the time of Scylla. The efforts of his skill were ineffectual, and the barbarians became masters of the native seat of the muses and the arts. But while the conquerors abandoned themselves to the license of plunder and impertinence, their fleet, that lay with the slender guard in the harbour of Piraeus, was unexpectedly attacked by the brave Daxippus, who, flying with the engineer Cleodamus, from the sack of Athens, collected a hasty band of volunteers, peasants as well as soldiers, and in some measure avenged the calamities of his country. But this exploit, whatever lustre it might shed on the declining age of Athens, served rather to irritate than to subdue the undaunted spirit of the northern invaders. A general conflagration blazed out at the same time in every district of Greece. Thebes and Argos, Corinth and Sparta, which had formerly waged such memorable wars against each other, were now unable to bring an army into the field, or even to defend their ruined fortifications. The rage of war, both by land and by sea, spread from the eastern point of Sunim to the western coast of Epirus. The Goths had already advanced within sight of Italy, when the approach of such imminent danger awakened the indolent Gallienus from his dream of pleasure. The emperor appeared in arms, and his presence seemed to have checked the ardour, and to have divided the strength of the enemy. Nalobatus, a chief of the Heruli, accepted an honourable capitulation. Entered with a large body of his countrymen into the service of Rome, and was invested with the ornaments of a consular dignity, which had never before been profaned by the hands of a barbarian. Great numbers of the Goths, disgusted with the perils and hardships of a tedious voyage, broke into Mercia, with a design of forcing their way over the Danube to their settlements in the Ukraine. The wild attempt would have proved inevitable destruction, if the discord of the Roman generals had not opened to the barbarians the means of an escape. The small remainder of this destroying host returned on board their vessels, and measuring back their way through the Hellespont and the Borysphus, ravaged in their passage the shores of Troy, whose fame, immortalized by Homer, will probably survive the memory of the Gothic conquests. As soon as they found themselves in safety within the basin of the Euxine, they landed at Ancalus in Thrace, near the foot of Mount Hamus, and after all their toils indulged themselves in the use of those pleasant and sultry hot baths. What remained of the voyage was a short and easy navigation. Such was the various fate of the third and greatest of their naval enterprises. 
it may seem difficult to conceive how the original body of fifteen thousand warriors could sustain the losses and diversions of so bold an adventure. But as their numbers were gradually wasted by the sword, by shipwrecks, and by the influence of a warm climate, they were perpetually renewed by troops of banditti and deserters, who flocked to the standard of plunder, and by a crowd of fugitive slaves, often of German or Sarmatian extraction, who eagerly seized the glorious opportunity of freedom and revenge. In these expeditions the Gothic nation claimed a superior share of honour and danger. But the tribes that fought under the Gothic banners are sometimes distinguished and sometimes confounded in the imperfect histories of that age. And as the barbarian fleet seemed to issue from the mouth of the Tanis, the vague but familiar appellation of Scythians was frequently bestowed on the mixed multitude. End of chapter 10, part 3《Chapter Ten, Part Four of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Chapter Ten Emperors Decius, Gallus, Aemilianus, Valerian, and Gallienus. Part Four In the General Calamities of Mankind. The death of an individual, however exalted, the ruin of an edifice, however famous, are passed over with careless inattention. Yet we cannot forget that the temple of Diana at Ephesus, after having risen with increasing splendour from seven repeated misfortunes, was finally burnt by the Goths in their third naval invasion. The arts of Greece and the wealth of Asia had conspired to erect that sacred and magnificent structure. It was supported by a hundred and twenty-seven marble columns of the Ionic order. They were the gifts of devout monarchs, and each was sixty feet high. The altar was adorned with the masterly sculptures of Paraxteles, who had, perhaps, selected from the favourite legends of the place of the birth of the divine children of Latona, the concealment of Apollo after the slaughter of the Cyclops, and the clemency of Bacchus to the vanquished Amazons. Yet the length of the temple of Ephesus was only four hundred and twenty-five feet, about two-thirds of the measure of the church of St. Peter's at Rome. In other dimensions it was still more inferior to that sublime production of modern architecture. The spreading arms of a Christian cross require a much greater breadth than the oblong temples of the pagans and the boldest artists of antiquity would have been startled at the proposal of raising in the air a dome of the size and proportions of the Pantheon. The Temple of Diana was, however, admired as one of the wonders of the world. Successive empires, the Persian, the Macedonian, and the Roman, had revered its sanctity and enriched its splendour. But the rude savages of the Baltic were destitute of a taste for the elegant arts and they despised the ideal terrors of a foreign superstition. Another circumstance is related to these invasions, which might deserve our notice, were it not justly to be suspected, as the fanciful conceit of a recent sophist. We are told that in the sack of Athens, the Goths had collected all the libraries, and were on the point of setting fire to this funeral pile of Grecian learning. Had not one of their chiefs, of more refined policy than his brethren, dissuaded them from the design, by the profound observation, that as long as the Greeks were addicted to the study of books, they would never apply themselves to the exercise of arms. The sagacious counsellor, should the truth of the fact be admitted, reasoned like an ignorant barbarian. In the most polite and powerful nations, genius of every kind has displayed itself about the same period and the age of science has generally been the age of military virtue and success. 4. The new sovereign of Persia, Artaxerxes and his son Sapor, had triumphed, as we have already seen, over the house of Arsaces. 
Of the many princes of that ancient race, Chrysoas, king of Armenia, had alone preserved both his life and his independence. He defended himself by that natural strength of his country, by the perpetual resort of fugitives and malcontents, by the alliance of the Romans, and above all by his own courage. Invincible in arms during a thirty years' war, he was at length assassinated by the emissaries of Sapor, king of Persia. The patriotic satraps of Armenia, who asserted the freedom and dignity of the crown, implored the protection of Rome in the favour of Triadatus, the lawful heir. But the son of Chosroes was an infant, the allies were at a distance, and the Persian monarch advanced towards the frontier at the head of an irresistible force. Young Triadatus, the future hope of his country, was saved by the fidelity of a servant, and Armenia continued above twenty-seven years a reluctant province of the great monarchy of Persia. Elated with this easy conquest, and presuming on the distress or the degeneracy of the Romans, Sapor obliged the strong garrisons of Kare and Nisbus to surrender, and spread devastation and terror on either side of the Euphrates. The loss of an important frontier, the ruin of a faithful and natural ally, and the rapid success of Sapor's ambition, affected Rome with a deep sense of the insult as well as of the danger. Valerian flattered himself that the vigilance of his lieutenants would sufficiently provide for the safety of the Rhine and of the Danube. But he resolved, notwithstanding his advanced age, to march in person to the defence of the Euphrates. During his progress through Asia Minor, the naval enterprises of the Goths were suspended, and the afflicted province enjoyed a transient and felicious calm. He passed the Euphrates, encountered the Persian monarch near the walls of Edessa, was vanquished and taken prisoner by Sapor. The particulars of this great event are darkly and imperfectly represented. Yet, by the glimmering light which is afforded us, we may discover a long series of imprudence, of error, and of deserved misfortunes on the side of the Roman Emperor. He reposed an implicit confidence in Macrianus, his praetorian prefect. That worthless minister rendered his master formidably only to the oppressed subjects, and contemptible to the enemies of Rome. By his weak or wicked counsels, the imperial army was betrayed into a situation where valour and military skill were equally unavailing. The vigorous attempt of the Romans to cut their way through the Persian host was repulsed with great slaughter, and Sapor, who encompassed the camp with superior numbers, patiently waited till the increasing rage of famine and pestilence had ensured his victory. The licentious murmurs of the legions soon accused Valerian as the cause of their calamities. Their sedacious clamours demanded an instant capitulation. An immense sum of gold was offered to purchase the permission of a disgraceful retreat. But the Persian, conscious of his superiority, refused the money with disdain, and detaining the deputies, advanced in order of battle to the foot of the Roman rampart, and insisted on a personal conference with the emperor. Valerian was reduced to the necessity of entrusting his life and dignity to the faith of an enemy. The interview ended as it was natural to expect. The emperor was made a prisoner, and his astonished troops laid down their arms. In such a moment of triumph, the pride and policy of Sapor promoted him to fill the vacant throne with a successor entirely dependent on his pleasure. Chirides, an obscure fugitive of Antioch, stained with every vice, was chosen to dishonour the Roman purple. And the will of the Persian victor could not fail of being ratified by the acclamations, however reluctant, of the captive army. The imperial slave was eager to secure the favour of his master by an act of treason to his native country. He conducted Sapor over the Euphrates, and, by the way of Calchas, to the metropolis of the east. So rapid were the motions of the Persian cavalry, that, if we may credit a very judicious historian, 
the city of Antioch was surprised when the idle multitude was fondly gazing on the amusements of the theatre. The splendid buildings of Antioch, private as well as public, were either pillaged or destroyed, and the numerous inhabitants were put to the sword or led away into captivity. The tide of devastation was stopped for a moment by the resolution of the high priest of Emesa. Arrayed in his sacerdotal robes, he appeared at the head of a great body of fanatic peasants, armed only with slings, and defended his god and his property from the sacrilegious hands of the followers of Zoroaster. But the ruin of Tarsus, and of many other cities, furnishes a melancholy proof that, except in this singular instance, the conquest of Syria and Cilicia scarcely interrupted the progress of the Persian arms. The advantages of the narrow passes of Mount Taurus were abandoned, in which an invader, whose principal force consisted in his cavalry, would have been engaged in a very unequal combat, and Sapor was permitted to form the siege of Caesarea, the capital of Cappadocia, a city, though of the second rank, which was supposed to contain four hundred thousand inhabitants. Demosthenes commanded in the place, not so much by the commission of the emperor, as in the voluntary defence of his country. For a long time he deferred its fate, and when at last Caesarea was betrayed by the perfidy of a physician, he cut his way through the Persians, who had been ordered to exert their utmost diligence to take him alive. This heroic chief escaped the power of a foe, who might either have honoured or punished his obstinate valour. But many thousands of his fellow-citizens were involved in a general massacre and Sapor is accused of treating his prisoners with wanton and unrelenting cruelty. Much should undoubtedly be allowed for national animosity, much for humbled pride and impotent revenge. Yet, upon the whole, it is certain that the same prince, who, in Armenia, had displayed the mild aspect of a legislator, showed himself to the Romans under the stern features of a conqueror. He despaired of making any permanent establishment in the empire, and sought only to leave behind him a wasted desert, whilst he transported into Persia the people and the treasure of the provinces. At the time when the East trembled at the name of Sapor, he received a present not unworthy of the greatest kings, a long train of camels laden with the most rare and valuable merchandises. The rich offering was accompanied with an epistle, respectful but not servile, from Odenathus, one of the noblest and most opulent senators of Palmyra. "'Who is this Odenathus? said the haughty victor, and he commanded that the present should be cast into the Euphrates. That he thus insolently presumes to write to his lord. If he entertains a hope of mitigating his punishment, let him fall prostrate before the foot of our throne, with his hands bound behind his back. Should he hesitate, swift destruction shall be poured on his head, on his whole race, and on his country. The desperate extremity to which the Palmyrenian was reduced called into action all the latent powers of his soul. He met Sapor, but he met him in arms. Infusing his own spirit into the little army collected from the villages of Syria and the tents of the desert, he hovered round the Persian host, harassed their retreat, carried off part of the treasure, and, what was dearer than any treasure, several of the women of the great king, who was, at last, obliged to repass Euphrates with some marks of haste and confusion. By this exploit, Odenathus laid the foundations of his future fame and fortunes. The majesty of Rome, oppressed by a Persian, was protected by a Syrian or Arab of Palmyra. The voice of history, which is often little more than the organ of hatred or flattery, reproaches Sapor with a proud abuse of the rights of a conquest. We are told that Valerian, in chains, but invested with the imperial purple, was exposed to the multitude, a constant spectacle of fallen greatness, and that, whenever the Persian monarch mounted on horseback, he placed his foot on the neck of a Roman emperor, notwithstanding all the remonstrances of his allies who repeatedly advised him to remember the vicissitudes of fortune, to dread the returning power of Rome, and to make his illustrious captive the pledge of peace, not the object of insult. So Paul still remained inflexible. 
when Valerian sunk under the weight of shame and grief, his skin, stuffed with straw, was formed into the likeness of a human figure, was preserved for ages in the most celebrated temple of Persia. A more real monument of triumph than the fancied trophies of brass and marble so often erected by Roman vanity. The tale is moral and pathetic, but the truth of it may very fairly be called in question. The letters, still extinct from the princes of the East to Sapor, are manifest forgeries. Nor is it natural to suppose that a jealous monarch should, even in the person of a rival, thus publicly degrade the majesty of kings. Whatever treatment the unfortunate Valerian might experience in Persia, it is at least certain that the only emperor of Rome who had ever fallen into the hands of the enemy languished away his life in hopeless captivity. The emperor Gallienus, who had long supported with impatience the censorial severity of his father and colleague, received the intelligence of his misfortunes with secret pleasure and avowed indifference. I knew that my father was immortal said he, and since he has acted as it becomes a brave man, I am satisfied. Whilst Rome lamented the fate of her sovereign, the savage coldness of his son was extolled by the servile courtiers as the perfect firmness of a hero and a stoic. It is difficult to paint the light, the various, the inconsistent character of Gallienus, which he displayed without constraint, as soon as he became sole possessor of the empire. In every art that he attempted, his lively genius enabled him to succeed. And as his genius was destitute of judgment, he attempted every art, except the important ones of war and government. He was a master of several curious but useless sciences, a ready orator, an elegant poet, a skilful gardener, an excellent cook, and most contemptible prince. When the great emergencies of the state required his presence and attention, he was engaged in conversation with the philosopher, Plontius, wasting his time in trifling or licentious pleasures, preparing his initiation to the Grecian mysteries, or soliciting a place in the Archipagus of Athens. His profuse magnificence insulted the general poverty. The solemn ridicule of his triumph impressed a deeper sense of the public disgrace. The repeated intelligence of invasions, defeats, and rebellions he received with a careless smile, and, singling out with effective contempt, some particular production of the lost province, he carelessly asked whether Rome must be ruined, unless it was supplied with linen from Egypt, and arras cloth from Gaul. There were, however, a few short moments in the life of Gallienus, when, exasperated by some recent injury, he suddenly appeared the intrepid soldier and the cruel tyrant, till, satiated with blood, or fatigued by resistance, he insensibly sunk into the natural mildness and indolence of his character. At the time when the reins of government were held with so loose a hand, it is not surprising that a crowd of usurpers should start up in every province of the empire against the son of Valerian. It was probably some ingenious fancy, of comparing the thirty tyrants of Rome with the thirty tyrants of Athens, that induced the writers of the Augustan history to select that celebrated number, which has been gradually received into a popular appellation. But in every light the parallel is idle and effective. What resemblance can we discover between a council of thirty persons, the united oppressors of a single city, and an uncertain list of independent rivals, who rose and fell in irregular successions through the extent of a vast empire. Nor can the number of thirty be completed, unless we include in the account the women and children who were honoured with the imperial title. The reign of Gallienus, distracted as it was, produced only nineteen pretenders to the throne. Cyrides, Macrianus, Ballista, Odianathus, and Zenobi in the east. In Gaul and the western provinces, Posthumus, Lolanius, Victorianus, and his mother Victoria, Marius, and Tetricus, in Illyricum and the confines of the Danube, in Genus, Reglianus, and Aurelius, in Pontus, Saturninus, 
in Isuria, Trebellianus, Piso in Thessaly, Valens in Achaia, Aemilianus in Egypt, and Celsus in Africa, to illustrate the obscure monuments of the life and death of each individual, would prove a laborious task, alike barren of instruction and of amusement. We may content ourselves with investigating some general characters, that most strongly mark the condition of the times, and the manners of the men, their pretensions, their motives, their fate, and their destructive consequences of their reception. It is sufficiently known that the odious appellation of tyrant was often employed by the ancients to express the illegal seizure of supreme power without any reference to the abuse of it. Several of the pretenders who raised the standard of rebellion against the Emperor Gallienus were shining models of virtue, and almost all possessed a considerable share of vigour and ability. Their merit had recommended them to the favour of Valerian, and gradually promoted them to the most important commands of the empire. The generals, who assumed the title of Augustus, were either respected by their troops for their able conduct and severe discipline, or admired for valour and success in war, or beloved for frankness and generosity. The field of victory was often the scene of their election, and even the armour of Marius, the most contemptible of all the candidates for the purple, was distinguished, however by intrepid courage, matchless strength, and blunt honesty. His mean and recent trade cast indeed an air of ridicule on his elevation, but his birth could not be more obscure than was that of the greater part of his rivals, who were born of peasants, and enlisted in the army as private soldiers. In times of confusion every active genius finds the place assigned him by nature, in a general state of war, military merit is the road to glory and to greatness. Of the nineteen tyrants, Tetricus only was a senator, Piso alone was a noble. The blood of Numa, through twenty-eight successive generations, ran in the veins of Caliphanus, Piso, who, by female alliances, claimed a right of exhibiting, in his house, the images of Crassus and of the great Pompey. His ancestors had been repeatedly dignified with all the honours which the commonwealth could bestow. And of all the ancient families of Rome, the Califernian alone had survived the tyranny of the Caesars. The personal qualities of Piso added new lustre to his race. The usurper Valens, by whose order he was killed, confessed with deep remorse that even an enemy ought to have respected the sanctity of Piso and although he died in arms against Gallienus, the Senate, with the Emperor's generous permission, decreed the triumphal ornaments to the memory of so virtuous a rebel. The lieutenants of Valerian were grateful to the father whom they esteemed. They disdained to serve the luxurious indolence of his unworthy son. The throne of the Roman world was unsupported by any principle of loyalty, and treason against such a prince might easily be considered as patriotism to the state. Yet, if we examine with candour the conduct of these usurpers, it will appear that they were much often driven into rebellion by their fears, than urged to it by ambition. They dreaded the cruel suspicions of Gallienus. They equally dreaded the capricious violence of their troops. If the dangerous favour of the army had imprudently declared them deserving of the purple, they were marked for sure destruction, and even prudence would counsel them to secure a short enjoyment of empire, and rather to try the fortune of war than to expect the hand of an executioner. When the clamour of the soldiers invested the reluctant victims with the ensigns of sovereign authority, they sometimes mourned in secret their approaching fate. "'You have lost,' said Saturnus, on the day of his elevation. "'You have lost a useful commander,' and you have made a very wretched emperor. The apprehensions of Saturninus were justified by the repeated experience of revolutions. Of the nineteen tyrants who started up under the reign of Gallienus, there was not one who enjoyed a life of peace or a natural death. As soon as they were invested with the bloody purple, they inspired their ardents with the same fears and ambition 
which had occasioned their own revolt. Encompassed with domestic conspiracy, military sedation, and civil war, they trembled on the edge of precipices, in which, after a longer or shorter term of anxiety, they were inevitably lost. These precarious monarchs received, however, such honours as the flattery of their respective armies and provinces could bestow. But their claim, founded on rebellion, could never obtain the sanction of law or history. Italy, Rome, and the Senate, constantly adhered to the cause of Gallienus, and he alone was considered as the sovereign of the empire. That prince condescended, indeed, to acknowledge the victorious arms of Edenathus, who deserved the honourable distinction by the respectful conduct which he always maintained towards the son of Valerian. With the general applause of the Romans, and the consent of Gallienus, the Senate conferred the title of Augustus on the brave Palmyrenian, and seemed to entrust him with the government of the East, which he already possessed in so independent a manner, that, like a private succession, he bequeathed it to his illustrious widow Zenobia. The rapid and perpetual transitions from the cottage to the throne, and from the throne to the grave, might have amused an indifferent philosopher, were it possible for a philosopher to remain indifferent, amidst the general calamities of humankind. The election of these precarious emperors, their power and their death, were equally destructive to their subjects and adherents. The price of their fatal elevation was instantly discharged to the troops by an immense donative drawn from the bowels of the exhausted people. However virtuous was their character, however pure their intentions, they found themselves reduced to the hard necessity of supporting their absorption by frequent acts of rapine and cruelty. When they fell, they involved armies and provinces in their fall. There is still exact a most savage mandate from Gallienus to one of his ministers. After the suppression of Ingenus, who had assumed the purple in Illocrum, it is not enough, says the soft but inhuman prince, that you exterminate such as have appeared in arms. The chance of battle might have served me as effectually. The male sex of every age must be extirpated, provided that, in the execution of the children and old men, you can contrive means to save our reputation. Let every one die who has dropped an expression, who has entertained a thought against me, against me, the son of Valerian, the father and brother of so many princes. Remember that in Genus was made emperor. Tear, kill, hew in pieces. I write you with my own hand, and would inspire you with my own feelings. Whilst the public forces of the state were dissipated in private quarrels, the defenceless provinces lay exposed to every invader. The bravest usurpers were compelled by the perplexity of their situation to conclude ignominious treaties with the common enemy, to purchase with oppressive tributes the neutrality or services of the barbarians, and to introduce hostile and independent nations into the heart of the Roman monarchy. Such were the barbarians, and such the tyrants, who, under the reigns of Valerian and Gallienus, dismembered the provinces, and reduced the empire to the lowest pitch of disgrace and ruin, from whence it seemed impossible that it should ever emerge. As far as the barrenness of materials were to permit, we have attempted to trace, with order and perspicuity, the general events of that calamitous period. There still remain some particular facts. 1. The disorders of Sicily. 2. The tumults of Alexandria. And 3. The rebellion of the Isaurians, which may serve to reflect a strong light on the horrid picture. 1. Whenever numerous troops of banditti, multiplied by success and impunity, publicly defy, instead of eluding the justice of their country, we may safely infer that the excessive weakness of the government is felt and abused by the lowest ranks of the community. The situation of Sicily preserved it from the barbarians. Nor could the disarmed province have supported a usurper. 
the sufferings of that once flourishing and still fertile island were inflicted by baser hands. A licentious crowd of slaves and peasants reigned for a while over the plundered country, and renewed the memory of the servile wars of more ancient times. Devastations, of which the husbandman was either the victim or the accomplice, must have ruined the agriculture of Sicily. And as the principal estates were the property of the opulent senators of Rome, who often enclosed within a farm the territory of an old republic, it is not improbable that this private injury might affect the capital more deeply than all the conquests of the Goths or the Persians. 2. The foundation of Alexandria was a noble design, at once conceived and executed by the son of Philip. The beautiful and regular form of that great city, second only to Rome itself, comprehended a circumference of fifteen miles. It was peopled by three hundred thousand free inhabitants, besides at least an equal number of slaves. The lucrative trade of Arabia and India flowed through the port of Alexandria, to the capital and provinces of the empire. Idleness was unknown. Some were employed in blowing of glass, others in weaving of linen, others again manufacturing the papyrus. Either sex and every age was engaged in the pursuits of industry. Nor did even the blind or the lame want occupation suited to their condition. But the people of Alexandria, a various mixture of nations, united the vanity and inconsistency of the Greeks, with the superstition and obstinacy of the Egyptians. The most trifling occasion, a transient scarcity of flesh or lentils, the neglect of an accustomed salutation, a mistake of precedency in the public baths, or even a religious dispute, were at any time sufficient to kindle a sedation among the vast multitude, whose resentments were furious and implacable. After the capture of Valerian and the insolence of his son had relaxed the authority of the laws, the Alexandrians abandoned themselves to the ungoverned rage of their passions, and their unhappy country was the theatre of a civil war, which continued, with a few short and suspicious truces, above twelve years. All intercourse was cut off between the several quarters of the afflicted city. Every street was polluted with blood, every building of strength converted into a citadel. Nor did the tumult subside, till a considerable part of Alexandria was irretrievably ruined. The spacious and magnificent district of Brucian, with its palaces and museum, the residence of the kings and philosophers of Egypt, is described above a century afterwards, as already reduced to its present state of dreary solitude. 3. The obscure rebellion of Trebellius, who assumed the purple in Isauria, a petty province of Asia Minor, was attended with strange and memorable consequences. The pageant of royalty was soon destroyed by an officer of Gallienus, but his followers, despairing of mercy, resolved to shake off their allegiance, not only to the emperor, but to the empire and suddenly returned to the savage manners from which they had never perfectly been reclaimed. Their craggy rocks, a branch of the wide-extended Taurus, protected their inaccessible retreat. The tillage of some fertile valleys supplied them with necessaries, and a habit of raping with the luxuries of life. In the heart of the Roman monarchy, the Assyrians long contained a nation of wild barbarians. Succeeding princes unable to reduce them to obedience, either by arms or policy, were compelled to acknowledge their weakness by surrounding the hostile and independent spot with a strong chain of fortifications, which often proved insufficient to restrain the incursions of these domestic foes. The Assyrians, gradually extending their territory to the sea-coast, subdued the western and mountainous part of Cilicia, formerly the nest of those daring pirates, against whom the Republic had once been obliged to exert its utmost force, under the conduct of the great Pompey. Our habits of thinking so fondly connect the order of the universe with the fate of man, 
that this gloomy period of history has been decorated with inundations, earthquakes, uncommon meteors, preternatural darkness, and a crowd of prodigies, fictitious or exaggerated. But a long and general famine was a calamity of a more serious kind. It was the inevitable consequence of raping and oppression, which extirpated the produce of the peasant, and the hope of future harvests. Famine is almost always followed by epidemical disease, the effect of scanty and unwholesome food. Other causes must, however, have contributed to the furious plague, which, from the year 250 to the year 265, raged without interruption in every province, every city, and almost every family of the Roman Empire. During some time, five thousand persons died daily in Rome, and many towns that had escaped the hands of the barbarians were entirely depopulated. We have the knowledge of a very curious circumstance, of some use perhaps in the melancholy calculation of human calamities. An exact register was kept at Alexandria of all the citizens entitled to receive the distribution of corn. It was found that the ancient number of those comprised between the ages of forty and seventy had been equal to the whole sum of claimants from fourteen to fourscore years of age, who remained alive after the reign of Gallienus. Applying this authentic fact to the most correct tables of mortality, it evidently proves that above half the people of Alexandria had perished, and could we venture to extend the analogy to the other provinces, we might suspect that war, pestilence, and famine had consumed in a few years the moiety of the human species. End of chapter 10, part 4「Chapter 11, Part 1 of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1 」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Chapter 11 Reign of Claudius, Defeat of the Goths Part 1 Reign of Claudius, Defeat of the Goths, Victories, Triumph and death of Aurelian. Under the deplorable reigns of Valerian and Gallienus, the empire was oppressed and almost destroyed by the soldiers, the tyrants, and the barbarians. It was saved by a series of great princes who derived their obscure origin from the martial provinces of Illyricum. Within a period of about thirty years, Claudius, Aurelian, Probus, Diocletian, and his colleagues triumphed over the foreign and domestic enemies of the state, re-established with a military discipline the strength of the frontiers and deserved the glorious title of Restorers of the Roman World. The removal of an effeminate tyrant made way for a succession of heroes. The indignation of the people imputed all their calamities to Gallienus, and the far greater part were indeed the consequence of his dissolute manners and careless administration. He was even destitute of a sense of honor, which so frequently supplies the absence of public virtue. And as long as he was permitted to enjoy the possession of Italy, a victory of the barbarians, the loss of a province, or the rebellion of a general, seldom distributed the tranquil course of his pleasures. At length, a considerable army, stationed on the upper Danube, invested with the imperial purple their leader Aureolus, who, disdaining a confined and barren reign over the mountains of Rhaetia, passed the Alps, occupied Milan, threatened Rome, and challenged Gallienus to dispute in the field the sovereignty of Italy. The emperor, provoked by the insult and alarmed by the instant danger, suddenly exerted that latent vigor which sometimes broke through the indolence of his temper. Forcing himself from the luxury of the palace, he appeared in arms at the head of his legions and advanced beyond the Po to encounter his competitor. The corrupted name of Pontirolo still preserves the memory of a bridge over the Adda, 
which, during the action, must have proved an object of the utmost importance to both armies. The Russian usurper, after receiving a total defeat and a dangerous wound, retired into Milan. The siege of that great city was immediately formed. The walls were battered with every engine in use among the ancients, and Aureolus, doubtful of his internal strength and hopeless of foreign succors, already anticipated the fatal consequences of unsuccessful rebellion. His last resource was an attempt to seduce the loyalty of the besiegers. He scattered libels through the camp, inviting the troops to desert an unworthy master, who sacrificed the public happiness to his luxury and the lives of his most valuable subjects to the slightest suspicions. The arts of Aureolus diffused fears and discontent among the principal officers of his rival. A conspiracy was formed by Heraclianus, the Praetorian prefect, by Marcion, a general of rank and reputation, and by Secrops, who commanded a numerous body of the Dalmatian guards. The death of Gallienus was resolved, and notwithstanding their desire of first terminating the siege of Milan, the extreme danger which accompanied every moment's delay obliged them to hasten the execution of their daring purpose. At a late hour of the night, but while the emperor still protracted the pleasures of the table, an alarm was suddenly given that Aureolus, at the head of all his forces, had made a desperate sally from the town. Gallienus, who was never deficient in personal bravery, started from his silken couch, and without allowing himself time either to put on his armour or to assemble his guards, he mounted on horseback and rode full speed towards the supposed place of the attack. Encompassed by his declared or concealed enemies, he soon, amidst the nocturnal tumult, received a mortal dart from an uncertain hand. Before he expired, a patriotic sentiment using in the mind of Gallienus induced him to name a deserving successor and it was his last request that the imperial ornaments should be delivered to Claudius, who then commanded a detached army in the neighborhood of Pavia. The report at least was diligently propagated, and the order cheerfully obeyed by the conspirators, who had already agreed to place Claudius on the throne. On the first news of the emperor's death, the troops expressed some suspicion and resentment, till the one was removed and the other assuaged, by a donator of twenty pieces of gold to each soldier. They then ratified the election and acknowledged the merit of their new sovereign. The obscurity which covered the origin of Claudius, though it was afterwards embellished by some flattering fictions, sufficiently betrays the meanness of his birth. We can only discover that he was a native of one of the provinces bordering on the Danube, that his youth was spent in arms, and that his modest valour attracted the favour and confidence of Decius. The Senate and people already considered him an excellent officer, equal to the most important trusts, and censured the inattention of Valerian, who suffered him to remain in the subordinate section of a tribune. But it was not long before that emperor distinguished the merit of Claudius by declaring him general and chief of the Illyrian frontier, with the command of all the troops in Thrace, Macia, Dacia, Pannonia, and Dalmatia, the appointments of the prefect of Egypt, the establishments of the proconsul of Africa, and the sure prospect of the consulship. By his victories over the Goths, he deserved from the Senate the honor of a statue, and excited the jealous apprehensions of Gallienus. It was impossible that a soldier could esteem so dissolute a sovereign, nor is it easy to conceal a just contempt. Some unguarded expressions which dropped from Claudius were officially transmitted to the royal ear. The emperor's answer to an officer of confidence describes in very lively colors his own character and that of the times. There is not anything capable of giving me more serious concern than the intelligence contained in your last dispatch, that some malicious suggestions have indisposed towards us the mind of our friend and parent Claudius. As you regard your allegiance, use every means to appease his resentment, but conduct your negotiation with secrecy. 
that did not reach the knowledge of Dacian troops. They are already provoked, and it might inflame their fury. I myself have sent him some presents. Be it your care that he accept them with pleasure. Above all, let him not suspect that I am made acquainted with his imprudence. The fear of my anger might urge him to desperate counsels. The presents which accompanied this humble epistle, in which the monarch solicited a reconciliation with his discontented subject, consisted of a considerable sum of money, a splendid wardrobe, and a valuable service of silver and gold plate. By such arts, Gallienus softened the indignation and dispelled the fears of his Illyrian general. And during the remainder of that reign, the formidable sword of Claudius was always drawn in the cause of a master whom he despised. At last, indeed, he received from the conspirators the bloody purple of Gallienus. But he had been absent from their camp and councils, and however he might applaud the deed, we may candidly presume that he was innocent of the knowledge of it. When Claudius ascended the throne, he was about fifty-four years of age. The siege of Milan was still continued, and Aureolus soon discovered that the success of his artifices had only raised up a more determined adversary. He attempted to negotiate with Claudius a treaty of alliance and partition. Tell him, replied the intrepid emperor, that such proposals should have been made to Gallienus. He, perhaps, might have listened to them with patience and accepted a colleague as despicable as himself. This turned refusal and a last unsuccessful effort obliged Aureolus to lead the city and himself to the discretion of the conqueror. The judgment of the army pronounced him worthy of death, and Claudius, after a feeble resistance, consented to the execution of the sentence. Nor was the zeal of the Senate less ardent in the cause of their new sovereign. They ratified, perhaps with a sincere transport of zeal, the election of Claudius, and, as his predecessor had shown himself the personal enemy of their order, they exercised, under the name of justice, a severe revenge against his friends and family. The Senate was permitted to discharge the ungrateful office of punishment, and the Emperor reserved for himself the pleasure and merit of obtaining by his intercession a general act of indemnity. Such ostentatious clemency discovers less of the real character of Claudius than a trifling circumstance in which he seems to have consulted only the dictates of his heart. The frequent rebellions of the provinces had involved almost every person in the guilt of treason, almost every estate in the case of confiscation, and Gallienus often displayed his liberality by distributing among his officers the property of his subjects. On the accession of Claudius, an old woman threw herself at his feet and complained that a general of the late emperor had obtained an arbitrary grant of her patrimony. This general was Claudius himself, who had not entirely escaped the contagion of the times. The emperor blushed at the reproach, but deserved the confidence which she had reposed in his equity. The confession of his fault was accompanied with immediate and ample restitution. In the arduous task which Claudius had undertaken of restoring the empire to its ancient splendor, it was first necessary to revive among his troops a sense of order and obedience. With the authority of a veteran commander, he represented to them that the relaxation of discipline had introduced a long train of disorders, the effect of which were at length experienced by the soldiers themselves. That a people ruined by oppression and indolent from despair could no longer supply a numerous army with a means of luxury or even subsistence, that the danger of each individual had increased with the despotism of the military order, since princes who tremble on the throne will guard their safety by the instant sacrifice of every obnoxious subject. The emperor expiated on the mischiefs of a lawless caprice, which the soldiers could only gratify at the expense of their own blood. As their seditious elections had so frequently been followed by civil wars, which consumed the flower of the legions, either in the field of battle or in the cruel abuse of victory, he painted in the most lively colors the exhausted state of the treasury, 
the desolation of the provinces, the disgrace of the Roman name, and the insolent triumph of rapacious barbarians. It was against those barbarians, he declared, that he intended to point the first effort of their arms. Tetricus might reign for a while over the west, and even Zenobia might preserve the dominion of the east. These usurpers were his personal adversaries, nor could he think of indulging any private resentment till he had saved an empire whose impending ruin would, unless it was timely prevented, crush both the army and the people. The various nations of Germany and Sarmatia, who fought under the Gothic standard, had already collected an armament more formidable than any which had yet issued from the Euxine. On the banks of the Niester, one of the great rivers that discharged themselves into that sea, they constructed a fleet of 2,000 or even 6,000 vessels, numbers which, however incredible they may seem, would have been insufficient to transport their pretended army of 320,000 barbarians. Whatever might be the real strength of the Goths, the vigor and success of the expedition were not adequate to the greatness of the preparations. In their passage through the Bosphorus, the unskillful pilots were overpowered by the violence of the current, and while the multitude of their ships were crowded in a narrow channel, many were dashed against each other or against the shore. The barbarians made several descents on the coasts both of Europe and Asia, but the open country was already plundered, and they were repulsed with shame and loss from the fortified cities which they assaulted. A spirit of discouragement and division arose in the fleet, and some of their chiefs sailed away towards the islands of Crete and Cyprus. But the main body, pursuing a more steady course, anchored at length near the foot of Mount Athos, and assaulted the city of Thessalonica, the wealthy capital of all the Macedonian provinces. Their attacks, in which they displayed a fierce but artless bravery, were soon interrupted by the rapid approach of Claudius, hastening to a scene of action that deserved the presence of a warlike prince at the head of the remaining powers of the empire. Impatient for battle, the Goths immediately broke up their camp, relinquished the siege of Thessalonica, left their navy at the foot of Mount Athos, traversed to the hills of Macedonia, and pressed forward to engage the last defense of Italy. We still possess an original letter addressed by Claudius to the Senate and people on this memorable occasion. Conscript fathers, says the emperor, know that 320,000 Goths have invaded the Roman territory. If I vanquish them, your gratitude will reward my services. Should I fall, remember that I am the successor of Gallienus. The whole republic is fatigued and exhausted. We shall fight after Valerian, after Ingenius, Regilianus, Lollianus, Posthumus, Celsus, and a thousand others whom a just contempt for Gallienus provoked into rebellion. We are in the want of darts, of spears, and of shields. The strength of the empire, Gaul, and Spain are usurped by Tetricus, and we blush to acknowledge that the archers of the east serve under the banners of Zenobia. Whatever we shall perform will be sufficiently great. The melancholy firmness of this epistle announces a hero careless to his fate, conscious of his danger, and still deriving a well-grounded hope from the resources of his own mind. The events surpassed his own expectations and those of the world. By the most signal victories he delivered the empire from this host of barbarians and was distinguished by posterity under the glorious appellation of the Gothic Claudius. The imperfect historians of an irregular war do not enable us to describe the order and circumstances of his exploits. But, if we could be indulged in the illusion, we might distribute into three acts this memorable tragedy. 1. The decisive battle was fought near Nisus, a city of Dardania. The legions at first gave away, oppressed by numbers and dismayed by misfortunes. Their ruin was inevitable had not the abilities of their emperor prepared a seasonable relief. A large detachment, rising out of the secret and difficult passes of the mountains, which, by his order, they had occupied, 
suddenly assailed the rear of the victorious Goths. The favorable instant was improved by the activity of Claudius. He revived the courage of his troops, restored their ranks, and pressed the barbarians on every side. Fifty thousand men are reported to have been slain in the Battle of Nisus. Several large bodies of barbarians, covering their retreat with the movable fortifications of wagons, retired, or rather escaped, from the field of slaughter. 2. We may presume that some insurmountable difficulty, the fatigue perhaps, or the disobedience of the conquerors, prevented Claudius from completing in one day the destruction of the Goths. The war was diffused over the province of Maesia, Thrace, and Macedonia, and its operations drawn out into a variety of marches, surprises, and tumultuary engagements, as well by sea as by land. When the Romans suffered any loss, it was commonly occasioned by their own cowardice or rashness. But the superior talents of the emperor, his perfect knowledge of the country, and his judicious choice of measures as well as officers, assured on most occasions the success of his arms. The immense booty, the fruit of so many victories, consisted for the greater part of cattle and slaves. A select body of the Gothic youth was received among the imperial troops. The remainder was sold into servitude. And so considerable was the number of female captives that every soldier obtained to his share two or three women. A circumstance from which we may conclude that the invaders entertained some designs of settlement as well as of plunder, since even in a naval expedition they were accompanied by their families. 3. The loss of their fleet, which was either taken or sunk, had intercepted the retreat of the Goths. A vast circle of Roman posts, distributed with skill, supported with firmness, and gradually closing towards a common centre, forced the barbarians into the most inaccessible parts of Mount Hemus, where they found a safe refuge, but a very scanty subsistence. During the course of a rigorous winter in which they were besieged by the emperor's troops, famine and pestilence, desertion and the sword continually diminished the imprisoned multitude. On the return of spring, nothing appeared in arms except a hardy and desperate band, the remnant of that mighty host which had embarked at the mouth of the Nister. The pestilence which swept away such numbers of the barbarians at length proved fatal to their conqueror. After a short but glorious reign of two years, Claudius expired at Simeum, amidst the tears and acclamations of his subjects. In his last illness, he convened the principal officers of the state and army, and in their presence recommended Aurelian, one of his generals, as the most deserving of the throne, and the best qualified to execute the great design which he himself had been permitted only to undertake. The virtues of Claudius, his valor, affability, justice, and temperance, his love of fame and of his country, place him in that short list of emperors who added luster to the Roman purple. Those virtues, however, were celebrated with peculiar zeal and complacency by the courtly writers of the age of Constantine, who was the great grandson of Crispus, the elder brother of Claudius. The voice of flattery was soon taught to repeat that gods, who so hastily had snatched Claudius from the earth, rewarded his merit and piety by the perpetual establishment of the empire in his family. Notwithstanding these oracles, the greatness of the Flavian family, a name which it had pleased them to assume, was deferred above twenty years, and the elevation of Claudius occasioned the immediate ruin of his brother, Quintilius, who possessed not sufficient moderation or courage to descend into the private station to which the patriotism of the late emperor had condemned him. Without delay or reflection, he assumed the purple at Aquilia, where he commanded a considerable force and though his reign lasted only seventeen days, he had time to obtain the sanction of the Senate and to experience a mutiny of the troops. As soon as he was informed that the great army of the Danube had invested the well-known valor of Aurelian with imperial power, he sunk under the fame and merit of his rival, and ordering his veins to be opened, 
prudently withdrew himself from the unequal contest. The general design of this work will not permit us minutely to relate the actions of every emperor after he ascended the throne, much less to deduce the various fortunes of his private life. We shall only observe that the father of Aurelian was a peasant of the territory of Sirmium, who occupied a small farm, the property of Aurelius, a rich senator. His warlike son, enlisted in the troops as a common soldier, successively rose to the rank of a centurion, a tribune, the prefect of a legion, the inspector of the camp, the general, or, as it was then called, the duke of a frontier, and, at length during the Gothic war, exercised the important office of commander-in-chief of the cavalry. In every station he distinguished himself by matchless vigor, rigid discipline, and successful conduct. He was invested with a consulship by the Emperor Valerian, who styles him, in the pompous language of that age, the deliverer of Illyricum, the restorer of Gaul, and the rival of the Scipios. At the recommendation of Valerian, a senator of the highest rank and merit, Alpius Crinitus, whose blood was derived from the same source as that of Trajan, adopted the Pannonian peasant, gave him his daughter in marriage, and relieved with his ample fortune the honorable poverty which Aurelian had preserved inviolate. The reign of Aurelian lasted only four years and about nine months, but every instant of that short period was filled by some memorable achievement. He put an end to the Gothic War, chastised the Germans who invaded Italy, recovered Gaul, Spain, and Britain out of the hands of Tetricus, and destroyed the proud monarchy which Zenobia had erected in the east on the ruins of the afflicted empire. It was the rigid attention of Aurelian, even to the minutest articles of discipline, which bestowed such uninterrupted success on his arms. His military regulations are contained in a very concise epistle to one of his inferior officers, who is commanded to enforce them, as he wishes to become a tribune, or he is desirous to live. Gaming, drinking and the arts of divination were severely prohibited. Aurelian expected that his soldiers should be modest, frugal and laborious, that their armor should be constantly kept bright, their weapons sharp, their clothing and horses ready for immediate service, that they should live in their quarters with chastity and sobriety, without damaging the cornfields, without stealing even a sheep, a fowl or a bunch of grapes, without exacting from their landlords either salt or oil or wood. The public allowance, continues the emperor, is sufficient for their support. Their wealth should be collected from the spoils of the enemy, not from the tears of the provincials. A single instance will serve to display the rigor and even cruelty of Aurelian. One of the soldiers had seduced the wife of his host. The guilty wretch was fastened to two trees forcibly drawn towards each other, and his limbs were torn asunder by their sudden separation. A few such examples impressed a salutary consternation. The punishments of Aurelian were terrible, but he had seldom occasion to punish more than once the same offence. His own conduct gave a sanction to his loss, and the seditious legions dreaded a chief who had learned to obey and who was worthy to command. End of chapter 11, part 1 Recording by Kritika Chapter 11, part 2 of The Deline and Fall of the Roman Empire, volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Monsbrew Helsingfors, Finland. Chapter 11. Reign of Claudius, Defeat of the Goths. Part 2. The death of Claudius had revived the fainting spirit of the Goths. The troops which guarded the passes of Mount Hamus and the banks of the Danube had been drawn away by the apprehension of a civil war, and it seems probable that the remaining body of the Gothic and Vandalic tribes embraced the favorable opportunity, abandoned their settlements of the Ukraine, traversed the rivers, and swelled with the new multitudes the destroying hosts of their countrymen. 
The united numbers were at length encountered by Aurelian, and the bloody and doubtful conflict ended only with the approach of night. Exhausted by so many calamities, which they had mutually endured and inflicted during a twenty years' war, the Goths and the Romans consented to a lasting and beneficial treaty. It was earnestly solicited by the barbarians, and cheerfully ratified by the legions, to whose suffrage the prudence of Aurelian referred the decision of that important question. The Gothic nation, engaged to supply the armies of Rome with a body of two thousand auxiliaries, consisting entirely of cavalry, and stipulated in return an undisturbed retreat with a regular market as far as the Danube, provided by the emperor's care, but at their own expense. The treaty was observed with such religious fidelity that when a party of five hundred men straggled from the camp in quest of plunder, the king or general of the barbarians commanded that the guilty leader should be apprehended and shot to death with darts as a victim devoted to the sanctity of their engagements. It is, however, not unlikely that the precaution of Aurelian, who had exacted as hostages the sons and daughters of the Gothic chiefs, contributed something to this pacific temper. The youths he trained in the exercise of arms, and near to his own person, to the damsels he gave a liberal and Roman education, and by bestowing them in marriage on some of his principal officers, gradually introduced between the two nations the closest and most endearing connections. But the most important condition of peace was understood rather than expressed in the treaty. Aurelian withdrew the Roman forces from Dacia, and tacitly relinquished that great province to the Goths and Vandals. His manly judgment convinced him of the solid advantages, and taught him to despise the seeming disgrace of thus contracting the frontiers of the monarchy. The Dacian subjects, removed from those distant possessions which they were unable to cultivate or defend, added strength and populousness to the southern side of the Danube, a fertile territory, which the repetition of a barbarous inroads had changed into a desert, was yielded to their industry, and the new province of Dacia still preserved the memory of Trajan's conquests. The old country of that name detained, however, a considerable number of its inhabitants, who dreaded exile more than a Gothic master. These degenerate Romans continued to serve the empire, whose allegiance they had renounced, by introducing amongst their conquerors the first notions of agriculture, the useful arts, and the conveniences of civilized life. An intercourse of commerce and language was gradually established within the opposite banks of the Danube, and after Dacia became an independent state, it often proved the firmest barrier of the empire against the invasions of the savages of the north. A sense of interest attached these more settled barbarians to the alliance of Rome, and a permanent interest very frequently ripens into sincere and useful friendship. This various colony, which filled the ancient province, and was insensibly blended into one great people, still acknowledged the superior renown and authority of the Gothic tribe and claimed the fancied honour of a Scandinavian origin. At the same time, the lucky though accidental resemblance of the name of Gete, infused among the credulous Goths a vain persuasion that in a remote age their own ancestors, already seated in the Dacian provinces, had received instructions of Samolxis, and checked the victorious arms of Sesostris and Darius. While the vigorous and moderate conduct of Aurelian restored the Illyrian frontier, the nation of the Alemanni violated the conditions of peace, which either Gallenius had purchased, or Claudius had imposed, and, inflamed by their impatient youth, suddenly flew to arms. Forty thousand horse appeared in the field, and the numbers of the infantry doubled those of the cavalry. The first objects of their avarice were a few cities on the Raetian frontier, but their hopes soon rising with success, the rapid march of the Alemanni traced the line of devastation from the Danube to the Po. The emperor was almost at the same time informed of the eruption, and of the retreat of the barbarians. Collecting an active body of troops, he marched with silence and celerity along the skirts of the Hercurian forest, and the Alemanni, laden with the spoils of Italy, arrived at the Danube, without suspecting that on the opposite bank, and in an adventurous post, a Roman army lay concealed and prepared to intercept their return. Aurelian indulged the fatal security of the barbarians, and permitted about half their forces to pass the river without disturbance and without precaution. Their situation and astonishment gave him an easy victory. His skilful conduct improved the advantage. 
disposing the legions in a semicircular form, he advanced the two horns of the crescent across the Danube, and wheeling them on a sudden towards the centre, enclosed the rear of the German host. The dismayed barbarians, on whatsoever side they cast their eyes, beheld, with despair, a wasted country, a deep and rapid stream, a victorious and implacable enemy. Reduced to this distressed condition, the Alemanni no longer disdained to sue for peace. Aurelian received their ambassadors at the head of his camp, and with every circumstance of martial pomp that could display the greatness and discipline of Rome, the legions stood by their arms in well-ordered ranks and awful silence. The principal commanders, distinguished by the ensigns of their rank, appeared on horseback on either side of the imperial throne. Behind the throne, the consecrated images of the emperor, and his predecessors, the golden eagles, and the various titles of the legions, engraved in letters of gold, were exalted in the air on lofty pikes covered with silver. When Aurelian assumed his seat, his manly grace and majestic figure taught the barbarians to revere the person as well as the purple of their conqueror. The ambassadors fell prostrate on the ground in silence. They were commanded to rise and permitted to speak. By the assistance of interpreters, they extenuated their perfidy, magnified their exploits, expatiated on the vicissitudes of fortune and the advantages of peace, and, with an ill-timed confidence, demanded a large subsidy as the price of the allegiance which they offered to the Romans. The answer of the emperor was stern and imperious. He treated their offer with contempt, and their demand with indignation, reproached the barbarians, that they were as ignorant of the arts of war as of the laws of peace, and finally dismissed them with the choice only of submitting to his unconditional mercy, or awaiting the utmost severity of his resentment. Aurelian had resigned a distant province to the Goths, but it was dangerous to trust or to pardon these perfidious barbarians, whose formidable power kept Italy herself perpetual alarms. Immediately after this conference, it should seem that some unexpected emergency required the emperor's presence in Pannonia. He devolved on his lieutenants the care of finishing the destruction of the Alemanni, either by the sword or by the surer operations of famine but an active despair has often triumphed over the indolent assurance of success. The barbarians, finding it impossible to traverse the Danube and the Roman camp, broke through the posts in their rears, which were more feebly or less carefully guarded, and with incredible diligence, but by a different road, returned towards the mountains of Italy. Aurelian, who considered the war as totally extinguished, received the mortifying intelligence of the escape of the Alemanni, and of the ravage which they already committed in the territory of Milan. The legions were commanded to follow, with as much expedition as those heavy bodies were capable of exerting, the rapid flight of an enemy, whose infantry and cavalry moved with almost equal swiftness. A few days afterwards, the emperor himself marched to the relief of Italy, at the head of a chosen body of auxiliaries, among whom were the hostages and the cavalry of the Vandals, and of all the Praetorian guards who had served in the wars on the Danube. As the light troops of the Alemanni had spread themselves from the Alps to the Apennine, the incessant vigilance of Aurelian and his officers was exercised in the discovery, the attack, and the pursuit of the numerous detachments. Notwithstanding this desultory war, three considerable battles are mentioned, in which the principal force of both armies was obstinately engaged. The success was various. In the first, fought near Placentia, the Romans received so severe a blow that, according to the expression of a writer extremely partial to Aurelian, the immediate dissolution of the empire was apprehended. The crafty barbarians, who had lined the woods, suddenly attacked the legions in the dusk of the evening, and it is most probable, after the fatigue and disorder of a long march, the fury of their charge was irresistible. But, at length, after a dreadful slaughter, the patient firmness of the emperor rallied his troops, and restored in some degree the honour of his arms. The second battle was fought near Fano in Umbria, on the spot which, five hundred years before, had been fatal to the brother of Hannibal. Thus far the successful Germans had advanced along the Emilian and Flaminian way, with the design of sacking the defenceless mistress of the world. But Aurelian, who, watchful for the safety of Rome, still hung on their rear, found in this place the decisive moment of giving them a total and irretrievable defeat. The flying remnant of their host was exterminated in a third and last battle near Pavia, and Italy was delivered from the inroads of the Alemanni. Fifth.
fear has been the original parent of superstition, and every new calamity urges trembling mortals to deprecate the wrath of their invisible enemies. Though the best hope of the Republic was in the valor and conduct of Aurelian, yet such was the public consternation when the barbarians were hourly expected at the gates of Rome, that by a decree of the Senate the Sibylline books were consulted. Even the Emperor himself, from a motive either of religion or policy, recommended this salutary measure, chided the tardiness of the Senate, and offered to supply whatever expense, whatever animals, whatever captives of any nation the gods should require. Notwithstanding this liberal offer, it does not appear that any human victims expiated with their bloods the sins of the Roman people. The Sibyl in books and joint ceremonies of a more harmless nature, processions of priests in white robes, attended by a chorus of youths and virgins, lustrations of the city and adjacent country, and sacrifices whose powerful influence disabled the barbarians from passing the mystic ground on which they had been celebrated. However puerile in themselves, these superstitious acts were subservient to the success of the war, and if, in the decisive battle of Fano, the Alemanni fancied they saw an army of spectres combating on the side of Aurelian, he received a real and effectual aid from this imaginary reinforcement. But whatever confidence might be placed in ideal ramparts, the experience of the past and the dread of the future induced the Romans to construct fortifications of a grosser and more substantial kind. The seven hills of Rome had been surrounded by the successors of Romulus with an ancient wall of more than thirteen miles. The vast enclosure may seem disproportioned to the strength and numbers of the infant state, but it was necessary to secure an ample extent of pasture and arable land against the frequented sun incursions of the tribes of Latium, the perpetual enemies of the Republic. With the progress of Roman greatness, the city and its inhabitants gradually increased, filled up the vacant space, pierced through the useless walls, covered the fields of Mars, and, on every side, followed the public highways in long and beautiful suburbs. The extents of the new walls, erected by Aurelian, and finished in the reign of Probus, was magnified by popular estimation to near fifty, but is reduced by accurate measurements to about twenty-one miles. It was a great, but a melancholy labor, since the defense of the capital betrayed the decline of the monarchy. The Romans of a more prosperous age, who trusted to the arms of the legions the safety of the frontier camps, were very far from entertaining a suspicion that it would ever become necessary to fortify the seat of empire against the inroads of the barbarians. The victory of Claudius over the Goths, and the success of Aurelian against the Alemanni, had already restored to the arms of Rome their ancient superiority over the barbarous nations of the north. To chastise domestic tyrants, and to reunite the dismembered parts of the empire, was a task reserved for the second of those warlike emperors. Though he was acknowledged by the senate and people, the frontiers of Italy, Africa, Illyricum, and Thraci confined the limits of his reign. Gaul, Spain, and Britain, Egypt, Syria, and Asia Minor, were still possessed by two rebels, who alone, out of so numerous a list, had hitherto escaped the dangers of their situation, and to complete the ignominy of Rome, these rival thrones had been usurped by women. A rapid succession of monarchs had arisen and fallen in the provinces of Gaul. The rigid virtues of Posthumus served only to hasten his destruction. After suppressing a competitor, who had assumed the purple at Mintz, he refused to gratify his troops with the plunder of the rebellious city, and in the seventh year of his reign became the victim of their disappointed avarice. The death of Victorinus, his friend and associate, was occasioned by a less worthy cause. The shining accomplishments of that prince were stained by a licentious passion, which he indulged in acts of violence, with too little regard to the laws of society or even those of love. He was slain at Cologne, by a conspiracy of jealous husbands, whose revenge would have appeared more justifiable had they spared the innocence of his son. After the murder of so many valiant princes, it is somewhat remarkable that a female for a long time controlled the fierce legions of Gaul, and still more singular that she was the mother of the unfortunate Victorinus. The arts and treasures of Victoria enabled her successively to place Marius and Tetricus on the throne, and to reign with a manly vigor under the name of those dependent emperors. Money of copper, of silver, and of gold was coined in her name. She assumed the titles of Augusta and mother of the camps. Her power ended only with her life. 
but her life was perhaps shortened by the ingratitude of Tetricus. When, at the instigation of his ambitious patroness, Tetricus assumed the ensigns of royalty, he was governor of the peaceful province of Aquitania, an employment suited to his character and education. He reigned four or five years over Gaul, Spain, and Britain, the slave and sovereign of a licentious army, whom he dreaded, and by whom he was despised. The valour and fortune of Aurelian at length opened the prospect of a deliverance. He ventured to disclose his melancholy situation, and conjured the emperor to hasten to the relief of his unhappy rival. Had this secret correspondence reached the ears of the soldiers, it would most probably have cost Tetricus his life, nor could he resign the sceptre of the West without committing an act of treason against himself. He affected the appearances of a civil war, led his forces into the field against Aurelian, posted them in the most disadvantageous manner, betrayed his own counsels to his enemy, and with a few chosen friends deserted in the beginning of the action. The rebel legions, though disordered and dismayed by the unexpected treachery of their chief, defended themselves with desperate valour, till they were cut in pieces almost to a man, in this bloody and memorable battle, which was fought near Chalon in Champagne. The retreat of the irregular auxiliaries, Franks and Batavians, whom the conqueror soon compelled or persuaded to repass the Rhine, restored the general tranquillity, and the power of Aurelian was acknowledged from the wall of Antoninus to the columns of Hercules. As early as the reign of Claudius, the city of Autun, alone and unassisted, had ventured to declare against the legions of Gaul. After a siege of seven months, they stormed and plundered that unfortunate city, already wasted by famine. Lyon, on the contrary, had resisted with obstinate disaffection the arms of Aurelian. We read of the punishment of Lyon, but there is not any mention of the rewards of Autun. Such, indeed, is the policy of civil war, severely to remember injuries and to forget the most important services. Revenge is profitable, gratitude is expensive. Aurelian had no sooner secured the person and provinces of Tetricus than he turned his arms against Zenobia, the celebrated queen of Palmyra and the East. Modern Europe has produced several illustrious women who have sustained with glory the weight of empire, nor is our own age destitute of such distinguished characters. But if we accept the doubtful achievements of Semiramis, Zenobia is perhaps the only female whose superior genius broke through the servile indolence imposed on her sex by the climate and manner of Asia. She claimed her descent from the Macedonian kings of Egypt, equalled in beauty her ancestor Cleopatra, and far surpassed that princess in chastity and valour. Zenobia was esteemed the most lovely as well as the most heroic of her sex. She was of dark complexion, for in speaking of a lady these trifles become important, her teeth were of pearly whiteness, and her large black eyes sparkled with uncommon fire, tempered by the most attractive sweetness. Her voice was strong and harmonious. Her manly understanding was strengthened and adorned by study. She was not ignorant of the Latin tongue, but possessed in equal perfection the Greek, the Syriac, and the Egyptian languages. She had drawn up for her use an epitome of Oriental history, and familiarly compared the beauties of Homer and Plato under the tuition of the sublime Longinus. This accomplished woman gave her hand to Odenatus, who, from a private station, raised himself to the dominion of the East. She soon became the friend and companion of a hero. In the intervals of war, Odenatus passionately delighted in the exercise of hunting. He pursued with ardor the wild beasts of the desert, lions, panthers, and bears, and the ardor of Zenobia in that dangerous amusement was not inferior to his own. She had inured her constitution to fatigue, disdained the use of a covered carriage, generally appeared on horseback in military habit, and sometimes marched several miles on foot at the head of the troops. The success of Odenatus was in great measure ascribed to her incomparable prudence and fortitude. Their splendid victories over the great king, whom they twice pursued as far as the gates of Tesipon, laid the foundations of their united fame and power, the armies which they commanded, and the provinces which they had saved, acknowledge not any other sovereigns than their invincible chiefs. The senate and people of Rome revered a stranger who had avenged their captive emperor, and even the insensible son of Valerian accepted Odenatus for his legitimate colleague. End of chapter 11, part 2 Recording by Monsbru, Helsingfors, Finland